My name is Kenneth, I'm 22 years old, and this story happened a couple of months ago. I had just gotten a job working nights at an Amazon warehouse near where I live. On my shift, there weren't that many of us. It would just be me on my own doing my work somewhere in the warehouse. I think it was my second night at work when the security guard who worked there introduced himself. His name was Vincent. He was a large man, slightly overweight, in his late 30s. He was friendly at first when we started talking. Mostly small talk and interests we both have. He asked if I wanted to go get a beer and maybe see a movie the following Friday, as we both had that day off. I agreed as I didn't have any plans and I don't go out too often. That Friday in the evening, me and Vincent met up at a bar near where we work. Everything went okay. We had some drinks, talked about sports and previous jobs we worked. Then we headed out to the movie theater. That's when Vincent started acting weird. We bought our tickets and headed to the theater. I needed to use the bathroom, so I went. I was standing at the urinal doing my thing when I heard a bathroom door open. I couldn't hear any footsteps, but I didn't think twice about it. Then I turned around. I saw Vincent standing there, watching me. His head was down, but his eyes were up, and he was just smiling at me. I jumped and I laughed, saying he startled me. But Vincent just stood there, looking at me. It was like he was angry, almost, with a weird smile. It's weird. You have to be there to understand. I just walked past him and said I would wait for him outside. That was the first red flag. Then as we were in the movie theater watching the movie, I swear he was staring at me. I wasn't certain, but I could see in the corner of my eye that he was turned staring directly at me. I was too freaked out to check, so I did my best to focus on the movie. The next thing that happened was Vincent started rubbing his hand on my thigh. That was it for me. I got up and I walked out. The next week at work, Vincent came up to me and asked if I wanted to go hang out. I looked at him confused and annoyed at the same time. I thought me up and leaving was obvious I wasn't interested and don't want anything to do with him. I told him no, I'm busy and carried on working. Fast forward a few weeks later of him asking me and hanging out and texting me, calling me, I really had enough. So the next time I saw him in work, I told him I don't want anything to do with him and to leave me alone. I turned away and carried on sorting boxes. Vincent walked away and I thought that was the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. Later that night, I decided to take a break and go to the bathroom. I sat inside one of the stalls to answer a few texts. I then heard some heavy boots stumping down the corridor, then into the bathroom. I opened the stall door to see what was going on. Before I could open the door, it was kicked into me, causing me to fall backwards. And then Vincent was on top of me, putting his hands all over my face, trying to cover my mouth and then he started strangling me. I was losing consciousness, but I still remember the look of Vincent's face as he was choking me. His face was red and his eyes were wide as they could be. I thought I was gonna die, but for some reason, Vincent let me go and left the bathroom. I sat up trying to catch my breath. I was still in defense mode because I thought for some reason, Vincent was gonna come back and kill me, but he never did, thankfully. I reported what happened to the manager. He looked on the CCTV camera and I called the police. You can see me walking into the bathroom and about a minute later, Vincent rushes in. At that point, Vincent had left the warehouse and went home. Well, that's what he told the police anyway. I'm gonna fast forward what happens next and say due to no proof of Vincent attacking me, the charges were dropped against him. He even got to keep his job. I felt that justice had been taken away from me and there was no way I was gonna continue at Amazon, especially with that maniac still working there. I left that job, obviously, and currently have a new job. I hope and pray for whoever comes into Vincent's path, stay away from him. I love modern warfare, and I usually play for hours on end. If you don't know what that is, it's a Call of Duty game. My name is Michaela, and a few months ago, I had a really bad experience due to playing Call of Duty. I usually play with my friends Mimi, Yaya, and Maya in hardcore team deathmatch or Warzone. I'm not really that good and possibly the worst of my friends. There was one Saturday where it was raining and storming all day so we literally played for about 15 hours straight. Late that night everyone was getting tired but me. Then this guy joined one of our games. His name was Probe Master. This man kept whispering in the mic like some weirdo or something. Then all of us received requests through PSN. I'm the only one that actually accepted it. 
I stayed on the game while everyone went to sleep. Every match, I'd hear this guy whispering, but he kept camping in the game, so his KD was very low. One game I did horrible. Then this guy sent me a message saying that I'll put up impressive numbers, but my overall ratio was 0.20. I know I suck, but this guy would not stop talking about how good I was. Just be polite. I would say thank you. So a few weeks go by and this guy would constantly jump in my Call of Duty games and every Friday he would send me a message saying I hope you have a good weekend, like some creeper because I would never respond. Well, until one day. He jumped in the game as my friends and I were in a free for all game. After the first game he played with us and some randoms, he said good game guys. Especially you, Michaela. All of my friends stopped talking. Then Maya asked me how this guy knows my name. And I said I don't know because my username isn't even close to my real name. Then she attempted to ask him, but he wasn't on anymore. Three days later, and this guy still hasn't logged back on. I even sent him a message asking him how he knew my name. No response. I was a little worried. Not for him, but... Just wondering how he knew my real name. Maybe he guessed it. So again, one day I get home, open up my blinds, relax a little, and I started playing Modern Warfare in my living room. I threw on my hoodie to get more comfortable. Everyone was playing except for Malia. We didn't know where she was. So I'm sitting there waiting for the next game to load and I receive a text that says, Michaela? With a question mark from a number I didn't know. I can tell it was an iPhone because I replied with, yeah, who's this? In the term blue and the person immediately read it with no response. I looked up at my TV because I heard a camera sound and I noticed a flash. I need to mention that the window was about six or seven feet behind me to the right and that's where it came from. Then I received a text message from the same number. It was a photo of me. Taken from outside the window, I was stuck. I looked at the reflection on my TV. I could see a man standing on the outside of my window. I turned around and the man started clawing at the screen, trying to get in the living room. I yelled for my dad and he started running downstairs. Before my father got to the room, the man ran away. My father ran outside, but the guy was gone. One of my neighbors got a good look at him and helped with the sketch. I also showed the text messages to the cops. This guy just simply disappeared. I haven't seen him on a game and haven't received text messages anymore. He's never been found. That situation keeps me on my toes. Just be careful. This dream has stayed with me for years. Although not profound or life altering, I've never been able to shake the memory and the feeling of absolute terror and dread. To give some context, this was a number of years ago. Currently, I'm 23 years old. When this dream occurred, I was around the age of 11. As a child, I suffered from sleep paralysis for a number of years. At first, this terrified me to the point of me not wanting to sleep. It became so bad that I pushed myself to states of exhaustion before my body could no longer remain conscious and I would just pass out, only to return to the horrifying imagery of my subconscious. The first time I ever experienced sleep paralysis, I still lived with my aunt. I awoke to the sensation of not being able to move, and this confused me but didn't scare me. It was only when I saw what stood in the corner of my room that the fear really start to set in. It was a hooded figure in all black. In his hand was some kind of weapon. It stood there staring at me. My eyes widened as I prayed for this to be some kind of dream or hallucination. I was frozen in fear. Its sharp, crooked dagger teeth began to form a smile. It slowly began to turn its head like a doll, continuing until it was at such an unnatural angle, and then it started to inch towards me. It didn't walk. It simply began to move closer. I can't really explain it. It edged closer to me, still staring at me. Looking back, I can still picture it, and it disgusts me. It continued until it was halfway across the room. Then without warning, it just stopped. This is when my blood ran cold. It slowly raises its arm from beneath its cloak to reveal its hideous revolting arm. A mixture of rotting flesh and bone. Decomposing right there in front of me. And the sight of it made me want to throw up. Then it did something I would never forget. Slow and methodically it raised its hand and began to point. Not at random. 
not at something in my room, but at me. My eyes widened further, and my heart began to thump in my chest. It then places both hands upon his head and began to pull and twist his head back into place. The noise it made sent shivers down my spine and sent goosebumps and chills all over my body. It cracked and creaked and screamed back into place and then the figure began to approach me. It was at that point, full-blown panic set in and I began to struggle. I kicked and twisted and tried to throw my body but I couldn't move. I couldn't move at all. I was trapped, paralyzed. I tried my best but I could not break free. So I did what anyone would do in this situation. I screamed. I screamed with all my might. I thought that if my family was alerted, maybe they could stop it. It'd go away. Or at the very least, they'd surely see what happened to me. But to my absolute dismay, no sound came out of my mouth. I tried again, but the same result. By now, the figure was almost at the foot of my bed. I continued to cry out for help. In my head, I was screaming like a madman, but in reality, not a sound could be heard. I looked up and it's here. The figure is at the foot of my bed. Only now it's not smiling. Now it looks even more terrifying. Its teeth are aligned jaggedly and I know it's going to sound stupid but it looked hungry. I continued to struggle. It got closer and closer until it was right in front of me at the side of my bed. I was frozen. It leaned in until it was face to face with me. And it was at this point I thought my life was over. It reached its arms out toward me, and it screamed a blood-curdling scream. I tried to close my eyes and prepare myself to be ripped apart, but no, nothing. Just like that, it was gone. I looked around my room with my heart thumping so hard I thought it would escape my ribcage. I was sweating profusely and was completely afraid. I scanned the room, but it was empty. I turned on the light still nothing. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, my light stayed on. The previous night's ordeal hunted me for the next day and I couldn't focus. I just wasn't myself. I tried to talk about it with my aunt but she just blew me off and said it was a bad dream and maybe a demon that had taken a liking to me. I dreaded going to bed all day and when night came, I wasn't prepared. I was terrified. I decided I wouldn't sleep in fear of whatever I saw would return. I tried my hardest, but eventually I began to drift away, and I struggled. My eyes became heavy, and tears began streaming down my face. I couldn't face it. Whatever that thing was, it had shaken me to my very core. It might sound silly to some, but I genuinely believed that when I fell back to sleep, that my life would be in serious danger. I sobbed and cried myself to sleep. The next morning, I woke up, and I was fine. No figure, no traumatic experience. Nothing. Later on, I would learn about sleep paralysis, as I did end up suffering from it quite a few years. And I ended up doing some research, which confirmed it all to be just sleep-related hallucinations. Eventually, I did discover tricks to overcome the experience, and it works. If you too experience sleep paralysis, try researching it like I did. Good luck. This happened a few months ago. I'm a 23-year-old female, and I had finally bought a car for myself. I loved driving around and listening to music. I usually liked doing this by myself. On this night, it was around 7 p.m., and it was winter time. On this particular drive, I took two of my siblings. My sister was 18, and my brother was 13. I took them along with me after their constant pleading because they were bored. Now, I'm a smoker, and coming from a South Asian household, women are not supposed to smoke. So I took these opportunities to smoke without worrying that my parents would catch me. The city that I live in has some bad areas. However, we lived in a quiet suburban area. So I didn't give a second thought about parking somewhere, getting out of my car and lighting up a cigarette. I don't like smoking in my car. So there I was parked beneath a street light, scrolling away on my phone. It was getting pretty dark but I wasn't too worried about it as I would visit this road frequently and it wasn't too far from my aunt's house. As I was smoking my cigarette, I look up from my phone and I see a man emerging from some bushes nearby. I didn't think much of it. I see people walking around here all the time. This man was very tall 
Standing at at least six foot four, he was on the opposite sidewalk. I assumed that he was just going to carry on walking, so I looked back to my phone. Until I looked up again and saw him standing in front of my car, staring at me. My sister, who was still in the car, must have been watching him as well, because she knocked on the window, telling me to come in. I had already put out my cigarette and was making my way to the driver's side door, keys in hand. The man was still standing there, not moving a muscle. I got in and locked my door and breathed a sigh of relief, thinking that maybe I was just overreacting. As I put my keys in the ignition, I looked up to see where the guy was, but he was no longer standing in front of my car. I looked in my rearview mirror and saw that he was now standing behind us. He was taking pictures of my license plate. I slightly rolled down my window and I could see his face a bit clearer now. He appeared to be an Indian man with a beard and a hoodie over his head, obscuring some of the features on his face. I asked him as politely as I could, Excuse me, what are you doing? The man comes towards my window, but still kept his distance. He then said in a very aggressive tone, Do you know who I am? I didn't know if he was asking a rhetorical question or not. I have a lot of shit going on in my house. I don't need you parking here and watching me. You look real suspicious. Just randomly parking here with your two friends? What do you think you're doing? Get the fuck out of here. I chuckled nervously. I was trying to keep calm, but my anxiety was already halfway through the roof at this point. I didn't understand how I looked threatening in any way, as I'm a small girl who's been told that she looks like a kid. I was in my pajamas, and I was clearly minding my own business. Look, I just parked here to smoke. I come here all the time since I live close by. That's when the man got right up to my window. He slid his fingers through the gap and forced my window all the way down, screaming at the top of his lungs. Get the hell out of here! I screamed in terror and told him to stop swearing, as I had a minor in the back seat, and he was scaring him. He then screamed, If you don't get out of here right now, I'll damage your fucking car. My adrenaline was running at full speed, and I was terrified. I didn't even bother putting my seatbelt on. I bolted out of there, and in my panic, I went straight ahead at a junction. It led me to a dead end. As soon as I stopped my car, I took the opportunity to try and calm down. My whole body was shaking. I couldn't even keep my foot on the clutch. My sister was quick to ask me if I was okay. But before I could even answer, I saw a pair of headlights coming right for us. It was the man. He was going at least 50 on a 20, and he almost crashed right into my car. But by some miracle, he just missed us. After his car screeched to a stop, he jumped out, and that's when I realized that my window was still all the way down. I quickly tried to roll my window back up, but the man was too quick. He then dove into my car. Half of his body was through my window. I screamed so loudly with his ear right next to my face that I'm sure I deafened him. He was trying to force my car keys from the ignition, but I thanked my lucky stars that with my car, to release the key, you had to have your foot on the clutch, which I didn't. With one hand, I was pressing down on the horn of my car to make as much noise as possible so I could alert anyone who was nearby. I scratched his hands away from my car keys and I heard my poor siblings crying their eyes out. My little brother had no idea what he could do to protect me and my sister was in the passenger seat experiencing all of this firsthand. I finally managed to force the man out of my car and that's when he started screaming again. I thought I told you to get out of here. Now I'm going to fucking kill you, bitch. The deranged man then attempted to pull my door handle, trying to get inside, and that's when I floored it the fuck out of there. I didn't care that my body was shaking like a fish out of water. My main priority was the safety of my siblings. I knew that we were making a loud commotion. I laid down on my horn, trying to get the attention of anyone nearby, but nobody came to help us. I managed to maneuver my way out of the dead end, and then went down a new street, into a totally different area, and I then parked. 
I knew that this was probably not a good idea, but I didn't see the guy following us. The three of us just sat in my car, sobbing away. This was the first time that anything like this has ever happened to us. I called the police, and I immediately wanted to punch myself in the face when the dispatcher asked if I had gotten the man's registration number. Of course, in my panic, I didn't. I wanted to slap myself in the face, because I listened to a lot of horror stories on YouTube, and I always felt that they taught me how to handle certain situations. The dispatcher was very understanding, as was the female officer who called me the next day. As a woman, she understood how scary it must have been for me, and I cried to her as I recounted the incident. Unfortunately, the cops informed me that there was no CCTV cameras in that area, so there wasn't really much that they could do, especially with me not knowing where he came from. If he did in fact come from one of the nearby houses, I didn't know which one. The officer apologized to me, but it was really my fault for not mentally noting important information. They made a report of my attack, so if a similar incident happens in that area, they can make the connection. The officer said that when I parked my car, the man was likely doing something illegal nearby, and that's why he freaked out on me. I personally think it was just some deranged individual who enjoyed scaring people who looked like easy prey. Growing up in a working-class Latino family, we didn't have the luxury of taking lavish vacations throughout the year. However, that didn't stop us from exploring the natural wonders of Southern California through camping. At a young age, my sister and I understood the value of camping through our shared respect for Mother Nature. Over time, we mastered surviving in the outdoors, so much so that we desired to explore new campgrounds throughout the state. On one such occasion, a co-worker of my father overheard him talking about his summer vacation plans and suggested to him a new campground to check out. To this day, my parents nor I are unable to remember the name of the campsite yet we all agreed that it was somewhere in the hills of San Diego County. My father was excited for the prospect of visiting a new national park and packed up the car for the customary family summer retreat. The drive up to the campsite was long and dangerous. Even though we were driving during the day, the steepness of the mountain, coupled with the numerous blind turns, had everyone sitting on the edge of their seats. Arguments soon erupted amongst us as we didn't find any signs indicating where to go. This was in the age before smartphones and GPS. Eventually, we convinced our father to stop and ask for directions. As the campground came into view, we all let out a collective sigh of relief. We made it. And yet, the place did not look like it was a national park at all. There wasn't a ranger station or a welcome center anywhere in sight. The lake appeared murky like a bog whereas the campground itself was devoid of life, a proverbial ghost town, with the only inhabitants being us. With our bewilderment aside, we cautiously surveyed the area, finding any clues that will guide us to the keeper of this place. Out in the distance, we saw a crumbling, open sign dangling in the window of a dilapidated diner. Just as the sign implied, we entered the establishment to inquire about the place. Pushing the creaking door open, we were greeted by the owner of the diner, a gaunt-looking man who I would now say was plucked straight out of the movie, The Hills Have Eyes. Well, how can I help y'all folks on this fine day? My dad replied, We made reservations to camp here, but I'm not sure if this is the right place. We then handed the man our booking papers for him to inspect. With his bony fingers grasping the pages, he replied, yeah, yeah, you have the right place. I'm the groundskeeper of this here national park. Let me finish some paperwork on my end, and I'll get things ready for you and your family to stay here with us. As he wobbled off to the back of the diner, my sister and I retreated to the safety of our car. Although we were children at the time, we both felt a sense of unease, even dread at the thought of spending the night here. Despite our worries, our parents reassured us that the vacation had only just begun, albeit with a few bumps along the way. As we neared the site, all of our concerns were tossed out the window, 
as it was time to transform this empty lot into our secure encampment. The rest of the day came and went as our campsite was beginning to take shape. The sounds of our radio, along with the rhythmic banging of the hammer, were the only echoes greeting us as the sun began to set. This detail stood out to me. Due to the fact it was early July here in Southern California, and there are always people camping around this time. In either case, we all just brushed it aside and thought that more people would arrive by tomorrow. And they did. On the following day of the trip, my father went fishing at the lake. While he was off on his own adventure, my sister and I decided that it was time to have one of our own. Recruiting the aid of our mother, we set out to explore the campgrounds. To our surprise and elation, we discovered that this campground had its own public swimming pool. With our minds made up, the three of us got into our bathing suits, slathered on the sunscreen, and made our way to the pool. Soon my sister and I were splashing around in the water without a care in the world, until I noticed three suspicious men, dressed entirely in black. They came and sat at one of the chairs at the opposite end of the pool from where our mother was watching us. At first, I thought the men were new campers that had recently arrived at the grounds to examine the swimming pool. But to my dismay, the men just huddled around each other and whispered incomprehensible things while staring intently at the two of us. My mother's instincts caught on to the predatory behavior, and she decided to cut our excursion to the swimming pool short. When my father arrived from the lake, he said he was unable to catch any fish, and that the fish he did find were all belly up dead in the water. My mother then informed my father of the three suspicious looking men eyeing my sister and I at the pool. This infuriated him. My father, brandishing his machete, stormed out in search of the group of men, ostensibly to talk some sense into them. Some time passed, and my father arrived back at the campsite, dismayed that he did not find the men, only a mother and her two little boys. This point may sound insignificant at first, but it will become important later in the story. As night fell, my sister and I were preparing to go to sleep, when we were suddenly jolted awake by the pleading screams of a woman. Her pleas were joined by the cries of two young children and various male voices demanding their silence. My father recognized the woman's voice as the mother he saw earlier in the day camping alone with her two kids. My father, who is a former Marine, loaded his rifle and concealed his hunting knife. He then proceeded to tell my mother to take care of us while handing her a loaded gun. I then saw my father head out towards the campsite where the single mother and her children were staying. My sister and I were petrified when we noticed the terror-stricken look on our mother's face. As the yelling escalated, two thunderous bangs from the rifle rang out. Which put an end to the chaos. Seconds later, we heard the crackling branches closing in as someone moved quickly towards us. My mother, with eyes wide and knuckles clenched, aimed into the darkness, ready to protect us at all costs. To our relief, my father emerged from the shadows with a fearful mother and her two sobbing children. My father then claimed that he scared off the men who were harassing us at the pool and will be helping the mother pack her things to leave. To ensure that they made their way down the mountain safely, my father offered to follow her in our car until she got to the main highway. In a moment of reprieve, the woman held her children tight. We all assured her that their safety was of the utmost importance, and knowing my father, any form of aggression needs to be handled quickly. With pleasantries aside, my father departed yet again to help the mother pack up her campsite and leave this backwater excuse for a national park. The few rays of sunlight that streamed into our tent signaled the start of a new day, since our father had left to escort the small family from the imminent danger. With a look of apprehension on my mother's face, 
my sister and I started to pack up camp, knowing all too well that we did not want to risk our lives spending another night at this place. I was making my way to the bathrooms, when my eye caught the glimpse of our car slowly making its way back to camp. I ran back to tell my mother and sister, who noticed the car as well, and soon the bloodshot eyes of my father behind the wheel came into view. As he exited the car, he informed us that the mother and her children made it safely to the highway. This was then followed by a long pause, with my father saying, Now let's get the hell out of here ourselves. With that, we all took our positions and packed up the rest of our camping gear. Before leaving this godforsaken place, my father informed the owner of the diner about what happened last night and about the three suspicious-looking men. The only thing that the emaciated-looking man said was, Well, it's a damn shame that you and your family can't stay here a little longer. We then hightailed it out of there like bats out of hell, vowing never to return. Ever since this harrowing experience, my family and I have been unable to get my sister to go camping again. As time went on, I decided to ask my father where he had heard about that awful place, to which he added a new detail not previously disclosed. He mentioned that upon returning to work, he wanted to confront his co-worker about the horrible camping recommendation he gave. When he tried to locate him, Another co-worker stated that the same man quit a couple of days before my father was going to return from vacation. My father was left speechless and confused upon hearing this. Was the man somehow connected to those three men? If so, what were their motives for harassing a family out in the middle of nowhere? The answers to these questions we will never know, but what I do know is this. If my father did not intervene on that fateful night, that single mother and her kids would have met a fate far worse than a failed camping trip. I am an immigrant from Belarus. English is not my first language, so I apologize if I phrase things differently. Here's some backstory. I was only 11 when my family left the country after the collapse of the Soviet Union. My father was involved with the Communist Party, and would frequently visit Moscow when I was a boy. I don't know all the details. I don't even know what exactly my father's role was in the USSR, but from what I understand, we were granted asylum in the United States and had to flee Belarus in 1991. But that's not really why I'm writing this story. This is about something I saw in my childhood that has scarred me for life. This took place roughly a year before we left so I'm guessing the year was 1990. My family, like many others, lived in a massive apartment building in Minsk. There were two other identical apartment buildings adjacent to ours, and directly behind the buildings was a playground area where I would play with my friends Sasha and Victor. Beyond the playground was a section of trees that separated a shopping plaza from the apartment grounds. I remember that my mother was feeling ill and was bedridden, and my father was away on business in Moscow, so I was pretty much on my own that night. I remember that I had gotten bored watching TV in the living room and decided to go outside and see if any of my friends were at the playground. I would say this was around 8 p.m. and it was dark out. By then, most of the children were inside, and I don't even think anyone was allowed on the playground at that time, but I didn't care. There was no one around to tell me to go back inside, and I was pretty excited to have the playground all to myself. It was chilly out that night, but it was not snowing, so I figured that I would play on the slides and swing set until I either got bored or if security came along and told me to go back inside. So there I was, just swinging in the dark, when I heard something near the fence that separated the trees from the playground. It was a strange noise, like someone was sawing wood, but there was something just off about it. I ignored the sound, but it became louder as time passed, to the point where I became curious as to what was causing this strange noise. There were no lights at the playground itself, but there were lights mounted to the back of the apartment buildings that illuminated things just enough to where you could see your surroundings but the trees beyond the fence were pitch black. 
I got off the swing set and approached the edge of the playground. The sound continued getting louder, even as I got up right to the fence. It wasn't until I let out a curious, Hello? that the noise ceased. I stood there staring into the dark trees, waiting for a response, but all remained silent. After about another minute passed, I innocently asked, Why are you chopping down trees in the dark? I then heard a shuffling from within the trees, and soon, I saw a dark figure come into view, but did not step out from the tree line. What happened next is something that still makes me want to vomit out my insides. The dark figure then threw something. The object flew over the fence and hit me directly in the chest. I was knocked backwards, more out of surprise than the actual force of the impact. Hey, why'd you do that? I shouted. But before I could get another word out, I caught a glimpse of what had been thrown at me. A severed human arm was lying on the ground in front of me. I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran back towards the apartments bawling my eyes out. I stormed into our apartment and sat on the living room couch to collect myself. I did think about waking my sick mother and telling her about what happened, but decided against it. To give you some perspective, my mother grew up in Siberia and she could be quite ruthless at times. Not only would she not be too happy about being woken up, but she most likely wouldn't believe my story. And I probably wouldn't be able to sit down for a week if she found out I left the apartment alone after dark. So I kept this incident to myself. As a child, I understood that what happened was scary, but I had no grasp of the implications. I thought there was a monster in the woods who ate people who came out after dark. Now that I'm an adult, there are some things that I've come to realize. For our remaining time in Belarus, I never saw or heard any kind of investigation regarding a missing person or a mutilated body being discovered, which is nothing out of the ordinary living in Soviet society. The monster in the woods, hiding in the trees that night, was most likely a sadistic madman dismembering a human body with a hacksaw. There is one more thing that I should mention. For the rest of the time that we lived there, I cannot for the life of me recall ever seeing my friend Sasha again after that night. This happened a few weeks ago. I was hanging out with my friend Dustin, and we decided to go explore this creepy old abandoned asylum. It was a huge building, about three stories high. We walked past the railroad. We then continued to the old asylum. As we walked to it, I looked up and my heart dropped. From the third story window, I could see someone looking down at me and Justin. I stopped and he asked me what was wrong. I told him to look up in that window on the right. He looked up and saw it too. We continued to stare at it for about a few seconds before whoever or whatever it was moved out of sight. We then were deciding if we should still go in. We settled it. It was just some person trying to buy drugs or something. Drug deals and teens were always in there sneaking. We went past no trespassing signs and explored the first level of the building. There was a lot of broken glass and graffiti everywhere. There was this one that said, I love it when they run. Don't get me wrong, that was kind of creepy, but obviously done as a joke. So we made it up to the second floor and basically the same thing there, except for an old elevator shaft that was cracked slightly open. Dustin turned his flashlight on and put it in the elevator. We saw a whole lot of electrical junk, some dead birds and animals. If that wasn't freaky enough, we also heard something walking above us on the third story. My heart felt like it was about to explode. I had a bad feeling about this, and I told him we should leave. He said, nah, it'll be fine, and he started walking up to the third story. I didn't want to be left alone near the spooky elevator, so I followed behind him. We had our phones out, taking pictures of all kinds of stuff on the previous floors. As we walked up the stairs, I swear we were being followed and I told Dustin to hurry up. He went upstairs and I wasn't far behind. What I saw on the third floor of that asylum will haunt me for the rest of my life. There were pentagrams and animals all over the place. It smelled awful up there. There were some rooms in the back of the corner. Keep in mind, 
This is the floor we saw that thing looking down at us from. We heard what sounded like whispers coming from the middle room. We got our phones out and started taking pictures of it. After I got about two or three pics, I saw a figure step out of the room. My heart was beating so hard I swear it had come through my chest. It was the same person I was looking from the window. Me and Dustin were freaking out, but we didn't dare move. About 10 seconds of staring, and it started sprinting at us screaming. I took off in a sprint down the stairs, almost dropping my phone. I ran and jumped out of the two-story window and landed in some brush. I got up and ran some more before crouching behind some old shed. Then it hit me. Dustin was still in there. I hadn't even noticed him when I ran down the stairs. I texted him and asked him where he was, but didn't reply. I sat crouched behind that shed for about three minutes before I saw Justin sprinting out of that house. I jumped from behind the shed and called his name. He saw me and screamed run. He looked behind him. Then I looked behind him. He was being chased by two people. I took off down the road heading for the railroad. Dustin caught up with me and we didn't stop until we made it to the tracks. We jumped in a ditch beside the railroad and looked up to see the two people standing at the door of the asylum. They were watching us, but then turned and walked back inside. We ran up to the local burger place and sat down at a booth. Out of breath, we ordered some Sprite and fries. While waiting for food, I asked him what happened after I ran. He said the guy chased him and he ran down the stairs and saw me jump out of the window and he ran to the elevator where he found a small space behind some boxes to hide behind. He said after he sat there for a bit, the guy came down the stairs with another person. They were watching to see where we went. Then his phone went off because I texted him. He said they looked his direction and saw him. They then chased him down the stairs and out the door. And that's when I saw him and we ran. We didn't call the cops because we didn't want to get in trouble for trespassing. I don't know those guys, and I don't know what they were doing in that building, but needless to say, I don't think me or Dustin will ever go back there again. I'm 33 and I have a son named Jeffrey. He's eight years old. Recently, I was able to save enough money to buy Jeffrey a PS4 for his birthday. Three days before Jeffrey's birthday, I went on Amazon and bought a PS4 bundle that came with FIFA 20, Last of Us, God of War, Madden, and Fortnite. I ordered it so it would be delivered on Jeffrey's birthday to surprise him. On the morning of Jeffrey's birthday, I looked outside and saw an Amazon delivery van pull up to my house. Once he knocked at the door, I told Jeffrey to answer the door, as it was a surprise for him. This was something I regret. Because once the door opened, a man stood there holding the PS4, and the way he looked at Jeffrey didn't sit right with me. He just stood there with a really weird smile staring at my son with wide eyes. I could tell Jeffrey was feeling uncomfortable as he looked up at me in an unsettling and confused way. I thought the man would just hand us the PS4 and leave, but the way he was staring at my son I had to step in. I signed for it and I said thank you. The man just said bye, but he wouldn't look at me. He kept his eyes on my son who was now behind me. My son and I were both a little put off by that man. but. Jeffrey was happy with his new PlayStation and went to set it up in his room. The following Monday, I picked Jeffrey up from school and asked him how his day was. He told me the usual stuff he always says, what he learned, what lessons he had. But one of the things he said scared me. He told me during one of his breaks when they had recess, it was a man he had got his attention through a fence that was hidden by some bushes in the field where the children spend their break times. I asked Jeffrey what the man said to him. He told me the man was being friendly, asking him where his friends were, when the school let out, and even if he wanted to go to his house afterwards. I asked if he knew this man, and if he had seen him before. He said, yeah. It was the man who delivered his PlayStation on his birthday. And not only that, he saw the man walking around outside watching our house from across the street. I asked Jeffrey when the man was outside our house. He told me in the evening over the weekend, he would look outside his bedroom window and see the man standing there across the street waving at him, smiling. I straight away called the school and warned him about the man hanging around the school. I also told the delivery service and the police. I told them what my son had told me. The next two days, I kept Jeffrey home from school. I was so paranoid and worried I didn't want to let him out of my sight. 
that following Wednesday night I woke up a little past midnight. I hadn't been sleeping well. I went to check on Jeffrey and then went downstairs to pour myself a glass of water. I then jumped out of my skin when I saw a black figure outside the back door and saw that the figure had tried the back door handle but it was locked. I looked out the window trying to see who it was but there was no one there. Then across the road I saw a car started and took off down the street. I called the police telling them someone had tried to enter my house. I got no sleep that night and I'm still having trouble sleeping. This all took place about two weeks ago and we haven't had any incidents since but I'm still paranoid and frightened that this isn't over. When I was a kid, I used to ride my bike almost daily to the local library branch a few blocks from my home. One day when I was about eight, I rode down to the library like I normally did, parked my bike by the bike rack near the back entrance to the building, went in and browsed for whatever an eight-year-old boy would read, checked out a few books, and left the library. When I came out, there was a man standing over by the bike rack. I didn't think anything of it, so I just went over to get my bike so I could go home. As I went to get on my bike, he said, Hi, my name is John. Then he asked me, What's your name? I was a stupid kid, so I told him. And then he said, I work with your mom, you know. What is her name again? So again, stupid kid, I told him, and then he said, Well, she wanted me to show you something over there behind those trees. In hindsight, and upon many years of reflection upon this incident, the guy sounds like the most inept kidnapper in history. It's like he was reading from the script of How Not to Abduct a Child. However, it was 35 years ago, and the most education kids got about this kind of thing was just don't talk to strangers. My parents were great, but this was just not something people worried about all that much back then. I was a bit creeped out when he said that my mom wanted him to show me something in the trees, and my radar for this is weird went up. I politely declined the invitation to the woods and hopped on my bike to pedal home. As I turned away, he grabbed the bar on the rear of my seat to keep me from pedaling away. Now I was scared. I jumped off the back and re-entered the library. I made my way to the circulation desk and asked if I could use the phone. The woman at the desk told me that the phone was not for public use, so I left the library again from the back entrance. The front was always locked. Happily, my bike was still there, and the creepy man was gone. Thinking nothing of it, I jumped on my bike and set off. About a block from the library, I noticed a brown car at a stop sign on a side street. I looked again, and I saw the creep behind the wheel. I realized many years later, and not at this time, that he knew my route home, which means he must have followed me from my house to the library. Whenever I think of this now, it gives me a sick feeling knowing that he could have taken me any time he wanted on my way to the library. I was probably saved by something as random as someone walking a dog or grabbing their mail, and he didn't want any witnesses. I pedaled faster once I spotted him, and he pulled out onto the main road. I was on the sidewalk, and he was following me closely. When my bike sped up, he sped up all the while screaming and pointing at me. By now, I was screaming too, and moving pretty quickly for an eight-year-old on a five-speed, carrying library books. And no, I never thought to drop the books. I quickly turned onto a side street, and he was moving too fast to make the turn as well, and I saw him turn onto the next side street. The side street I turned on led to my street, but there was a hill that I could not pedal up, between my street and I. I got about midway up the hill when I had to get off and walk my bike up. He was parked at the very top of the hill, just staring at me. I literally walked right past him, and I will never forget his stare or the hate in his eyes. I have no idea why he let me walk past him, why he didn't grab me, why he didn't kill me, 
I got to the top of the hill, got back on my bike and pumped my legs to get home. At this point, my house was less than 500 feet away. He turned his car around and followed me again. I got to my house, dropped my bike and screamed for my grandmother because she was the one home watching me while my parents were at work. The creep sped past my house and turned down a side street. I never saw him again. My parents called the police when they got home. I remember that the creep drove a Plymouth Duster type car and he was balding and was about 25 or 30 years old. I don't know if he was ever caught or if he ever hurt any children, his name or anything. All I know is that I have never gone back to that library. It sounds silly, but it's true. And for the next few years, I walked and rode my bike constantly, looking over my shoulder. And now, I am unbelievably protective over my children. I don't trust anyone easily. I don't trust anyone with my children, and my first reaction to a helpful teacher or coach is what is his or her motive or true intention. Not a day goes by that I don't think about that day, and I wonder not, why me, but instead, why not me? My name is Bree. This happened in 2016. I was 19 years old at the time. I was up late the night before into the early morning studying, and I hadn't had much sleep, so I had just woken up from a nap. I decided to hop in the shower to wake myself. That's when I heard this weird scraping sound coming from somewhere outside. I stopped the shower and peered out from behind the curtain, and then made my way over to the window. I saw nothing, but I could still hear the noise. I thought it may have been my neighbor working in a shed, so I ignored the disturbance and finished up in the shower. Before I continue, I should inform you that I have severe anxiety problems, and I often get a little paranoid sometimes. It also doesn't help that I have PTSD as well. Anyways, I was now back in my room, and I took a seat on my bed. I texted my then-boyfriend and asked him what he wanted for dinner. While I was waiting for him to respond, I just relaxed and scrolled through my Facebook. I was reading an article about the recent clown sightings that were happening at the time, when I was interrupted by the sound of footsteps coming from outside. I stopped and listened carefully. I heard a few more steps, followed by a tapping noise. I was a bit confused by this. It hadn't yet occurred to me that I had an unwelcomed guest outside. I was thinking why my boyfriend hadn't knocked on the door or called before he showed up. We usually had a routine with things like this, especially if I was home alone. He would either text, call, or FaceTime me to let me know when he was on his way home, or if he was at the door, because there had been a lot of shady activity around our neighborhood at the time. I then called out to him, and suddenly, all fell silent. I texted him and asked if he was at the door. There was no reply, so I decided to peek through the bedroom window. While I was making my way to the other side of the room, my phone started ringing. It was my boyfriend wanting to FaceTime. When I answered, he said he was about 15 minutes away. As I was talking to him, I pulled back the curtains of my bedroom window, and that's when all the blood in my veins turned to ice as I came face to face with a fucking clown. I know I wasn't hallucinating. An actual clown was looking at me through the window, smiling. After my initial shock, I actually started to laugh, thinking that this had to be some kind of prank my boyfriend was pulling on me. So I played along, pretending to be terrified, and whispered into the phone. Very funny, asshole. Love the whole scary clown thing. I chuckled and rolled my eyes. My boyfriend was confused, and I explained to him about the clown at the window, and said that he and his friend did a good job scaring the piss out of me. He seemed confused, saying that all of his friends were hanging out at the pub, and that he was not a part of any plan to prank me. Upon hearing this, I felt my stomach in my throat, as I looked back at the clown, who was still just outside my window. 
he reached into his costume and pulled out a very real-looking butcher's knife. By this point, I wasn't sure what was going on, so I grabbed my baseball bat. My boyfriend told me that he was now only a few minutes away. He shouted at me to stay inside and to lock all the doors and windows. I quickly closed the curtains and went into the lounge. It wasn't long before I heard a loud pounding on the front door. Suddenly, I heard a creepy voice coming from the other side. Let me in, child. I didn't respond to the voice. I just stood perfectly still, waiting for the next move. <coughs> loud pounding rang out again, causing the door to rattle on its hinges, but I kept quiet, even when I heard the doorknob rattling. Although I was pretty scared at this point, I was also getting a tad irritated and yelled out to the clown. Fuck off. Go annoy someone else. I then heard muffled laughter, followed by the creepy voice. <laughs> Please let me in, doll. I just want to play. I want to play with your insides. I had enough of this. I was about to go out and confront this creepy asshole myself when I heard my boyfriend's voice, who was still on the phone, say, Hang up and call the cops. After some consideration, I thought that maybe confronting the creepy clown outside with a butcher's knife was not the correct course of action. So I did as my boyfriend said. I left the lounge and was soon explaining to the police dispatcher the situation. I was on my way back to my room when I heard the sound of glass breaking. I stopped in my tracks and told them that I think the clown just broke into the house. They immediately told me to get somewhere safe, and that's when I heard my ex yelling out, Hey, what the fuck are you doing? Get the hell out of here. The police are on the way. <laughs> the clown just bellowed out a psychotic laugh and took off. As I made my way back into the bedroom, something caught my eye. I peered out the window. Through a gap in the curtains, I saw another clown. He appeared to be holding some kind of saw blade in his hand. I went to move, but I was like a deer caught in the headlights. I couldn't move or scream. Fear then overcame me, as I realized my boyfriend was now out there with two creepy clowns. I screamed into the phone. There's another clown outside my bedroom. Please hurry. After a few moments, I was relieved when I heard my boyfriend at the back door. I quickly let him inside. We then held each other tightly until the police arrived. After taking our statements, the police discovered a rusted hacksaw and an axe lying on the ground outside of my bedroom window. There were red marks all over them. Of course, the creepy clowns that had turned my night into a freak show were nowhere to be found. After that night, I struggled to fall asleep. I often think to myself, what would have happened to me if I had been stupid enough to open that door? Were they just a couple of thrill seekers looking to frighten a girl who was all alone? Or were they in fact, out for blood? My grandparents had passed away within a few months of each other, leaving their house empty. There was talk of renting it out initially, but because of its poor state of disrepair, the family decided against it. No consensus about what to do with it could be arrived at, therefore it would be left to decay for another decade or more before I would stumble upon it. My aunt and I were going through my mother's things and discovered an old family photo album. Mom had gone off on one of her journeys and no one was sure if she had ever returned. Her and I had been having an on and off relationship for years, so there was a lot about the family I didn't know. I came across a picture of her and I when I was just a baby, but I didn't recognize the house we were standing in front of. I inquired and my aunt told me about the old Wheeler family house that had once belonged to her parents. No one had been there in over a decade and she wasn't even sure if it was still standing. So, after half an hour of badgering, she agreed to take me out to see it. That following morning, we headed out of town through 30 miles of cornfields until we came to a turnoff that led down a long, weedy gravel road. As we crested the hill, I was taken aback. The house I saw before me 
despite being run down, was still breathtaking. In its prime, it must have been the finest home in the county. My aunt pulled up within a few yards of it and we got out. From what I could see, nobody but the occasional mowing company had been there in a very long time. I couldn't help but be in awe of the place. The vibrant pink and blue paint had long faded from its soaring towers and the massive porch was beginning to sag in a few places. Before I entered, I wanted to take in every bit of the wonderful facade as I could. Around the back was the remnants of the old horseshoe pits and, what I was told, my grandfather's Ford pickup. Although the big house had long seen its best days, I knew I hadn't seen anything that could have compared. Maybe one of those beautiful Victorian mansions in San Francisco. Even those would be dwarfed in comparison to this. When I was ready, we climbed the concrete steps and entered through the back entrance. From the moment we cracked the door, we were overwhelmed by a hideous smell coming from inside. We assumed it was a normal part of having a house sealed for so long and continued with our search. Everything appeared as if it had been left where it was on my grandmother's last day, almost like a time capsule or museum. The lights were even still working. Only later did I discover that my mother had been paying the bills all these years and hopes someone would return and live there someday. Walking from room to room and seeing all the beautiful antique furnishings, I couldn't stop wondering why I had never been told about the house. Regardless of our frequent estrangements, I would have helped my mother with the upkeep of it. It was downright insane to me to leave such a beautiful place to rot. Then again, my mother's strange ways were the main reason for our frequent falling outs. As we made our way to the second floor, the smell only got worse. I suggested we cut our visit short and just take a quick look around. Every door was closed, so I went for the closest one and stuck my head in. This must have been a guest room or spare. Upon the bed laid a beautiful and elaborate quilt easily over a hundred years old. My aunt was going through a cedar chest in a room next to me. I joined her and we discovered another much older photo album and decided to bring back with us to look at later. She closed the door behind us and I made my way toward the last room. Unfortunately, the closer I got to the door, the stronger the smell got. I was reluctant to open it, but I thought if the poor critter was where I could get to it, I'd take it outside and give it a good burial. Cracking the door, the stench slapped me in the face and I lost focus for a moment. When I regained my composure, I was met with a terrible sight. Before me was not a dead forest creature but a human being. The bloated body, now unrecognizable, laid curled up silently on the bed. I could feel my knees begin to buckle, so I turned as quickly as possible away and out of the room. My aunt was confused by my behavior and stuck her head in before yanking it out, quickly again. We both ran down the stairs where the smell was less potent and I called 911. The officers spent a few minutes in the room before coming back out with a small piece of paper and a driver's license. One of them joined us at the table where we were sitting and asked a few questions about my mother. This made me nervous and I began demanding he explain himself. A serious look came across his face and he told us that the body appeared to belong to my mom. I didn't want to believe it at first, but when he handed me her license I knew it was true. My aunt and I held each other for a long time and cried. The officer gave us a few moments before interjecting himself again. Then he asked me if I knew why she would take her own life. I had naturally assumed my mom had died in her sleep. She was an older woman, but the note he handed me made everything clear. She had been depressed for a long time because of being at odds with each other and the last time we spoke, some things were said and she feared she couldn't take it back. The morning after our argument, she decided to return to the only place that she'd ever been happy. Although she claimed to not be sure of what she was going to do at the time, the poor state of the house just sent her over the edge. The last sentence asked that I not blame myself for her death and that I move on with my life. The ending read simply, Goodbye, Mom. A couple of weeks later, after everyone had time to deal with their grief, I brought the remaining family members together. After seeing the old house and realizing how the poor condition of it hurt my mother, 
I propose we try to raise the money to renovate it. In light of what had just occurred, I wanted to at least try to create something positive from our tragedy. I was given their blessings and went to work. It took some time, but on the first day of spring 2018, the Historical Society allowed me to lead the first tour of the newly restored Wheeler Mansion. A great day could have been much better had my mother been there with me. No matter our differences, it was her who inspired me and the one who truly made it all possible. I was born, raised, and still live in Texas. I come from a family of hunters. It's pretty much a family tradition. I'm going to tell you about something that I experienced when I was 20 years old, back in 2005. My father had just been diagnosed with lung cancer, and everyone in my family was naturally devastated by this, especially me, since my dad and I were very close. I had a lot of other personal stuff going on in my life at the time, and I felt that I needed to go out for a few days just to clear my head. I decided to make it a solo hunting trip, and packed up some camping gear, along with my Marlin 336 that my dad gifted to me when I was 18. If I could get sentimental for a moment, my father ended up passing away three years after his diagnosis, and to this day, I still use that rifle for hunting. Anyways, I'd say this happened around late October, early November. I don't want to be too specific with a location, because technically, I wasn't supposed to be hunting in this specific area. However, I will disclose that it was near the Mexican border. This will be important later. I decided to set up camp for three days before heading back. I had been hunting on this land before with some friends of mine, and I knew the precautions to take not to be spotted by the game warden. I'm sure if there's any other hunters listening to this broadcast, they'll be more than happy to tell you that we often wipe our asses with the rule book. Before anyone judges me too harshly, or the practice of hunting in general, I will say that I'm a very spiritual person, and I have a profound respect for Mother Nature. I don't leave trash everywhere, and every animal that I put down, I never let go to waste. I'll be the first to admit, there are hunters that give us a bad name. And me not following the rules is more of a middle finger to the government than it is to the sport of hunting. I once straight up beat the shit out of someone who was a friend of a friend for shooting a stray dog for absolutely no reason. If it's consolation to anyone, I handed him a horrible ass whooping for that. But I digress. The first day went off without a hitch. No problems whatsoever. Aside from the fact that there was no game to be found anywhere, so I figured that I would head further south the next day to see if my luck would improve. Other hunters knew about this restricted location and may have already cleaned out this area. As night fell, I found myself sprawled out next to my truck, just staring up at the night sky, wondering if me and my dad would ever take another hunting trip together. That's when I heard the sound of footsteps slowly making their way through a nearby brush. This was alarming for obvious reasons. Whoever they were, they had the drop on me. I knew better than to light up a campfire under these circumstances. But if this person was roaming around in the dark without a flashlight, they may have had some kind of night vision apparatus giving them the advantage. I was concerned because if you were looking at me through the trees at that particular moment, it would have appeared that I was sleeping. I was in this odd position where I was resting on top of my sleeping bag with a blanket because I felt claustrophobic being fully immersed in a sleeping bag. It was a good thing too, because this meant I was able to mobilize quickly and something told me that I only had seconds to make a decision. I rolled sideways and as soon as I did, I caught a quick glimpse of a muzzle flash coming from the tree line directly in front of me. I felt dirt fly up and hit my back from the bullet striking the ground next to me. I scrambled to my feet as more shots rang out from the trees, one of them shattering the passenger side window of my truck. I took cover behind the bed of my pickup and quickly drew the 38 snub nose that I had strapped to my ankle. After the gunfire died down, I laid flat on the ground and returned to fire in the direction of the trees from under the truck. I heard several sets of footsteps fleeing from the area. 
but I held my position in case my theory about the night vision was correct. With only two rounds left in my 38, I pretty much spent the rest of that night underneath my truck, with my pistol aimed at the darkness, until the sun came out and illuminated my surroundings. I very cautiously got out from beneath my vehicle and packed up my gear as quickly as I could and hightailed it out of there. Later on, when I told a friend of mine about the incident, he said he wished I would have told him that I was heading that way. He would have warned me that the Mexican cartel started using that area to smuggle contraband and people across the nearby border. This friend of mine was a Mexican immigrant himself and had several family members mixed up in the cartel and coyote groups. So needless to say, I trusted his word. All things considered, I think I got off pretty easy. Had I been in my sleeping bag that night, I have no doubt that bullet would have nailed me. These days, I stick to the designated hunting grounds. Some things are just not worth the risk. I live in a major city in Texas. My apartment complex is gated and in a good neighborhood, but the security isn't extremely tight. Sometimes the gates are left open and anyone could piggyback off of someone else entering with the access code. Maybe twice in the past three years, the management has put out notices of vehicle break-ins and other items being stolen from porches. We also have frequent door-to-door -door solicitors, even though there are signs forbidding it. So this particular Friday evening, I go to bed at about 2.30am. For some odd reason, I was having trouble getting to sleep so I put on a podcast to listen to and eventually start to doze off. I become aware of a noise that sounds like a clicking sound but it sounds like one of my upstairs neighbors making some noise. I kind of zone this out, as I'm used to my neighbors staying up late on weekends. After about 30 seconds, I realize the noise is extremely repetitive and getting louder. I then start focusing on it more intently, trying to isolate what it could be and where it was coming from. Suddenly it hits me. It's coming from the entrance to my apartment. I leap out of bed and head to the foyer. I identify the noise right away. The lock mechanism is moving back and forth rapidly like someone is trying to unlock the front door. I can hear that an object is inserted into the lock and the person is jimmying it back and forth with a lot of force. I instinctively turn around, head to my bedside safe, unlock it with a combination, and pull out my 357 SIG pistol, load a 14 round magazine, and chamber a hollow point round. I head back to the door and as I exit the bedroom, I see the lock twist and unlatch. I immediately pointed my weapon straight ahead knowing that if someone comes through, I will have to make a split second reaction. I decide that if someone comes through my door, I will give them a momentary chance to retreat, but if they do anything other than that or enter aggressively, I'm going to shoot and ask questions later. They don't enter. However, because I had also locked the deadbolt inside only. When I first moved in a year prior, I remember thinking that the deadbolt was a great security feature and I got in the habit of always keeping it locked when I'm home. In hindsight, this decision saved me from a life or death confrontation. Upon realizing that, I approached the door and looked through the keyhole. On the other side are three Asians, two men and one woman. All three are wearing hoodies, so it's difficult to make out their faces. The men have objects in their hands, but I can't make out exactly what. The two men are talking back and forth, probably trying to figure out why they can't open the door, even though they have successfully opened the outside lock at this point. The woman is also talking loudly behind the two men, such that anyone in the hallway would be able to hear her voice. She's talking in another language. The only words I can make out are, blah blah blah, apartment 250 blah 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 and she keeps repeating that over and over like a broken record. Upon hearing that, I start to wonder for a moment if maybe they're just drunk and have the wrong apartment number. But that's impossible. To open my lock, they would have to have a copy of my exact key or some kind of lock-picking device. I've never copied my key or even given it to anyone. And here's the other thing. Not only is 250 not my apartment number, but, as I figured out later... That apartment number doesn't exist anywhere in the complex. Standing back from the door, I take a long broom handle and jab it hard in the face of the door, letting them know that I'm on the other side. They immediately stop fiddling with the lock and take off running. 
I debate whether to call 911 and decide against it until they return. I know they'll be long gone by the time anyone gets there. It would be too risky to follow them to try and get a better description or license plate, and I don't have enough identifying info as it is to make an arrest. I filed a police report the next day and let the apartment management know. They said it was unusual, but they would alert the resource officer and ask for a police presence for a couple of nights. Nothing ever came of the report, but that's not a surprise to me. It's been seven months since this happened and no further incidents. Nobody else in the apartment has reported anything similar happening. I don't think they'll be back, but one precaution I took was to buy a smart lock for the deadbolt, so I can leave that deadbolt always locked from the inside, even when I'm not home. It's crazy to think that the deadbolt was the only thing between myself and an armed confrontation with intruders. They say you don't really know what you'll do in those situations until it really happens, but I can honestly say I am proud of how I stayed calm and was mentally prepared to defend myself. If there's one good thing that came out of this, I feel confident that I responded the right way and was ready for the unthinkable. On my 19th birthday, my stoner friend convinced me to try his medications, as he called them. Unfortunately, me agreeing to give some to my inexperienced friend led to horrible consequences. I experienced unimaginable pain and suffered for a few solid years after the incident. It all started at school that day. I decided to invite my two best friends for a sleepover. Let's call them Steve and Chris for the sake of the story. Steve and I went to the same class and we've known each other since childhood. The second friend, Chris, was a year younger than me. We were really close friends and always stuck together. All of us went to the same school back then and just to clarify, in my country you graduate from high school when you're 19 years old. So at 9am, Steve approached me when I was collecting books for my morning classes. We shook hands and talked about some school stuff. Suddenly, he changed the subject and we started talking about the party. Hey man, thanks for inviting me to your house today. Of course, dude. How am I going to spend my birthday without my best friend? That's why I got you a really special birthday present. Oh, really? What is it? You're going to love it, dude, but I can't tell you right now. It's a surprise. Uh, alright man. I like surprises. Keep it a secret till tonight. Oh, and aside from me, did you invite anyone else? What about Chris? He'll be there. I wanted to invite more people, but after last year's party, my parents didn't allow it. You were there, so you know. I remember, that was a crazy party, dude. They were so pissed after Kyle broke the window. Yeah, that was so wrong. Anyways, I got classes, dude. Remember, 8pm, my house, tonight. Gotcha. Later, dude. I turned around and went to my class. I didn't think much about Steve's gift for me back then. I guessed it was some kind of liquor like usually when we partied. He was always the type of guy who liked to drink and party a lot. I was inviting him from time to time to my house and he always had a bottle of vodka with him so I thought that's what he would give me as a birthday present. I wasn't expecting anything more creative from him. Fast forward to 7pm, I finished school and went home. I went inside the house and luckily my parents were already gone. They decided to leave town after I asked them to because I wanted us to have the whole house to ourselves. I threw my backpack on my bed and started to get ready for the party. I turned the music on and prepared mattresses for my friends. I ordered some pizza and sat down on the couch waiting for them. It was almost 8.30pm when I heard the doorbell ringing. Finally, they're here, I thought to myself. I run to the doors and open them. Hey, I was worried about you. Don't act like my mom, dude. Just take your gift. Thanks, dude. Come inside. We took the wrong bus, and that's why we're late. Well, now that you're finally here, I say we start drinking. Drinking? Oh, come on. That's for kids. When he said that, I was really surprised. At first, I thought he finally matured and stopped drinking so much, so I asked him, No way. Steve, you, you don't drink anymore? Nah, man. I just stepped up my game. I got something way better for you, birthday boy. I looked at him with eyes wide open. I was really excited and afraid at the same time. I still couldn't figure out what it was. I didn't want to wait much longer and invited the guys upstairs to my bedroom. Alright, take off your shoes and let's go upstairs. We all walked upstairs and went into my room. I closed the curtains and we sat in a circle. 
Steve looked at both of us and pulled a bag full of colorful drops from his backpack. Uh, what's this? It's ecstasy. A friend of mine is a supplier and he's legit. He ensured me that it's clean. Take one, that should be enough. When I saw the bag, I didn't freak out or anything. I always wanted to try ecstasy and I heard that it's harmless. I wanted to have fun that night and I trusted Steve, so I took one without hesitation. We were all excited about this new experience and didn't think that it could affect us that badly. Chris and Steve also took one. We decided to sit down on the couch and watch TV before the pills kicked in. But after about 20 minutes, I couldn't feel anything other than my stomach hurting. And neither of my friends looked like they were tripping or had any effect. Do you feel anything? Uh, no. Me neither. Maybe they don't work? Let's just take one more. Nah, man. I'll pass. My stomach hurts a little bit from the first drop. Because of what happened next... I think my stomach hurting saved my life back then. They grabbed the bag, took one more, and after a few minutes, even more. My stomach started to hurt really badly. After a while, I was feeling nauseous and dizzy. I guess that the drop started to work, but it wasn't a nice feeling. I straightened up on the couch and turned my head left to see how my friends were reacting. At first, it seemed like they were mindlessly watching TV and feeling well, but then I asked them, Hey, how you guys feeling? No response. I could only see them blinking while looking at the TV. I was really confused as to why they're not answering me, so I asked again. Hey, gents, you hear me? Still no response. Then it hit me. I noticed saliva pouring out of Chris's open mouth, and his eyes were slowly hiding under his eyelids. I started to panic. Steve didn't look too well, but he finally said something to me. I'm not feeling well. He told me to do it. I said no. What are you talking about, dude? Look at Chris. He looks like a zombie right now. I don't think that that's how those drops are supposed to work. What do we do? Steve ignored me and mumbled something to himself, talking about some evil guy or something. I couldn't exactly understand him. I was terrified. I was the only one technically sober at this point. I felt a sudden rush of adrenaline and my heart started to beat faster and faster. My dizziness and stomach ache didn't want to stop. I got up and sat next to Chris, then grabbed him by his shoulders and shook him. Hey, Chris, you alright, dude? Say something. Hey, Chris, you in there, buddy? Speak! Chris looked like he was unconscious and even stopped blinking. His skin was slowly turning pale. I couldn't feel a pulse or any sign that he was breathing. I suspected that he overdosed, but I didn't know what to do in the situation. Chris's condition was getting worse and worse. Steve, Steve, you gotta help me, dude. Chris isn't breathing. What do we do? Uh, no, leave me alone. He then put his head on his lap and started to swing his body. I stepped away from him. There was only one thing left to do. I knew this would lead to really bad consequences, but I had to save my friend's life. I was petrified, but I pulled myself together and ran to get my phone from the charger and called for an ambulance. The rest of the night I only vaguely remember, maybe because of the drug or maybe because of the paralyzing fear. It didn't take long for paramedics to arrive. They took us immediately to the hospital and performed CPR on Chris on the way. I remember they took Chris into one room and me and Steve into another. They assigned me a bed and I fell asleep immediately. After waking up, I heard the news and burst out in tears. Chris didn't make it. Steve was fine, but he was throwing up all day and suffered extremely. It turned out that the pills weren't clean. They were laced with PMA, a substance that's much more toxic than MDMA and takes longer to kick in. That's why we couldn't feel anything for so long, and apparently Chris took a fatal dose. Steve was sentenced to five years in prison for sharing the pills with us, and fortunately, I was only fined with about $5,000 and 100 hours of community service. My family was understandably angry and ashamed of me. I lost their trust, I think for the rest of my life. I won't even mention the nightmares and anxiety I had for many years after the accident. My name is Harry and this happened about nine years ago when I was 10 years old. Growing up, it was just me, my brother, and my mom. We didn't have a lot of money and we moved around a lot, most of the time in the rough neighborhoods. We moved into an apartment building when I was about 10 years old. It didn't take us long to get settled in. My mom gave my brother and me a task to help out. 
My brother would go out and get groceries and work side jobs if he could. And my task was to do the laundry. One day I went down to the first floor with a basket full of laundry. I walked into the laundromat and started putting clothes into the machine. That's when a man walked in with a laundry basket of his own. He was about in his early 40s. Light bright hair that was slicked back and big 70s style glasses. He didn't say anything, but every now and then, I would look across the laundromat and would see him staring at me. I tried not to look, but I couldn't help but check, especially when you know you're being watched. After some time, the man left the laundromat, which left me feeling relieved. Later that day, after finishing laundry, I was heading outside with my brother and a new friend to play baseball. Before exiting the building, I looked to my left down the corridor to the laundromat and I saw that same man from earlier. He was peering around the corner, looking into the laundromat. What was he doing, I thought. Was he actually looking for me? He was being very sneaky. I left the building before he had a chance to turn around and see me. About three or four days passed before I needed to do laundry again. The first thing I saw when I walked into the laundromat was that man. This time he spoke and said, Hey, I didn't know you liked baseball, while giving me an unsettling smile. How did he know I liked baseball, I thought. Has he been watching me, following me? I said, oh yeah, while letting out an awkward fake laugh. I walked past the man and towards the washing machine. The man didn't say anything. Instead, he just stood there watching me again, still with a weird smile. Thankfully though, he left shortly after I was able to continue doing my laundry. One evening I was bored and I think there was some electrical problem in our apartment. Because of that, I wasn't able to play video games or watch TV. So I decided to do something productive and do some laundry. I went down to the laundromat and began doing the load. That's when the lights started flickering. And at the same time, the man came into the laundromat. As soon as I saw him, I felt faint. He walked slowly up to me, looking up at the lights flickering and said, I think there's going to be a power outage. I looked up at the lights as well and said nervously, yeah, I think so too. I looked at the man and he just gave me a creepy grin, just like before. At that point, the power did cut off, and the laundromat, along with the rest of the building, went dark. I was stuck in the dark laundromat along with this man. He then grabbed both of my arms really tight and pulled me close to him, and he said to me, It's okay. You don't have to be afraid. It's only the dark. It's fine. Before I could say anything to tell him, let me go. He covered my mouth with his hand, then whispered to me saying, Shh. It's okay, don't worry. I remember thinking at that point I was about to die, thinking that that man was about to take me away. And it was pitch black in the building after all. And the exit to the building was just down the corridor. The lights then flickered back on. Then the man said to me, see, I said everything's gonna be okay. Then letting me go from his tight grip. I remember standing there frightened. The man walking past me and he left the laundromat. I never saw that man again after that, so I never mentioned it again. I sometimes think if the lights didn't come back on, would he have tried to take me away or worse? This story happened to me about a month ago. The apartment that I live in isn't in a good area, but I haven't got that much money and it's all I can afford currently. Thankfully, I have a washing machine in my apartment and I don't have to go to the laundromat. Unfortunately, my washing machine broke. It was on a Saturday evening and after calling a repairman to look at it, he told me he couldn't fix it until Monday as he didn't have the time or equipment that evening and the next day would be Sunday. So I had to do my laundry in a nearby laundromat, which was in a neighborhood that I try my best to avoid. I would be out all day Sunday, so I had no choice but to go to the laundromat that same Saturday evening. Going to the laundromat in the neighborhood I don't go to, especially at night, was quite unsettling. I walked to the laundromat and saw it to be empty. I didn't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing. I guess good as there was no one around to bother me. I sat down on the bench scrolling through my phone as my laundry was in the washing machine. I still didn't see anyone outside or inside, and I didn't see the owner behind the counter either. I then started to hear some kind of scuffling in the back room behind the counter and a loud thud. 
The door was slightly open, but I couldn't see anything. I was about to get up and leave because I thought something bad was happening, like a robbery taking place, and I didn't want to get caught up in that. But before I got up, a man opened the back room door and he looked at me and turned away. He came out less than a minute later, this time wearing a different shirt than before. He must have been the owner or something, I remember thinking that. He gave me a friendly wave and a smile and stood at the back of the counter. Some time later, he went into the back room and I didn't see him again. My laundry was done and I went home. The next morning, I couldn't believe what I saw on the news. The owner of the laundromat I was at the previous night was found dead in a pool of blood early that morning. And the picture of the owner wasn't the man that I saw the previous night behind the counter. It was rumored that the owner was in some kind of money trouble and didn't have the money to pay what he owed. It's scary to think that a murder took place in the room next to me and I had no idea about it. And a suspected murderer came out and waved to me as if nothing was going on. I told police what I saw and as far as I know, the suspect hasn't been found. My name is John and I'm 35 years old. I'm a security guard and have been for a while now. About a year ago, I got a job working night shifts at a small hotel. My job would be sitting at a desk watching a computer monitor, which was connected to a few cameras located around the hotel. And every hour or so, I would get up and patrol the area. This one night, I was sitting at my desk scrolling through my phone. When I took a quick glance at the monitor and saw there was someone in the laundromat, which was located in the basement. There shouldn't be anyone down there at the time. I remember thinking that, which was past 2 a.m. I should mention that the camera quality wasn't the best, but it was good enough to see when something is going on. So I went down to the basement, turned my flashlight on, and spoke out. Is anyone down there? You need to leave right now. I tried to sound confident when I said that, but I'm not sure if it came out that way. Going down into a dark laundromat basement in the middle of the night is pretty creepy especially when you saw someone in there. And what's more creepy was, no one replied. And there was no one down there. I went back upstairs to my desk. As I mentioned earlier, the camera quality wasn't the greatest, so I brushed it off to being a glitch in the footage or something. I continued looking at my phone, but this time more cautious to the monitor. It wasn't long before I noticed something on the screen again. It was in a laundromat. I looked closely and I saw, I swear I was certain I saw something. I could see someone pacing back and forth. Once again, I went down to the basement and into the laundry room at the check, shining my light and asking who was down there. There was no reply. I couldn't see anyone in there. The laundry mat wasn't that big, so I could clearly see if someone was in there and it was empty. I was so confused and at the same time frightened. How can I see someone on the camera but the room was clearly empty. Just as I was heading back upstairs I heard a bang. Then a continuous banging. I shone my flashlight into the laundromat and I saw one of the washing machine doors was swinging open and shut by itself, slamming into the machine each time. I slowly walked up to the swinging door and put my hand in front of it, and it stopped. As soon as I stopped the door from swinging, I heard a whisper in my ear, and something grabbed my shoulder. I jumped and turned around, seeing nothing but an empty laundromat. I ran upstairs and out of the basement, back to my desk. I looked at the monitors again, and this time, there was nothing on the screen, except you could see that the washing machine door opened and closed by itself. I rewind the footage back to see if I could see something that I may have missed. The only thing that I could see though was me walk up to the washing machine door, stopping it, and me getting frightened and running out of the laundromat. I could make out one word from the whispering I heard in my ear, and that was leave. The next night I struggled to get through the night shift. I kept watching the monitors expecting something to happen, especially in that laundromat, but I never did. I was too scared to work there after that, and the following day I told my boss that I was leaving. I'm not a superstitious man at all, 
but I honestly believe that what I experienced was 100% supernatural. In March of 2010, a California Sheriff's Department dispatcher named Monique Patino was to receive one of the most shocking and disturbing calls of her entire career. The call came early on a Tuesday morning. Monique answered the call in the same manner she'd done a thousand times before, only to hear the terrified, fear-saturated voice of none other than a seven-year-old boy on the other end of the line. 911, what is your emergency? she asked calmly. As a mother, the response shook Monique to her core. Um, there's some guy. He's going to kill my mom and dad, can you come? The little boy asked, his voice wavering into a terrified wail as the horrific realization hit him. Can you come really fast and bring some cops, a lot of them, and, and bring soldiers too? Monique was the mother of two young children herself, and despite the fact that the child's terrified cries screamed through her head like nails on a chalkboard, she remained calm and professional, immediately dispatching nearby units of police to the family's home. Listen to me, she said to the young boy. Take a breath. I already have the police coming. Where are you at in the house? Ah, uh, inside the bathroom, the boy replied in between staggered panic breaths. Three men, armed with small caliber weapons, had managed to sneak into the family's house through an unlocked door in a home invasion intended to separate the family from their valuables. The family's six-year-old daughter had ran out to their car to grab her school lunchbox so her mother could fill it before she drove them to school. But the assailants, in a green and gray two-door compact car, had been casing the house, and when they realized that the little girl could well have neglected to lock the door behind them, they swooped in to take advantage. But the seven-year-old boy named Carlos had acted fast. He grabbed the family house phone, then his younger sister and rushed into the upstairs bathroom, locking the door behind him before he called 911 to seek emergency assistance. But as young Carlos was in the process of saving his family from the horrendous, violent ordeal, one of the gunmen overheard him talking to the 911 operator and began to break down the door to the bathroom, slamming his boot into the thin wood over and over again. Just hearing them scream and cry for help, she later said. I just felt their fear through the phone. The sound of the two young children's screams as the evil, callous criminal began to smash his way into their apparently protected space is frankly the stuff of nightmares. However, when the home invader finally broke his way inside and saw the phone in the young boy's hand, he realized the situation, that little Carlos had the presence of mind to actually call the police instead of simply cowering in the family bathroom hoping to stay hidden. He panicked, calling out to his fellow criminals that the cops were probably only moments away from arriving on the scene. The trio then scarpered without taking a single valuable item from the family home or harming any of the family they had subjected to such a terrifying experience. However, unfortunately for the family and for law enforcement, the quick reactions of the home invaders meant that they were never found or arrested for the crime and are horrifyingly enough still on the loose today. When a news conference was held to commemorate the young man's brave actions, seven-year-old Carlos told a large congregation of reporters that he had managed to remain calm during the harrowing ordeal because his mother used to make him practice dialing 911 in case of emergencies. At the press event, Carlos, who proudly sported the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department baseball cap, gave a huge hug to the 911 dispatcher who had handled his call. Monique Patino went on to call the boy her little hero, as she intermittently wiped away tears of joy from her cheeks. She told Carlos that he had been exceptionally brave for doing what he did, telling him she was very, very proud of him for having saved his entire family from what had would undoubtedly been a prolonged and highly traumatic experience. I'm still astounded by his mindset, Los Angeles County Sheriff Sergeant Douglas Jensen was later heard to have said, to be able to think about getting his sister, grabbing his phone, locking himself in a bathroom and calling 911, it shows so much. He did a fantastic job, better than most adults, he added, and the whole episode offers a valuable lesson to parents everywhere. Teaching your kid how to dial 911 in case of an emergency is something that is not only prudent, but might well save your life one day. 
As terrifying as it is to hear the 911 call of this incident, which is freely available on YouTube and on various California news websites, hearing just how brave that young Carlos is to act in the way that he did is frankly inspirational. But we should also keep in mind that the toll these kinds of calls take on the mental health of the nation's 911 dispatchers cannot be underestimated. So please, take a moment to be grateful for all that they do to keep ourselves and our families safe. On October 26, 2014, a call came into a 911 dispatch center in the state of Florida. The call came from the 300 block of Southeast Walton Lakes Drive in the city of Fort Pierce. At first, the caller sounds practically timid and polite, informing the dispatcher that he is in need of the police, even calling her ma'am as he does so. The caller then calmly informs the dispatcher that a murder has been committed. He sounds resigned not stating that he thinks that a murder has been committed, but that he knows it is a fact. By who, she asks, her tone still relatively calm. By me, ma'am, he replies. Who did you murder? The dispatcher then asks, starting to sound disturbed by what she's hearing. The response is haunting. I murdered my wife. The caller goes on to admit that he murdered his wife at around 7 o'clock that same morning, telling the dispatcher that his name is Checkington Sinclair. Listening to the 911 call, it's horrifyingly clear how cold and collected Checkington is, his tone rivaling even the most chilling portrayals of murderous psychopaths shown in Hollywood movies. He goes on to explain that his wife's body is still in the apartment they shared together, that he killed her with a gun, and that he shot her in the head in the couple's bedroom. Checkington mentions that after he shot his wife in the head that morning, he calmly laid the pistol he murdered her with on the couple's dining table. All right, we got somebody coming out there to talk to you, the dispatcher then says, regaining some of her professionalism as she does so. But why did you do this? We got into an argument, Checkington says plainly, and she came at me with a knife. I mean, I had to defend myself. She was going to attack me with a knife. When asked what his wife's name was, Checkington replies that she was named Latoisa Argret. Latoisa was 24 and 7 weeks pregnant with her 21-year-old husband's child when he shot her in the head. The couple had been married for just shy of 8 months, but Checkington was quick to inform the dispatcher that they argued and fought with alarming frequency. When asked how long the Fort Pierce Police Department will take to arrive at the apartment block, the dispatcher informs Checkington that they will not be long at all and pleads with him not to be near the gun when they arrive. He replies that he simply wants them to come over as quickly as possible so they can deal with the situation and they would not be standing near the weapon when they arrive. Upon their entry into the couple's apartment, police officers found Latoise's body exactly where her husband had said it was, on the floor of their bedroom, with a steak knife in her hand. At first it appeared to be tragic, but typical case of domestic violence that had unfortunately and horribly ended in murder by self-defense. But upon questioning the couple's neighbors, law enforcement began to become deeply suspicious. One neighbor told officers that they had been woken up by a loud bang as early as 6 o'clock in the morning and had heard another one follow soon after. But they failed to act on what they had heard because they knew the couple fought frequently and had assumed it was one of the pair slamming an apartment door. Despite the fact that the gunshots seemed to have occurred around 6 that morning, Checkington didn't end up calling 911 until 9, a whole three hours later. This only deepened the concerns of the investigating police that his story was not entirely factual. Forensics examiners then noticed that the blood splatters around the bedroom were not consistent with the story of self-defense that had been claimed by Checkington. Not only that, but skull fragments were buried in the bedroom wall, well away from where the fatal shot had penetrated the floor of the apartment, that there was no doubt in their mind that Latoise's body had been moved after she had been shot and killed. They also recognized that the murdered woman's fingerprints were indeed on the knife, but not clear enough to confirm that she had gripped the handle at all. It seemed likely that not only had Checkington moved her body after he had killed her, but he had also placed the knife in her hand in an attempt to make it appear as if though she had attacked him. 
When confronted with this evidence by homicide detectives, he admitted the truth. He admitted that he had wanted to kill his wife after he confronted her over a text message she received from a former boyfriend. He went on to confess how he had serious doubts that the child that Latoisa was pregnant with was actually his, and that the couple argued so frequently because he was insecure and jealous, constantly suspecting his wife, as well as countless previous girlfriends, of being habitually unfaithful to him. Checkington then officially changed his story regarding how the murder unfolded, telling police that he and his wife had gotten into a verbal altercation early on the Sunday morning about a text message she received from another man. Latoisa denied any infidelity, asserting that the seven-week-old baby inside of her did indeed belong to him, and that he had nothing to be jealous of. But this did not calm Checkingson down. He took her cell phone, walked into the couple's bathroom, and violently threw it into the toilet, smashing the screen and inflicting a heavy amount of water damage to the phone's motherboard. Latoisa then screamed at him, furious that he should essentially accuse her of lying to him. Checkingson now apoplectic with rage that his wife was now raising her voice to him, retrieved his pistol from the bedside drawer, aiming it at her head and pulled the trigger. Because he was shaking with anger, Checkingson's aim was poor. His first shot grazed his wife's skull, splitting off chunks of bone fragment that were later found by the forensic examiners. This first shot knocked her to the floor, stunning her. At this stage, she was absolutely no threat to anyone and presented absolutely no danger to her husband, horribly contradicting his initial story of self-defense. Then, as she lay face down on the bedroom floor of their small Fort Pierce apartment, Checkington walked around the bed, fired another shot. He then proceeded to send a text message to a close friend, informing them that he wouldn't be able to participate in fantasy football that season as well as texts to his mother and brother telling them that he loved them. This wasn't just a murder, this was an execution, Assistant State Attorney Brandon White had later said at the murder trial. There was a good chance that any sane or rational individual would have come to their senses after the first shot was fired. It was a shot to the head, one that fractured a woman's skull, but checking since Sinclair actually stopped a check if his wife was still alive, and discovering that she was, fired another shot square into the back of her head, straight-up execution style. Under Florida law, because Sinclair was convicted of first-degree murder and the death of his wife, the death of his unborn child also became a first-degree murder. Because Sinclair pled guilty, the state did not seek the death penalty and spared his life, and so he sits in a Florida penitentiary, to this very day, to wander of the life he might have led with his wife and child had he not opted to pull the trigger on that fateful October morning. A little context, I am currently a senior in college and live off campus with my two best friends. This time of year, particularly around Thanksgiving, my friends try to help me stay busy as it is typically a difficult time for me. My mother left our family the week of Thanksgiving when I was 8 years old and my dad passed away 5 years ago on November 22nd. So as I said, it's a pretty easy time of year to get myself down in the dumps if I don't stay active. Every year for the last three or four years, I have gone to one of my friend's houses to celebrate Thanksgiving with their families. But this past year I decided I wanted to just stay home and have a mellow long weekend. I figured I could catch up on work as well as my schoolwork, which was pretty far behind. My roommates and I didn't live particularly close to the university. We lived in a suburb about 15 to 20 minutes outside of the school. This was nice because we didn't ever have to host any parties, we could just attend them near campus and head back home afterwards. Anyways, there was one house in our street that didn't quite match the others. It wasn't that the house was worse than the others, but it had no landscaping and desperately needed a fresh coat of paint. My roommates and I knew the owner as he introduced himself when we moved in a few years back. His name is Jacob, he's about 5 foot 6 and probably weighed 100 pounds soaking wet. Every time we've had an interaction with him, he was always very nice and polite. He even helped us fix our porch light when it broke last summer. He seems to be very cordial with everyone in the neighborhood and has helped numerous people with small handy jobs similar to the one I just mentioned. On the Wednesday night leading up to Thanksgiving, my two roommates went back to their family's houses in their hometowns. They both asked several times if I was 100% sure I wanted to spend Thanksgiving alone and that I'd be fine by myself. 
I honestly thought I would be and thought perhaps enough time had passed that I could just focus on other things and not dwell on the pass. I stocked up on Mountain Dew so I could stay awake after my assignments to play some PlayStation. At about 9 or 10 p.m., I went up to my room to throw on some sweatpants and grab the blanket from my bed. I glanced out my window and saw Jacob sitting on his front porch with the two porch lights on. I didn't think anything of it and went downstairs into the kitchen and made a peanut butter and fluff sandwich. I would say I was in the kitchen for probably about five minutes or so finishing eating and doing a few dishes. When I finally sat down to play some games, I thought I heard something hit the front bay window, so I went to take a look. At first, I didn't see anything, but then noticed that Jacob had now turned the porch lights off and was standing on his front lawn, staring at the house with his head tilted like he was looking towards the windows upstairs. A little creeped out, I tried calling one of my friends who knew I was still in town to see if she wanted to meet up or stop over to hang out for a little bit. She didn't answer, so I sat on the couch for a couple of moments trying to figure out what to do. He was still standing there staring and seemingly moving a few feet closer to our property each time I looked. I wasn't sure what to do. I couldn't call the cops. He hadn't done anything except freak me out a little and to this point he hadn't even stepped on my property. After another few minutes I looked out the window again and saw Jacob now on our lawn looking at the corner of the house. At least that's what it looked like he was staring at. At this point I wasn't sure what his intentions were and I didn't want to find out. Perhaps I was blowing this out of proportion but I was legitimately scared. I grabbed my keys and phone and a few other items thinking I would just drive to campus. Maybe the library was still open even though we were off for the holiday. I kept all the lights on so I didn't seem like I was leaving and decided I was going to sneak out the back door. As I quietly sneaked through the yard I turned the corner to quickly get to my car and there was Jacob standing in our driveway. I asked him what he was doing in the driveway and he put his finger over his mouth to make a shh noise. I slapped him as hard as I could and made a run for it past my car. My instincts and adrenaline told me to just run until I found someone or someplace else. As I got about a block or two down the road, I saw a bunch of cop cars pull up towards the area of my house. Confused, I began to go back towards my house, thinking perhaps another neighbor saw Jacob stalking outside of my house and called the police. As I approached the house, one of the officers asked my name and if this was my residence. I confirmed the information and what I heard next is still the most horrifying and disturbing information I had ever received. The officer stated that Jacob reported that he was on his porch when he saw me from across the street. He saw me walk out of my upstairs bedroom and as I walked away out of the room he saw a man come out of my closet. Apparently that was why Jacob was looking into my room when I saw him the first time and also why he was looking at the corner of the house. He was following the intruder who was now walking into my roommate's room. When I last saw him outside my house before I slapped him and ran in terror, Jacob stated that the random guy in my house had made it to the downstairs. Jacob was trying not to make any noise as not to alert the person inside, fearful he could be violent or dangerous. As soon as he saw the man in the house, Jacob called the authorities and did his best to try and defuse the situation and not bring any alarm to myself or the intruder. The person inside the house was arrested and taken away. He didn't have anything on him other than a knife so it is unclear if he was attempting to rob the home or was planning something more sinister. Either way I couldn't express to Jacob how much gratitude I had for what he did. He even tried apologizing for how he handled the situation stating that there were probably things he could have done differently to make sure I was safe and aware of the situation. Unfortunately, this experience adds another mental scar to this time of year that will take a long time to get over. But one thing I can be sure of is that I will never spend a Thanksgiving holiday alone again. This happened not long ago. I'm 15 going on 16. I live in New York City and have had some strange late night experiences before, but none as disturbing as this one. My parents were out of town, it was a summer night, I was at a pretty large party. There was quite a lot of drinking and smoking which is expected at a party with a bunch of 14 to like 20 year olds. I'm pretty tall for my age, like 6'1", and I have a pretty deep voice so I easily pass as older. 
I knew that I had to get home on my own, so I tried to regulate the amounts of drink that I had. At around maybe 2 or 3 a.m., I realized that I should start heading home. It was a Friday, and I didn't have anything to do the next morning, but still, I was tired and figured most people would be leaving soon anyway. For those of you that don't know, New York City's transit system runs 24-7, 7 days a week, so I wouldn't have any problems hopping on a train, even at 3 a.m., to get home. The party was in Far Rockaway in Queens, and I live in an apartment building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, so I had a pretty long ride to get home. I wasn't worried, though. I was no stranger to long commutes on the subway. I would take the train everywhere I went since I was like 9 or 10. I headed over to the Far Rockaway, Mott Avenue train station and sat on one of the benches. There's a screen that says what time the train will be coming, and this late at night it would be a while. After maybe 10 or 15 minutes of waiting, the screen showed a train in Wood 207th Street 20 minutes. I waited for a while longer until I saw the headlights of the train coming down the tracks. The train arrived, but since this was the first stop, I had to wait about another 10 minutes until it would actually leave the station. I got on and a few people exited, leaving the car empty. I sat all the way at the end of the car, so I wouldn't be next to anyone if anyone else got on. At this point, I was really, really tired and felt like I was about to just pass out right there, so I did. For those of you that don't know, New York City subway cars are rectangular with three doors on each long side which open at the stations and one door on each short side where people can walk through from other cars. I woke up a little while later to the sound of one of the short side doors close to me opening. A man who appeared to be homeless walked in and the smell immediately hit me like a truck. I remember him having raggy clothes and tangled hair. He looked at me. Hey brother, you got a dollar? Uh, nah man, sorry. I responded. Come on man, I, I know you got something. He insisted, smiling for some reason. Not for real, I, I don't, I'm sorry. I didn't have any singles, just a few 20s, and I wasn't about to give this guy $20. He just stood there for a few seconds and said, Alright, whatever. And walked away, still smiling. Now this didn't strike me as weird at all, not yet at least. I've been living in New York my whole life and I'd gotten used to all the homeless people in the subway and them asking for money. It didn't bother me. I looked out at the stop I was at. I was just in Brooklyn. The A train ran local at night so my ride would be longer than usual. I figured I still had a pretty long way to before I got to the 42nd Street Manhattan where where I would transfer to the Q train that brought me to the station near my apartment. So, I went back to sleep. When I woke up again, I was in downtown Manhattan, I think like West 4th or 14th Street. I was getting close to my stop. I looked around and the train wasn't empty anymore. There was a guy sitting on the other end of the train with his headphones on, and in the middle of the car, there was a guy sitting there, head down, muttering to himself. I was pretty sure it was the same guy that had asked me for money before. I thought that was a little weird, but I wasn't nervous or anything. I just figured he had some sort of mental illness or something. After a little while, I arrived at the 42nd Street Station. The guy was still there, and when I got off the train, he must have been going in a similar direction as me because he got up and off the train also. Now, 42nd Street Station is huge, and I needed to go all the way to the other side of the station to get from the A train side on 8th Avenue to get to where the Q train was on 7th Avenue. Walking through the huge station, specifically the passage that takes you from one side to the other, I'll admit was a little creepy. It was eerily quiet for a place that usually is packed with so many people during the daytime. The only other people around now were late night workers and homeless people. I arrived on the side where the Q train would be going uptown towards my stop. When I got to the platform, there were only maybe three or four other people that I saw waiting for the train like I was. I walked over to the benches and sat down to wait. I looked up and saw that there was a guy, a little further down the platform on the side from where I came from, standing there, muttering to himself like having a full-on conversation with nobody. I couldn't make out his face from where I was sitting, but I was sure it had to be the same homeless guy that I'd seen on the A train. Now I was getting a little suspicious. Was he following me? 
The train arrived after a few minutes and I got on. I'd only have a few stops from where I was to my apartment, so there was no point in trying to sleep. The man boarded the same car as me and I could see clearly now it was him, the same guy. There wasn't anybody else in the car at the moment. I wasn't entirely nervous, but at the same time I was definitely on edge now. I tried not to look at him to avoid eye contact. He was still mumbling to himself and now I could pick up on some things he was saying. Random phrases like, should I? Maybe. Help me. When I got to my stop, I promptly got up and got off the train. Honestly, at this point, I wasn't even surprised when the man got off too, still talking to himself. The station was completely empty. It was 4, going on 5 a.m. by now. I walked through the station, up the stairs, toward the exit, ignoring the man who was definitely following me. When I got to the street level, I started walking faster towards my apartment. The station was on 72nd Street. I still had to walk a few blocks further up to get to my apartment. I looked back a few times to see the man, still behind me, speaking pretty loudly now. I was honestly more annoyed than scared at this point. Maybe it was the tiredness, maybe it was the little bit of liquid courage left in me, but I was seriously done with this guy's stuff, so I stopped walking, turned around and said, Hey, can I help you? I just want some money. I know you got some. Listen, I don't. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops. He said something about how I don't know all the stuff that he's been through and then just walked in the other direction, still muttering angry slurs under his breath to himself. I continued home, shaken but too tired to think about what happened at this point. I got to my apartment and went to bed. The next morning, my friend who lives in the same building as me called me and asked if I'd heard about what happened last night. I hadn't told anyone about the incident yet, so I said I didn't know what he was talking about and he explained. Apparently a neighbor in our apartment building who was coming back from an early morning jog or something called the police because there was a man lying outside the doors to our apartment. As he was arrested, he was yelling and screaming, resisting arrest yelling stuff about how his life was horrible and how he was waiting to kill that person last night that didn't have the heart to hand over any money to him. I assume the guy that he was referring to was the guy that I had encountered last night and the guy that he was talking about was me. And he must have followed me all the way to my apartment which, given how tired I was, must have not been that hard to do without me noticing. Who knows what would have happened if the police didn't take him away. The man was obviously seriously ill and I do hope that he gets the help he needs. All I can say to you all is be safe when you're alone at night. Especially in the city. Always watch your back. This story didn't actually happen to me, rather to a close friend of mine. He told me this story a few hours ago and I wanted to share. He lives in Hayward and was attending a march for the BLM movement at around 4pm I think. I don't know what streets or anything specific like that. He had just sent me a couple of videos of the crowd marching and taking a knee. So after about 10 minutes he said that they were passing through a street lined with shops and alleyways. There was an older man sitting on a curb by one alleyway watching the march. Jordan describes the man as looking upper 40s, wearing a black and white flannel shirt and jeans and a cap. Jordan had the misfortune of walking nearby said alleyway and the man stopped him, saying something along the lines of what he needed help fixing his passenger seat since the recliner handle was broken and it was a two-person job to get it back into its upright position. The man gestured towards his car, which Jordan examined. It was a black Chevy Malibu that was parked in possibly the most sketchiest part of the alley, right towards the back kind of hidden behind a trash dumpster. Jordan declined and quickly walked away before the man could say anything else. Now for his sake, I wish the story ended here, but I wouldn't be posting it here if it did. I think sometime later, like an hour maybe, Jordan decided to start heading home while the march continued. He says he was cutting across some field that was in between houses where only two other people were in sight, and as soon as he emerged at the other side, his air was suddenly cut off as a thick arm wrapped around his throat and began aggressively yanking him backwards. 
Of course, Jordan yelled as loud as he could, and thankfully the aforementioned two guys began to rush to his aid, shouting at Jordan's attacker. The guy let go and pushed Jordan. As Jordan stumbled forwards, he spun around and saw the guy who had asked him for help with his car, hopping into the Chevy Malibu and speeding off. The two other people asked Jordan if he was okay and comforted him and whatnot. Keep in mind that Jordan only told me this over a few texts and I haven't gotten a chance to talk to him in public about it, so some details were spared. I think Jordan contemplated calling the police but didn't think it was worth it. He told me that they were probably already busy enough and he might be ignored or have an extremely long response time to which the only info he had was a description of the guy. He hadn't gotten the guy's license plate. Jordan went home and that's pretty much all he told me so far. It might sound cliche, but please, everyone stay safe. These are terrible times and with all the looting and protests, stuff like this is bound to happen in the shadows. Like all women, I have a fair amount of creepy experiences with men. I have a whole host of stories I could tell here, but one of my more memorable stories happened when I was a student. For context, I went to university in France and spent a few months doing an internship in Paris where this encounter took place. I was only 20 years old and so, it being a Friday night, I was on my way to meet some friends at a restaurant. The apartment I was living in was in close proximity to a couple of metro stops and the line I needed was a few blocks away on a pretty busy street. When I was only a block from the stop, a guy looking to be about my age suddenly approached me asking me if I knew where the metro stop was. I indicated the large yellow M glowing above the stop on the corner and thought that that would be the end of our conversation. Instead, he fell into step with me, explaining that he wasn't from the city and didn't know the train lines too well. I said it was no problem and he gave me a funny look as he asked, You aren't from here, are you? Hmm, I thought. He was right. French is my second language, and although I've spoken it from a young age, I still have an accent on a few words. Normally, I don't mind having an accent or people remarking that I'm not French, but when a guy you just met on the street one night comments on it, it can make you a little uneasy. I confirmed, though, that I wasn't French, and we actually ended up having a decent conversation as we walked to the metro stop, down the stairs, and through the turnstiles. During that first, and what would turn out to be our only conversation, he seemed nice enough and didn't set off any red flags. I told him where I was from and what I was studying, and he told me that he was in the city visiting some friends. We ended up getting on the same train, though even then I questioned whether he was actually going the same way as me or not, and kept talking until my stop. Right before I got off the train, he asked for my numbers so that we could meet up sometime and... In a move completely out of character for me, as is talking to strangers, I did. Big mistake. He texted me that Sunday, asking if I wanted to meet up on Wednesday. I agreed, but then he asked if we could meet at Chatelet. For anyone who doesn't know, Chatelet is an enormous metro stop near the center of Paris. Several metro lines run through it, as do other trains that go out of the city proper. It also connects to a huge shopping mall. When he asked this... I started to feel uneasy. My intuition told me that there was something wrong with wanting to meet up in a place that had so many ways in and out, a place where if you got on a certain train or were forced to do so, no one could find you. My mind tends to jump to worst case scenarios, but my gut is never wrong. In any case, I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt, as he supposedly didn't know the city that well, so I told him that Chatelet was pretty big and it might be hard to find each other in there. I suggested meeting up at the bookstore in the connected mall, still a public place but less hectic, but he didn't seem to like the idea and stopped replying to my messages. The next day, Monday, I was on my way to a meeting with my boss when my phone buzzed and I saw it was a text message from him. Can you call me now? Another message came in. Or can I call you? My intuition spoke up again in the back of my mind, telling me that something still wasn't right. I replied, I'm going into a meeting right now, let me get back to you. With that, I turned my phone all the way off and didn't turn it back on again until after the meeting was over and I was on the bus home an hour and a half later. Turning it back on, I almost dropped it as it started to buzz uncontrollably with several dozen text messages loading simultaneously. I only scanned them, 
there being so many, but they seemed to range from proposing that we meet at a friend's house on Wednesday night to, why won't you answer, where the F are you, followed by a number of missed call notifications, all from his number. My intuition was doing more than pinging at this point, so when his number popped up on the screen again, I turned the phone off again until I reached my apartment. Once again, I dare turn it back on and saw even more missed texts and calls from him. Pretty spooked at this point, I shoved the phone back into my purse and made dinner, not even looking at the phone until well after I had eaten. Once I could stomach it, I took the phone out of my purse. I felt a shiver go up my spine as I saw that he had called me no less than 16 times and that his text messages had become more and more vulgar before ending with a final, fine, I guess this isn't working out. Maybe I'll see you again. Goodbye. I've never blocked a number so fast in my life and immediately called my mom. I could barely hold the phone again, though this time it was because I was shaking so badly. To this day, I can't help but feel that I dodged something extremely dangerous. More specifically, someone who was probably just looking for a girl to take advantage of and jumped at the chance when he met a young foreign one in a big city. I'm still not sure what possessed me to give him my number, but I console myself with the fact that I didn't tell him I was living near that metro stop where he approached me. I just have a feeling that he might have come looking for me. The lesson that I have taken away from this incident, aside from never giving my number out ever again, is to always trust my gut. She saved me before, saved me that day, and will most likely do it again. Back in 2005, I was 15 years old and like any teenage girl, my main source of income was babysitting. I mainly babysat for two families. Family A, which was every Monday and Wednesday for four hours in the afternoon, and Family B, which was different evenings when the parents had events they wanted to go to. The moms of the two families were first cousins, and the mom of Family B used to babysit myself and my sisters when we were little. All of us, myself, Family A, and Family B, live within a five-mile radius of each other in the Michigan countryside. On the night my story takes place, I was babysitting for Family B. It was a Friday night in the middle of summer, and the two children a boy, four years old, and a girl, two, went to bed fairly easily. I know it was after 10 p.m. because it was dark out when the little boy came downstairs and said he couldn't sleep, so he wanted to sit on the couch with me. I was watching the movie The Patriot on TV and let him snuggle up with me and he went right back to sleep. Shortly after he came down, the phone rang. I looked at the caller ID to see if it was the family calling when I saw it was my home calling. I answered the phone and it was my dad. He said something that basically boiled down to this. Hey, so there's an escaped convict in the area. Police are out looking for him, so if you hear police sirens or a helicopter, don't be alarmed. And then he hung up. I, quite frankly, was terrified. Babies in the house that I had to protect. My dad had sounded so cavalier like he was warning me that it was going to rain. I had no idea what this man had done to be chased by the police, but... It had to be bad. I went looking around the house for something to defend us with. All I had were kitchen knives, no baseball bat, no crowbar, and no access to the gun in the safe. I ended up calling my dad and asking him to come stay with me. He actually thought I was being ridiculous, but I didn't care. I felt better. Thankfully, nothing happened. When the parents got home an hour later, my dad explained why he was there. The mom was very understanding and showed me how to get into the gun safe and where the bullets were. Like I said, she was our babysitter growing up and she was basically my older sister. She was and still is a big believer in the second amendment and self-defense. But my story didn't end there. That next Monday I was babysitting for family A which had two girls, four years and two years old. The older girl was telling me a story about someone in the backyard and how they couldn't go back in their house and had to stay outside all night. When the mom got home, I asked her about it. It turns out that the previous Friday, the police had been at their house until the wee hours of the morning. Family A's neighbor had a restraining order against her ex-boyfriend for domestic violence, and he had shown up at her house late on Friday. She called the cops, and he had fled into the property of Family A because he had several arrest warrants out. The police kept Family A out of their house for safety reasons while they searched the area, 
They eventually found the guy and took him to jail. That's what all the fuss was about that Friday when I was babysitting for Family B. Fortunately, he never got close to Family B's house. That incident was the start of me being more proactive in safety, making sure I knew how to lock the doors, where any weapons were, and to make sure I had a knife with me at all times. If something like that ever happens again, I know I will handle the situation much better. I'm a 17 year old girl who goes to the local high school here. I never really had much dating experience, but this guy clearly didn't have much either. When the story takes place, I was around 14 years old. For some quick context, in my state you are legally allowed to date someone under 18 so long as you are 2 years older or younger, meaning that someone who is 16 can date an 18 year old, but a 14 year old dating an 18 year old could lead to serious consequences. I've been a part of a classroom that we refer to as BMC, which is a class for kids with behavioral issues such as anger or depression. I've been a part of this program since middle school, but never have I been through a person quite like this. I normally keep to myself, listening to my music at a deafening volume, and because of this, I never had friends in that classroom, especially since this was during my freshman year and sophomore year. I was nowhere near popular during that time, Yet, I did happen to get several desperate guys approaching me. Normally, I would reject them, yet, for some reason this time, I didn't. Maybe it was pity, perhaps. I was waiting at the far end of the bus loop one day, given the fact that my bus was a special needs bus. As I was listening to music, I saw a boy approach me. He was bigger in size, always seemed to wear the exact same superhero shirt and jacket. I still to this day don't even know if he even washed it. For this story, we'll call him Freddy, mainly because he reminded me of the freaky animatronic. Anyway, he came up to me and told me that he had a crush on me, despite me not even knowing his name prior to this point. I was a little creeped out by this, so I was a little lost in terms of words. He asked for my number. I said yes, but then what he said next later gave me goosebumps. This is very important to keep in mind. Don't tell your parents he said. I asked why, and all he said was, I could get in trouble. At this time, I was very gullible and thought, why get him in trouble when he doesn't know better? See, I'm autistic, and at the time, I had a feeling he was as well. Before you go off and tell me that he really doesn't know any better, I should tell you that just because someone is autistic doesn't mean that they are dumb or can't be manipulative. Even people with mental illnesses can be a bit of a bad apple. I know that from experience with Freddy and many others. When I gave him my number, we small talked for a small bit until my bus finally arrived. Even at the time, I was so relieved to see my driver to see that I would escape Freddy. So I bid my goodbyes and he waved. He then said to me, I love you. I nearly vomited at that statement. I gave him a bewildered look and he asked, Too soon? Yeah, too soon, I confirmed. I hurried onto my bus and sat down. I tried to avoid looking in the window so I didn't have to look at him. Once again, he was far from attractive or even hygienic. I soon got blown up by texts from him to the point that I had to turn off notifications for his texts. But then when I did respond, he would complain and ask why I wasn't responding. When I said I was busy, he would just ask when I would be done. When I told him I didn't know in order to buy myself some time away from him, he just texted me 10 to 15 minutes later asking if I was done. Clingy people were my biggest turnoff, especially since I was that person at one point as well. I know that being on the receiving end of that sort of affection can be very uncomfortable. When I finally had enough, I casually told my parents the whole story. They panicked and told me to block him while they contacted my BMC manager. The next day, my BMC manager called me to see her privately. She explained that even though he was a senior, he had attempted to pull these things off with several girls before me. She explained that he knew full well what he was doing and that I had to stay away from him. I got scolded by her and family that next time. I should communicate what is happening, especially given the fact that this boy was far from the first boy to attempt to take advantage of me. He was luckily one of the few that failed, thankfully. 
I am sad to say that even though I went through this experience, I still am too gullible and always have been. And because of this, I'm asking all of you, regardless of your gender, to consider what it is you want. If you don't want to follow your gut or communicate your feelings, you could fall into the same trap I've fallen into more times than I'd like to admit. My name is Chloe, I'm 21 and I'm from Scotland. In 2018, me, my ex, and his little brother decided to explore abandoned places. We stumbled across an old abandoned mental hospital. Lennox Castle Hospital is the name. We decided to check it out, bearing in mind it is approximately 10pm so it was dark. We went in having to climb rocks and stuff, and when we got in, we were just wandering around enjoying scaring each other like you do. My ex, who we'll call C, went into one of the rooms. Me and his brother stood outside, we'll call his brother R. Me and R were standing at the window of the room C was in when we heard keys being shaken behind us. I thought it was my keys, but then I remembered C had them in his pocket and he was in front of us. We kept hearing movement as well, when there wasn't any wind. The next time I went up was with four of my friends towards the end of 2018. The middle of winter and around 10 to 11 p.m. so it was pitch black. There was me, A, K, J, and T. Me and T kept hearing high-pitched screams coming from above us, but no one else had actually heard them, and they thought we were just joking. We also kept hearing movement in the bushes, and again, no wind. The walk back down was probably the most terrifying thing to ever happen to me. T told me she had seen glowing red eyes in the trees. I told her it's her mind playing tricks trying to create a reason for the noises we heard. We walked further down and I had the feeling that I had to look into the trees. And as I looked, I saw them. The red eyes. I tried to pass it off telling myself that it was an animal in the trees, but Jay had the light and it was way ahead of us, but not only that, the trees were far apart and on a hill. The eyes were between the trees and looked like they were floating. No one else had seen or heard anything. We had no explanation for why it was just me and T who had seen them. Fast forward to tonight, 11pm. Me and my best friend Jed decided to check it out. We walked up but kept hearing screeching. We passed it off as possibly being foxes. The movement started up again just as I remembered it. The screeching was the same noise I heard before but this time Jed had heard it. We got to the hospital and we were quite far back from it. I had my flashlight on and I pointed it towards the building. Jed stood mesmerized by it as it's a lovely structure. I stood my light to one of the windows and I had saw a railing. The railing looked like it had a black figure standing, holding on. I mentioned it to Jed and all he said was, No, top left. He paused. I asked him what it was and he rushed me back to my car. When we got back to the car he said he had seen a pure black figure in the top left window which twitched its head as if it were trying to get us to go to it. All the way back to the car we hear footsteps and the screeching again. This place definitely has something going on and I will not stop going there until I find out exactly what. This happened to my grandpa. I'm not sure exactly when this happened, but this was when all my younger aunts and uncles weren't married yet and still live with them. In all, I had seven uncles and five aunts, just from my dad's side of the family. Years ago, my uncles bought a house and my grandparents lived with them. A lot of paranormal stuff has happened in that house and I don't know why my grandparents didn't move out sooner. At the time of this incident, everyone was out shopping or doing whatever they used to do outside of the house and it was just my grandparents' home. My grandpa sat in his big chair, as always, and was occupied by the television. Usually, my grandma would stand behind that big chair and just watch TV with my grandpa. I don't know why she always did that when they had so many other couches to sit on. After a while of my grandparents just watching TV, my grandpa spoke. Honey, go grab me something to eat. I'm hungry. My grandpa waited for an answer. Did you hear me? Silence. My grandpa was in his late 70s, so his body was quite weak. That's why instead of turning around to see if my grandma was still there or not, 
he reached over his shoulder to where she'd usually be. Instead of a shirt, however, he felt a soft breast that would belong to a young lady. Just as he was about to use his strength to turn around to see who or what was behind him, he felt a hand on his ear inside of his head. The hand then slowly started moving towards the middle of his face. Once the palm of the hand covered his cheek and the fingers reached his nose and mouth, he opened his mouth and grabbed a hold of one of the fingers and bit as hard as he could. As he spit out the finger, he felt the hand pull away fast. He finally looked behind him and saw no one. He didn't bother wasting his energy to look around as he knew he wasn't going to find anyone or anything because, as he recalled, he didn't see or taste any blood when he bit the finger off. But unexpectedly, the finger that he had bit off had fallen onto the floor, and it was real. There was no blood or anything, just a clean, chewed-off finger. My grandma finally showed up as my grandpa picked up the finger. Here, he said, handing her the finger. As expected, my grandma freaked out and asked, What is this? He explained to her what happened, and he told her to keep the finger for good luck, as he said. It may seem crazy, but my family is a religious shaman family, and we, or the elders at least, believe these things. I've actually never seen the finger myself, but one day when I was young, I saw my grandma in her room picking up a small, red triangular pouch that she dropped. I didn't know then, but usually those pouches were filled with herbs believed to keep you healthy, so I stepped into the room asking, What is that? She smiled before answering, It's a finger. I should state that this was a few years ago, and I'm a tiny woman. Back at this time, I look like a teenager, so I've always been mindful that I seem an easy target or easier to fool. I had seen a job interview for a small business looking for a secretary. No experience needed as they would provide on-the-job training, and as that's the kind of thing I was looking for, I applied. I heard back quickly and was invited to an interview. When I arrived, I was excited. It was a bit of a journey from my home, but it was in a beautiful old building on the third floor with a modern layout inside, though you could tell it was very new as it was bare bones and very little had been unpacked. Still though, if you have to work somewhere, might as well be a nice building, right? Anyway, the interview seemed normal. I only encountered female members of staff and they were all warm and lovely. The woman interviewing me was amazing and even sat talking to me for a while after getting to know me. When I get home, I wasn't in the door long before I get a phone call from them. I nailed the interview. Awesome, I thought, and I was offered the job. I was about to accept when I was told on the phone, Okay, you'll come here tomorrow and we'll have the van drive you to where you'll be working. And I was like, what? Confused about what they meant. They then told me that I'd be meeting with customers on their behalf and talking and selling stuff. I was not comfortable with this as it wasn't what I was interviewed for, but I gave them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they had a second position that they thought I'd fit in better with. It wouldn't be that weird as a new company, and while not what I was comfortable with, I should hear them out. So I asked more questions, and the woman on the other end of the line is getting more snippy and tense. Gone was the nice, friendly woman from earlier, and she would not reveal where I would be going or who I would be meeting with. By this point, plenty of red flags were going off, so I had to decline the offer pretty quick. For anyone curious as to what had happened, I reported this as it seemed very dodgy. But when they were checked in on, the floor was no longer occupied by them. They'd apparently just rented it for a week and were gone. When I was 11, almost 12, the woman living above me was a coke dealer. The night of my 12th birthday, she went missing. Not long after, her boyfriend came down to ask if he could use our phone. This was 2004, so having a cell phone was more of an exception than a rule, at least in my area. For a little context, I was home alone at the time while my mom was at work about a five minute walk away. 
My mom had let our neighbor and her boyfriend come in to use our phone several other times before, so I assumed nothing was wrong with it and let him in, bringing him into the living room, which is towards the front of our apartment to use the phone in there. He picks up the receiver, dials a number, waits a few seconds, and hangs up the phone. He does this a couple of more times before the front door of the building opens. You can easily hear the front door open from where we are. It's a very heavy door. The walls are thin, and the way our building is set up, it's a small, old, single-family house converted into apartments. My and my mom's apartment was the only one on the first floor, and our upstairs neighbor's apartment was the only one above us. Irrelevant, but there was also a much smaller apartment below us. My neighbor's boyfriend looked at me, put his pointer finger to his lips like he was trying to shush me, and told me not to tell anyone he was there before speed walking to my room at the other end of the apartment. I watched my bedroom door close right before there was a loud, hard, cop-like knock on the door. My jaw dropped as I opened the door to see a police officer. He asked if my neighbor's boyfriend was there and, being scared, I stammered out, y Yeah, he just went into my room. The officer asked if he could come in, which I agreed to, and as he was coming in, he asked if we could let his partner in the back door and lead them to my room. We walked together to the back of the apartment and I let his partner in. The back door to the apartment was right next to my bedroom door, but we had to walk around the kitchen table to get there. There was just barely enough space between the two doors to fit a narrow rectangular table against it without blocking the path to either door. As I let them into my room, I watched as they pulled my neighbor's boyfriend out of my bedroom closet. As they brought him out of my room and towards the back door, which just led to an enclosed fire escape, they told me to go wait in the living room while they brought him out the back door. I walked back to the living room and, after they closed the door, I could hear what they were saying and I could hear the distinct sound of metal clicking and quickly realizing that he had been handcuffed. Still scared, I waited for the police car to drive away before grabbing my keys, making sure that the back door was locked and locking the front door on my way out before running to my mom's work, crying. Pretty sure I cut the five minute trip into about two minutes and I've never been a fast runner. I was fueled entirely on adrenaline and fear at that point and I just wanted my mom. When I told her what had happened, my mom was so angry that he had used me the way he had, hiding out in a child's bedroom closet of all places to try to keep the cops from finding him. She gave me a short but gentle lecture that night about not letting people in to use the phone telling me that I was not to let people use our phone, even if I knew them unless she was home. I don't want to know what exactly he was wanted for, nor do I want to know what would happen if the cops had not shown up. I don't know if he had known that the cops were on their way and had come to my apartment specifically to hide from them, or if he was up to something else and knew it was the cops when the front door of the building was opened. It was probably only after my close call that my mind really started to run away with what could have happened were it not for my dog. I'm a 26 year old female. I live with my fiance, my two cats, and my dog Rowan. Our house is literally less than a minute away from a huge farmer's field that is frequented by many dog walkers at all times of the day. Me and my significant other often take turns walking Rowan around the field throughout the day. It was only around 7.30pm and it was still really bright and sunny. Rowan was letting me know it was time to go for a walk so while my partner was tinkering in the garage, I grabbed his lead and headed to the field. Let me quickly tell you about Rowan. He's a two-year-old Rottweiler who is very loving and playful, if a little daft, but would not hurt a fly, not a bad bone in his body. He's also extremely well trained. We made sure to put the effort in as he's a big dog breed with a bad rep so wanted to make a point of not feeding stereotypes. I'm very much of the opinion of there's no bad dogs, just bad owners. Unfortunately, we've had some run-ins with some not so good owners so Rowan gets a little nervous when meeting new dogs and people but we're working on it. Now back to the story, we're walking around the farmer's field, Rowan is off sniffing and peeing on every blade of grass in sight. I always keep an eye out for other walkers anyway due to Rowan being a little nervous and I clocked a guy on his own walking down the path towards me fairly far away. At first I thought nothing of it as plenty of people walk this route without dogs. We were just coming out of lockdown in the UK. 
As the guy got closer, I noticed he was in a full tracksuit with a hood up, which was odd as it was like 23 degrees, so shorts and a t-shirt weather. He then took a small path off the field leading through some bushes. It was a public made shortcut rather than an official public footpath, but it was well enough used so I kept walking thinking nothing of it. At about 15 meters away from the path he took, Rowan shot back to my side immediately dropping the mouthful of dirt he had been pretending not to eat. He's not the smartest. I pat him and noticed he was standing super alert staring at the path entrance. When I looked up, I caught a glimpse of the man peeking around the edge of the bushes that concealed the entrance. I stopped dead in my tracks, and Rowan's fur stood on end as he positioned himself in front of me. It took me a second to realize that this man had been watching and waiting in the bushes for me to approach. My current route would have meant that I'd be walking right by the path opening. My stomach dropped as I realized we were the only ones around on that field. I had this weird moment where I was almost trying to convince myself that I was overreacting, but then the guy whistled. Not a wolf whistle, but as if to try and get my dog to come to him. Rowan was having none of that, though, and I definitely took that as my cue to trust my stranger danger instincts. I immediately turned and sped walk back the way we came, simultaneously pulling my phone out and dialing my partner's number. I ended up having to clip on Rowan's lead on to get him to walk with me, and he was not taking his eyes away from the path. He was even growling a little, which was so out of character and put me on edge even more. I glanced back, and the man had edged slightly out of the bushes, watching me walk away. My partner answered the phone after a few rings. I was only halfway through stammering out the story, and he was already sprinting up the field to meet me, telling me to stay on the phone, but to keep an eye on the man. The man in the tracksuit now fully came out of the bushes and just stood staring at me, walking away. I dared a quick look away from him towards the entrance to the field to see my fiancé jogging towards me. He was relieved I was okay, but was also immediately pointing and shouting, Is that him? Clearly furious at what this man might have had in his mind had Rowan not picked up on him hiding in the bushes. I eventually convinced my fiancé not to confront him as he was still stood staring, almost taunting us. You never know what people might be capable of, or have concealed. We came off of the field and took Rowan on a different walk, which he was more than happy about. I've never been so proud of him for stepping up and protecting me. Safe to say, he got plenty of treats and fussing when we got home. So I work for a very major retailer you've all heard of. This was from a year and a half or so ago back when I worked in the electronics and photo departments. One afternoon I answered the phone and spoke to a customer. He wasn't very direct about what exactly he was looking for. At first he said he was looking for a gift for a family member that he hated. He said it wanted it to be something that they would accept because of the obligation but would absolutely hate. I asked if he was looking for a type of gag gift, and he dodged my question. Instead, he started asking me what I would buy if I wanted to get a gift for a family member like that. I said I wasn't sure, but maybe a movie or some music they didn't like would be a good choice. Then he surprised me by asking what type of movies I liked watching. I said it wasn't anything that would really fit what he was looking for, as I usually watch anime. Next, he asked if... That was something I'd want to watch over dinner. I said I certainly do watch it while I eat dinner sometimes, not knowing where he was going with this. Then he said, No, I meant with me. I laughed nervously and told him no. Then I quickly changed the subject back to what he was looking for and asked if we had a certain TV series in stock. I told him I'd go check. By this point, I was feeling pretty uncomfortable, but... I wanted to keep my customer service and not disappoint the customer by being rude. So I found what he was looking for and then told him the price and how many copies were in stock. After this, he asked me some other question about myself and I told him that perhaps I wasn't the best person to help him, so I handed the phone off to a male coworker. I walked away from the desk at that point and made my way back to the photo department where I felt safer as I wasn't in the direct view of customers who were walking around. I took a moment to collect myself before I left. The next part was of my coworker's interaction with a customer on the phone. 
My coworker introduced himself in the usual manner and asked how he could help. The man said, Oh man, where did that cute bubbly girl go? My coworker replied with an improvised response of, Oh, uh, she's actually our photo associate. She doesn't know as much about electronics. To which the customer responded, Oh, I'd like to see some pictures of her without clothes on. To which my coworker did not know how to respond. The customer then said it would be easier to just shop in person and that he'd be back later to see me and hung up. I asked my coworker if he was able to ever get the customer off the phone. He told me what the customer had said and I felt literally sick. I was also so terrified of coming into contact with this customer that I went to management and reported the issue to them. They just chuckled and said that there wasn't anything they could do as it was likely just a prank caller. I was worried about spending any time on the sales floor but I still had to complete my shift. That evening I was terrified. I politely asked a male coworker to walk me to my car. He obliged and thankfully we saw no trace of the creepy guy anywhere and we've never heard from him ever since then. I was an 18 year old female when this incident occurred. I was in the first year of university. I was walking to one of my classes when I then saw a man walking towards me. There was nothing really too off-putting about his appearance. He was tall and slightly large and he looked to be in his 40s. He was also wearing a shirt with my school's logo on it. The same shirt that the service workers wore. I noticed that he was staring at me. I stared back at him to try and make him look away, but he didn't. He continued to walk towards me and held eye contact till he passed me. I didn't really think too much of this. Over the next few months, I had saw him around campus several times, and the same thing would always happen. He would always stare at me until he walked past me, but he never once said a word. On one occasion, I had saw him in the basement of my building while I was doing laundry. Once again, he walked past me without saying anything. Although he really made me feel a bit uneasy, I didn't let it bother me too much and just kind of assumed that maybe he just had something off about him. This continued for a couple of months before anything disturbing happened. On one night, my roommate was asleep and I needed to clear my head. So I slipped on my shoes and coat and then headed out for a smoke. Now, my university's campus was smoke free, so I walked around to the back of my building and then lit a cigarette. I had heard some rustling coming from further away, still around the building but kind of in a spot where I couldn't see it. I didn't get too worried though as the back of my building faced the woods and we're kind of used to seeing deer and other small animals around the campus. Still though, I was really curious. I quietly walked over and looked around the corner. I was surprised to see a man standing there looking right up at my building. I started to squint my eyes and that's when I realized that it was the same man who was always staring at me. What was he doing? His hands were in his pockets and he seemed to just be staring right up at the windows. I felt a little uneasy as that's when I realized that he was staring at the general area of my own window, but I couldn't tell for sure what he was looking at. I didn't want him to see me so I quietly finished my cigarette and flicked it onto the ground. I crushed the cigarette into the ground with my shoe and then headed back to my room. I had then took a really quick shower and slipped on some PJs. I tried to fall asleep that night, but I just couldn't get that man out of my head. Why was he just staring at the building? Was he really looking into my window? After a few minutes of wrestling with my thoughts, I decided that my questions really needed answers. So I quietly got up and tiptoed across my room to the window. I looked out the window, and sure enough, the man was staring at me. When he noticed me staring back, I honestly expected him to walk away. But he didn't. He just continued to stare at me. I started to feel kind of sick at this point. Should I call someone? I mean, I guess he wasn't technically doing anything wrong. So I decided I would just leave it. He couldn't do anything to harm me. My door was always kept locked and there was no way he could fit through my window. It was on the third floor and it was extremely tiny. 
I crawled back into bed and went to sleep. About two months had passed since this incident, and I hadn't seen the man since. I was hoping that maybe he had quit or maybe he had been fired, but I wasn't so lucky. One day I came back from class to then find my roommate standing in the lobby of my building, and she had two police officers standing with her. When she saw me, she had then grasped and ran right towards me, then hugging me. She was visibly really shaken and she seemed really scared about something. I asked her what was going on and before she could even answer me, a police officer then approached me. He then asked me to confirm my name and room number. I told him and he then showed me a picture of the man. It was the same exact man that had been standing out my building two months prior. I said that I recognized him and I told them everything that happened from the start of the year. The police officer sat me down and he then told me what happened. Apparently the man had been sneaking into our room like multiple times throughout the year. The man had both mine and my roommate's schedule so that he could see when we would be in and out of the room. He also had placed micro cameras in the corners of the room. My roommate wasn't feeling well so when she had left one of her classes early one day, she had returned to the room to find the man standing in it. She then freaked out and called the campus police. The police then searched his office and they found that he had stolen multiple things from my room. Things like my underwear, and he even stole my garbage. It was really weird. He also had like dozens of pictures of me and some even taken around campus and some extremely zoomed in on me in my room. The man also had a spare key to our room which he would use to get in and out of it. The man was obviously fired from his job. I'm not exactly sure what kind of legal action was taken, but the police assured me that I'd never see him again. I've always really wondered what his true intentions were, and what would have happened if my roommate hadn't caught him that day. I guess it's a good thing I never found out. A few years back, I was a shift manager for a local big box pharmacy and convenience store. It was right across my backyard and I could probably sprint there in under a minute if I really wanted to, so it really worked out for me. I was in my late 30s. I worked out quite a lot and while I was fit, I was still a smaller girl. Even though I was married, I would constantly get hit on and asked out. It was pretty flattering, but it always made me feel really awkward. Now this particular store I worked at was in a really weird part of town. It was on the right side of town to attract the Karens, but close enough to the not-so-good side of town to attract the drug addicts, drunks, and psychopaths. Anyway, let me say that I'm not someone that gets scared easily. I've had someone high on meth crash their car into the side of the store, causing the back of our store to bend inward because we didn't carry pineapple juice. I had a man pick me up and throw me over his shoulder and start walking out the door with me, saying that I'd make a good wife. Yeah. That's one for another time. Anyways, it all started on a Sunday morning. I remember this because I was really busy building end caps and making sell signs. I was working with my favorite coworker, so the day was flying by and I was really bubbly this day. There was a man and his son that came into the store and they made a beeline for me. The man was probably just a little under six foot and he was skinny. The man had dreadlocks and a long skinny silver earring dangling from his ear. He also had this really tan trench coat that I found really odd because it was summer. Nonetheless though, I had then greeted them and asked if they needed some help. The man spoke with a really thick Jamaican accent and he said that his GPS stopped working and he wanted to see if we had any. I let out a really small laugh thinking he was messing with me. Uh, no, that would be at Best Buy or something, but we do have a small section of electronics on this wall over here. I indicated the wall to the back of me. Oh, thanks, he said, taking a look but also keeping his eyes on me. Something about those eyes just really chilled me. He was speaking another language to his son, but I kept going on about my task for the day, and he would call me to help him, asking me questions about chargers and SD cards. I answered them and then he started telling me how beautiful I was. Really awkwardly, I had thanked him. You must work out, yeah? He asked. Um, yeah, yoga mostly. 
I replied while getting more and more uncomfortable now. He made some more comments about my body telling me how he loved my tattoos and he was just really being a creep. I tried to stay polite though and eventually I just walked away to do some more work. I started to avoid him but he was still staring at me. The man had his phone out and I kept hearing the shuddering of a camera. I went to the office to tell my other coworker that I thought the guy was taking my picture and I was just really feeling uncomfortable. He then came out and watched over me. Shortly after my coworker came out, the man and his son then left. By the time the end of my shift came, I forgot about him. A few weeks later, I was up front ringing customers with a different coworker. We were crazy busy that day, but I was the manager on duty. After we got the line down, my coworker then handed me an envelope. Uh, what's this? I asked her. I don't know, some man in dreadlocks told me to give it to you, she said. I took the envelope and I went into my office with it. Inside of the envelope were dozens and dozens of pictures of me. My heart sank. I had no idea that these were taken. Most of them were of me in the store while working, some of me walking home, and some even with me and my daughter. I felt sick. There was also a note with it. It said something along the lines of, You're so beautiful. I'm in love with you. I'd be a much better husband than what you have now. Please give me a chance. There was more to it, but it's in police evidence now. The guy really stupidly left his name and address. I then called our store manager as well as the police. They took our camera footage, my statement, and the pictures and letter. They told him that he really needed to stay away from me or the next time he's getting arrested and he's banned from the store. I was really relieved but still really bothered by it. A few more weeks to about a month then went by. It was another really busy Sunday night. It was just myself as the manager on duty and we had another coworker as my cashier. We were ringing things up together when I noticed a man staring at me. The man was tall with a medium build. He had dreadlocks and he had the same earring and long trench coat as the other man did. This man was really scary. His eyes were just cold and really dead and angry. It felt like they were staring right through my soul. He didn't have anything to purchase, just stood and stared. I tried to smile politely at him, then another wave of customers came. I got lost in helping everyone, but didn't see the man anymore. Even when things calmed down, I still didn't see him. I decided to go start facing the back of the store, and I told my coworker to call me if she needed me. As I was back there, I heard that Jamaican accent and all over. I looked up at the mirror to see that same scary man on the phone. Yeah, she's here. No, it's just one other girl here with her. I can grab her when she leaves. No problem. I was absolutely horrified. He didn't see me, so I slowly made my way up to the front. I briefly tell my coworker what's going on and then call the police and store manager. The cops took him away. A few days later, a detective came to speak to me. The two men were brothers. They were abducting women and actually using them for human trafficking. He told me I was really lucky. I later found out that they had apparently found a woman beaten to death in their apartment. They've both since gone to prison. This still gives me really bad nightmares. What happened to that woman could have easily been me, but thank God it wasn't. My name is Chloe and this story happened to me two weeks ago. I'm 32 years old and have a 10 year old son named Jesse. Every now and then the company I work for requires me to travel across the state and other parts of the country to take place in important business meetings that are mandatory for me to attend. Thankfully, my bosses are understanding of the situation. Jesse's father isn't in the picture, so my work allows me to bring Jesse with me on business trips. Most of the time, we stay in a rented lodge or an apartment. A few weeks ago, I had to go on another business trip. It was out in the country, which was nice because the house me and Jesse would be staying in was a real small lodge, which was very secluded. The night before the meeting, I was on a Zoom call with my colleagues at around 10 p.m. While Jesse was upstairs playing on his Nintendo Switch. 
During my Zoom call, Jesse called me from upstairs telling me I need to see something. I excused myself from the call and headed upstairs. I went into his room and asked him what was wrong. He told me there was a man outside looking up into his window. I looked out into the dark field and couldn't see anything. I told Jesse I couldn't see anybody out there. He said the man walked off into the darkness as he called for me. What he said concerned me, but I had to brush it off as maybe it was a dog walker or something. I usually think rationally when it comes to things like that. I told Jesse to tell me if he sees the man again. I then returned to my Zoom call. About an hour went by when one of my bosses suggested we took a quick bathroom and drink break. Leaving the Zoom call on as we usually do, I went to put a pot of tea on and went upstairs to check how Jesse was. I asked if he was okay and if he saw anything outside. He told me he hadn't seen anybody since. I tucked Jesse in the bed and went back downstairs to continue my business call on Zoom. Most of the colleagues were back on from the break, apart from a couple. One of my bosses said, oh, that's strange. I thought I just saw you walking around the kitchen. The laptop that I was using for the call was set on the table in the living room, which was opposite the kitchen, which also had a back door. I replied saying, no, I was just upstairs. He said he was certain that he saw me walking around the kitchen. I laughed and I told him he was seeing things. My pot of tea started to boil. I had forgot about it. As I walked into the kitchen, I noticed the back door was slightly open. I thought it was odd, especially being what my boss just said to me. But I chalked it up to Jesse forgetting to close the door. He was outside playing earlier that day after all. I closed it and locked the door, poured myself some tea and sat down and continued my Zoom call. About 10 minutes go by and I started to feel funny like really sleepy all of a sudden, but it wasn't a normal feeling. I felt fine and all of a sudden I felt like I couldn't keep my eyes open, and that's what happened. I fell asleep on a Zoom call. I didn't know at the time, but I was out for about 10 minutes until I woke up to Jesse frantically pulling me trying to wake me up. He told me there was a man outside trying to get in. I turned around I saw a man on the other side of the back door pulling the door handle in an aggressive way. He looked furious, as he couldn't get inside. This means that what my boss said to me earlier, when he thought he saw me in the kitchen was true. That man did get in the house as I was upstairs checking on Jesse. He must have spiked my tea, and that's what made me fall unconscious. Once unconscious, I think he was planning to enter the house and assuming the door was still unlocked to take my son away. The thought of this makes me sick to my stomach. I thank God that I noticed the door slightly open and locked it shut. This story could have had an awful ending otherwise. We called the police and they searched the area, and not surprisingly, they found no one. Jesse and I returned home after that. This incident will haunt me for the rest of my life, and Jesse's too. I'm an office manager, and being the manager of a company has its perks sometimes but it also means I have to be the one to let people go. In this one instance, I had to fire a man named Hooper. What made it awkward was he was dating my best friend, Olivia. She had asked me to give Hooper a job. As she's my friend, I gave him a four month trial basis. I won't go into detail too much about why I needed to fire him, but it was basically, he just didn't know how to do his job. I had to let Olivia know the day before I was about to let Hooper go. She was understanding and thankful I gave him a chance. That following morning, I called Hooper in my office and told him that we were letting him go. He didn't really say much, but the expression on his face was surprised but also a little mad, which is understandable as he had just got fired from a job. But he left the office, and I carried on with my day as usual. Later that evening, I got in my car, but before starting it, I received a Zoom call from my bosses. I will skip most of the conversation because it's private and irrelevant. At one point, one of my bosses said, Courtney, please tell me you have finally fired Hooper. I replied saying, yes, I have. Then my boss said, thank God, he was useless, and letting out a laugh with some of the other bosses. Later that night, I was in bed asleep, and I woke up to what I initially thought was my phone ringing. But after listening more carefully, I realized it wasn't a phone call, it was a recording of some kind, I kept hearing it on repeat. Thank God he was useless, thank God he was useless, 
Thank God he was useless. With laughing in the background over and over. It was the Zoom conversation I had with me and my bosses earlier that night. I looked around my room and there was an old tape recorder sitting on my cabinet. Someone had broken into my house and put that there. I went downstairs and saw the front door was open. Of course, the first thing I did was call the cops and I told them I suspected it was Hooper who had put the recording there. What's creepy was no one had seen him again, not even Olivia. She said that he just vanished and stopped responding to her calls and texts. People lose their jobs every day, but it's scary to think how people will react. I don't understand what Hooper's intentions were with recording and quite frankly, I don't think I want to know. You can call me Derek in this story. I'm 23 years old and have recently landed myself an intern job working in the office of the city that I moved to. It hasn't been as good as I thought it would be. My boss and other managers always drop extra work on me, and I usually end up staying in the office way later than everyone else, when everyone else has already gone home. This one Thursday was no different. I was stuck in the office past 11 p.m. It was on a Zoom business call with people who were across the country, and some were across the world. There weren't many people on the Zoom call. It was about four people, not including myself. I looked up from my desk and I took a look at the Zoom call. Three of the four people were guys I knew. They were from the same company across town. The other caller I didn't know. But on a Zoom call, you can get dozens of people on the call at once. I don't always know everyone, so I didn't think much about it. The fourth person I didn't recognize was in an office that was dark. But there was no doubt that there was someone on the call. I could see them sitting down in a dingy office, but I couldn't make out any features whatsoever. One of my coworkers left the call. And then I asked the remaining two who the other person was. They both said it was probably someone. I won't say the name, obviously, but they had just gone to make coffee or something. The two co-workers then signed off. And it was just me and the other person on the call. As my co-workers said, they probably just went to make coffee. So I got my head down and I carried on with my work. After about 10 minutes, I got up to use the bathroom and I got myself a coffee. As I was pouring myself a mug, I heard something tip over on one of the nearby offices. It sounded like a stack of paper falling. I called out, hello? I was startled, yeah, but I wasn't completely terrified. I assumed I was there alone. But this is a massive office building. There are plenty of people who could be here working late. When I got back to my desk, I took a look at the Zoom call. That's when I got freaked out. The one person who was still on the call had stuck a piece of paper on his computer camera and said hello with three dots next to it. I typed in the chat box, who's the person on the call? Unsurprisingly, there was no response and then the Zoom call ended. I was pretty scared and felt like going home and just taking my work with me. As I was packing up my stuff, I received a phone call. I answered it and said hello. There was no answer, but there was definitely someone on the line. I could just tell by the noises, and I could hear light breathing as well. I spoke again saying, hello, who is this? That's when the phone went dead. I put the phone down and sped walk to the elevator. Once stepping inside the elevator and pressing the bottom floor button, a light turned on in the office down the corridor, and I heard a door slam shut. Right before the elevator closed, this all happened. That was the last weird thing that happened to me that night. It was the creepiest experience I've ever had. Unfortunately, I still have to stay late, and I'm always paranoid of who's around me, and I never feel alone when working late there. I started my new job at Will Rogers Airport. I say new job, but I was really just moved to a different airline and working on the same ramp agent position. Now I have to tell you that I have a crippling fear of heights. And my least favorite part of being ramp agent is when I have to climb in a cargo bin or rear loading plane because it's about 20 feet above the ground. The first thing is it was raining. Not just light raining, but pouring rain with a few scattered lightning flashes and random power surges. Every now and then, we have dead bodies transported in the cargo bins. This was one of those occasions, and tonight was my lucky night apparently because my manager told me 
I was throwing this plane. Throwing mean, I was pulling the cargo out of the bin. It was the last plane for the night and wasn't very much cargo besides the body. My coworker John pulled the ramp loader to the plane and raised it up so I can walk up to the conveyor belt to enter the bin. About four other co-workers come over with a baggage tug for the cargo. I say to everyone in a louder than normal tone because the rain was loudly smacking the metal shell of the airplane. I hope y'all are ready. I'm not trying to be out here all night. John laughed and said, don't worry about it. Maybe you can find a new friend in there, in reference to the bodies. I didn't think it was funny, but I chuckled and told him to shut up and let's get going. I climbed into the small and cramped space and sat in the bin as far from the human-sized white cardboard box as I could and pulled my phone out of my pocket to select a playlist to listen to while I throw the bin. I find a good one and I start working. The conveyor belt moves at a snail's pace and you have to wait until they scan each individual package so I can't just throw them as fast as I want to to get out of there. About 10 minutes into it, I'm getting closer and closer to this box and my music stops playing. I've had earbuds that short out when they get wet. So in the front of my mind, I automatically assumed that the rain somehow got on it and I just needed to shake the little water out of them. But they were bone dry. I checked Spotify to see if it was a glitch or a problem with the app. And I see I have an unread text. Did I get a notification and forget in the midst of my rap fuel baggage handling? The way my phone is set up when I get a message, it will tell you who it is from, but it won't display the message. You have to access them and read it. The message was from an unknown number, which was odd because very few people have my number. I clicked the notification and I read the message and all it said was hi. I sent a text back and I said, uh, who is this? My phone displayed that whoever sent the message saw mine immediately after it sent. I waited and no response. I started my playlist back up and got back to my job. Shortly after, a crash of thunder that was so loud the plane shook made me jump at first, but I quickly rationalized it and returned to work. I noticed the conveyor belt was no longer moving. I yelled to John, what the hell is going on up there? Why did it stop? He told me to sit tight, they're gonna drop off this load. I think to myself, where else am I gonna go? About one minute later, it got cold like I could see my breath cold. I wrote it off as just a cold front. I reach over for some stranger's luggage to lean on while I wait. As I look over for a bag to grab, lightning went across the sky and I saw a quick flash of a little boy, 11, maybe 12 years old, sitting on a white box, staring at me with this eerily happy smile and his head turned slightly to the side. My heart sunk and I froze never taking my eyes off that box for what felt like hours. I was startled by the replacement conveyor belt starting up right next to the plane. I darted to the moving conveyor, crawling as fast as I could, trying to keep my balance and panic at the same time. I hit the ground and looked at John and said, nope, I'm done. You're going to have to go in there. I didn't want to explain exactly what I saw, but John knew something scared me. So he asked me what was wrong and who was it. I stuttered a little bit and I walked away before I could say anything. Then I got a new text message notification that I heard loud and clear this time. It responds from an unknown sender saying, it's your new friend. This incident took place in my old house in the winter of 2013, me being 12 years old. My mom had gone on a vacation to visit her friend in Bakersfield, California, leaving us home alone. My sister Aurora, who's the oldest at 21, will be watching us, as well as my brother Austin, 19 back then. Austin and Aurora had come back from the local gas station to grab some snacks, hot dogs, hamburgers, slushies, candy, and chips, and as well as Austin getting a pizza from Little Caesars. As we were going to watch a football game that night, it was December 15th, 2013, when it was pitch blackout. The game being either the third or fourth quarter, even over the commentator and the loud sounds coming from the TV, we could hear a faint yet very slight scratching sound coming from the garage. It sounded like our cats were scratching the wood on the garage. 
or maybe one of the dogs. Addison, my little sister, was looking around for the dogs and cats when she found them in the basement all resting in either our billet room or the two bedrooms we had down there. Addison came upstairs and told us, and we were pretty reasonably shaken. The scratching continued, and it only made us feel more unsettled. Austin and Aurora looked pretty shaken when we heard a loud collapsing sound in the garage. It sounded like someone climbed up the ladder to our storage area, went through all of our boxes, and shuffled them around. It was when it hit us. Bailey, my other sister, turned off the TV, while Allie, another one of my sisters, went to go turn off the lights. Addison hid in one of my basement bedrooms. Allie hid behind the china cabinet in our other basement bedroom. I was hiding under my bed. Aurora and Bailey were hiding behind my parents' bed. Then someone opened the door to our house and slammed it shut. It was a man. The man said in a gruff voice walking into the bedrooms. Aurora, Austin, Ali, Bailey, Elijah, Addison, I would like to give you some candy. He also said our full names at one point and somehow knew our middle names. The man started pounding on the three bedroom doors and screaming that he had a bunch of candy canes and he just wanted to spread the Christmas cheer. Austin jumped on the man from behind and he actually had a huge kitchen knife. Austin managed to stop him from stabbing or cutting him. The cops arrived a minute later and the man was still in Austin's possession. Austin had left him for maybe 20 seconds and when he went back in the hallway, the man was gone. We heard the front door shut and Austin never caught the guy. Unfortunately, however, the story doesn't even end yet. One day, when I was 15, I was walking home from school with Addison and Bailey. Aurora and Austin and Allie had all moved out by then. I opened the front door to see everything shifted around and the whole house was trashed. We found this incredibly odd and even more that it was a terrible foul smell coming from our basement and five of our dogs, Rocky, Roscoe, PD, Coco, and Bingo, were all clawing at the basement door. I opened the door since Rocky, Coco, and Bingo were all German shepherds. They weren't scared as PD and Roscoe were golden retrievers and they were petrified. Rocky went down first. He was acting very brave and then looked in the basement bedrooms and started barking. Our basement bedrooms are like this. One is off in the billet room and there's a door at the back of the room leading to another basement bedroom. One was our guest room slash office and the other room was a storage room that was formerly our playroom. But Rocky was actually barking into our storage room. Bailey and Addison were upstairs cowering while me and Rocky were downstairs in the storage room scavenging around the room. I turned on the fan and the light. Then I hear, Elijah, come down here please. I jumped and the man from that one night in December stood up with a knife. Rocky pinned the guy to the floor, biting him profusely. I screamed for Addison or Bailey to call the cops and they arrived in five minutes while Rocky was on top of the man. He was arrested and had been responsible for several crimes. I had forgotten about both incidents for a while and we actually moved out of that house a few days ago, which was June 11, 2020. And when we were actually looking at the house for a last look, Bailey looked at the wall behind the china cabinet in the guest room and screamed. There was old carved blood into the wall that said, I will come back. I will forever be grateful toward Rocky and Austin, both saving our lives. And Coco unfortunately died in August 2017 due to lymphoma. This incident will forever haunt me, and I hope we never see that man again. And I fear he will come to our new house and he was sentenced to 12 years. Just out of college, and despite having a degree, it was almost impossible for me to get a job. Day after day, week after week, I sent out my resume to every game developer and computer company in the country, and a few in Europe and Asia. Six months into this, my money was running very low. This was when I was forced to face the facts. I needed a job immediately and it didn't matter where and for how much. Just in time I found a job listing for a video game store at the mall. You know the one I mean. 
and the terrible stories you hear about them are almost always true. Because of my background in games, I was given an interview immediately and hired soon after. My first shift was the following morning. Other than a few hiccups along the way, it kept my head above water until I got on with Dell two years later. The meat of the facts began just before my second year was about to start. Because of the high turnover, I was made an assistant manager by month nine. None of my shifts were evenings, so I was tasked with keeping the younger employees in line, a job I never really took seriously since I was only a few years older than they were. I didn't care how they acted as long as they did their job. Around this time, a girl was hired that could have been my undoing. The second I saw her, I knew she would be a problem. However, it wasn't just her that was the source of trouble. Her super jealous boyfriend became a thorn in the side of every guy that worked with her and sometimes just spoke to her. A shift of hers didn't go by without him showing up to check on her. Some nights, he would do no more than sit on a bench outside the store and watch her work, but anytime she would get too close to a guy for his liking, he'd approach them and physically intimidate the guy she was talking to. She never said a thing when this happened. I actually think she kind of liked it, but it would be what would push her away from him in the end. She'd worked at the store for a couple of weeks before someone showed her the hallways that ran along the back of every place. She took advantage of the fact he wasn't aware of them and this turned out to be a big mistake. If any person reading this doesn't know what I'm talking about, pay attention. You're about to learn something. I'm not sure how common this is, but some indoor malls, those built in the old way where each store inhabited an area that leased from the mall owner, there are a network of paths or halls that run behind each business. They're used mainly by the employees. The system allows them to enter and leave their jobs without being seen by the customers. Although I'm pretty sure their intended purpose was to give janitorial staff an uncluttered pathway to maintain the spaces. That being said, in all my time at that job I only saw a member of the cleaning staff a handful of times. Most of those times they were sneaking a cigarette rather than working. Luckily, we could still smoke inside the building back then. No one said anything to the office if they caught you, probably because they were doing the same thing on their breaks. If we are all on the same page now, I'll get to the real story. Like I said, his jealousy, no matter how it turned her on, was at the same time pushing her away. On her breaks, she'd often sneak out the back and disappear for a while. Where she went, I had no idea or really cared. The boyfriend took forever to catch on, but when he did, he was super angry. She continued this routine for a few months, and just one day, she never came back to the store. I didn't attach any importance to this. It was during the holidays, and work was a nightmare. It wasn't uncommon for employees to go on break after an especially hectic rush and not return. The turnover was simply that bad. Things got a bit more interesting about four or five days later. The police showed up and had some questions about her disappearance. I was like, disappearance? What's going on here? They then informed me that she had been reported missing the day after she bailed on work by her parents. She had never made it home and they thought we may know something. The crazy thing was that when they visited her boyfriend's place to see if she was there, in addition to him not being there, after some digging, they learned that nobody had seen either of them for about a week. I was quick to make it clear that I didn't know anything. I had just assumed she got sick of the place and bailed. I guess they were happy with that. Never heard from them again. Time passed and the situation around her almost faded completely from my mind, until something really big in February happened and brought it back into crystal clarity. Some workmen were renovating one of the store's spaces for an incoming client and once they had completed emptying the space of what the previous renters had left behind, they began the undertaking of finding the source of a terrible smell. Initially, it had been inferred that the smell was emanating from some old food products left behind in the space, but even after the clearing the stink remained. The next theory was that an animal like a rat had died in the wall. It had happened before. So, before they went to the extreme of busting holes in the walls to find the source of the smell, 
They went next door to the adjoining space that was also empty and had been for some time. They spent close to an hour sifting through tons of old displays and leftover building materials. It turned out that the mall had been using this space for years as storage and the place was a mess. The two guys tasked with doing this were about to say forget it when one of them stumbled upon the source of the stink and it definitely wasn't a rat. Someone had taken a large piece of plywood and put it over a tiny little closet thus making it invisible. The guy had caught on that the smell grew worse as he got closer to this board, so he pushed aside the heavy display rack holding the board against the wall, and as soon as he pulled back the board, he found what was causing it. The semi-mummified body of what looked like a female was lying on the floor facing the wall. It appeared the arid and dry Arizona heat had preserved the corpse and suppressed decomposition. This had to have been why it wasn't stinking up the entire mall and managed to remain hidden for so long. Naturally, the mall was alive with talk of who the body could possibly belong to. Numbers of people had just stopped coming to work one day or skipped out during their lunch. We'd gone through at least 15 people in the last year ourselves. When the answer came, no one could have guessed who it was. Early one morning, I was awakened by my manager with the news that Becky Morrison was the person they found in the empty store. My only answer was, who? He reminded me that she was the girl with the crazy, jealous boyfriend that had disappeared just before Christmas. I hung up and went back to sleep. When I returned from my shift that night, it was the only thing anyone could talk about. The next question asked was, who did it? The overall favorite was the crazy boyfriend. Everyone knew by now that he had disappeared just after her, and considering his body wasn't found alongside hers, it was a fair assumption. He was most definitely nuts, it made sense. The story took a whole new angle just a couple of weeks after she was identified. An article was published in the paper discussing a possible new motive behind this, the police had recently received information that Becky had been messing around with a fellow mall employee during her breaks. They were meeting in the unoccupied store her body had been discovered in and fooling around. After following some leads, they were able to identify the employee. He was a 22-year-old guy working in the Hallmark store, but no name was given. He told the officers that he and Becky were supposed to hook up the day she disappeared, but he got holed up by the time he'd reached the empty space and she was gone. He figured she couldn't wait and returned to work. It was only a few days later when the cops showed up at the mall to ask questions that he heard she was missing. His mind went straight to the worst and he was afraid he'd be blamed for it so he said nothing. Then, when the news reached him that the boyfriend was also missing, it was too late. He figured if the boyfriend was hiding out, waiting for his chance to get him, it was best for him to say nothing, just on the off chance he didn't know for sure who the guy was. It all boiled down to him being afraid, and with what I knew, I could understand. What nobody knew and still probably doesn't is that her and I had a thing for a short while too. It wasn't long, but once is all it takes. I was the person who told her about the back hallways after all. We slipped out there a few times to mess around. Fortunately, we never got busted. When she moved on to the next guy, I wasn't hurt. I knew she had a boyfriend anyway. Now you know why I had to act as if though I didn't care about her. We figured it was the safest thing for the both of us. Turns out we were right. I was overjoyed no one knew about us. If the dude was crazy enough to strangle her for cheating, which seemed to be the reason, he would no doubt come after the dude she was with. I felt sorry for the Hallmark guy. It wouldn't take much mental math to figure out who he was, if he didn't already know, and since they still haven't found him to this day, the fear of her boyfriend popping up out of nowhere and putting some holes in him must have been real strong. I know I was looking over my shoulder for several years after, the police have this theory that he may have ended his life not long after. There hadn't been any activity on his bank account or card for years and I still wasn't taking any chances. Nine years later, a week doesn't go by that I don't think about her. 
An outsider may have seen her as an easy girl, but I still don't think of her that way. It struck me that she was just looking for a guy that would treat her well and commit to her for the long term without being psychotic about it. She was genuinely a good person, and certainly didn't deserve the end she had, but then again, I can't think of very many that do. I'm not sure if this is the creepiest or the most disgusting thing to ever happen to me, but here it is. I'm a 17 year old female and this happened about 3 months ago. Me and my friends always liked to go to McDonald's after we had a good yoga session. You could call us regulars. We probably did yoga together 2 or 3 times a week and it wasn't a class or anything. It was just me and 3 of my friends. We had another friend, Olivia, who occasionally joined us, but she was kind of flaky. If she didn't feel like doing yoga that day, we just went ahead and did it without her. We had been in this routine for a couple of weeks at this point, and we always look forward to getting some nice junk food. There was something about McDonald's that was like the guilty pleasure of my entire existence. I normally didn't get it otherwise, but I really look forward to the couple of occasions that me and my friends went there. But this one experience was horrible. I had been there enough that I started to recognize the people that worked there. I never had conversations with them, but I knew their faces well enough to spot when someone new was in the back working. That's exactly what happened this one Wednesday afternoon. I noticed this guy with really thin hair. He had a really creepy face, and I'm not sure how to describe it exactly. His eyes were humongous. They looked like the eyes of a bug. And then he had this really strange body language that always kind of freaked me out. It was like jumpy or something. If he was deep frying french fries for example, he would stand perfectly still for a second and then really quickly submerge them in one motion and it would splash grease all over. This was very unusual considering I had seen enough people put down fries that there was an easier way he could have done that. He didn't have to splash it like that. I was watching him one day and we made eye contact. It was really unusual too because I was looking at him as my mom's credit card was processing to pay for my meal. He had his back turned toward me. I was trying to figure out if I knew who he was and then he just spun around to look at me and it was all in one motion. It was just really freaky. So I started noticing him more and more. He was always working whenever my friends and I got finished with our yoga. It didn't bother me too much. My friends also noticed how weird he was and told me about similar experiences. It wasn't creepy enough that we stopped going or anything, but it was certainly enough to notice. I remember the day in particular. It was a weekend because I didn't have school that day. Me and my friends had just finished a really good yoga session and we headed over to McDonald's. Anyway, my friends and I ordered our food and were waiting for a few minutes. It took a little bit longer than usual, which isn't really an issue because we're not impatient or anything, but here was the weird part. They weren't busy. We were basically the only people in there waiting for food and I think they had one other person who had already ordered who was sitting down and already eating. I didn't see any cars in the drive through and I just found the whole situation extremely bizarre. I had noticed that the creepy guy was working, but I didn't see him for a very long time. He went behind a wall that I couldn't see him around and I wasn't sure why he did this either. Life went on and we got our food and sat down. I normally start by eating my fries and then have whatever my main meal is after that. Today it happens to be chicken nuggets. I got a 10 piece. As I was eating I felt that creepy guy's watchful eyes looming over us. I felt really freaked out and I convinced my friends to take our meal into the car to leave. As we left, I looked back to see him frowning at me. I didn't stop walking. Well, we got out there and for a few minutes I felt like I was being paranoid and I overreacted. My friends thought so too, until I looked at my chicken nuggets. I looked inside of the box they were in and they seemed to be covered in some kind of weird substance. I couldn't quite make it out and I didn't know what to think. My immediate reaction was that they had put mayonnaise on it or something. Thankfully, I was smart enough to ask my friends before I took a bite. 
my one friend screamed. That freak jizzed on your nuggets. The more I analyzed this strange substance on my chicken nuggets, the more convinced I became that it really was, in fact, that. That certainly explains why it had taken so long for us to get our food. I didn't quite understand how he was able to pull it off, though. He was one of at least five other workers there. It's not like they would have just allowed him to do this, right? Whatever the case may have been, I didn't feel comfortable eating those chicken nuggets and I threw them out without hesitation. My friends and I were all really freaked out that this had happened to us. My friends threw out the rest of their food just to be on the safe side. We weren't really sure if we should have reported this incident to the police or something. We really didn't know what to do. We just kind of laughed it off as being one of those crazy life experiences and that was it. I haven't gone back to McDonald's since this whole experience. But yeah, that's the story of how I ordered chicken nuggets one time and the freaky guy working there put his secret sauce on them. Okay, I don't think you guys are even going to believe this story, but it's 100% true. Just happened last week. I don't know how else I could even preface this dumpster fire of a story, but here it goes. I'm a 22-year-old male and I live with my fiancé. We had a nice apartment, but we were really looking to buy a house. I know, a little young for that, but we both landed really nice jobs after college and figured that it's better to get it out of the way now and start settling down. We're kind of old-fashioned like that. My fiancé's grandmother owns a home and no one lives in it. She had it for about a year since a family relative passed away. No one wanted anything to do with it since there was a lot of work that needed to be done, like painting the walls and redoing the floors and just various tasks like that. It wasn't completely horrible inside, but there was enough work that it literally sat there for a good little while. Well, my fiancé and I started talking to her grandmother after buying the place. She told us that she would sell it to us for a low enough price that we would be able to afford all of the renovations and whatnot. We were really excited about it. It was really exciting to think we were going to have purchased our first home together so shortly after graduating from college. But here was the problem. She had a lot of people in her family who started feeling left out. It was my fiancé's aunt and her two sons. Their father had died shortly after the second son was born and the mother had a hard time coping with everything. She was a regular drinker and arguably an alcoholic. My fiancé told me that they were extremely negative people and after meeting them a few times at family functions, I was surprised at how right she was. They lived in government housing. She collected disability fraudulently and her two sons didn't work, despite one being 24 and the other being 19. There were whispers of drug abuse in there too. Suffice to know that these were not the kind of people you wanted to associate with. When word got out that we were buying the house from her grandma, they started feeling really left out. There were a few occasions where they'd try offering to watch the house, very obviously an attempt to get in there and do God only knows what. We politely declined and did everything we could to avoid them. I happened to be at the house one day. My fiancé was working and I work remotely online, so I was home alone. I had just walked down the street to buy a lemonade when I saw someone at her house. It was extremely unexpected. I got ready to confront a potential burglar when I noticed it was my fiancé's cousin trying to break in. He was startled when he saw me and froze for a minute. I asked him what he was doing and he told me something about thinking he saw a car he didn't recognize in the driveway. I explained that it was my car and he left without any big confrontation. As he walked away though I heard him start cursing under his breath. This was the point when I started feeling like we had something to worry about. Not feeling unsafe inside your own home is the worst feeling ever, especially being two young recent college graduates. We both worked really hard to make this happen, and the idea that it made us feel unsafe there really bothered us. I still didn't even understand what they wanted out of the whole ordeal. They didn't have enough money to afford the property tax alone. Forget about utilities and anything else. About two weeks went by without any kind of confrontation. 
I had falsely convinced myself that they'd finally leave us alone. I was dead wrong. We went to McDonald's one day, exactly one week ago today, the day I'm writing this. Me and my fiancé both just wanted to be out of the house for a little while. Considering we were in the process of buying a house, we didn't want to go eat anywhere expensive, so McDonald's just seemed like a logical decision. Now before I continue, I feel the need to explain something about my fiancé and I. We are normally very serious people. We work very hard and we're both kind of workaholics, but when we get together to have some fun, we go hard. Work hard, play hard, right? Well, we got kind of silly when we played. Let me cut to the chase. We were both playing in the ball pit at our local McDonald's. We always enjoyed goofing off like that and we weren't too concerned with what people would think of us. We'd only been messing around for five minutes when her cousin showed up at McDonald's too. It was creepy. He walked right in, looked at us the entire time. Before he even opened the front door, his eyes were stuck on us, and they felt heavy. My fiancé immediately knew something was wrong when my facial expression changed and she darted around to see what I was looking at. We both watched as her cousin made his way out to the ball pit. He stepped outside. As he walked, he moved his body to grab something out of his pocket. I couldn't see what it was, but my first thought was a gun or a knife. The look in his eyes told me he was out to do serious harm. He jumped into the ball pit in my direction. I luckily landed one solid punch in his face as he came down. It threw him off. I had an advantage. He kicked me in the stomach, but I landed a few more punches on his face. He started screaming for me to stop and that I was killing him. I would have kept going if my fiancé hadn't been watching. He started this, not me. We got out of the ball pit. He then began telling us that he was going to press charges on me for assaulting him. I wasn't even phased by this. There were plenty of witnesses there that had seen the whole thing transpire. I started telling him that I was calling the cops and I was going to press charges on him. He got really panicked and ran back to his car and drove off. I'm not going to lie to you. This whole thing really shook me up. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to do. I looked around online and found an easy solution. A restraining order. My fiancé and I had both gotten restraining orders on her aunt and her two cousins. I didn't know why we didn't think of this sooner. They really solved the issue and once they understood that we had a restraining order against them, they buggered right off. I haven't seen or heard from them since. And thankfully, and hopefully, that's the end of my story. My name's Gerald and I'm 22. For the past year I've encountered a buttload of crazy people and have accumulated even more crazy stories. While most of them would make you laugh, the one I've chosen to share was terrifying while it was happening and still gives me shivers when I remember it. A little more than a year ago I applied for and got a job at my favorite convenience store across the street from my house. I would moved there my sophomore year in college and decided to stay after I left school. This little store has served as a savior to me. Living as young men often do, I had very little money, but I was always confident I could find something to fill my belly regardless of how much was in my pocket at the time. So, when the time came, I was no longer able to rely on my parents for money. The corner store was the first place I went for a job. I was in luck. Only the day before, one of the employees was fired for stealing from the register. I took his place and I've been here ever since. Like any other corner store, we sell alcohol. Beer, wine, liquor, the whole boat. Naturally, this makes us a beacon for the local drunks. These folks have served as countless hours of entertainment. While most are harmless people, on one specific occasion, a horribly violent outburst occurred. It was a quiet Saturday night, about an hour before close. Most of the regulars had made their appearances a few more than once. The two involved in this incident had been in around 7 p.m. and had just returned. They were, or at least appeared to be a couple. I'd seen them around the neighborhood since I moved in. The owner of the store said they'd been customers since he bought the store, and that was 13 years ago. 
Although they were not very talkative when they came in, I never had any reason to believe either could be violent. However, that night something had changed. Upon arriving the second time, they went straight to the cooler containing the quart and 40 ounce size beers. Nothing out of the ordinary, as I said, but tonight an argument between the two started soon after their arrival. Initially, I couldn't hear what it was about, but soon I could hear everything they said across the store. I minded my own business for a while, but once the female began screaming curse words at the man, I felt like I had to at least get them to take it outside. I wasn't sure what to say, but I began my walk to the opposite side of the small store. Before I was halfway there, the man started screaming back at the woman. I'm not sure exactly what she had said to him, but it had obviously infuriated him. Mere moments before, he had taken a quart bottle of bush or some other cheap beer from the cooler. All of a sudden, he began striking down at the woman's head with it. I'm not sure if he thought it would break or if he intended on hurting her with the nearest thing, but strike after strike he continued. It was a horrifying thing to witness. I blame the entertainment industry for giving people the false impression of how easy it is to break a beer bottle over someone's head. I assure you, it's very hard. Following the fifth or sixth strike, the woman had dropped completely to the floor and stopped moving. The guy stood over her for a moment, but looked up when I assume he heard me running towards him. The second he saw me, he ran out the side door and disappeared into the darkness. The sight of her laying there made me sick to my stomach. The blood dripping from her ears was almost as shocking as the ever-growing pool around her head. It seemed like a bad idea to touch her, so I made the decision to let the paramedics check her for a pulse. When they arrived, she was still alive, but they didn't have much hope for her survival. The cops certainly weren't in any hurry to get there, but when they did finally arrive, 45 minutes later, I filled them in on all I had seen. From the way they reacted, I got a strong feeling that they were very familiar with the two. While on shift, a few days later, my boss called with some news. The female was brain dead and her family had made the choice to let her pass. The cops had picked the guy up the following night. From the description my boss gave me, he didn't even seem to remember what had happened. The doctors that examined him said that it's likely he truly may not remember what he did because of the many years of alcohol abuse had possibly destroyed his brain. Sounds like he might not get the full punishment due to him under the law. I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Sometimes, it seems like people really do get away with murder. During my time in college, I had a friend whose dad owned an 800-acre piece of land in eastern Texas. In the past, he leased it out to hunters and paper companies, but was no longer doing it. He had built a cabin on the land a few years before and would let us go out there from time to time to mess around. It served as a great way to relax from the pressures of school and getting closer to nature. The spring break of 1997, we loaded up our trucks and headed for the cabin. Our plans included shooting guns, drinking beer, and other things rednecks like us do in the woods. Our first morning kept us pretty busy cleaning the cabin and moving all our stuff inside. Around dinner, we made a big fire outside and cooked a bunch of steaks and fried potatoes. We skipped dessert and broke open some beers. The sun went down not long after and for the remainder of the evening we got loaded and passed around a joint or two. At some point in the night, I heard a shuffling noise outside and went out to check on it. The fire was barely burning at that point and just outside of its light, I swore I could see the shape of a man standing completely still. From what I could tell, he was facing me, perhaps waiting to see what I would do. I blinked my eyes real hard to get a clearer look, but my position and the lack of light made it hard to see clearly. The shape continued to stand still, so I decided I'd walk up a little closer in hopes of getting a better picture. The thought terrified me, but I was transfixed by the being or perhaps I was still too intoxicated to make wise decisions. I took two steps forward, but was distracted by a voice behind me. My friend had woken up and noticed the door was wide open. So he got out of bed and saw me walking around the fire. His voice caused me to jump a little, but I soon realized who it was speaking. I asked him if he saw the figure on the other side of the fire pit. 
He just laughed at me and said I must be so stoned I was seeing things. We laughed it off and returned to bed. On my way, I turned back to take one more look, but the shape was no longer there. I chuckled to myself and went back to sleep. The next morning, I wrote the whole experience off as the result of too much fun and went on with my day. We spent the first half of it fishing at the big pond. Post-lunch was shooting guns and one guy's compound bow that he had just bought. The beers and smoke were broken out after dinner. A game of poker was attempted but soon cancelled in favor of another evening telling lies around the fire. On one of my many trips to relieve myself that night, I was spooked by the sound of a stick breaking close by and noped it back to the fire. The look of fear on my face made the other guys laugh their butts off. I tried to explain what had happened but was quickly reminded that we weren't the only creatures in the woods. The reasoning seemed sound so I accepted it. Not long after, we were standing around, involved in some deep discussion, and I turned to speak to the guy on my left. What I saw caused me to clench up so tight I could have snapped a steel rod with my sphincter. Standing within a few steps behind my friend was another man I did not recognize. It was like he appeared out of nowhere. What made it creepier was that he was staring intently at the back of his head, almost like he was trying to bore through it with his eyes. I remained frozen stiff. The longer I looked at him, I realized he was the same being I saw lingering outside the light of the fire the night before. He was average height with a long, unkempt beard. My friend continued rambling about whatever, unaware of his shadow. After several long seconds, the stranger turned to me with a blank expression and walked away. This was when my friend finally noticed my horrified look. When he spoke, the thrall of fear was released, and I began pointing and rambling about what I had just witnessed. He and my other friend laughed at me again. There was no way I was seeing things this time. I described the man, and one of them suggested he was a Bigfoot. Despite my protestations, no one was buying it, and I eventually cut my losses and shut up. However, I wasn't beat. Their mockery had made me even more determined to prove the stranger's existence. The next two days were quiet. No stranger, in other words, but I kept my eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. By our fifth morning, I was beginning to question my sanity. I'd seen this mysterious being stalking around us twice, and now it had suddenly disappeared. I resolved to put my quest on the back burner until some new evidence arose. My friend's dad had mentioned him and owner of one of the surrounding properties had spotted a small group of wild hogs running through his land, so we grabbed our rifles and went on the search for them. A mile or so, down one of the property's many roads, we came across some hog wallows and knew we were on the scent. We went up the road, now on foot tracking them. Another mile on, we stumble upon three large hogs rooting up the ground and prepared to make bacon. Two of us chambered around as quiet as possible on our rifles and took aim. I was less than a second from saying three and pulling the trigger when the loud crack of another rifle filled the air followed closely by a burst of wood and bark above my friend's head. It took a moment for it to register that we were being shot at. A few seconds later, Another crack and strike, this time even closer to my friend. We weren't going to wait for a third. The friend who appeared to be the target led us down a side trail that led back to the cabin. No more shots followed as we fled. However, instead of finding safety at the camp, the shots began again. Seeing no other option, we hopped into my truck and hauled it out of there. This was a time just before the commonality of cell phones so we had to drive the 20 miles to town to get help. After we explained the situation, we returned to the property a few hours later with some deputies. We approached slowly and remained in the cars when we parked. We waited to see if the shots would start again, but nothing happened. A cursory look around counted three holes in the cabin and another two in my buddy's windshield. Perhaps the worst was that all of our camping stuff, sleeping bags and such, were spread out all over the ground. Luckily, we'd smoked everything the night before, so the police were none the wiser. 
Nothing was missing but a box of 30-30 ammo and, strangely, my sleeping bag and wool blanket. A theory began to form in the deputy's mind that we had stumbled upon a squatter or poacher camping out on the property for whatever reason. They acted as if they were going to let it go, but once my friend's dad who owned the land heard about it, he put pressure on them to start a search. This was about the time I repeated my story of seeing someone lurking around the cabin. No one was laughing now, and my story was finally being taken seriously by somebody. The search was led around the property by my friend's dad. School had already begun again by the time it took place. It continued for a full week, but nothing other than a few old camps were found. It was assumed that he knew the heat would be on him after the shooting incident and he moved on. During the course of the investigation, several avenues were followed to ID the stranger like escaped cons, but he remains unidentified to this day. Because of the chance of another attack, our trips to the property ended. The next year we tried to camp out somewhere else, but it wasn't the same and our nature getaways died out. Within five years, my friend's dad had a heart attack and lost interest in the cabin. The paper company's lease were renewed and the land's trees had been used to make paper and pulpwood products ever since. Each time I jot down a quick note, I'm reminded of our awesome trips and especially the odd and terrifying week that caused them to stop. I do, once or twice a year, talk to my old college friends on the phone. As far as he's heard, that crazy stranger still hasn't been caught. We sometimes theorize as to his origins and where he may have ended up. I, however, often take this much further when I'm alone. I wonder why our so-called strangers seem to focus so much of his anger onto my friend and perhaps far more concerning. Is he still out there waiting for his chance to finish what he began all those years ago? I live in a major city in Texas. My apartment complex is gated and in a good neighborhood, but the security isn't extremely tight. Sometimes the gates are left open and anyone could piggyback off of someone else entering with the access code. Maybe twice in the past three years, the management has put out notices of vehicle break-ins and other items being stolen from porches. We also have frequent door-to-door -door solicitors, even though there are signs forbidding it. So this particular Friday evening, I go to bed at about 2.30am. For some odd reason, I was having trouble getting to sleep so I put on a podcast to listen to and eventually start to doze off. I become aware of a noise that sounds like a clicking sound, but it sounds like one of my upstairs neighbors making some noise. I kind of zone this out as I'm used to my neighbors staying up late on weekends. After about 30 seconds, I realize the noise is extremely repetitive and getting louder. I then start focusing on it more intently, trying to isolate what it could be and where it was coming from. Suddenly it hits me. It's coming from the entrance to my apartment. I leap out of bed and head to the foyer. I identify the noise right away. The lock mechanism is moving back and forth rapidly like someone is trying to unlock the front door. I can hear that an object is inserted into the lock and the person is jimmying it back and forth with a lot of force. I instinctively turn around, head to my bedside safe, unlock it with a combination, and pull out my 357 SIG pistol, load a 14 round magazine, and chamber a hollow point round. I head back to the door and as I exit the bedroom, I see the lock twist and unlatch. I immediately pointed my weapon straight ahead knowing that if someone comes through, I will have to make a split second reaction. I decide that if someone comes through my door, I will give them a momentary chance to retreat, but if they do anything other than that or enter aggressively, I'm going to shoot and ask questions later. They don't enter, however, because I had also locked the deadbolt inside only. When I first moved in a year prior, I remember thinking that the deadbolt was a great security feature and I got in the habit of always keeping it locked when I'm home. In hindsight, this decision saved me from a life or death confrontation. Upon realizing that, I approached the door and looked through the keyhole. On the other side are three Asians, two men and one woman. All three are wearing hoodies, so it's difficult to make out their faces. The men have objects in their hands, but I can't make out exactly what. 
The two men are talking back and forth, probably trying to figure out why they can't open the door, even though they have successfully opened the outside lock at this point. The woman is also talking loudly behind the two men, such that anyone in the hallway would be able to hear her voice. She's talking in another language. The only words I can make out are, blah blah blah, apartment 250 blah blah blah, and she keeps repeating that over and over like a broken record. Upon hearing that, I start to wonder for a moment if maybe they're just drunk and have the wrong apartment number. But that's impossible. To open my lock, they would have to have a copy of my exact key or some kind of lock-picking device. I've never copied my key or even given it to anyone. And here's the other thing. Not only is 250 not my apartment number, but, as I figured out later, that apartment number doesn't exist anywhere in the complex. Standing back from the door, I take a long broom handle and jab it hard in the face of the door, letting them know that I'm on the other side. They immediately stop fiddling with the lock and take off running. I debate whether to call 911 and decide against it until they return. I know they'll be long gone by the time anyone gets there. It would be too risky to follow them to try and get a better description or license plate, and I don't have enough identifying info as it is to make an arrest. I filed a police report the next day and let the apartment management know. They said it was unusual, but they would alert the resource officer and ask for a police presence for a couple of nights. Nothing ever came of the report, but that's not a surprise to me. It's been seven months since this happened and no further incidents. Nobody else in the apartment has reported anything similar happening. I don't think they'll be back, but one precaution I took was to buy a smart lock for the deadbolt so I can leave that deadbolt always locked from the inside, even when I'm not home. It's crazy to think that the deadbolt was the only thing between myself and an armed confrontation with intruders. They say you don't really know what you'll do in those situations until it really happens, but I can honestly say I am proud of how I stayed calm and was mentally prepared to defend myself. If there's one good thing that came out of this, I feel confident that I responded the right way and was ready for the unthinkable. I've had a few delivery jobs that have given me the creeps. One or two that I was pretty sure I was about to be robbed. Another was a gunfight between gang members unfolding in the street I was delivering to right as I was turning onto it. But these are just occupational hazards. Yeah, it sucks, but I guess you do get over them. Only one delivery job really, truly terrified me. The only one that scares me to think about even today. So we get an order from an address that none of us drivers had ever delivered to before. This normally causes some suspicion among us since we're always pretty wary whenever delivering to a new address. A fair few first-time deliveries have resulted in an address getting blacklisted. Sometimes they try to stiff you for money or some other scam to get free pizza. Generally speaking, the drivers take turns delivering to a new address and this time it just so happened to be my turn. So once the order is completed and the pizzas are boxed up, I take them out to my car and punch the address into my sat-nav. It turns out the address is right on the edge of our delivery area, pretty much in the middle of absolute nowhere. It dawns on me that this could be the oldest trick in the book. Call the pizza into some hard-to-reach location, then demand it to be free once it takes more than 45 minutes to deliver. But, to my relief... I make it out onto this old dirt road with time to spare, yet my relief doesn't last long, not when I see the state of the address I'm delivering to. The house is so run down it looks like a squat, like it's been commandeered by the homeless as a place to avoid sleeping rough. There's a musty old pickup in the driveway, its wheels all askew from years of misuse. I mean, the place was just the very definition of haunted house. Needless to say, I wasn't expecting a particularly generous tip. As I take the pizzas out from the passenger seat of my car, I start hearing this faint, whining noise. My ears prick up immediately and I freeze, trying to work out just what the sound is and where it's coming from. I come to realize it's the sound of a violin being played, but more accurately, it was the sound of a violin being played very badly. 
These discording noises carried on as I walked up the dirt pathway toward the porch and the front door. The sound of some old violin bow being dragged across dry old strings that were way out of tune. Creepy sure, but that's not what terrified me. When I knocked on the front door, the screaming cat violin sounds ceased instantly. A few moments of silence went by before I began to hear slow, heavy footsteps growing steadily closer. I can't be certain, but I'm almost sure I heard someone breathing on the other side. These heavy, labored breaths as I waited for the door to open. The silence was broken by a metallic snap of the door unlocking before hurried footfalls sounded on the other side. Someone had unlocked the door then scampered away from it as if they were overtly skittish about visitors. Um, hello? I got your pizza order here. I remember asking, feeling the tension rise as silence once again engulfed the scene. Uh, come inside, mister. A childish voice came from the other side. I wanted to just turn tail and run at this point, but returning to the pizza place without the money for the pizzas would definitely mean a verbal or written warning from my manager. I already had one for turning up late. I couldn't afford another. So reluctantly, I took hold of the door handle, turned it, and walked inside. The interior of the house was bathed in darkness, only a handful of weak oil lamps to give me any sense of the layout. A figure was crouched on a nearby sofa, the old violin laying next to it. There's fifteen on the table there, mister. The person sounded like a child, but they looked bigger than they should have. On the small, dusty coffee table in front of the couch, there's a pile of change in little piles. Normally, I'd have taken issue with this, but to be honest, I was desperate to get out of there at that point. I'd have taken any form of currency. As I stooped down to start sliding the little piles of coins into my cup palm, I started to hear the kids labored breathing again, but I dared not look towards them. I could see its legs in my peripheral vision, and even then, I could see how unnaturally long they were. This person was not a child. S sorry about the coins, mister. I saved them up. I saved them all up to afford this treat for myself. It's all I have. I had told the person not to worry in the sunniest disposition I could muster. The last thing I wanted to do at this point was upset them. I pocketed the coins, barely having counted them. I'd come up with a difference myself if I needed to. Like I said, I just wanted to get out of there. But as I turned to leave, hastily thanking the person, I caught a glimpse of the person's face in the low light of the oil lamps. They were burned, horribly burned up and down their arms and chest. The scarred flesh extended all the way up their face and head, only the person's features were obscured by a small rubber mask. The mask didn't even cover up their entire face, only a small central portion that concealed their eyes, nose, and mouth. The only thing I could really make out was that the mask had a long wooden nose, kind of like the puppet Pinocchio, whose nose would grow whenever he told lies. The small carved eyes were blank. I averted my gaze from the mask and was unable to return it. It was one of the most hideously sad and scary things I'd ever laid eyes on. Just as I had reached the front door, I heard that same childlike voice emanating behind me. Want to hear me play a song, mister? Before I even had the chance to answer to tell them I was too busy with deliveries to hang out, they had grabbed the old violin next to them and began to whine out of tune. Although the strings were almost totally out of tune, I started to make out the tune they were trying for. You know the one. If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. If you go down in the woods today, you better go in disguise. For every bear that ever there was will gather there for certain because today's the day the teddy bears have their picnic. I was in the back of the driver's seat of my car before you could say nope, I'm out, scrambling to start the engine so I could make a quick getaway. I don't think they had any intention of hurting me. 
I certainly wasn't as in much danger as when those idiot Crip and Blood wannabes decided to shoot it out like right in front of my car. But something about that place still creeps back into my mind while I lay there in darkness trying to sleep. Something that means I'll never, ever make another delivery there. I'll quit before I go back. I'm ashamed to say it, but it needs to be said. I screwed up on my job and a man died because of it. Not just a man, a man I was being paid to protect. Usually it can be forgiven for making a mistake on my first job. However, when it's your first job protecting another man from outside dangers, one mistake can be the last. In retrospect, hindsight, whatever word you use, I wish I'd never agreed to taking the job. Just being a large built man with a license to carry doesn't make you qualify to be a private security. This all being said, I took the job. The client losing his life is a direct result of my negligence. Maybe if I discuss what happened, I can relieve myself of a small amount of this burden. However, I can assure you I know the guilt will never truly fade away. The job came out of nowhere. Mike, a close friend of mine, had been a bodyguard on and off for years. He made it clear the job was a one-time only deal. No other guys he knew were available on such short notice. His next client was coming into town in the morning. Mike needed someone with a carry permit to back him up. He knew I had one, so I got the call. He assured me it wasn't a dangerous situation, but he liked to have another guy to watch his and the client's back. I was somewhat nervous initially, but the money I was offered was too good to pass up. We met up at his place later that night. He gave me a rough outline of what I was expected to do. Once it had been all laid out before me, it seemed simple enough. Although this would be his first time with this particular client, he assured me once more it would be simple. After all, the guys with the real problems always had their own staff. Our client was a regular suit and tie in town for some business. Four hours of work and he'd be back on a plane home. The morning of the job, we met with the client at the airport. A third guy, Roger, was doing the driving for us that day. He's a retired SWAT officer who picked up the occasional driving job for Mike. He'd had a boatload of training and evasive maneuvers while he was in the army. Plus, he could be a third gun in an emergency. He drove us to the client's first appointment and everything was going well. From what I could make out, the dude was a wholesale jeweler out of London. Stuff didn't really start falling apart until we were leaving the second place. As we exited the jeweler's store, I noticed a sketchy looking, possibly Middle Eastern guy. He was standing in front of the place next door. When he noticed us leaving, he pulled a knife from his pocket and ran towards us. Before he could get anywhere near us, I instinctively moved toward him. He turned and ran, and I foolishly gave chase. I had gotten somewhere around 30 yards and heard a barrage of gunshots behind me. I turned around just in time to see Mike go down. The client was already on the ground and wasn't moving. Roger was standing next to the car, shooting at two men running from the scene. By the time I'd drawn my pistol, the firefight had ended. It was clear to me I'd messed up. As Roger and I checked Mike and the client for signs of life, a weak few words came from Mike. I hope you won't be offended if I don't ask for your help again. We had a brief chuckle, but we both knew this wasn't a laughing matter. Roger confirmed that the client was in fact dead. I rode to the hospital with Mike, and Roger stayed behind with the cops. This big mess made no sense. I knew I could trust Mike. He said the client indicated no current danger to his life. We were supposed to be only there to prevent robberies. We'd both seen the guy with a load of stones on him, so no flags went up. Regardless, considering the number of guys in on the hit, I had a strong feeling we didn't get the whole story. I'd been waiting for news on Mike for about half an hour when Roger finally showed. The cops were right behind him. Now it was my turn. When they were done with me, they wanted to talk to Mike, but he was still in surgery. Two hours later, we got the good news. He was going to make it. 
but he'd be in the hospital for the next week at the least. For the next nine days, I stayed at his side. It was the least I could do. The following morning, we had our first discussion since the shooting. You do realize the guy with the blade was a decoy, right? It became pretty obvious once I heard you all yell at me to come back. Listen, don't feel guilty. It's, it's not your fault. I've fallen for dumber things than that. We continued our talk for a while until Mike fell asleep. No matter what he said, though, I'd always feel bad. A man lost his life, after all. The detective showed up later that day and pumped him for any new info, but Mike had none. Mike was released eight days later. Neither of us heard anything new until Roger called Mike five days later with some inside information he'd gotten from one of his pals. The client had been far from honest with us. He had hired us because he was involved in a deal with some men in which he screwed them out of $100,000. They had made it known if he was to return to the States, he'd be whacked. If Mike would have known this beforehand, he wouldn't have taken the job. That's likely why the dirtbag kept it quiet. Somehow this bit of info had made it past the background check. Nonetheless, even a crook doesn't deserve to be sprayed with bullets on a public street. We were only hearing it from their side. It could have all been a huge misunderstanding. After my anger cooled, it became obvious to me that I was just deflecting my feelings onto the client. Thief or not, I was responsible for the safety of the man. Not only had my mistake gotten him killed, a very good friend of mine almost did too. When Mike's back in fighting shape, I'm sure he'll return to security work albeit in a slightly more careful manner. I'm just glad he's still kicking. I hope he gets someone in the future far more competent than myself. When it comes to me, I think I'll stick to construction. It appears to be a whole lot safer. For a little context, I am currently a senior in college and live off campus with my two best friends. This time of year, particularly around Thanksgiving, my friends try to help me stay busy as it is typically a difficult time for me. My mother left our family the week of Thanksgiving when I was 8 years old and my dad passed away 5 years ago on November 22nd. So as I said, it's a pretty easy time of year to get myself down in the dumps if I don't stay active. Every year for the last three or four years, I have gone to one of my friend's houses to celebrate Thanksgiving with their families. But this past year, I decided I wanted to just stay home and have a mellow long weekend. I figured I could catch up on work as well as my schoolwork, which was pretty far behind. My roommates and I didn't live particularly close to the university. We lived in a suburb about 15 to 20 minutes outside of the school. This was nice because we didn't ever have to host any parties. We could just attend them near campus and head back home afterwards. Anyways, there was one house on our street that didn't quite match the others. It wasn't that the house was worse than the others, but it had no landscaping and desperately needed a fresh coat of paint. My roommates and I knew the owner as he introduced himself when we moved in a few years back. His name is Jacob. He's about five foot six and probably weighed a hundred pounds soaking wet. Every time we've had an interaction with him, he was always very nice and polite. He even helped us fix our porch light when it broke last summer. He seems to be very cordial with everyone in the neighborhood and has helped numerous people with small handy jobs similar to the one I just mentioned. On the Wednesday night leading up to Thanksgiving, my two roommates went back to their family's houses in their hometowns. They both asked several times if I was 100% sure I wanted to spend Thanksgiving alone and that I'd be fine by myself. I honestly thought I would be and thought perhaps enough time had passed that I could just focus on other things and not dwell on the past. I stocked up on Mountain Dew so I could stay awake after my assignments to play some PlayStation. At about 9 or 10 p.m., I went up to my room to throw on some sweatpants and grab the blanket from my bed. I glanced out my window and saw Jacob sitting on his front porch with the two porch lights on. I didn't think anything of it and went downstairs into the kitchen and made a peanut butter and fluff sandwich. I would say I was in the kitchen for probably about five minutes or so, finishing eating and doing a few dishes. When I finally sat down to play some games, I thought I heard something hit the front bay window, so I went to take a look. At first, I didn't see anything. 
but then noticed that Jacob had now turned the porch lights off and was standing on his front lawn, staring at the house with his head tilted like he was looking towards the windows upstairs. A little creeped out, I tried calling one of my friends who knew I was still in town to see if she wanted to meet up or stop over to hang out for a little bit. She didn't answer, so I sat on the couch for a couple of moments trying to figure out what to do. He was still standing there staring and seemingly moving a few feet closer to our property each time I looked. I wasn't sure what to do. I couldn't call the cops. He hadn't done anything except freak me out a little and to this point he hadn't even stepped on my property. After another few minutes I looked out the window again and saw Jacob now on our lawn looking at the corner of the house. At least that's what it looked like he was staring at. At this point I wasn't sure what his intentions were and I didn't want to find out. Perhaps I was blowing this out of proportion but I was legitimately scared. I grabbed my keys and phone and a few other items thinking I would just drive to campus. Maybe the library was still open even though we were off for the holiday. I kept all the lights on so I didn't seem like I was leaving and decided I was going to sneak out the back door. As I quietly sneaked through the yard I turned the corner to quickly get to my car and there was Jacob standing in our driveway. I asked him what he was doing in the driveway and he put his finger over his mouth to make a shh noise. I slapped him as hard as I could and made a run for it past my car. My instincts and adrenaline told me to just run until I found someone or someplace else. As I got about a block or two down the road, I saw a bunch of cop cars pull up towards the area of my house. Confused, I began to go back towards my house, thinking perhaps another neighbor saw Jacob stalking outside of my house and called the police. As I approached the house, one of the officers asked my name and if this was my residence. I confirmed the information and what I heard next is still the most horrifying and disturbing information I had ever received. The officer stated that Jacob reported that he was on his porch when he saw me from across the street. He saw me walk out of my upstairs bedroom and as I walked away out of the room he saw a man come out of my closet. Apparently that was why Jacob was looking into my room when I saw him the first time and also why he was looking at the corner of the house. He was following the intruder who was now walking into my roommate's room. When I last saw him outside my house before I slapped him and ran in terror, Jacob stated that the random guy in my house had made it to the downstairs. Jacob was trying not to make any noise as not to alert the person inside, fearful he could be violent or dangerous. As soon as he saw the man in the house, Jacob called the authorities and did his best to try and defuse the situation and not bring any alarm to myself or the intruder. The person inside the house was arrested and taken away. He didn't have anything on him other than a knife so it is unclear if he was attempting to rob the home or was planning something more sinister. Either way I couldn't express to Jacob how much gratitude I had for what he did. He even tried apologizing for how he handled the situation stating that there were probably things he could have done differently to make sure I was safe and aware of the situation. Unfortunately, this experience adds another mental scar to this time of year that will take a long time to get over. But one thing I can be sure of is that I will never spend a Thanksgiving holiday alone again. This incident occurred during my second year of college, sometime in the fall of 2002. All four years there, I worked as a waitress in a small family restaurant next to campus. The pay was far from adequate, but the owners treated me like one of them. Growing up without parents made this connection very important to me, so much so they remain an important part of my life to this day. I was one of four girls working nights, and three of us were students currently attending the university. The surrounding neighborhood had been on a downward slide for the past 20 years. Even with a large number of students inhabiting the area, crime was still steadily on the rise. In order to at least try to prevent ourselves from becoming victims of said crime, several safety measures were implemented. All the usual things, escorting each other to our cars, not leaving the back door open, things like that. However, no matter how hard you try to be safe, some a-hole will find a way to violate you anyway. One late night, just as we were wrapping up the dinner shift, a giant idiot would do just this and in the process 
almost cause a beautiful family to collapse. That night, we were quickly coming on the end of another regular dinner shift when a man came in and said he wanted to get something to go. No problem. I took his order and gave it to the kitchen. Working the kitchen that night was Matt, the owner's only son, and he wasn't happy when he saw it. He tried to throw it together as fast as possible so he could finish cleaning and head home. While he waited, the man paced nervously, looking outside repeatedly. This behavior seemed kind of shady, so I stopped my closing duties and began looking outside to see if I could see what he was looking at. It took a minute, but I caught sight of another man standing just out of view of the bay windows. This guy was dirty looking. His hair looked like it hadn't been washed or combed in years. The second man's actions were very similar to the others, almost as if though they were about to rob us. I foolishly pushed my instincts aside and began ringing up the man's orders. When I gave him the total, he quickly handed me a $20 bill and looked behind him. I continued to ignore his behavior and when I opened the drawer, I heard a man's voice quietly tell me to give him all the money in the register. Maybe from instinct, I looked up to see who it was. It was all coming from the customer and he was holding a handgun at my face. Keep your voice down and don't panic. Just give me the money and I'll leave. This entire time I had been the only employee in the front of the house, so he had me at his mercy. Every word he said quivered as it came from his mouth. His fear made mine even worse. I didn't need to be told twice. I grabbed every cent out of the drawer and was about to hand it to him when I heard Matt's voice coming from behind me. Did you forget something? Everything that happened after this went by so fast. I still question my recollection of events to this day. I know for sure that Matt's arrival surprised us both, but the look on the customer or robber's face was pure shock. The second I noticed him moving the gun away from my face, I crouched behind the podium to hide. The gunfire followed soon after that. I wasn't sure if Matt had been shot at this point. I was still curled up on the floor with my arms over my head very similar to a child hiding under the covers in hopes the boogeyman will go away. I don't know how long I stayed like that. A few seconds, maybe? When I did peek out from my arms, all I saw was Matt's body laying motionless on the floor. Even then, I stayed where I was until I heard the voice of his mom yelling out to us. That's when I finally stood up to see the results. The shooter was gone, and money was scattered all over the floor from where I dropped it. Matt more than likely died immediately. At his feet, grilled chicken salad was scattered everywhere like the money. Matt's mom stormed out of the back. When she saw her only son lying on the floor, she collapsed in grief next to him and this is where she stayed until the police arrived. Just to avoid making an already long story longer, I'll leave you with the facts. Even after telling the cops everything I saw and giving a detailed description of both men, neither man was caught. The family closed the restaurant for several days after the shooting and stayed that way until a few days after the funeral. From the day of the reopening, a cop in plain clothes has protected the place and there hasn't ever been another holdup since. My work at the restaurant would continue for the remainder of my time at the university. I was shaken up for quite a while and may have been for far longer if it wasn't for the love and support of the family. We seem to have served as a coping mechanism for one another and, through the shared pain of Matt's death, brought closer together. After I graduated, I moved on and am currently living in Atlanta with my partner. The restaurant continues running five days a week and doing well. It seems the neighborhood may be on its way up. In the last year, several large companies have opened branches and the continued growth has proved to be a positive thing for all concerned. Allison, the matriarch of the family, recently told me on a phone call that she was willing to put up with the hipsters that were slowly invading the area. After all, they were a big step up from the murdering crackheads that had been seen there before. Do you remember as a kid, where you imagined dentists as some kind of crazy psychos who enjoy hurting people? And how they wanted to rip out all of your teeth against your will? Well, 
We all know now that we were just overreacting kids back then. But it wasn't exactly false for me. When one day, my childhood nightmare became a reality. And this experience is something that has forever left a mark and a trauma on me. Me and my boyfriend back then moved in together and wanted to start a new life in a new town. We both came from poor families with experiences of alcohol abuses, so we couldn't afford much and we had to work really hard to sustain our needs. One evening, when I came back from work, my tooth started to hurt a lot. I tried to ignore it because I thought I was just tired and it would eventually go away after some time. So I went to bed and fell asleep. But in the morning, the pain got worse. I told that to my boyfriend and he started to worry. We didn't have any insurance because we hardly even have money for our basic needs. So for us, this was a big problem. We started to search through the internet and local magazines for dental clinics but most of them were very expensive and clearly we couldn't afford them. My condition was getting worse to the point that I couldn't even focus on my work most of the time. Desperately, I called to my parents. I begged them for help and asked to send us some money, but they refused. By now, you guys probably know what they were like and that's the exact reason why I moved out from there. At the end of my shift, my boyfriend called me with some good news. He found a really cheap dentist in town and he immediately made an appointment for me. He texted me the address and told me to be there at exactly 7pm tonight. I packed my things from work and went to the bus stop. When I arrived there, I went into the building and sat down on a chair next to the clinic room. I could hear two people talking inside the room, so I decided not to interrupt and wait for my turn. After 10 minutes, some lady just ran out of the room like she was in a hurry or something. She dropped her wallet on the floor but before I noticed it, she was already gone. Meanwhile, the door opened again and a pleasant man's voice invited me in. I turned around and I could see a short middle-aged man with a big smile. I greeted him and told him about the lady and the wallet she dropped. He said, Oh, don't worry. She was in a hurry for a bus. You can give me her wallet. She's a close friend of mine and I'll give it back to her. I gave him the wallet and brushed off the situation. For the next few minutes, we talked and filed all the necessary papers. I told him about my toothache. He seemed so nice and funny. Then, he prepared his dental equipment and I sat down on the chair. And after that, things started to get weird. He told me to open my mouth wide so that he could start the examination. I don't know why, but it felt like he was standing too close to me. Besides, shouldn't dentists sit down on their chair while working too? Then. I felt a rubbing sensation on my arm. It was so weird. I thought it was his leg but later, I realized it wasn't. I thought he wasn't doing it on purpose so I tried to move my arm a bit, but his body followed my arm. He tried to chat me up to distract me from whatever he was doing but I could feel everything. Then he stopped for some time. But a few seconds later, he just grabbed my arm and told me not to move that much. He was holding me really tight. I had enough, so I gathered my courage to tell him to stop. But he just sighed. Fortunately, a few seconds later, he released my arm. After this confrontation, he started to act harsh and rude. He seemed like he was offended and didn't want to smile anymore. Nothing really happened after that, until I finished my dental appointment where he told me to come back again for a follow-up treatment next week. After leaving, I felt so scared of him and didn't want to go back. 
I could see him looking through the window of his clinic with a really angry or disappointed face like he was expecting something from me. I told what just happened to my boyfriend but he told me I was just overreacting and we couldn't afford any other dentist. So I should be grateful that he found me a clinic that fits our budget. I knew that he wanted what's best for me but as I said, we were in a bad financial situation so I couldn't complain and be picky in this time. I knew I had to go back there again, but at least he did his job and my tooth didn't hurt anymore. Fast forward to my second dental appointment. I was feeling so anxious right before the meeting but unexpectedly, he greeted me with the same big smile as before. We chatted like nothing happened and he proceeded to the treatment very professionally. Everything seemed to be okay while he was treating me. This time, he sat on a chair and didn't do anything weird. In the middle of the operation, I was looking at him and he seemed nervous. We were sitting in silence for some time when, out of nowhere, he told me, Hey, I really like your body. You are just my type. It was so confusing and it felt so awkward. I couldn't even answer him with a fully open mouth. but. I started to move my lips and replied, I appreciate your compliment. Then there was just dead silence. I started to look around the room and I noticed the wallet. I realized it was the same wallet that I gave him a week ago after some lady dropped it on her way out. Something was wrong with this guy. My heartbeat was pounding and I started to sweat. Then he said, Come to my apartment after the treatment, just for a tea. I immediately knew what was going on, and I replied to him, Um, thanks for the invite, but I have a boyfriend and I respect him, so I don't want to hang out with some other men. Come on, I don't ask you to go to bed with me. Just for a tea. He won't find out, he replied. I refused again, but he insisted. He was trying so hard to convince me that he was literally forcing me to agree. The worst thing was he was holding his dental drill and started to become violent with it. He started to push it harder and harder into my teeth. I couldn't see but I knew something bad was going on and he was intentionally doing it to me. I could feel more and more pain while he was doing this. You will go with me, right? Just for a tea. Just for a tea, okay? He was repeating it over and over again. I stopped replying to him and now I was just looking for a way to escape. But I didn't want to hurt myself with all those dental equipment so I just didn't move. I could feel he was drilling in my tooth harder and harder. I felt like crying from the pain but I didn't want to show him that I am an easy target. Finally. I said to him, Okay, I will go with you. His face instantly turned from angry to cheerful, and he said, Sweet! With a big smile like nothing had happened. Then he stepped away from me to grab something from the table, and I took my chance to hit him on the head with any item next to my chair, and I ran away from the clinic as fast as I can. I wasn't even trying to look behind me if he was chasing me or if he was still inside. I just want to escape from this crazy maniac. When I ran out of breath after a few blocks, I stopped to take some air. Fortunately, I couldn't spot him anywhere. Then I realized something was pouring out of my mouth. It was blood. He did something to me and I couldn't see how bad it was. I slowly placed my finger into my mouth and checked every tooth. I came across something that felt really weird. I counted all of them and realized that there was something quite missing. But then I realized, he just drilled my tooth deeper into my gums. I came back to my house and told everything in tears to my boyfriend. He drove me to the police station and I gave a statement. They directed us to the state dental clinic to check for damages. The damages were so bad that they had to remove my tooth. 
I couldn't take it anymore and burst it out into tears. It was so hard for me because we couldn't even afford an implant back then. Meanwhile, the police drove to that guy's clinic to take him to custody. He insisted that he was innocent. It was just a medical mistake and that I was crazy. He testified that I made it all up. If you want to know how it all ended, then here is the harsh reality. Unfortunately, the law system favors the rich people, and he was only fined a few thousands as a punishment. I bet he had deals with the police too. He didn't go to jail nor was forced to close his dental clinic. I couldn't afford a good lawyer so I couldn't do much back then. And this crazy maniac is still seeing patients. I remembered the name of the lady through an ID from her wallet and asked the police about her. They told me that the lady was reported missing about a week ago and nothing more. Up to this day, all I'm wondering is that what he did to that lady and how many more women did that maniac sexually harassed and have physically hurted over the course of his time operating the clinic. Back when I was 17, I used to babysit for our neighbor, who at the time was a single mother who happened to be going through a particularly nasty divorce. She had two young sons, one of which was 8 years old while the other was only around 18 months. They were absolutely adorable and very well behaved kids, but you could tell that they were going through a lot, and the older one definitely showed signs of stress over the whole thing. And I'll never forget the time he asked me why his daddy couldn't live with them anymore and it honestly broke my heart. Not because I didn't have an answer for him, but because to hear it would have just been too much to bear. Too much for anyone to bear. Anyway, after a few months of being alone, she finally decided to get back on the old dating horse. I was so happy for her. After such a rough time, she deserved to find happiness again. To find someone who had the wherewithal to be a real father to these two adorable little boys. So one night she leaves on her date and says she'll be back around midnight and not a moment later. Only she doesn't tell me exactly where she's going and I have no way to contact her because this was back in the 80s and no one had a cell phone. Well they did exist but not in the available commercial sense. It was all landlines back then. Otherwise this might not have gone the way it did. So on the night in question I'm chilling on the couch absent-mindedly flicking through the TV channels. I put the kids to bed an hour previous, they're sleeping like rocks and everything seems fine and dandy. When suddenly there's a knock at the front door. I wasn't expecting anyone but then again it wasn't my house so I felt kind of obligated to answer and take a message or whatever. Only as I started walking down the hallway towards the front door, whoever is on the other side starts banging against it and cursing up a storm. Cheryl, I know you're in there. Open the door. Now what was exactly said, I don't remember, but I'm not keen on repeating some of the words they used. It was really, really harsh. So I'm just frozen, looking at the door in total fright when the oldest boy came flying out of his room and down the stairs, running to the door and yelling, Daddy's home. I grab him, pull him away from the door. I had no idea what this guy's intentions were and after all, they were probably divorced for a freaking reason. But I almost fainted with fear when I hear the words, I got my shotgun in my truck, and tonight I'm going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. He screams this, but then I hear his footsteps move up the gravel path. It appeared he wasn't bluffing at all. And if that was the case, then our lives were clearly in danger. When he gets back, he's banging on the door and threatening to start shooting through it if no one opens. I grab both kids and run out the back door and across the street to my house where my mom calls the police. When the police arrive a few minutes later, they actually find the ex-husband taking a massive dump on Cheryl's porch. He was arrested, and I wait with the kids at my house for their mom to show up. Everyone was in tears by that point, even my mom, who was normally a pretty reserved woman. 
I mean, maybe he was just having a manic episode and no one was in real danger, but honestly, it was one of the most terrifying nights of my entire life. When my grandfather was younger, he became the principal of an elementary school. He was in his late 20s, early 30s at the time, and despite being young, he was a born leader. He was a great principal and everyone loved him. I can attest to that as I attended multiple award ceremonies for him and the respect and admiration he received was crazy. There was a young boy at the school who was having behavioral issues in class, and my grandfather saw that the kid didn't have a lot of parental support. So he called in his father and had talked with him about spending more time with his son in just a general parenting session. It turned out that all the boy needed was his dad's attention and after a few weeks he was a happy model student. Whenever my grandfather would leave school late, he would see the dad was playing basketball with his son after he got home from work. It was one of those moments that he took pride in, being able to make a difference in people's lives. However, not everything had such an easy solution, and my grandfather found himself having to deal with an employee, Stanley the janitor, who was showing up to work drunk. Stanley was an alcoholic with a mean streak, and my grandfather tried on multiple occasions to deal with his behavior. Finally, one day Stanley showed up so drunk that my grandfather sent him home and called the superintendent to let him know he was going to be firing him the next morning after he sobered up. He then warned them to let him deal with it when Stanley was sober, because he was not a stable person. As it goes in these kinds of stories, the superintendent was furious and decided that he was going to call Stanley himself and fire him despite my grandfather's warning. No one called my grandfather to tell him about it either, so he was completely in the dark and thought he could deal with it in the morning. Stanley was furious and went to the school that evening. He searched the offices, my grandfather's included, and tore things apart until he finally had what he wanted. He was in a blaze of fury and on his way out, he saw the father and his son playing basketball. He walked towards them and pulled something out of his trousers. It was a gun. He then proceeded to shoot the little boy, killing him instantly. The father was so upset was hysterically crying but somehow managed to get the gun away from Stanley and shoot him. My grandfather was called to the elementary school immediately by the police because there were two dead bodies. The little boy and Stanley were dead. What was even worse was the crying from the father and him saying that he couldn't save his son. It was clear that he could never forgive himself for that day. My grandfather was pulled aside by one of the police who would search Stanley for evidence. They had found a list, a hit list of people that he was going to kill and all the addresses of those people that he had retrieved when he searched the offices. My grandfather was number one on that list. So, if it weren't for that father, it's likely that I would never been able to meet my grandfather and possibly my mother and grandmother would have been killed if Stanley had been able to complete his mission. To this day, I get goosebumps whenever I hear that story, and it's just so chilling. My grandfather never uttered a single word about this after his initial recount, and my mother made me swear to never tell him I knew. He carried the weight of that boy's death on him until the day he died. I live in a house compound and one day me and my family were visiting a friend's house. After a couple of hours, my mom and my friend's mom ask us to go fetch something from my house. So we go back to my home, which is a long way from his, and the walk seemed uncomfortably long and creepy and had an eerie atmosphere for some reason. After ages of walking, we reach my house and we get the thing they needed which was inside the house. So I unlock the door and got the object and I noticed the bathroom door was lit and the exhaust fan was on, which we usually turn off unless someone is using the toilet, but I didn't give that any attention and thought my dad was using the toilet since he wasn't in my friend's house when we left. So me and my buddy decided to wait outside the house for my dad to finish, and I occasionally went to the small window outside the bathroom 
and called for my dad, but I didn't get an answer. But I heard someone humming and singing, so I thought that he was having a good time. After a good half an hour passed, I started feeling uneasy and told my friend we had to leave because our parents are probably angry now. When we arrived at his house, we were shocked to see my dad sitting and talking to my friend's parents. We asked him, where were you? And he said, I didn't go anywhere, I just stayed here since we first came. This made me scared because my family had been here for three hours and we just waited for my dad for one hour. I go ask my sister the same question and get the same response. Someone was surely in my bathroom. After the visit is done, we go back home just to find the front door which I locked and unlocked and the bathroom door was wide open. My family acted normally but I was completely freaking out and I couldn't get any sleep that night. First and last time I babysat, back when I was 16 in the early 80s. I'd just gotten a driver's license and needed gas and insurance money for the old beat up car I'd bought. I was watching two boys about 6 and 10 while parents went out to celebrate some anniversary or something. They had promised to be home at 11. At the time, cell phones were pretty rare so no way to contact them other than calling the restaurant. Evening was going great until about 9.30 when their large, aggressive Doberman goes crazy running around the house barking and growling before running into the basement, refusing to come up. Sort of freaks me out a bit because this dog is huge, aggressive, and very protective of the house and kids. I do a quick check of the house and kids and everyone was okay. I let the dog stay in the basement, put kids to bed at around 10 as instructed by the parents, job done. So I'm watching TV at around 10.30 when, suddenly, I begin to smell something burning. Running into the youngest boy's room and find the oldest boy in bed with him. Both are asleep, so I wake them both and tell them that we need to get the dog and go outside. But the dog just straight up refuses to leave the basement. And I had to prioritize. So I get the kids outside and tell them to sit in the front yard while I go in to call the fire department. Not showing good judgment here, but I was 16. Oldest says, I left a candle burning under my bed. As I go back in, yup, a candle under their bed, since apparently monsters couldn't live anywhere where there's light. I know, dumb kids. As I open the door to go back in, there's this huge explosion behind me across the street and power goes out. The kids start screaming and follow me back into the house. I grab the phone but there's no dial tone. I get the kids out of the house again, onto the back porch this time and make it really clear that they're to stay there, but I can still hear the dog whimpering in the basement. I run to the oldest kid's bedroom with the fire extinguisher and flashlight from the kitchen and look under the bed through hazy smoke. The offending candle has gone out but has burnt a hole in the box spring which also has gone out. I flip the box spring and blast it with the extinguisher just in case. I then run to the front porch to see the transformer on a telephone pole had exploded. A lightning pole... What? Lighting the pole on fire and taking out the phone and electricity service for the street. I run and check on the box springs which are still out. I open the bedroom windows to air out the room then get the kids off the back porch into the living room onto the couch where they both are just crying their eyes out. The oldest was apologizing for the fire but insisted that if he didn't keep the candle lit, then, of course, monsters would get him. Fire department shows up for the transformer at around 11. Kids fall asleep on the couch at around midnight after watching the firemen across the street put out the transformer fire, and the power comes back on at about 1.30 a.m. The parents show up at 2.30 a.m. when they were supposed to be back by 11. They're somewhat buzzed and start complaining that the kids are not in bed and the oldest room is trashed with a flipped over mattress and dry fire extinguisher powder covering the box springs. And to add insult to injury, they straight up refuse to pay me. The situation gets really tense and, would you believe it, the Doberman picks this time to come out of the basement and starts aggressively growling at me. Walked out with a dollar to my name and I never babysat again. 
For the longest time, I was a tombstone caretaker for a cemetery in rural Georgia. It was only a summertime job for a 16-year-old, nothing too crazy, just cleaning off the grime and build up dirt from off of the tombstones and stuff. Now to kind of set the scene a little, the cemetery included one building that housed bathrooms for the five caretakers employed by the cemetery, in addition to one small, simple mausoleum. Other than that, it was all just flat earth with tombstones littering the entire site. The whole place felt pretty cut off too, as surrounding the place were some of the densest forests in the entire state of Georgia. Naturally, because of the eerie surroundings, I was always a little bit more paranoid than maybe I should have been. That, and I watch a ton of horror movies and such, which I get as a terrible combo for someone working at a cemetery. So one night, I'm doing my rounds when I have to go into the small mausoleum. We had some of the wealthier families in the area entombed within, and it was my job to go in, make sure all was neat and clean, making sure it met the standards of these uppity folks. I'm walking over to it, and right off the bat, I feel like something is off. I couldn't quite put my finger on it at first, just this general sense that I wasn't alone. That's about the time that I noticed candlelight coming from the small mausoleum. I was also pretty certain that I could hear voices coming from inside too, like younger voices, kids my age at the time. They were giggling and laughing and it didn't sound particularly wholesome. Now I hadn't seen anyone enter or leave the cemetery, but I also wasn't about to potentially take on a bunch of drunk teenagers on my own, as I definitely would have got my butt whooped. So I called the lone security officer on duty, the dude that does a few rounds on the lot. He was an older, retired cop, but he was definitely tough, and I knew he jumped at the chance to help me out. When the ex-cop finally turns up, we both go inside. It was empty, which made absolutely no sense, as I'd literally just heard voices and stuff inside. And there were indeed lit candles inside, burning around one of the tombs, a tomb that had been opened up to reveal the remains of a child-sized skeleton. Nothing other than that was disturbed, but that was bad enough, mainly because the open tomb contained a rotten old child's doll, like the knitted kind. It was seriously disturbing to see that old thing smiling away while lying hand in hand with an actual kid skeleton. Me and the security guard quickly got out of there, doing a lightning sweep of the grounds to try to at least get eyes on these sick idiots that desecrated that girl's final resting place. Neither of us saw a soul, which was more frustrating than it was scary, and after about a quarter of an hour, we met back at the mausoleum to set the girl's grave in order by sliding the stone tablet back on top of the tomb. When we stepped inside, the doll that was previously hand in hand with the dead girl was sitting on the other side of the mausoleum, like just sat there upright, with that same uneven smile stitched across her face. Whoever was messing with us had actually gone back to move that doll to taunt us. I quit the next day and never went back, not even to visit. Okay, so years ago my dad purchased a cemetery when I was in middle school, and I worked for him through high school graduation. I did yard work, mowing, weeding, tended to flower beds, etc., and aside from the occasional shadows seen out of the corner of my eye or hearing strange sounds, the cemetery was actually quite a peaceful little place. But the strangest is when you have a burial in the crypts. Basically, you dig down about five or six feet to expose a giant pair of stone slab doors. You pull the stone doors off and then drop down into a tiny, cold, dark room. These rooms can either fit two full-size coffins, four children's coffins, by far the hardest to deal with, or years and years worth of cremated remains. So back in the 50s and 60s, families would purchase one crypt and the entire family tree would be cremated and interred inside it. Some just put the cremated remains in it and close it up, but others lit candles and leave mementos, flowers and souvenirs, pictures and stuff like that. It's really creepy opening up one of those things after like 50 plus years and finding all kinds of melted candles and old pictures of the deceased people inside. Not only that, but when you hop down in there enough times, eventually you have a weird realization that you are at the same level and completely surrounded by bodies. 
and that one day, inevitably, you're going to be joining them. Another time, my best friend and I were earning a little money over summer at the cemetery, working as groundskeepers when we were juniors and seniors. It was easy money. We got paid five bucks an hour, mostly for edging or trimming and generally keeping the whole place nice and tidy. We raked a lot of leaves and dug a lot of holes that summer, but we also got to tear around the grounds in what was basically a souped-up golf cart with our tools in the back. There was a lot of dead flowers to dig up, not to mention a lot of empty liquor bottles, beer cans, and unfortunately on occasion, even some used condoms. There was a widow who left scribbled notes on her husband's grave, almost all of them completely illegible. Also a lot of sodden, stuffed animals left on the graves of children. It felt so wrong throwing that stuff in the trash, and take my word on it that it sucked even harder than digging holes. It was annoying to work in the rain, and it rained often, but it was truly a gravy job, no puns intended. The creepiest thing I saw was one of the old-style baby dolls that had been left on a graveyard. Not inherently spooky, I know, but what creeped us out was the fact that it was badly burned, almost like someone had gone over it with a blowtorch or something. Not just that, either. It had what we discovered to be these big iron nails that had been driven into the spaces its eyes should have been. Probably just some local college kids playing a prank or something. Heck, it could have been my buddy, but he never admitted to it. It just really creeped me out to see that thing one early morning, when there wasn't another soul in sight. Having said that, there was something far, far worse I encountered while doing that job. It was the naked corpse of a young woman my age, left neatly with her arms at her sides one foggy Saturday morning. She had been strangled right there. Whoever murdered her had also bludgeoned her horribly. She was identified quickly, and it turned out that she was a student at a neighboring high school, but her clothes were never found, and to my knowledge, her murder was never, ever solved. My friend and I were grilled by police on two separate occasions, and honestly, I think that was the scariest part, knowing we were actually implicated in the murder. But we didn't know a thing, and each had alibis, so thankfully we were eventually rolled out, and thankfully, the cops never bothered us anymore. I just pray that she's resting in peace. Former funeral director here. A bit of a setup first. The cemetery I run is real old, like by a good few hundred years. At least it must be since the church next to it was constructed during the 17th century. Considering the fact that it is a pretty rural place as well, most people back in the day were buried with only wooden crosses and such, no stone or marble. So as time goes on, crosses rot and wither away, new people get buried, etc. Nowadays, due to less people living out here in the sticks, which means our budget is increasingly limited, the cemetery is really run down and overgrown. It is a really pretty place and it's honestly pretty depressing. So as some of you can imagine, when you keep burying bodies in the same small patch of dirt for that many centuries, eventually the soil has been worked over dozens and dozens of times. So in the end, it consists of mainly bone meal. You can't even rake over the flower beds there without accidentally uncovering some teeth or finger bones or something equally grim. It's nothing but fragmented skeletons all the way down under the thin turf. The soil sort of resembles the kind of dirt you see near sandy beaches, except on closer examination, all the light-colored parts are just bone fragments rather than crushed seashells. Not really scary or unexpected, just super eerie until you eventually get used to it. You learn to treat anything recognizable as human remains with respect and just tuck it away out of sight under the plant or whatever else you were putting there. Anyway... So someone was taking care of their relative's grave and decided to expand the area around the grave. For some reason, the people around her are not particularly fond of grass, rather preferring a well-leveled ground with zen garden lines made with a rake. The person removed the grass and was sprucing up the place with a rake when they pulled up a bunch of snow-white hair from the dirt. They must have just freaked out and ran out of there, leaving the cemetery attendant to stumble across what was essentially hair coming out of the ground. 
She reported it to the church and supposedly they reburied the remains. Even with all my years as an undertaker, I'm not entirely sure how there could have been a body so close to the surface, but there's another incident that sticks with me even more than that one. My business partner and I had just gotten back to the funeral home from a call for a 27-year-old woman who tragically passed away due to terminal cancer. As we were moving her body from the cot to an embalming table, we heard an audible click and the radio across the room turned on full volume of static. It's one of those old radios you turn the volume dial until it clicks to turn it on. We both looked at each other, pale as ghosts. He happened to be extremely religious and this event visibly shook him. He found an excuse to leave early not long after the incident. So I shut the radio off as I typically use my iPhone to listen to music while doing embalming work. When I finished the procedure and was attempting to move her from the embalming table to a dressing table, I heard that click from the old radio and it turned on full volume yet again. At this point I was fairly freaked out and got out of there not long after. My partner and I never spoke of it again and nothing like that had ever occurred to my knowledge before or after. So this happened back in 6th grade and I think it's the closest I've ever come to dying. At the school I went to we always used to have some big end of the year field trip. We'd usually go to some city and look at all the important or historic buildings, have lunch, learn some things, and leave. That year, we were going to New York, and me and a couple of friends planned what we wanted to do. We wanted to go do our own thing, go shopping, get some new clothes, that kind of thing. Only when we got to school the next day, the teachers made it really clear we had to stick with the group. But since we were all stupid, rebellious 6th graders, we decided we'd just have to work around that. On the ride to New York, me, my friend Olivia, and my friend Devin decided we were going to leave the group and do whatever we wanted. Our class was pretty big, almost 60 of us because they put 5th, 6th, and 7th graders together, so we thought if we weren't gone too long, nobody would notice. We had brought money and we had planned on buying tons of stuff, because even though we were a big class, we lived in a small town with only a couple of stores. Olivia loved shopping, and she had actually researched the area we were going to be around and picked out all the good stores. She even made us a little map. She was good at that kind of stuff. Anyways, when we got to New York, Devin chickened out because his parents were pretty strict and he didn't want to get his phone taken away again. Olivia and I just decided that he could just give us some money and we'd buy his stuff for him. So we did that, and after they herded everyone off the bus, we kind of lingered back. We were right about them being distracted by everyone else because we got away no problem. Olivia's map worked out pretty good and we were gone probably around 10 or 20 minutes before things started getting crazy. We had just left the store and Olivia was carrying her shopping bags when this guy noticed us. It probably wasn't hard to pick us out. Two little 6th graders walking around alone carrying a ton of clothes. He started calling out to us, saying how he could buy us more clothes, all the jewelry we wanted and if only we would just come with him. We didn't believe him, of course. We just kept walking, heading on to the next store. Only this guy wouldn't stop talking. He started following us now, and getting kind of angry that we wouldn't answer him. I told him to buzz off because I thought that he would take a hint. There were tons of people around, and we figured he couldn't really kidnap us in front of 200 people. But he kept following us, and he started getting a lot closer. He had probably been 30 or 40 yards back, where we could barely see him over the people, but now he was only 15 or 20 feet. And that's when we started panicking, because God, there's a potential kidnapper after us, and we had no idea where the group was. We decided to split off from the sidewalk and head down into some alley because we figured people would call out the guy if he started following us. But of course, it was New York, and everybody else was wrapped up in their own little problems. So now we're walking down this dark alley and this guy is still after us. He fell a little back, probably back to about 30 feet now, but now he's not pretending to be a good guy. He's talking about how he's going to kill us and how they're never going to find our bodies and how much fun he's going to have with us and he's smiling this deranged grin the whole time. We're both on the verge of tears now because we figured this sociopath is about to have his way with us. Olivia just decides to drop her stuff and yells run, so we both start booking it and we're probably around halfway through this alley. 
but then she turns around and she screams. So I turn around and I see this psychopath is now running after us too, and he has a knife. We're both screaming now, and I'm running faster than I ever have before, and we just run out of the alley back into this crowd of people. And as we try to get into this group of people to make sure this guy can't stab us to death, I turn around and he's just standing back in the alley, smiling. And I turn back around and this random lady is asking us what's wrong because we're both sobbing and Olivia's dress is ripped and I'm bleeding because my arms scrape the wall and we're crying so hard we can barely talk. As soon as we can actually manage to talk we tell her about our school and she looks it up and calls them and we somehow manage to find our group again. We're both forced to stay right next to the teacher because they don't trust us anymore and I honestly don't blame them. We didn't even tell them about the man though. And as soon as I get home, I'm grounded and my phone is taken away. But still, nobody but me and Olivia knows about that man. School ends a couple of days later and I get my phone back, so I text Olivia and she sends me a picture of our class in front of some important building and says, look in the bottom left corner. And that man is in it. Mostly hidden behind some wall, but you can still see his face, smiling that deranged grin for the camera. We never really talked about the man again. I didn't want to bring it up and Olivia didn't either. I'm terrified of cities now. I like to stick to a couple of towns near me and that's it. There's a much lower chance of running into any psychopaths. This happened to me when I was in first grade, so about six or seven years old. I'm now in my mid-twenties. Every year, the first graders take a trip to the zoo about an hour away from her town. I was a shy little girl, so I spent most of the bus ride staring out the window while the other kids were busy conversing with each other. A jeep pulls up where I have a clear look into the vehicle and at the driver. We were on the interstate. I am seeing him playing with something under his shirt, all the while looking at me and then back at the road, back at me and so forth, one hand on the wheel and the other fiddling with whatever was under his shirt. I couldn't keep my eyes off of him fascinated about what he was hiding. Then he lifted his shirt. And yep, I got a good look at what he was playing with the whole time. He freaking waved at me. Granted, I was a little girl and had never seen one before, nor did I understand why he was doing what he was doing. A girl that was near me asked what I was looking at, and then she got to see for herself. She started hollering, and I swear to God, all the kids on the bus ran to the window to see what was going on. The jeep gunned off, and I'm sure it got off the next exit. I remember telling my mom about it when I got home, but then I just sort of blocked it out of my mind. It was only several years later when I had two daughters of my own that I recalled this event, and just last night I was talking to my mom about it, wishing that I had been more mature and had thought to get his license plate number or something. All I remember is that it was a jeep or SUV of some type and some middle-aged white guy. I just hope and pray to God that I, nor any other child in their life, ever has to go through or see something like that again. When I was in high school, my two closest friends were Colin and Eric. They were both tallish, skinny guys. I was a small young woman who, as a 16-year-old, could pass for 13. One night we went for a walk. Well, I was walking and the two guys were rollerblading slowly along. To get to my home, we went through the middle school parking lot. The lot was at the front of the school and a row of trees separated the lot and the road. Just as we entered the lot, conversation broke as Eric and Colin decided to race to the end. They took off. As I was walking, a car pulled into the lot and slowly drove up beside me. It was about 10 o'clock at night, but the lights on the front of the school meant I could see the car pretty clearly. It was navy blue and its black windows were tinted dark. There were no decals or anything on it. Nothing that said security or neighborhood watch. The driver was a Caucasian man, probably in his late 20s. He didn't look overweight, but his face was wide and looked a bit swollen or something. He was wearing a red shirt, no uniform. He rolled down his window and spoke to me. Hey, you're not allowed to be here, you're trespassing. I was confused. I stopped walking and took a small step toward the car to hear him better. Uh, par pardon me? I'm going to have to take you downtown, get in the car. Now, it was pretty clear this guy wasn't security or a cop, 
so I immediately put more distance between myself and the car. In a loud, firm voice, I said, No. The driver looked confused at that. I glanced towards the end of the parking lot. Eric and Colin had seen the car and were skating back quickly. He tried again. You're in a lot of trouble. Get in the car. No. At that moment, Colin and Eric reached me. I think one of them asked the driver who he is. The guy didn't say a word and just pulled away quickly. We all three discussed how creepy that was as we continued our walk. When I got home and said goodbye to the guys, I went inside and told my mom about the incident. She thought I was overreacting. I found the non-emergency number for police and gave them a call. They told me that the middle school did have a security officer there, that there was no reason that he would have had any right to ask me to get inside of his car. I have grapheme to color synesthesia, which gives me a very good memory for numbers and letters. I remembered the driver's license plate and told the police, but I'm not sure if anything came of it. I moved into a large studio apartment complex a few months ago. I am a single female with a two-year-old daughter. My sister and a few of her friends came over about three weeks ago to hang out, have some beers, and play cards against humanity. My studio has an enclosed patio, save for a door size opening, no gate or door. Since my child was sleeping, I had everyone chill outside on the patio. We were having a great time, joking, talking, and listening to low-playing music when the security guard entered my patio. Hi there, uh, are we being too loud? Has someone placed a complaint? No, no, you guys are fine, just doing my rounds. He lingered for a minute more, then strolled out into the night. We continued our activities and didn't really give him a second thought. He returned about 25 minutes later, right after most of the group had left. Only my sister, her friend Cody, and I remained. He was an overweight, late 40s to early 50s white male and wore glasses. He strolls into my patio once again and strikes up conversation. We learned he is a retired cop that had quit the force after suffering a heart attack on duty. He states he had to undergo a quintuple bypass surgery and after recovery, he started night security jobs. I felt sorry for him because of his medical history and sat and listened to him for quite a while. He must have stayed at least 30 minutes before my sister got uncomfortable and loudly announced that we were going to bed. He bid us good night and left. Once again, my sister said that she didn't like the way that he was looking at me and she thought that he took a liking to me. I initially told her she was reading into it too much and that the dude was just lonely and had a long shift ahead. A week and a half later, my sister is visiting again and we are sitting inside my place talking. My studio has a black screen door, which is visible to see through, and a wood door. I had the screen locked and the wood door wide open to let some air in. My sister is talking to me and I have the sensation that someone is looking at me, so I glance up. The security guard is standing at the doorway of my patio, staring. I say hello and he jerks forward, as if expecting an invitation in or something. But I turn my attention back to my sister, and when I glance back again, he's gone. This week on Tuesday, I took a shower and threw on my red silk Japanese-style robe. I was washing dishes for about 25 minutes and had poured a glass of wine. I turned from the kitchen to sit on my couch, and I strangled a scream. The security guard is almost pressed up against my screen door, staring straight at me through the foot-long crack of the wooden door. I was so startled and shaken, but... The first thing I did was make sure my robe wasn't exposing me. I ran up to the screen. You, what are you doing? You scared me. No emotion and no apology. I was just doing my rounds. My scalp is crawling and I'm still shaky. Okay, well, I'm going to bed now. He is still right up next to the screen door, all the way inside my patio and turns and looks at my beach cruiser parked against the wall. Oh, you have a bike? You should put that inside because someone could take it. Yeah, I'll get to it. I pretty much slam the door shut and lock the door. I sit down with the wine and calm my nerves. I was shaken up but wasn't sure if he really was being a creeper or just a lonely individual that was looking for someone that had expressed interest. After a debate with my friends and sister, I contacted the property manager. I was actually surprised at how quickly it escalated. They took my verbal incident report over the phone and just informed me today that the guy has been fired. 
The property manager told me to call the police if I see him on my premises again. I grew up in a very small town in Montana. During Halloween one year, my brother and I sold lemonade by the side of the road because it was unusually hot that year. We didn't make a lot of money, but we did have a lot of fun selling lemonade to people who were passing by. So my brother and I were standing at our lemonade stand when we noticed an old rusty car pass by us two or three times. At the time, it struck me as a little creepy. Eventually, the car slowed down and stopped right in front of the stand. There was a woman in the passenger seat and she rolled her window down. I saw she was really skinny with gray hair and it was stained and silky. It looked like it was nasty, honestly. I couldn't see the man who was driving very well because he never looked at me. He just stared straight ahead. Both of them seemed very odd and their clothes were old and dirty. The lady smiled. You boys out here selling lemonade all by yourselves? Asked the woman. Yeah, my mom lets us, I replied. Is your mom home? She asked. Yeah, she's in the house, I said. The woman turned and looked at the man who was driving. He nodded, still staring straight ahead. The woman turned back to me and said, Okay, I'll have some lemonade. That'll be 25 cents, I said as I poured her glass. She rummaged around in her purse and I could hear coins clinking. Then she put out a $5 bill and held it to me. A chill went down my spine. Why was she handing me a $5 bill if she had coins in her purse? Something just didn't feel right. So I lied and said I don't have any change. She said you can keep the change. Just come and take the $5. Something felt very wrong, but $5 was a lot to me at the time. I walked up to the car and reached out to take the $5 from her hand. As soon as my fingers touched it, the woman suddenly grabbed me by my wrist and began pulling me into the car. I screamed so loud my brother ran to the house yelling for help. The man floored the accelerator and the car lurched forward. I fought with all my might and managed to wrench myself free from her grasp. The car stopped and the man got out, but I was already running for my life. My brother was pounding on the door and screaming. My mother rushed out and turned just in time to see the rusty old car speeding away. We told my mom what had happened and she called the police. When my brother and I calmed down and went back to the lemonade stand, there was a $5 bill lying on the ground. We packed up the lemonade stand and put it away for good. The year was 2018. I love Halloween more than most. As a child, I loved it. As an adult, even more. In 2015, I started to go trick-or-treating again in my neighborhood. As a short adult, and using a concealing costume, I'm a woman. I was able to do it year after year without incident, until 2018. That year, I used my favorite costume, a homemade zombie outfit with a skull mask. For the record, by this time I was over 30, but trick-or-treating was fun for me. My childhood neighborhood was too rough to trick-or-treat in. Anyway, I've been out for over two hours going house to house, getting lots of goodies. By this time, I was sweating pretty heavily, forcing me to pause and dry under my mask occasionally. Soon, I rounded a street corner and passed a man walking two dogs. The street was clear and many houses were unlit. I took a few steps forward and paused. Suddenly, standing in a house's pathway was an old lady. Where exactly did she come from? She wasn't there before. She looked to be in her mid-70s, with white hair, a sweater, a skirt, low-heeled shoes. She smiled as she approached me, standing in front of me. She said, hello, dear. Are you out trick-or-treating? Come with me and I'll get you some candy. I said to her, thank you, but I don't have to. She chuckled warmly like I said something funny. Nonsense. Come with me and we'll get you some candy, sweetie. For some reason, I decided to follow her. As we walked together, I suddenly realized something. My shoes made noise as we walked. 
while hers didn't make any noise. Two houses down, she paused and said, go on, dear. I'll wait here for you. I did the trick-or-treat routine, then turned to thank her. I froze in shock. The old woman was no longer standing there. There's no way she could have left without me hearing her. I asked the man in the doorway if he'd seen her. Puzzled, he asked, her, you came alone. There's no one with you. Confused, I said, I must have been seeing things. I walked home wondering what had happened. After 10 minutes, I stopped in my tracks and chuckled to myself, saying to myself, holy crap, I just saw a ghost. My name is Brent and this happened when I was 11 years old, when I lived in a somewhat sketchy neighborhood. This took place on Halloween with a friend of mine named Carlos. Me and Carlos were best friends since the second grade, and there was a two-story house rumored to be hunted near us. We decided that it would be a good idea to test out the rumor, which had seemed obviously fake to us at the time, or so we thought it had been fake. We went trick-or-treating and then left our candy at my friend Carlos's house. It was close to midnight, which was the time we intended to be at the house to make things a little scarier due to the fact that we love horror movies. It took us a while to get to the house as it was a few houses away and it was the second to the last house on the street. As we arrived at the house at around 11.56, me and my friend Carlos then thought it would be a good idea to trick or treat here so we rung the doorbell. A man which looked to be in his mid-thirties dressed with a hoodie and ripped jeans answered the door almost right away. My friend then mentioned the rumor of his house being hunted. We laughed it out, and he used the poor excuse which we bought at the time, which was that he was a very messy and unorganized man. He then said, you kids are almost a little late for Halloween. It's going to end in two minutes. It's almost 12 a.m. He said the candy was in the room and he offered us to come in. Us being really anxious at the time, took the offer to not be rude. We sat in the living room on the couch, waiting for the man as he went upstairs. Carlos's mom then texted him to ask if we were going to have a sleepover that night, which he replied with yes. As the man was coming back, he insisted on us going upstairs because he had Reese's, which was my favorite candy at the time. So me being a pretty mindless 11 year old, I took the offer. As we went upstairs and into his hardly lit up room, it appeared as if the man collected knives. We saw it as a pretty cool hobby and the man gave us each two Reese's chocolates. We then thanked the man. As we were going downstairs, my friend Carlos fell down the stairs screaming in pain. I turned around and the man was holding what appeared to be a red knife, which was probably one of the ones from his collection. My fight or flight was immediately activated and I punched the man in the face. He stabs my leg, but I managed to hold on in pain and knock him out with five punches. I take the knife out of my leg and start limping away holding Carlos, and we get out. I call the police and they arrest the man a while after he wakes up. The ambulance takes me and Carlos to the hospital. I was fine after two days, but Carlos was apparently stabbed twice in the back and was bleeding out. He took about a week or two in the hospital to recover. A while after getting out of the hospital, the police told us about the man's past. He was a registered sex offender. I never again went inside a stranger's house, and to this day I fear what could have happened if I was not able to hold on in pain from being stabbed. On Halloween when I was in the fourth grade, I stayed home sick from school. I was lying on the couch watching Hocus Pocus when I heard the doorbell ringing. It was the postman. He told me I had a package to deliver, but it was so big that he needed me to help him carry it in. I don't know why, but I knew something wasn't right. I didn't see his truck parked out front. And when I asked him where it was, he told me it was around the corner. I asked him why the regular postman wasn't here. And he said he was visiting family. He kept telling me to open the front door. I said I was sick and I wasn't allowed to leave the house. I told him my parents would pick up the package from the post office, but he said that would be too much hassle and told me my mom would want me to take the package now. I told him I had to get my shoes first and then I would come out and help him. 
Then I closed the front door, locked it, and ran to the back door and locked that one too. I called our neighbor who was a close family friend and begged her to come over to my house right now. Then I stood at the front window and stared at the man. When he saw me, he yelled through the door asking if I found my shoes yet. I yelled back, telling him that I called my neighbor to come and help carry the package because she was older and stronger. At that point, he just turned around and ran off. They never caught the guy, and I always wonder if he ever managed to trick some other kid. The story took place about a year ago. Me and my three friends, Saul, Fernando, and AJ, decided to take a trip to Universal Studios for the yearly event, Halloween Horror Nights event. The trip to our destination was not too long, so we got there in about two hours or so. When we got there, it was full of guests, but we managed to enjoy the rest of the day and got to go through different attractions and mazes. The theme park was set to close at 2 a.m., so we started heading back to our town. We took the ramp to the freeway and began our way back once again. I was so tired from walking all day, we were all falling asleep, except for my friend Fernando, of course. He was the driver. One hour on the road and we decided to stop at a nearby Denny's off the freeway. We went inside, ordered food and ate. It was all normal once again. A few guests were still eating too, and it was almost 3 a.m. We finished our meals, paid, and went out the door to the parking lot. As we stepped outside, I noticed a strange man standing next to a car across from ours. He just looked like he was staring blankly at us. From what I could see was that he was wearing a trench coat. As we were about to get into the car, the man started walking slowly toward us. And there I could notice a long scar across his face. Suddenly, my friend saw asked the man, Yo, did you lose something? The stranger stood there with an evil-like smile and slowly started taking a knife out of his pocket. We all hurried back into the car and told our friend Fernando to floor it. As we were exiting the parking lot, I turned my head back and noticed that the guy was still standing there waving his knife at us. I'm just thankful that this story didn't end up worse, because God knows what plans that man had. Honestly, that was just a weird experience. My name is Eric and this happened to me when I was around seven or eight years old. One summer, my dad took me to a campsite for a long weekend. When we arrived, there were some kids around my age playing in a small park. I looked at my dad and he said, go ahead. So my dad unpacked the car and I went to maybe make some friends. There were two boys in a small park. I said hello and they said hello back. Their names were Kevin and Graham. Graham had to go shortly after because his parents were calling for him. So Kevin and I hung around and we talked about things we liked and how long we were staying at the campsite. After about an hour, Kevin's mom was calling for him, so we had to leave. I was about to head back to my dad when a boy appeared from the woods. He said hello. I said hi back. He introduced himself as Daniel. He seemed like a nice kid and we got along pretty well. He asked me if I wanted to play hide and seek, so I said yes. We played hide and seek at the campsite for maybe 45 minutes until I told him I had to go, so I went back to my dad and went to the camper. I told my dad I had made some friends, and my dad asked where their campers were. I told him where Kevin and Graham's were, but I never asked where Daniel was. I thought maybe, well, I'll see him the next day and I'll ask him then. So the next day I went outside to see if any of the kids wanted to play. Kevin and Graham were both unavailable. I was about to just return back to my camp room when Daniel appeared out of nowhere, out the woods. We greeted each other and I asked him if he wanted to play hide and seek again. He said, yeah, but he said, we should play at his house. I asked him where his house was. He told me it's not far, it's just through the woods. I followed Daniel in the woods toward his house. We were walking for ages and one thing that I found unusual was, the more we walked, the less talkative and distant Daniel became. Eventually, we exited the woods, and Daniel said, here we are. He pointed at a rundown old house with a white van parked beside it. 
He started walking toward it. I slowly followed and asked Daniel, So this is your house? He replied by saying, Yeah, let's go play hide and seek. I got this bad feeling. And it became worse the closer we got to the house. It didn't look like a normal house. I started to notice that there were people standing by the windows inside the house. I asked Daniel if that was his dad in the window. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about him. He's harmless. And just continued walking. I don't know what it was, but something made me slow down. Daniel was by the front door at this point. And when he turned around, asked me if I was coming. I told him I had to go. I turned around and ran through the forest and back to my camper. I spent the next few hours watching TV. Then I got bored and decided to go back outside. I knocked on Graham's door, but he wasn't available. I knocked on Kevin's door and his dad told me he was already out with some boy named Daniel. So I went back to the camper and did something else with my time. Late that night, there was a knock on our door. It was Kevin's parents. They asked if we had seen Kevin anywhere, as he's been gone for hours. I asked his mom if she had checked Daniel's house, and she said no because she didn't know where Daniel lived. I showed Kevin's parents along with my dad and a few other people through the woods to Daniel's house. When we got there, the van was gone. And when we knocked on the door, there was no answer. And the whole house was empty and abandoned. We didn't find Kevin for the rest of our time at the campsite and he's still missing to this day as far as I know. I thought then, and still think today, that Daniel was some kind of bait to lure kids in the same age as him to be kidnapped. And I'm thankful my gut sensed danger and told me to leave. My name is Jack, and growing up, my younger brother and I, who's two years younger than me, had a complicated and somewhat difficult childhood. I won't go too much into details, private and personal, but... There were a lot of occasions where my brother and I, whose name is Brian, would move around the country a lot and live with different relatives and sometimes friends. This one time, I think I was about 10 and Brian was 8. Our dad was driving us across the country for a reason I can't remember. I don't know what time it was, but I know it was dark and late. When we finally stopped for the night at a motel, it was even darker. After checking into our room, which was on the ground floor, our dad said he was leaving to do something and he'll be back soon. He said he'll bring back a pizza and told us to not leave the room. There was nothing to do in our room and we didn't know how to work the TV, so I suggested that we play hide and seek. Brian was to be the seeker. I left the room and ran upstairs to the floor above us, around the corner behind an ice machine and waited. I had a clear view over the motel and could see Brian looking around for me. I remember standing behind the ice machine giggling and watching my brother walk around the motel in the pool area looking for me. Then the door behind me slowly creaked open revealing a large man that looked to be in his late 40s, had a dirty white tank top on, and he seemed overweight. He asked me in a friendly voice what I was doing. I told him I was just playing hide and seek. He then asked me if I was playing with my parents. I told him no, just my younger brother. At this point, Brian was upstairs and found me talking to the man. The man asked if our parents knew we were playing hide and seek. Brian spoke up and said, no, our dad left us. The man then asked Brian and I if we wanted to come inside to watch cartoons, and he had some cookies and milkshakes for us as well. Me and Brian looked at each other and then looked back at the man and said, okay. And we entered the man's motel room. We sat down on the bed and the man turned the TV on and he put on some cartoons. I can't remember what cartoons it was though. He then said he would be right back and was going to get our milkshakes and cookies. The man went into the bathroom. I got up and I took a look into the bathroom to see what the man was doing. I was confused at why he didn't go in the kitchen. He had two glasses of water and then put a little bit of white powder in each glass. Thinking at the time it was just the ingredients to make a milkshake. I sat back down on the bed. When the man finally came out of the bathroom, he handed me and Brian a glass each. He said, here's your milkshakes. It didn't look like milkshakes at all. At least not one that I've ever had. It looked like it was just water with white powder floating around. I suddenly had this bad feeling in the pit of my stomach telling me I was definitely in danger and we needed to leave. 
Brian was about to take a sip of his drink. I stopped him, and the man was still watching us, just silent. Out of nowhere, the man just asked us, what's wrong? Drink your milkshake. This time in a much less friendlier tone than he had been speaking to us before. I looked at the man, and he was looking at me, waiting for me to speak. I then said, we always eat cookies first before we drink our milkshakes. The man let out an irritated sigh and went back into the bathroom. I put the glass down on the floor and quietly did the same with Brian's. I grabbed Brian's arm and quickly exited the man's room. We ran around the corner and down the stairs into our motel room. I turned out the lights and I kept watch out the window. After about five minutes, the man came down the stairs and started his car. I was feeling a bit of a relief, thinking he was just about to leave the motel. But he got out of the car and looked directly at the window I was looking through and started approaching our room. I remember panicking at the moment, thinking that the man was about to take us. He was getting closer to our door when our dad pulled up and asked the guy what he was doing. The man didn't say anything and just walked away and went to his car and drove off. We never saw him again. When our dad asked us who that man was, we told him we didn't know. Brian and I never spoke about this incident again to anyone. I sometimes have nightmares about if we did drink that man's drink and what would have happened to us if we did or if our dad didn't come back in time. When my grandfather was younger, he became the principal of an elementary school. He was in his late 20s, early 30s at the time, and despite being young, he was a born leader. He was a great principal and everyone loved him. I can attest to that as I attended multiple award ceremonies for him and the respect and admiration he received was crazy. There was a young boy at the school who was having behavioral issues in class, and my grandfather saw that the kid didn't have a lot of parental support. So he called in his father and had talked with him about spending more time with his son in just a general parenting session. It turned out that all the boy needed was his dad's attention and after a few weeks he was a happy model student. Whenever my grandfather would leave school late, he would see the dad was playing basketball with his son after he got home from work. It was one of those moments that he took pride in, being able to make a difference in people's lives. However, not everything had such an easy solution, and my grandfather found himself having to deal with an employee, Stanley the janitor, who was showing up to work drunk. Stanley was an alcoholic, with a mean streak, and my grandfather tried on multiple occasions to deal with his behavior. Finally, one day Stanley showed up so drunk that my grandfather sent him home and called the superintendent to let him know he was going to be firing him the next morning after he sobered up. He then warned them to let him deal with it when Stanley was sober, because he was not a stable person. As it goes in these kinds of stories, the superintendent was furious and decided that he was going to call Stanley himself and fire him despite my grandfather's warning. No one called my grandfather to tell him about it either, so he was completely in the dark and thought he could deal with it in the morning. Stanley was furious and went to the school that evening. He searched the offices, my grandfather's included, and tore things apart until he finally had what he wanted. He was in a blaze of fury and on his way out, he saw the father and his son playing basketball. He walked towards them and pulled something out of his trousers. It was a gun. He then proceeded to shoot the little boy killing him instantly. The father was so upset, was hysterically crying but somehow managed to get the gun away from Stanley and shoot him. My grandfather was called to the elementary school immediately by the police because there were two dead bodies. The little boy and Stanley were dead. What was even worse was the crying from the father and him saying that he couldn't save his son. It was clear that he could never forgive himself for that day. My grandfather was pulled aside by one of the police who would search Stanley for evidence. They had found a list, a hit list of people that he was going to kill and all the addresses of those people that he had retrieved when he searched the offices. My grandfather was number one on that list. So, 
If it weren't for that father, it's likely that I would never been able to meet my grandfather and possibly my mother and grandmother would have been killed if Stanley had been able to complete his mission. To this day, I get goosebumps whenever I hear that story and it's just so chilling. My grandfather never uttered a single word about this after his initial recount and my mother made me swear to never tell him I knew. He carried the weight of that boy's death on him until the day he died. So, when I was young, I went to that one house in the town where the residents went all out and probably spent thousands of dollars getting the place perfect for Halloween. Now, this place was insanely well done, and I mean really freaking good. Albeit, even as an adult, it competed with professional haunted houses. I believe the year was either 1999 or 2000 because I went as Darth Maul. I remember being literally scared out of my mind the previous few years and I hoped my badass character would provide me with some sort of courage. They blocked off the scene with a black tarp and had everything you could ever want to see at such a house. A psycho shower scene with a zombie crawling out of a toilet, ghouls and imps climbing the tree, blood, gore, strobes, fog, everything. I remember feeling terrified, even with my double lightsaber. Even though I was scared to death to walk through it, I always admired the workmanship as I knew that the props they had were either really expensive or took some good effort to make. To this day, I've never seen a better yard than that. As always, every year, I saw the house owners sitting on their porch reveling in the terror they brought to the neighborhood and handing out candy. So, I nervously crossed the yard past flying banshees and impaled corpses. I noticed the main attraction at the end of the line. There, on what I guess was probably the driveway, was the bottomless pit attraction. The illusion bewildered and chilled me, and though it was only lit by the lone light bulb, it made the box glow like a low burning furnace. I must have stared at it for a while, when I suddenly heard a cough and a low hushed voice to my right. I don't really remember what was said, but I want to say it sounded something like, hey check this out, or hey I want to show you something, in a gruff and horsey kind of tone. I looked over, and at first saw nothing but the wide gate to what was clearly the side of the owner's house. There was just a faint amount of light from the glowing pit to illuminate the outlines of the gated fence. After adjusting my eyes, I noticed a figure standing completely still. In fact, it was so still, I remember thinking it was just another static prop. My young mind just didn't register a lot of this, and was still looking for the voice I heard, not realizing it had come from the figure who I could still only barely make out. After a few moments, I heard the voice again. I realized it had come from the figure and began to approach it. This was obviously a stupid idea, but in comparison to everything else that was happening around me, this figure seemed anything but imposing. So I cautiously approached the figure, trying to make sense of it. Suddenly, the figure began to move, and consequently, I froze solid. The light from the amber glow lit up its face just enough for me to make out its features. This I do remember clearly. It was a scraggly and rough looking man with a coarse grey beard and yellowed teeth. His weathered and tattered clothing looked like it hadn't been cleaned in ages. He was smiling at me, though I had no idea why, but it unsettled me greatly under the hellish glow of the light bulb behind me. It all felt wrong. It was as if at that moment I had acquired some clarity and realized his presence here obviously was not part of the show. And considering I already also saw the owners, he clearly did not belong on the property. I screamed and ran out of there as fast as I could to the exit, not looking behind for a second. I probably got a few looks from the other kids around us, but as soon as I found my parents waiting outside, I told them about the man I saw. I saw one of the owners approach and ask if everything was alright. I said something like, I didn't like the old man by the gate. He looked at me for a second and went, what man? I never went back there ever again. Number two. Several years ago, right before I was about to leave for trick-or-treating on Halloween, I got into a fight with my mum. I had told her I was going to pick up a friend and go out with that friend, 
but my mum insisted I had an adult with me. I raged, thinking it would be too embarrassing to have to follow around an adult like a child. I was old enough to look after myself, or at least I thought so. After the episode with my mum, I ran to my room, enraged that she would do that to me. However, instead of obeying her, I devised a plan to get what I wanted. My younger brother and sister were going to go trick-or-treating with my mum and my mum's friend and her son. I decided that I would tell my mum I was sorry for lashing out and that I was going to stay home and pass out candy. Then, after she left with my siblings, I was going to go out like I had planned. I had planned it perfectly too. I knew what time they were going to come back home. I knew what route they were going to take and I congratulated myself for my cunning plan. After my family left, I got together my costume. I was going as a gangster, which was probably the worst thing I could have done, but I was blinded by my excitement to realize my mistake. My mind went wild with all the things I could do now that my parents were gone. I could really live. I got so deep into this idea of being on my own that I decided I was going to trick or treat on my own and called my friend to tell her I was cancelling. Another huge mistake. I left the house with quite a bit of confidence in myself. The first street I went down went great. I got loads of candy and was having a great time. Once again, my excitement and confidence blinded me from the strange looks I got from being alone. I turned left down another street, my pride building with every step. I was almost at the end of the street, thinking of ways to explain all the candy I'd got to my parents, when I realized I was being followed. By the time I had come to this realization, I was at the section of the street where it was kind of out in the open, no trees between the sidewalk and the road, and I didn't see any other kids near me. There was a car, and quite a trashy one at that, following a few feet behind me. All my confidence had vanished and my hair stood on end. I glanced behind myself at the car and all the windows were down and three men were in the car, all smoking cigarettes. They were glaring right at me. As soon as I caught their stare, all the warnings my mother had given me about creeps like this hit me in the head. I looked down at my gangster costume and knew I blew it. I looked like a thug. I quickly turned back around and started walking, my heart beating out of my chest. My whole body went numb, and I instantly forgot how to do everything except walk forward. I was at the last house on the street with the car still following close behind, when I made the split decision to turn up the driveway of the last house. Now, the house I turned to was completely abandoned, and had been for years. The windows were boarded up, and the front yard had been scattered in junk. Everyone in the neighborhood knew that the house was abandoned too. The car stopped right in front of the house, and everyone inside the car was just staring directly at me. I walked up to the front porch and turned around, thanking God for the tall bushes blocking the porch from the street and blocking the creeper's view. I stood there for at least a minute, staring right back at them, knowing I wasn't going to make it. My heart thumped out of my chest, and I could hear it ringing in my ears. One of them got out of the car. He stood and looked directly at me through the bushes and into my soul. I stood holding the rusty doorknob, staring right back at him. We must have stood like that for a long ten seconds before the man got back into the car and they peeled down the street. Once they were gone, I ran as fast as I could across the street and up the opposite direction, frantically looking for someone I knew. I spotted my brother's friend and his mother and walked right behind them until they reached my street. I got a few weird looks from my mum, but I really didn't care. I ran up to my house and cried myself to sleep. I still live in the same neighborhood, and every time I pass the abandoned house, I silently thank it for saving my life. I don't know why the creeps didn't come after me, as they likely knew that the house was also abandoned. This upcoming Halloween will be my 40th birthday. And even after nearly 25 years, the terrifying memory of that night has never faded. You see, I lost my virginity in a pumpkin patch on Halloween. I know, cliche. Specifically, I lost it in the bed of a pickup truck while it was parked in the pumpkin patch. To give you an idea, the patch was maybe 80 by 100 feet and fenced off by wire mesh to prevent cows from getting in. 
The truck was parked just inside the only gate. Myself and my date had settled there right before the sun went down. My house was just across the street from the pumpkin patch. We shared a bottle of wine, awkwardly talked for a while, and then got to business. My family had two border collies. And as we were changing positions, the dogs wandered in and started barking at us. My date and I paused and drunkenly, playfully, began throwing scraps of food out into the pumpkins for them to chase. After a couple of minutes of that, we continued where we left off. After we were done, we sat there in the truck and looked up at the stars, while the dogs wandered around sniffing random things. After a short while, I saw my father return home, pulling into the driveway across the street. The dogs bounded out of the patch towards him, and me and my date quickly began to dress ourselves. Once we were fully clothed, we just sat on the tailgate and kept talking as we watched my dad pet the dogs and go into the house. It was about then that we heard it. A rustling sound coming from the patch somewhere behind us. We both paused and turned. At this point, there was only moonlight to illuminate our surroundings, but it was enough. And this is exactly what we saw. A single pumpkin began to rise up out of the patch, but not like someone was lifting it. It was kind of sideways, like it had been resting on its side and was now sitting up. For a split second, I thought someone was rising this pumpkin out of the patch on a stick or a metal bar. But then the stick changed position. It coiled like a snake and then shot straight up, like a man would be if he went from a squatting position to a standing position. I then saw two spindly legs with knee joints protruding from the thing, but no arms. There was a buzzing in my ear, and all of a sudden my date screamed. We both jumped off the truck and booked it out of the patch and sprinted towards my house. I glanced back once, and I'll swear on whatever you want me to swear on. A tall, skeletal figure was leaning over the truck where we had both been sitting, and I caught a glimpse of two beady red eyes staring back at me. We made it to my garage and forced our way through the kitchen door. I began screaming at my dad to get his gun. It wasn't until I saw the blood on the kitchen floor that I realized that my nose had been bleeding. Even more alarming, my date's nose was gushing blood as well. I told my dad that there was someone in the pumpkin patch and he grabbed his gun and power walked out of the house, the dogs following closely behind him. But they stopped halfway there, refusing to come any closer to the pumpkin patch. When my dad returned, he was livid. He wanted to know what had damaged the fence and broke the tailgate off my truck, which technically was his truck. I could only shiver in confusion and abject terror. He reported that something had knocked the tailgate right off the truck and then tore out of the patch from inside and destroyed a huge section of fence. I didn't sleep at all that night. I cowered in terror in the living room with all the lights on. The next day, the police came and examined the scene. The wire fence had been torn out of the ground and dragged a short distance away. There was no clear indication of what specifically had done it. My father and the police were convinced that it was a trespasser pulling a Halloween prank but I never believed that for a moment. I tried to explain that the dogs had been pounding through the patch minutes before the thing had appeared, and neither of them had made a sound to alert us that there was a trespasser nearby. Furthermore, the entry gate to the patch made plenty of noise whenever the wind rattled it. So if someone climbed over it, it would make even more noise, and we had been sitting right by the gate. Another thing that terrified me is the shape of the thing as it stood. Even if it was a trespasser with an elaborate costume, none of that would even begin to explain the tailgate, the destroyed fence, the nosebleeds, and our dogs being too nervous to approach the patch, or the eyes I had caught a glimpse of. My father went to his grave believing that we had been vandalized by trespassers. My date and I concluded later that whatever it was, it hadn't been human or an animal. I don't tell the story often because I mostly get the same Charlie Brown joke. It was the Great Pumpkin. So, no one really takes me seriously.
but I've heard that skinwalkers can take the form of anything that best suits their surroundings. Our property wasn't anywhere near a Native American reservation, but I can't think of anything else it could have been. So what do you think it was? It's been 10 years since I've spoken about this incident. On Halloween of 2009, me and my younger sister along with a couple of friends went out to trick or treat. I was only 8 years old at the time. My younger sister was 5. My best friend's older brother was 17 and it was his responsibility to look after us that night. This took place in London and at the time we hardly had any crimes in our area. The night went off without a hitch and we were all planning on calling it an evening since we had collected enough candy. My best friend's older brother was just about to call my dad, but before he could dial the number, he received a call from my dad. He let him know where to come to pick us up, and after a few minutes, my dad came and collected me and my sister. We said goodbye to our friends and thanked them for the fun evening. As my dad was driving my sister and I back home, he seemed on edge. Now since I was only eight, I kept babbling on about how much candy we had collected and how I couldn't wait to get home to eat them. My dad wasn't listening. He just looked really anxious about something. As soon as we got back home, I entered my house to find my mother, my aunt, and my cousin sitting in the living room. I greeted them and my mother hugged both me and my sister. My dad sat us down and told us that we could never go out trick-or-treating ever again. Now because I was eight, I began throwing a tantrum, complaining how I loved Halloween and my parents were being unfair. My little sister was too young to even care. She was too busy going through the candy that we had collected. So after 2009, me and my sister never went out for Halloween. We didn't bother throwing a tantrum since we knew it would be pointless. However, in 2012, my brother was born, and last year in 2018, he turned six. My father finally relented and agreed to take my little brother and my sister out trick-or-treating. By this time, Halloween had lost its appeal for me, and I didn't want to go out anyway. My little brother gets his way since he's the youngest, and he loves Halloween. I decided to ask my mom why she didn't allow me and my sister to go out on Halloween after 2009. She sighed and explained to me that a boy from our neighborhood had gone out trick-or-treating in the same area. He was with his friends, but had somehow separated from the group. He ended up knocking on the door of an old house that was located at the end of a quiet street. I'll spare you the gory details. But the boy's body was found in that house after several people heard screaming and called the police. The boy's arm had been removed from his body, and he died from blood loss. The police had been going door to door warning parents about what happened, and that's when my dad came and collected us. My mother told me that they arrested an old mentally deranged man in connection with the crime, but Halloween would never be the same again for my neighborhood. I had heard rumors about a boy who was killed on Halloween at my school, but I never took it seriously. I thought it was just a local urban legend. But now I understood why my dad looked so worried that night. The house where the boy was found, which is only a few blocks away from mine, now sits abandoned with its windows boarded up. People around here jokingly refer to it as the Myers House. Halloween is pretty much ruined for me. I'll be staying home again this year. However, my brother, who's now seven, can't wait for Halloween. I just hope my dad keeps a close eye on him. I was around that time in my life where most kids my age would stop trick-or-treating, either because they thought it was lame or because their parents told them to stop. My father and I had a similar conversation, and in the end, we decided that this trick-or-treat would be the final one. So when October 31st came, my dad helped me paint my face to look like a zombie. I figured that this costume should be simple, yet something I liked, so zombie it was. I grabbed an empty pillowcase and headed out, with my parents telling me to be back by 11ish. Before you ask, yes, I was going trick-or-treating by myself. 
I was able to convince my parents that I needed to get as much candy as I could, seeing as how I wouldn't be able to do this again next year. So off I went, running from house to house, shoving candy into my pillowcase as fast as I could. So by the time it got dark, my pillow was about three quarters filled, and I had no intent on slowing down. As I'm about to walk into a new neighborhood, a black van pulls up to the curb and was about a few feet away from me. The door opens, and out of the darkness comes some guy in a hockey mask and tattered jacket, wielding a machete. He turns his head towards me, probably just trying to creep me out. Nice Jason costume, I say, trying to be friendly as I begin to walk past him. Thanks, zombie. You want some candy? I've got bags of them, he says as he pulls out his little white sacks of candy. So, I being the idiot 14 year old I was, opened my pillowcase and let him plop two or three sacks into it. Make sure you eat them real soon, you'll love them, he snickered, which really sent a chill down my spine. He left as quickly as he came, but I just shrugged it off as I needed to finish trick or treating. I continued down the road, again going from house to house for candy. After about the third or fourth house, I noticed something odd. It was the same black van from before. After every house I went to, the van would get closer and closer. At around what I could only guess was 10.30, I headed home with my sack full of candy. As I walked, the area behind me illuminated. I turned around, expecting to see a car that would soon pass me. It was the van, and in the driver's seat was the same guy who had the Jason mask on, the same guy that gave me the candy. My heart stopped, and I broke into a mad dash back to my house, the van easily keeping up with me. I was luckily able to lose him by running into the woods near my house. I exited the woods that lead to the side of my house, and I looked for the fake rock that held the spare key to our house. After I got in, I put my candy on the kitchen table and somehow found a way to go to sleep. The next morning, when I woke up, my parents were sitting at the kitchen table, digging around through the bags of candy that Jason gave me. They started asking me who and where I got the bags from, which started to freak me out. I would later learn that the bags of candy were nothing more than just a bag of prescription drugs. There was a ton of sleeping pills in them, and I finally understood his intentions. He was going to follow me until I fell asleep, and then who knows what with me after he got me in the van. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure whether or not that machete he had was fake or not. The police came up empty handed, so I guess I'll never know his fate. This happened on Halloween of last year. Me and a couple of buddies were out getting candy. Our neighborhood isn't exactly the safest, but it isn't the worst either. About 90 minutes into trick or treating, we see a house with a sign that says go to the van for your candy which had an arrow pointing down to a creepy looking black van. This house was at the end of the street, so if things did go south, it would be easy to get away fast if necessary. We go to the van, and we see a man sitting in the driver's seat. He tells us, Your candy is in the back here. Open up the door and come on in. I know when something is up, and my alarm bells were punching my brain at this point. We all give each other a confused look. Then we ask the man, Why isn't the door already open? And why aren't you out here? Couldn't you have done the same thing with a take one note or something? He just repeats himself, telling us to get into the back of his van for our candy. We say no, and continue on with our trick or treating. About 20 minutes later, we're about two blocks away. We notice a van about halfway down the street behind us. The same black van from before. I tell the others and we agree to haul ass back to my friend's house. Once the van notices us running away, it takes off in the other direction. When we got to our friend's house, we frantically tell our parents about what happened. They called the cops, but as far as I know, they never found the van. We agreed not to trick or treat this year, and decided to just hang out instead. I still wonder what would have happened if we had been stupid enough to enter that van. Number 2 I used to own a small Halloween themed shop that was located downtown in a fairly small city. 
And unlike many businesses in town after Walmart's arrival, my store never really suffered when it came to customers. Of course, it was only open for the month of October. I sold a lot of unique things you might find at other novelty stores in bigger cities, but for cheaper prices. I really didn't do it for profit as much as I did to celebrate the spooky Halloween spirit. I also love to celebrate that spirit by doing the best to scare the crap out of people every Halloween. On one particular Halloween, my chosen victim was my buddy Alex. He was a pretty relaxed and calm guy for most of the time, so he was the perfect person for the plan I had in mind. First, you should know that I always began packing up my store on Halloween, fairly early in the morning, as it was unlikely to get customers on the holiday itself. I told Alex that I had much heavier merchandise that year and could use his help moving it all out. Not knowing what he was getting into, he accepted, and I told him to meet me at the shop around 10 p.m. sharp. As I said, Alex was a very relaxed and calm guy for most of the time. Well, unfortunately for him, he had once told me about his irrational fear of clowns and how he couldn't function around them. So naturally, my plan involved dressing up in a clown costume. When he would arrive at the shop, I would stand perfectly still like a statue. Once he realized he couldn't find me, he would then call me, most likely. But when my phone rang, it would be in the pocket of an apparent clown statue. And when he came over to investigate, I would give him my best scare. Pretty simple plan, right? Everything was set in motion. I dressed up and stood near the back of the store, obscured by some boxes and other decorations, and waited for his arrival. A little after 10, Alex entered. It was very dark, as I made the last minute decision to cut out the lights before he arrived. He called my name a few times, but of course I didn't respond. I heard him walking around a bit, looking around the shop for me. I could barely hold back my laughter. But after more shuffling, I heard Alex speak in a defensive tone. Not funny, dude. I looked around, but there was definitely no way he could see me right now. Even if I had twitched or anything, I continued to play dumb. Come on, man. He repeated again, sounding angrier this time. That's not funny. Confused, I quietly adjusted a nearby stack of boxes so I could peer through the crack towards his voice. I couldn't make out his shape very well but I knew for sure he was not looking in my direction. Suddenly my phone rang. I heard Alex turn towards the sound instantly. I froze, giddy with excitement, that the plan might be working. But as he approached, I realized he wasn't holding his phone. And a wave of disappointment fell over me, as I discovered my prank had been ruined by another caller. Alright, fine, you got me, I announced shortly after the phone stopped ringing taking off my mask and stepping out into the open. But Alex's face didn't look relieved. His face twisted in such horror in a way that I had never seen before. He began yelling and spouting panicked words and I spent the next few minutes trying to get him to calm down. He explained to me that when he entered the store, a man in a clown costume was staring at him and then began slowly walking towards him. But when my phone rang, the man had dashed right out of the store. Alex had no idea that I was actually hiding in the back of the store the whole time. I don't want to think about what could have happened if Alex had showed up late that night, or if my other friend had never called during the prank. Number 3 I'm a police officer. A situation that stands out the most would have to be Halloween of 2001. This particular experience nearly made me take a leave due to the weirdness. So don't say I didn't warn you. It starts off on a regular Halloween patrol. My regular partner was sick, but somehow still managed to attend a party. So I was stuck with a crotchety racist bastard who I didn't like. After about an hour, he says something like, Hey, Spook, what's going on over there? After a brief and angry discourse on nomenclature, we stopped to see what looked like an impromptu costume orgy past a thicket on the side of the road. This was normal for Halloween, 
and was more often than not middle-aged partygoers. The two men were dressed like Mickey Mouse, and the woman was hard to see, but appeared to be dressed as a deer. Normally when I see the old random hump, I let them have the privacy to finish, and then chase them off or arrest them depending on location. This time was disconcerting though. They weren't holding the woman down, but from what I could see she was unresponsive, so we strolled up and tapped on the tree behind them. They didn't stop canoodling, but what we saw made us jump back, and I'm ashamed to admit, I threw up on the spot. This is the part where I say I saw what was the single most awful thing I, and I'm assuming racist asshole as well, have ever seen. It wasn't a deer costume. It was a half-butchered doe, with its intestines strewn about. They were taking turns fucking it, and all they were wearing was Mickey Mouse masks. That was really hard to write because the image is still fresh in my brain, even after all these years. This was just so inhumanly awful that I can't describe it. I might tear up. I'm not kidding. Anyway, we stare completely frozen for about a minute until racist asshole takes out his gun and starts yelling at them. These guys don't pay any attention to us and just keep humping away, covered from the waist down in blood and what appeared to be some solid matter. Finally, my brain kicks in and I tell racist asshole to lower his gun and we both step forward and detain the two men. We call it all in, and we take the two men back to the station. They don't say a damn word the whole way back, but one of them kept chuckling. They tested positive for meth. Big fucking surprise. And they both were very incoherent, even after they came down. I didn't look too much into it, but they apparently were both run-of-the-mill laborers who had gone missing months prior. So that has to be one of the more gruesome things I've ever seen. One of the most visually disturbing anyway. So yeah, happy Halloween. So, I was very young when this happened. So young, in fact, that I don't remember a whole lot. Only bits and pieces. I'd say that I was five or six years old. My parents filled in the gaps for me. So I'm going to tell the whole version of the story, both my parts and theirs. We were living in an old farmhouse at the time. My parents were poor, so they rented from a landlord that owned a few small properties in the area. My dad worked in the steel mill on the midnight shift, so he worked some odd hours. This is relevant, because it might be the only reason that we're still alive, and that I'm able to write this story today. Help! He's going to rape me! Help me! We jolted out of bed and were fully awake in an instant. I was sleeping in my bed with my parents that night because I was having some awful night terrors. My dad, who had just switched from midnight shifts to days, jumped out of bed and cautiously made his way down the stairs, grabbing a stoking pick from the fireplace in the living room. He got to the door when he heard it again. Help! Help! Oh my god, he's coming! The woman's voice on the other side of the door began sobbing hysterically. We have to help her. Open the door, said my mother. My mum is an inherently good woman, who always goes out of her way to help people every single day of her life. She reached out for the deadbolt, but my dad stopped her. He shot her a look, and said cautiously through the door, What's going on? Who's after you, and where is he? The voice through the door responded. I just need to get in before he gets here. Please. Please. More sobs. My father turned on the porch light and said, Stay up on the porch with your back against the door. He then opened the deadbolt, but not the chain lock. He slipped a brick that we used as a doorstop through the crack. Take this, and use it to defend yourself if you need it. I'll be right on the other side of this door, and if he comes after you, I'll come out and help. In the meantime, I'm calling the police. They'll be here soon. This is when the woman starts to absolutely lose her mind. She began slamming her whole body into the door with a mindless fury. What the fuck's wrong with you? Let me in this goddamn house right now! 
What kind of fucking people are you? My dad forced the door shut and clicked the deadbolt home again. He immediately called the police, and they came within ten minutes. When they arrived, the woman was simply gone. The doorstop brick was sitting on one of the porch steps. My parents gave a description of the events and the woman as best they could. We tried our best to get some sleep in the following nights, but my mum and dad checked all of the locks and windows several times throughout the night. I don't remember understanding what happened, but I remember thinking that my parents were acting strange and wondering why they didn't help this woman. I thought the man snuck up and got her while we were calling the police. A few days later, we found out that the police had been called for a similar situation at a different house. My dad's brother-in-law worked in law enforcement and told us that that time, the police happened to have a car down the street and arrived without lights and sirens. The officers saw the woman that my parents had described at the front door on top of the porch. When they began walking up to her, a man dashed out of the bushes from the side of the porch. They chased him down pretty quickly, and recovered a long kitchen knife from the bushes where he had been hiding. The man and the woman had been working together to try to gain entry to houses. The police surmised that the woman would get people to open their doors and let her in, and then she would let her partner in. God only knows what they would have done once they got inside. Once I heard this story, and put it together with my memories of the event, it sent chills down my spine. Imagine what would have happened if my dad had been working the midnight shifts, or if he had just been asleep. He grew up in a very bad neighborhood, Gary, Indiana, so he was always cautious about people around him. Usually, it was mildly irritating, but that time, it may have saved our lives. Number 2 This happened on a Norwegian peninsula when I was about 15 years old. It must have been 2006, give or take a year. Regardless, it was Halloween night, and I didn't really have any plans. Too old for trick-or-treating, too young for partying. It was a small peninsula anyway, so there wasn't much going on. I was just sat at home, playing RuneScape on my desktop. This continued until sundown. You could say I was mildly addicted to that game. I usually like to play with the lights off. Bad for your eyes, but I like the mood it set. Anyway, it's around 9pm. My mum comes into my room and pats me on the shoulder. Didn't you hear me? I said I'm going out for 20 minutes, she said. I had my noise-cancelling headphones on, so I was oblivious to the fact that she had been shouting to me. She heads downstairs, and I hear the door slam. I put my headphones back on, and sink back into my own little pixelated world. As such, I can't really tell you how much time passed when this happened. When you looked out of my bedroom door, which at the time was wide open, you could see down into the long corridor leading to my mum's room opposite. Since all of the lights were off, I could only really make out the outlines of all the objects, and that was only after my eyes adjusted after looking at the bright computer screen. Until then, it was like looking into a dark void of total blackness. You know when one of your senses has picked up on something that you're not totally conscious of yet, and you feel a little uneasy? Well, that happened to me while I was playing. It felt like someone else was around me. Like that, I'm being watched sensation. I figure my mum came back from wherever she went, and that I just hadn't heard her due to my headphones. But if that was the case, why hadn't she turned the lights on? I looked down into the dark corridor. At the far end, something's glowing. It's large and fluorescent green. It's spherical. Looks like a floating orb of some kind. I freak out and whip off my headphones. After looking at it for a moment, it becomes clear that this isn't an orb at all, or anything supernatural like that. There's two black holes where I should be, and a dark slit for a mouth. 
It's a glow-in-the-dark mask, and it's not floating. Someone's wearing it. Whoever it is, he is facing me. I can't make out the rest of their body, but the head is definitely looking in my direction, and is slowly inching closer. It's some sort of distorted, expressionless face. It's hard to describe, but the image of it is burned deep into my memory. Realizing he's been spotted, the guy freezes. We just stare at each other for what felt like the longest time. He raises a finger up to the lips of his mask. Shh. I'm just a trick-or-treater. It's a thick, manly voice. One I didn't recognize. In a state of shock, and not really knowing how to react, I just sit there, keeping my eyes on him. So, trick or treat. I mumble out, neither. Please go now. But he doesn't go. The glowing face starts moving towards me. Desperate to keep him out of my bedroom, I leap up and slam my door closed locking it and pressing the full weight of my body against it. The guy is just outside my door. I can hear his deep breaths on the other side. He tries the door handle. It rattles. More heavy breaths. He tries the handle again. Then I can hear quick footsteps moving down the stairs, and what I think is my front door opening and closing. Still in shock. I just sit in my barricaded room, sobbing to myself until my mum finally returns. It felt like forever since I'd last seen her. She asked me what was wrong, why I was crying, and why there was a large hessian sack left in the corridor. I told her what had just happened. She called the police for me immediately. I like to think that this was just a crazy person, and that they didn't really have any intention of harming me. Just some sort of messed up Halloween prank. Whatever the case, it was a surreal experience, and the image of that floating, talking face has haunted me for the longest time. The most unnerving part about this to me, though, is the fact that the peninsula really was very small. For me to see a face around town that I didn't recognize was very rare. More than likely, someone in my family knew who this person was. Hell, I probably knew who it was. I hate to think that after that event, I may very well have interacted with that person. The thought that they specifically targeted me out of everyone in the area made me extremely uncomfortable. I never felt safe there after that. That's part of the reason I moved away when I was 18. It was late October in Sofia, Bulgaria. That year, Halloween fell on a Saturday, and my friend Minchko was throwing a massive shindig at his parents' apartment. Now, this guy was rich by Bulgarian standards, born into money. So when I say apartment, don't think of a typical, grotty Sofian flat. Think more along the lines of one of those unrealistically huge apartments from an American sitcom. His parents had gone away for the weekend to either Spain or Italy or somewhere else suitably warm, and as such, things were set to go wild. When the night finally rolled around, I dressed up in my zombie costume and set out to meet some friends. Minchko's invitation said that the party started at 8, so naturally, me and my group of chums didn't plan to arrive until 10. Gotta be fashionable. When we did arrive, most of the guests were already pretty drunk. The vodka was flowing freely, put it like that. They had a massive punch bowl, which was probably only 10% juice knowing Minchko. Some of us had a few midterm exams coming up, so we didn't want to go too wild. We just had a few beers, while everyone else pigged out on punch. Other than the people on my course, there was one other guy who wasn't really drinking that night. Some dude in a wolfman mask, who was just hanging around the punch bowl. He didn't seem to know anybody at the party, and was keeping to himself. Looked a little awkward, to be honest. The friendly half of me wanted to introduce myself, invite him to hang out with me and my friends. My socially anxious other half, however, decided against that. 
The night goes on, and one of the partiers starts to complain about having stomach pain. I figure he's overdone it. Some guys really can't handle their alcohol. He makes his way to the bathroom and starts vomiting. Not long afterwards, another guest starts complaining about the same problem. And then another, and another. Eventually, a dozen or so people are grabbing their stomachs in pain. Things start to seem serious, with some people even vomiting on the living room floor. A little worried, someone calls for medical assistance. At the hospital, things turned out not to be an extreme instance of alcohol poisoning. Instead, we found out that the punch bowl contained a secret ingredient that someone had slipped in. It had been laced with rat poison. Thankfully, the dosage wasn't high enough to kill anyone immediately, but without treatment, the amount could have been fatal within a few hours. At a party full of drunk people, it was totally possible that no one would have been sober enough to react appropriately and call an ambulance. Somebody also could have easily passed out, not realizing that they'd been poisoned. Thankfully, though many were hospitalized, nobody ended up with any prolonged health issues. When we were questioned about what we all knew, the guy in the wolf mask came into my mind. He had been hanging around the punch bowl. I mentioned it to the police, and said that one of the other guests must have known who he was. Talking to my friends about it afterwards though, it seemed like nobody did know who he was. Everybody assumed that he was a friend of somebody else's, and didn't bother to question his attendance. As far as anybody could remember, nobody talked to him. Nobody saw him without his mask on, and nobody even remembered who he turned up with, or even when he arrived at all. He had just slipped in unnoticed. To begin with, the police investigation turned up very little. It seemed as though it was just a one-off incident, some guy wanting to cause harm to a lot of people at once. But people like that rarely try this sort of thing only once. Almost one year later to the day, on the next Halloween weekend, the exact same thing happened at a party in a different part of town. This time, the amount of poison used was increased. Three people almost lost their lives that night, and ten were hospitalized. This time, however, the perpetrator was tackled by another partygoer who realized what he was up to. Under questioning, the police realized that the guy in the wolf mask was obviously a little disturbed in the head. He cited an event known as the Jonestown Massacre as his inspiration behind his actions. Looking into it, it turns out it was an event in the late 70s, where over 300 members of a cult died after being forced to drink from a poisoned punch bowl. This unstable nutjob wanted to pay homage to the largest mass suicide in history. For the first time in my life, I was damn thankful that I had exams coming up. I'm known for going a little bit wild at parties, and for trying to drink everyone under the table. Who's to say I wouldn't have chugged more poison punch than my body could have handled? Whenever Minchko hosts a Halloween party now, he always checks under everyone's mask at the door, just to make sure they're on the guest list. 20 years ago, when I was five going on six, I dressed up as Pennywise the Clown for Halloween. I wore the costume all day due to my school letting us wear them for parties in our classes. When we were dismissed from school, my father met me with a pleasant surprise. He was dressed in a yellow raincoat and had a hat on, and he was Georgie from the movie It. He held my hand as we went to the car, then we drove home. A few hours go by, and my father took me out to go trick-or-treating because my mother wasn't feeling too well. The night went on as scheduled, kids bombarding doors for candy, teenagers scaring each other, and parents losing their kids. Everyone loved our costumes. Again, I was Pennywise the Clown and he was Georgie from the 1990 It. My father held my hand in between each house and waited at the end of each driveway. One house took longer than others, and I remembered that I was very anxious. Once I received my candy, I remember that there were more people than usual, and I had to run through a crowd to get to my father. I reached him, held his hand, and off we went, but it was the opposite direction of where we initially were going. I didn't think anything of it because of how young I was. 
We went down one of the dark back streets where our garbage was picked up for some reason. And we were walking unusually fast. I remember that I said, Daddy. But my father started moving faster and didn't answer me. Then all of a sudden, I heard my name yelled out from about 25 yards behind us. And it was my father's voice. I looked back and it was my father. I looked up at the person that I was walking with and he had on the same costume as my dad, but when I looked closer, I noticed it wasn't him. I looked at my dad and yelled out to him. The man then let me go. And as soon as he saw my father, he started running and my father was running full speed at us. The man took off down the alley, then through a backyard. My father reached me and he was out of breath while he was hugging and kissing me, also asking me if I was okay. My father called the cops and explained to them that he lost track of me in a huge crowd at one of the houses and that there was some sick guy roaming our neighborhood. Once we got home, he told my mother everything that happened. He told her that a crowd gathered and some random guy with some costume, the same as him, walked up to him while I approached the porch. He told her that the guy said I was a cute kid. They wanted to just snatch me up in a joking manner. Then the crowd gathered even more and he lost track of me until he saw us turn the corner onto the back street. And that's when he started to run after us and yell my name. Now looking back, I bet my father was losing his mind and probably wanted to kill that guy when he saw us together. Until this day, I'm grateful that my father found us when he did because who knows what would have happened to me. When I was a kid, I loved Halloween. I went trick-or-treating up until I was 12. My last time going trick-or-treating, I went with my friend Drew. He loved Halloween as much as I did. This Halloween, everyone seemed more wild than usual, but it was Halloween and that's how teenagers act, I guess. We went to a house that had a flashlight lit on the front porch, but no candy. We noticed that everyone stopped at the end of the walkway they kept walking past the house once they noticed that there wasn't any candy. Not us. I told Drew we should check it out. Or she just let these people know to turn her light off because it's confusing people. Approaching the house, we noticed that none of the lights were on in the house. As Drew was set to knock on the door, one of the front windows raised just a little bit. And the blinds moved back about an inch. Drew put his hand down and the both of us looked at the window. Then the voice said, Hey, just come in for the candy. The door opened a bit, and by surprise, Drew walked in like a dummy. I asked him why he was going in, and he said, I want some candy. As he turned to answer me, someone put their hands on his mouth. I immediately ran forward to help him, then I heard multiple voices yelling grab him. The door shut. I could hear wrestling sounds. Drew was fighting these guys. I started yelling, screaming, and banging on the door, but I couldn't get in. I didn't have a cell phone, so I ran down the street asking people to help and that my friend was in trouble. Everyone laughed and were telling me that they're not falling for it. I got a block away and I ran to a police officer. I told him what was going on, but he was very skeptical due to it being Halloween. He put me in his car and I showed him where the house was. As we were pulling up to the house, I saw my friend's body on the front lawn with people just walking past. I started yelling and screaming to the cop that it was my friend and he needs the help. The police officer believed me once we got up to my friend. He was bloody. Luckily, he was alive, but those guys beat him pretty badly. Then they dropped his body and left. The police officer told us that the house was abandoned, and that's why we didn't notice any lights on. My friend is pretty much scarred for life, especially being that people were walking past him as if he were a Halloween ornament and laughing. But luckily, that cop listened to me. And honestly, I haven't celebrated Halloween since. This all happened 28 years ago, when I was eight years old. 
My mother and my father would often take me to visit my grandparents for Halloween. My aunt lived two houses down from my grandparents and I could go trick-or-treating with my cousins. Between my grandparents' place and my aunt's place, there was an old dilapidated house. We always skipped it when we went trick-or-treating Halloween night because the woman who lived there gave us the creeps. She was very big, like a huge woman. She was over six feet tall and wore chains around her neck and heavy work boots. There was obviously something very wrong with her. Whenever we went back and forth between my aunt's place and my grandparents' place, we always had to run past the woman's house because she was always standing at her windows watching us. It was so creepy that we never dared to run past her house alone. Sometimes the big woman would be outside of her house watering the garden or scrubbing the windows. When we ran past, she would shout and yell at us. She would tell us that the devil was coming for us. We told the adults about her, but they just told us to leave her alone and stay away from her. One Halloween, we were going trick-or-treating with my other older cousins. They dared us to go to the big woman's house and knock on her door. I remember being so afraid, but I didn't want to look like a coward, so I agreed. Dressed in our Halloween costumes, we walked up to her driveway and rang the doorbell. Suddenly, there was a lot of banging and slamming noises coming from the house. We were frightened, and I was about to run away when the door creaked open. The woman was standing there in the dim light. She was holding something in her hands, but when we saw what it was, we all ran screaming down the driveway. It looked like a human head. When we got home, we were all shaking and out of breath. Some of the younger kids were crying. The adults asked us what was wrong, and when we told them what we had seen, they just laughed at us, and they didn't take it serious. My grandfather said it was just a Halloween prop, and my grandmother told us we shouldn't be bothering that woman. After we all calmed down, we went outside again and continued trick-or-treating. However, we stayed away from that big woman's house. About a month later, my father got a phone call from my grandparents. They said that the big woman who lived next door had attacked my aunt. My aunt had just came home from shopping. She was carrying her groceries in one arm and she had my baby cousin in her other arm. Just as she got to her front door, the big woman appeared out of nowhere. She had a rope saw and put it around my aunt's neck. My aunt flipped out and immediately dropped the groceries along with my baby cousin. My aunt managed to get her hands around the rope saw. She started kicking her front door with her feet as she struggled. Her husband heard all of the commotion and when he saw what was happening, he ran outside and got the woman off of my aunt. My aunt survived the attack, but it left her with scars on her hands along with scars across the front of her neck. Of course, the police were called and they arrested the big woman. When they searched her house, they found something that shocked everybody in the area. The woman had been digging tunnels under her home, which came up under my aunt's house, my grandparents' house, and another neighbor's house. She had been bringing the dirt up and putting it in her flower beds in her garden. But that wasn't all. The most chilling discovery was that she had also built some kind of shrine under her house with candles and other stuff on it. At the center of the shrine was a real human head. Needless to say, it was the same head that we saw when we went trick-or-treating on Halloween night. She had already murdered one woman, and my aunt almost became the next severed head in her collection. The night before Halloween of 2006, I was walking down the sidewalk to my friend's house. As I was making my way down the sidewalk, I saw something moving across the street a little ways in front of me. I wasn't too familiar with the Halloween movies at the time, but I did recognize the Michael Myers mask as I watched the figure walk into the front yard of a house that was on the other side of the street. It then stopped, looked in my direction, and then turned and kept walking across the front yard. I was more weirded out than afraid. I figured this guy had to have been someone who lived there and was playing a practical joke on someone. I continued to my friend's house and eventually forgot all about it. The next morning, I was waiting for the school bus to come to pick up me and my sister. It was still pretty early, and the morning fog was rising up from the grass, and the frost was slowly melting off the windshields of some nearby parked cars. I was just wandering up and down the sidewalk, when I saw the Michael Myers guy again. This time he was directly across the road standing between two garages 
and looking my way. I pointed him out to my sister, but he was standing so still that she assumed that he was some kind of Halloween decoration. I was tempted to call out to him, but I decided against it. And even in my 12-year-old mind, I felt genuine alarm that an adult could walk around with a mask on this early and stare at someone else's children. It wasn't until I was on the bus that the figure finally moved. I tried to point him out to my sister, but the bus was already moving and he was out of sight. That night was Halloween, and my sister and I went out dressed as Ash and Misty, and my father accompanied us, occasionally saying, Pikachu, in a really loud squeaky voice when other people were close by to embarrass us. It wasn't until we were on our way home that I saw the Michael Myers guy again. He was walking down the side of the road behind us. Other people were walking by him without even reacting. I tried to point him out to my father, but he barely looked twice at the figure. When we got home, I watched from my bedroom as the figure stood outside our front lawn. He waited there for a few minutes before disappearing around the side of our house. Now I was starting to get nervous. I asked my dad if one of his friends was messing with us, and I begged him to take a look outside. But he came back a minute later, with a completely carefree attitude, stating that there was no one there. Later that night, my sister crept into my room and whispered that there was someone outside of her bedroom window. Instead of calling out to my parents, who were both asleep, I grabbed my flashlight and followed her back to her room. I told her not to turn on any lights. When we got to the window, I turned on the flashlight and shone the beam directly into the face of Michael Myers, who was standing directly outside peering through the window. His hands were cupped against his eyes to help him see inside. When the light hit him, you would think that he would have bolted, but instead, he remained motionless. He opened his hands and slapped the window hard enough to knock a framed picture off the wall. I screamed like I was being eaten by a shark. The figure then put his right index finger up to the lips of his mask, as if telling me to shush. He then vanished into the darkness. My father then burst into the room, and we both started crying as we told him what we saw. The cops were called, but they took their time getting there, obviously not very concerned that it was anything other than a Halloween prank. Had I not seen the stranger before that night, I may have believed that. The neighborhood was searched, but no one wearing a Michael Myers mask was found. A few weeks later, I had come down with a cold and was staying home from school. My sister waited alone at the bus stop that day. While she was there, someone tried to pull up next to her in a white van and tried to convince her to climb in. She sprinted back to the house and told my mom. I'm not sure if this connects to the man in the Michael Myers mask, but something tells me that it does. I think for any American teenager, starting high school has to be one of the most stressful, daunting experiences of their entire education. But for me, it was particularly rough. You see, I was a real late bloomer, still very much a squeaker by the time I got to be a freshman. While the boys my age were getting growth spurts and sprouting facial hair, I could easily have still passed for like 11 or 12. I mean, I got caught up eventually, don't get me wrong, but there are pictures of me from back then that my current roommate has seen and he jokes that I had the body of an anorexic bikini model. I'd like to argue to the contrary, but honestly, that's not far off. So unfortunately, I was an obvious target for bullying seniors, the worst of which was this big slab of meat with red hair named Josh. Josh used to push me into lockers on a daily basis like, Are you sure you're old enough to be here, short stuff? And I was in absolutely no position to be able to defend myself. So this goes on for like a month, and each time I get sicker and sicker of how he's treating me. 
It's not like I was a total pushover either. Despite my small stature, I'd managed to deter any potential middle school bullies by being something of a pint-sized brawler. Even if you don't quite win a fight, you can still inflict a fair amount of damage, and after that, suddenly they don't want the smoke anymore. So it was honestly only a matter of time before I snapped at Josh. Sure, he was bigger than me, but I was about perfectly positioned to nail one good punch to the balls, and after that, there was little chance he'd want to lay hands on me again. Anyway, it's getting closer and closer to Halloween, and some of the bullying is getting pretty intense, and I said each time something happens, I get more and more furious. Up until the point where, on the morning of Halloween, me and my friends are talking about going trick-or-treating that evening, swapping costume ideas and stuff, when Josh appears like out of nowhere and starts verbally pounding on us about how we're such a bunch of nerds. I think it was how he was trying to show me up in front of my friends that really did it. I just couldn't stand the thought of losing face in front of them, so I clapped back with like, Yeah, but your mom loves it when I dress up for her. Josh just stops dead, like this blank expression on his face. My buddies are all laughing like, got him, and I'm half expecting Josh to start trying to pummel on me, but he doesn't move. He just stares off into the near distance for like a full minute while I look back at him in confusion. Then, without a word in reply, Josh just storms off without so much as looking at us, but before he disappears around a corner, he full-on throws a right hook into a locker so hard he put a dent in the thing. Just like boom, punches it so loud a teacher comes out from a class screaming and asking what was that. It felt kind of good knowing I would gotten him so mad, even if I probably would end up suffering for it. But just how much I'd suffer for it, I had absolutely no idea. So cut to a, like an hour or two later and we're all having lunch, sitting around the tables just minding our own business. One by one, seniors start coming up to our table like, Did you really say that stuff to Josh about his mom? And when I say yes, they're all like, Wow, dude. Just, wow. Walking away, shaking their heads and laughing. This happens like a bunch of times too, and at first I think they're just impressed that I flamed the bully so hard, but there's something else there too. Something that kind of piqued my curiosity. So, in the end, when this one senior kid asks what I'd said, I stopped and was like, Why is that such a big deal? Guy had it coming. Yeah, but you brought up his mom. The kid replied, like it wasn't what kids always bring up against each other when they're trading insults. I'm like, so what? Your mama jokes are like old news by now. The kid then looks at me like I just told him I thought the earth was flat. Dude, Josh's mom died over summer break. Sudden cancer diagnosis or something. It was brutal. It's hard to even sum up the mix of emotions I felt in that moment. Like I felt like a douche. Bully or no bully, losing your mom like that must be one of the worst things that can ever happen to a person and to remind him of it made me feel terrible. Then, having not known, that just made me feel so out of the loop, just like an outsider or something, like I had no place being there, which was already bad enough considering my physique. But what really overwhelmed me was the fear I felt, knowing I had made him so unbelievably furious. The locker punch suddenly made all the sense in the world, and I imagine the kind of revenge I'd personally want if someone made fun of my dead mom like that. Suddenly a few crotch punches didn't seem like such an effective deterrent. Josh would be wanting to tear me apart. I managed to duck him for the rest of the day. For a while I was actually debating whether or not I should actually just bite the bullet and apologize to him. A little empathy might have been good for all involved, and it's not like I would be doing so just to save my own skin, like I genuinely felt bad about having said what I said. But I guess I was just too cowardly to actually seek him out, and doing so seemed like a dumb move on my part when it would just be easier to ninja around school and bail when the final bell rang, which is exactly what I did, then just headed home in the hopes that a little trick-or-treating fun would be exactly what I needed to take my mind off the whole thing. Besides, it was a Friday and whatever was going to happen over the mom insult fiasco was at least going to have to wait until Monday. I had gotten myself what was essentially a stay of execution. So like I said, 
That night was Halloween, and me and a few buddies had planned on going trick-or-treating together. It was a good time. I mean, anything involving free candy always makes for a good time, right? And the night was going smoothly, right up until we stop at a crosswalk where this car is pulling up. The car stops, and we step out into the street as we start to walk in front of it. Then right as we're on a level heading with it, one of my buddies is like, Don't look, dude. Under his breath nudging me and pointing towards the car. And naturally, I look. Big mistake. Because who sat in the driver's seat of that car cruising around on Halloween night with his buddies? Of all the people on the face of Earth that I really, really didn't want to run into that evening, it had to be them sitting in their car at the crosswalk. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It was the slab of meat. Josh. And right then, as I'm perfectly positioned in front of his car, we lock eyes with one another. Obviously, I'm wearing a costume, but no mask, so although it takes him a minute of being like, why does this little runt seem familiar to me, he does actually recognize who I am. Now, I knew he was going to be mad, but I didn't expect him to be this mad, because as soon as it hits him that it's me walking in front of the car, he guns his engine and just lurches forward actually trying to straight up run me and my friends over. We managed to run out of the way just in time and he heads up the street while onlookers are like, oh god, did you see that? Those poor kids almost got hit and stuff while well, we watch from the sidewalk as he does a very illegal U-turn before coming right back at us. We just start running down the sidewalk trying our very best to escape but the dude was in his car so we stood absolutely no chance of getting away from him. Josh just guns it past us, cutting off our route of escape then jumps out of the car to give chase. He was a big dude, but Jesus Christ was he fast. So needless to say, he catches up to me in like no time at all and just tackles me down onto the sidewalk. Then as you can probably guess, Josh then proceeds to beat the goo out of me, with me shouting, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know the whole time. Like he's just raining blows down on me, kicking me while I'm balled up on the sidewalk, when I hear something I still feel kind of conflicted about. He's grunting and cursing at me for a while, but then I hear something else. He's like whimpering or something as he's hitting me. Then his voice starts to break while he's calling me all kinds of names, and I come to realize that he's actually crying. It was weird. I could have at least tried to get up and make a run for it, but I didn't. I just shut up and let him wail on me for a while because honestly, I felt like I kind of deserved it. I know that probably sounds really dumb. He was a bully, and he's probably still a bully now, but yeah, there it is. I just felt really, really sorry for the guy. No one deserves to lose their mom like that. No one. He only stops beating on me when he's actually full-on ugly crying, then he heads back to his car and just drives off into the night. My trick-or-treating partners had long since ran off, leaving me alone and bloodied on the sidewalk trying and failing a few times to find my feet. I mean, I didn't blame them. Hearing that car engine revving behind us was one of the scariest experiences of our lives, but yeah, I was all alone at that point. So like I said, it took me a while to be able to stand up enough to start my walk home. But not until I gathered up some of the candy that had spilled out of my sack during the beatdown, which was going to be badly needed for some soul-soothing that night. I snuck in, dodged my parents, and told them the next morning that my bruises were just down to us play fighting and trying the kind of stuff that you don't try at home was all about. Mom was mad, but it meant I didn't have to tell them something that I was deeply ashamed of. Yeah, maybe it was like an unprovoked thing. Just Josh being the monster that he was. I'd have to tell them the truth, but given the circumstances, it had probably come out that I had insulted this kid's dead mom, in which case I wouldn't have a leg to stand on. But there it is. It was the scariest thing to happen to me for that Halloween and really any Halloween to come after. And the bullying didn't stop, but then again, when does it ever? My name is Bree. This happened in 2016. I was 19 years old at the time. I was up late the night before into the early morning studying, and I hadn't had much sleep so I had just woken up from a nap. 
I decided to hop in the shower to wake myself. That's when I heard this weird scraping sound coming from somewhere outside. I stopped the shower and peered out from behind the curtain, and then made my way over to the window. I saw nothing, but I could still hear the noise. I thought it may have been my neighbor working in a shed, so I ignored the disturbance and finished up in the shower. Before I continue, I should inform you that I have severe anxiety problems, and I often get a little paranoid sometimes. It also doesn't help that I have PTSD as well. Anyways, I was now back in my room, and I took a seat on my bed. I texted my then-boyfriend and asked him what he wanted for dinner. While I was waiting for him to respond, I just relaxed and scrolled through my Facebook. I was reading an article about the recent clown sightings that were happening at the time, when I was interrupted by the sound of footsteps coming from outside. I stopped and listened carefully. I heard a few more steps, followed by a tapping noise. I was a bit confused by this. It hadn't yet occurred to me that I had an unwelcomed guest outside. I was thinking why my boyfriend hadn't knocked on the door or called before he showed up. We usually had a routine with things like this, especially if I was home alone. He would either text, call, or FaceTime me to let me know when he was on his way home, or if he was at the door, because there had been a lot of shady activity around our neighborhood at the time. I then called out to him, and suddenly, all fell silent. I texted him and asked if he was at the door. There was no reply, so I decided to peek through the bedroom window. While I was making my way to the other side of the room, my phone started ringing. It was my boyfriend wanting to FaceTime. When I answered, he said he was about 15 minutes away. As I was talking to him, I pulled back the curtains of my bedroom window, and that's when all the blood in my veins turned to ice as I came face to face with a fucking clown. I know I wasn't hallucinating. An actual clown was looking at me through the window, smiling. After my initial shock, I actually started to laugh, thinking that this had to be some kind of prank my boyfriend was pulling on me. So I played along, pretending to be terrified, and whispered into the phone. Very funny, asshole. Love the whole scary clown thing. I chuckled and rolled my eyes. My boyfriend was confused, and I explained to him about the clown at the window, and said that he and his friend did a good job scaring the piss out of me. He seemed confused, saying that all of his friends were hanging out at the pub, and that he was not a part of any plan to prank me. Upon hearing this, I felt my stomach in my throat, as I looked back at the clown, who was still just outside my window. He reached into his costume, and pulled out a very real looking butcher's knife. By this point, I wasn't sure what was going on, so I grabbed my baseball bat. My boyfriend told me that he was now only a few minutes away. He shouted at me to stay inside and to lock all the doors and windows. I quickly closed the curtains and went into the lounge. It wasn't long before I heard a loud pounding on the front door. Suddenly, I heard a creepy voice coming from the other side. Let me in, child. I didn't respond to the voice. I just stood perfectly still, waiting for the next move. <coughs> Loud pounding rang out again, causing the door to rattle on its hinges, but I kept quiet, even when I heard the doorknob rattling. Although I was pretty scared at this point, I was also getting a tad irritated and yelled out to the clown, Fuck off! Go annoy someone else! I then heard a muffled laughter, followed by the creepy voice. <laughs> Please let me in, doll. I just want to play. I want to play with your insides. I had enough of this. I was about to go out and confront this creepy asshole myself when I heard my boyfriend's voice, who was still on the phone, say, Hang up and call the cops. After some consideration, I thought that maybe confronting the creepy clown outside with a butcher's knife was not the correct course of action. So I did as my boyfriend said, 
I left the lounge and was soon explaining to the police dispatcher the situation. I was on my way back to my room when I heard the sound of glass breaking. I stopped in my tracks and told them that I think the clown just broke into the house. They immediately told me to get somewhere safe, and that's when I heard my ex yelling out, Hey, what the fuck are you doing? Get the hell out of here. The police are on the way. <laughs> the clown just bellowed out a psychotic laugh and took off. As I made my way back into the bedroom, something caught my eye. I peered out the window. Through a gap in the curtains, I saw another clown. He appeared to be holding some kind of saw blade in his hand. I went to move, but I was like a deer caught in the headlights. I couldn't move or scream. Fear then overcame me, as I realized my boyfriend was now out there with two creepy clowns. I screamed into the phone. There's another clown outside my bedroom. Please hurry. After a few moments, I was relieved when I heard my boyfriend at the back door. I quickly let him inside. We then held each other tightly until the police arrived. After taking our statements, the police discovered a rusted hacksaw and an axe lying on the ground outside of my bedroom window. There were red marks all over them. Of course, the creepy clowns that had turned my night into a freak show were nowhere to be found. After that night, I struggled to fall asleep. I often think to myself, what would have happened to me if I had been stupid enough to open that door? Were they just a couple of thrill seekers looking to frighten a girl who was all alone? Or were they in fact, out for blood? My grandparents had passed away within a few months of each other, leaving their house empty. There was talk of renting it out initially, but because of its poor state of disrepair, the family decided against it. No consensus about what to do with it could be arrived at, therefore it would be left to decay for another decade or more before I would stumble upon it. My aunt and I were going through my mother's things and discovered an old family photo album. Mom had got off on one of her journeys and no one was sure if she had ever returned. Her and I had been having an on and off relationship for years, so there was a lot about the family I didn't know. I came across a picture of her and I when I was just a baby, but I didn't recognize the house we were standing in front of. I inquired and my aunt told me about the old Wheeler family house that had once belonged to her parents. No one had been there in over a decade and she wasn't even sure if it was still standing. So, after half an hour of badgering, she agreed to take me out to see it. That following morning, we headed out of town through 30 miles of cornfields until we came to a turnoff that led down a long, weedy gravel road. As we crested the hill, I was taken aback. The house I saw before me, despite being run down, was still breathtaking. In its prime, it must have been the finest home in the county. My aunt pulled up within a few yards of it and we got out. From what I could see... Nobody but the occasional mowing company had been there in a very long time. I couldn't help but be in awe of the place. The vibrant pink and blue paint had long faded from its soaring towers and the massive porch was beginning to sag in a few places. Before I entered, I wanted to take in every bit of the wonderful facade as I could. Around the back was the remnants of the old horseshoe pits and, what I was told, my grandfather's Ford pickup. Although the big house had long seen its best days, I knew I hadn't seen anything that could have compared. Maybe one of those beautiful Victorian mansions in San Francisco. Even those would be dwarfed in comparison to this. When I was ready, we climbed the concrete steps and entered through the back entrance. From the moment we cracked the door, we were overwhelmed by a hideous smell coming from inside. We assumed it was a normal part of having a house sealed for so long and continued with our search. Everything appeared as if it had been left where it was on my grandmother's last day, almost like a time capsule or museum. The lights were even still working. Only later did I discover that my mother had been paying the bills all these years in hopes someone would return and live there someday. Walking from room to room and seeing all the beautiful antique furnishings, I couldn't stop wondering why I had never been told about the house. Regardless of our frequent estrangements, I would have helped my mother with the upkeep of it. 
it was downright insane to me to leave such a beautiful place to rot. Then again, my mother's strange ways were the main reason for our frequent falling outs. As we made our way to the second floor, the smell only got worse. I suggested we cut our visit short and just take a quick look around. Every door was closed, so I went for the closest one and stuck my head in. This must have been a guest room or spare. Upon the bed laid a beautiful and elaborate quilt easily over a hundred years old. My aunt was going through a cedar chest in a room next to me. I joined her and we discovered another much older photo album and decided to bring back with us to look at later. She closed the door behind us and I made my way toward the last room. Unfortunately, the closer I got to the door, the stronger the smell got. I was reluctant to open it, but I thought if the poor critter was where I could get to it, I'd take it outside and give it a good burial. Cracking the door, the stench slapped me in the face and I lost focus for a moment. When I regained my composure, I was met with a terrible sight. Before me was not a dead forest creature, but a human being. The bloated body now unrecognizable, laid curled up silently on the bed. I could feel my knees begin to buckle, so I turned as quickly as possible away and out of the room. My aunt was confused by my behavior and stuck her head in before yanking it out, quickly again. We both ran down the stairs where the smell was less potent and I called 911. The officers spent a few minutes in the room before coming back out with a small piece of paper and a driver's license. One of them joined us at the table where we were sitting and asked a few questions about my mother. This made me nervous and I began demanding he explain himself. A serious look came across his face and he told us that the body appeared to belong to my mom. I didn't want to believe it at first, but when he handed me her license I knew it was true. My aunt and I held each other for a long time and cried. The officer gave us a few moments before interjecting himself again. Then he asked me if I knew why she would take her own life. I had naturally assumed my mom had died in her sleep. She was an older woman, but the note he handed me made everything clear. She had been depressed for a long time because of being at odds with each other, and the last time we spoke, some things were said, and she feared she couldn't take it back. The morning after our argument, she decided to return to the only place that she'd ever been happy. Although she claimed to not be sure of what she was going to do at the time, the poor state of the house just sent her over the edge. The last sentence asked that I not blame myself for her death and that I move on with my life. The ending read simply, Goodbye, Mom. A couple of weeks later, after everyone had time to deal with their grief, I brought the remaining family members together. After seeing the old house and realizing how the poor condition of it hurt my mother, I proposed we try to raise the money to renovate it. In light of what had just occurred, I wanted to at least try to create something positive from our tragedy. I was given their blessings and went to work. It took some time, but on the first day of spring 2018, the Historical Society allowed me to lead the first tour of the newly restored Wheeler Mansion. A great day could have been much better had my mother been there with me. No matter our differences, it was her who inspired me and the one who truly made it all possible. I was born, raised, and still live in Texas. I come from a family of hunters. It's pretty much a family tradition. I'm going to tell you about something that I experienced when I was 20 years old, back in 2005. My father had just been diagnosed with lung cancer, and everyone in my family was naturally devastated by this, especially me, since my dad and I were very close. I had a lot of other personal stuff going on in my life at the time, and I felt that I needed to go out for a few days just to clear my head. I decided to make it a solo hunting trip, and packed up some camping gear, along with my Marlin 336 that my dad gifted to me when I was 18. If I could get sentimental for a moment, my father ended up passing away three years after his diagnosis, and to this day, I still use that rifle for hunting. Anyways, I'd say this happened around late October, early November. I don't want to be too specific with a location, because technically, I wasn't supposed to be hunting in this specific area. However, I will disclose that it was near the Mexican border. 
This will be important later. I decided to set up camp for three days before heading back. I had been hunting on this land before with some friends of mine, and I knew the precautions to take not to be spotted by the game warden. I'm sure if there's any other hunters listening to this broadcast, they'll be more than happy to tell you that we often wipe our asses with the rulebook. Before anyone judges me too harshly, or the practice of hunting in general, I will say that I'm a very spiritual person, and I have a profound respect for Mother Nature. I don't leave trash everywhere, and every animal that I put down, I never let go to waste. I'll be the first to admit, there are hunters that give us a bad name. And me not following the rules is more of a middle finger to the government than it is to the sport of hunting. I once straight up beat the shit out of someone who was a friend of a friend for shooting a stray dog for absolutely no reason. If it's consolation to anyone, I handed him a horrible ass whooping for that. But I digress. The first day went off without a hitch. No problems whatsoever, aside from the fact that there was no game to be found anywhere. So I figured that I would head further south the next day to see if my luck would improve. Other hunters knew about this restricted location and may have already cleaned out this area. As night fell, I found myself sprawled out next to my truck, just staring up at the night sky, wondering if me and my dad would ever take another hunting trip together. That's when I heard the sound of footsteps slowly making their way through a nearby brush. This was alarming for obvious reasons. Whoever they were, they had the drop on me. I knew better than to light up a campfire under these circumstances. But if this person was roaming around in the dark without a flashlight, they may have had some kind of night vision apparatus giving them the advantage. I was concerned because if you were looking at me through the trees at that particular moment, it would have appeared that I was sleeping. I was in this odd position where I was resting on top of my sleeping bag with a blanket because I felt claustrophobic being fully immersed in a sleeping bag. It was a good thing too, because this meant I was able to mobilize quickly and something told me that I only had seconds to make a decision. I rolled sideways and as soon as I did, I caught a quick glimpse of a muzzle flash coming from the tree line directly in front of me. I felt dirt fly up and hit my back from the bullet striking the ground next to me. I scrambled to my feet as more shots rang out from the trees, one of them shattering the passenger side window of my truck. I took cover behind the bed of my pickup and quickly drew the 38 snub nose that I had strapped to my ankle. After the gunfire died down, I laid flat on the ground and returned to fire in the direction of the trees from under the truck. I heard several sets of footsteps fleeing from the area, but I held my position in case my theory about the night vision was correct. With only two rounds left in my 38, I pretty much spent the rest of that night underneath my truck with my pistol aimed at the darkness until the sun came out and illuminated my surroundings. I very cautiously got out from beneath my vehicle and packed up my gear as quickly as I could and hightailed it out of there. Later on, when I told a friend of mine about the incident, he said he wished I would have told him that I was heading that way. He would have warned me that the Mexican cartel started using that area to smuggle contraband and people across the nearby border. This friend of mine was a Mexican immigrant himself and had several family members mixed up in the cartel and coyote groups. So needless to say, I trusted his word. All things considered, I think I got off pretty easy. Had I been in my sleeping bag that night, I have no doubt that bullet would have nailed me. These days, I stick to the designated hunting grounds. Some things are just not worth the risk. I live in a major city in Texas. My apartment complex is gated and in a good neighborhood, but the security isn't extremely tight. Sometimes the gates are left open and anyone could piggyback off of someone else entering with the access code. Maybe twice in the past three years, the management has put out notices of vehicle break-ins and other items being stolen from porches. We also have frequent door-to-door -door solicitors, even though there are signs forbidding it. So this particular Friday evening, I go to bed at about 2.30am. For some odd reason, 
I was having trouble getting to sleep, so I put on a podcast to listen to and eventually start to doze off. I become aware of a noise that sounds like a clicking sound, but it sounds like one of my upstairs neighbors making some noise. I kind of zone this out, as I'm used to my neighbors staying up late on weekends. After about 30 seconds, I realize the noise is extremely repetitive and getting louder. I then start focusing on it more intently, trying to isolate what it could be and where it was coming from. Suddenly it hits me. It's coming from the entrance to my apartment. I leap out of bed and head to the foyer. I identify the noise right away. The lock mechanism is moving back and forth rapidly like someone is trying to unlock the front door. I can hear that an object is inserted into the lock and the person is jimmying it back and forth with a lot of force. I instinctively turn around, head to my bedside safe, unlock it with a combination, and pull out my 357 SIG pistol, load a 14 round magazine, and chamber a hollow point round. I head back to the door and as I exit the bedroom, I see the lock twist and unlatch. I immediately pointed my weapon straight ahead knowing that if someone comes through, I will have to make a split second reaction. I decide that if someone comes through my door, I will give them a momentary chance to retreat, but if they do anything other than that, or enter aggressively, I'm going to shoot and ask questions later. They don't enter, however, because I had also locked the deadbolt inside only. When I first moved in a year prior, I remember thinking that the deadbolt was a great security feature and I got in the habit of always keeping it locked when I'm home. In hindsight, this decision saved me from a life or death confrontation. Upon realizing that, I approached the door and looked through the keyhole. On the other side are three Asians, two men and one woman. All three are wearing hoodies, so it's difficult to make out their faces. The men have objects in their hands, but I can't make out exactly what. The two men are talking back and forth, probably trying to figure out why they can't open the door, even though they have successfully opened the outside lock at this point. The woman is also talking loudly behind the two men, such that anyone in the hallway would be able to hear her voice. She's talking in another language. The only words I can make out are, blah blah blah, apartment 250, blah blah blah, and she keeps repeating that over and over like a broken record. Upon hearing that, I start to wonder for a moment if maybe they're just drunk and have the wrong apartment number. But that's impossible. To open my lock, they would have to have a copy of my exact key or some kind of lock-picking device. I've never copied my key or even given it to anyone. And here's the other thing. Not only is 250 not my apartment number, but, as I figured out later, that apartment number doesn't exist anywhere in the complex. Standing back from the door, I take a long broom handle and jab it hard in the face of the door, letting them know that I'm on the other side. They immediately stop fiddling with the lock and take off running. I debate whether to call 911 and decide against it until they return. I know they'll be long gone by the time anyone gets there. It would be too risky to follow them to try and get a better description or license plate, and I don't have enough identifying info as it is to make an arrest. I filed a police report the next day and let the apartment management know. They said it was unusual, but they would alert the resource officer and ask for a police presence for a couple of nights. Nothing ever came of the report, but that's not a surprise to me. It's been seven months since this happened and no further incidents. Nobody else in the apartment has reported anything similar happening. I don't think they'll be back, but one precaution I took was to buy a smart lock for the deadbolt, so I can leave that deadbolt always locked from the inside, even when I'm not home. It's crazy to think that the deadbolt was the only thing between myself and an armed confrontation with intruders. They say you don't really know what you'll do in those situations until it really happens, but I can honestly say I am proud of how I stayed calm and was mentally prepared to defend myself. If there's one good thing that came out of this, I feel confident that I responded the right way and was ready for the unthinkable. This is my first time posting this story anywhere. I hope you can learn from this experience and apply it if, God forbid, this were to ever happen to you. I work for a company that forces me to travel a lot. 
I usually fly, but because I know how crazy airports are on holidays, I thought it would be a smarter decision to rent a car and drive home overnight, avoiding the nightmare that would be an airport on Thanksgiving week. I started the drive home, and even though I was a little tired, I was able to cruise from about 11pm until 3am, as there were barely any cars on the road. Shortly after 3am, I saw a van that was sideways in the middle of the road on the highway. Thankfully, I had my brights on and was able to see the vehicle with plenty of time for a safe stop. There was also an elderly woman near the side of the road who was waving me down. Cautiously, I slowed down and came to a stop. The woman walked up to my window, motioning for me to roll it down. I rolled it down the slightest bit, making sure even her hand couldn't get in the car. In an old cracking voice, she said, Young man, can you please help me change my tire? I glanced over and saw that she did indeed have a flat tire. She said to me again, I ran over something and my tire became flat almost instantly and motioned to what looked like a piece of plastic in the road. I reluctantly got out of the car and walked by the van and said she needed to move it to the side of the road for safety. I told her that there was no way we could change a tire in the middle of a highway in the middle of the night. She agreed and moved it out of the road into the side of the highway. As I began to change the tire, I had a million things running through my mind. Number one being, why did I have to be the one who got flagged down? I was almost finished taking the flat tire off when I noticed I didn't see the woman anymore as I was providing my own light source with my cell phone and looked up to ask if she could assist and she was gone. I looked all around the vehicle and didn't see anybody. Nothing but pitch black darkness other than my headlights which were providing some light in the general direction. Well, lucky for me, I had my keys in my pocket and locked my car door when I got out. I walked back over to my car and the woman was there trying to get into my vehicle. I told her to get away from my car before I called the police. She laughed at me and said it would be at least 30 minutes until anyone showed up to where we were. Just as I was trying to get this crazy person away from my car so I could leave, I noticed a man get out of the van. He must have been laying on the floor because I didn't see anybody sitting in the seats when I walked by to begin the process of changing her flat. The man seemed to be of average build. He started to approach me, his hand in his pocket which really started to make me worry about my safety. The woman then jumped on my back and attempted to choke me. I was able to shake her off quickly and elbow her directly in the throat. She began to cough and gasp incessantly which gave me the break I needed to get away. The guy who was approaching us devoted his attention to her and I got in that car and sped away as fast as I could. I have never driven that fast in my entire life. The adrenaline from the events fueled me for the remainder of my trip home. I know if someone else told me this story I would ask how dumb can you be and emphasize how idiotic of a decision it was to get out of that car. I'm just glad that I was able to get out of that situation unharmed and get home to my family. After police reports were called, I unfortunately never got any further information. I wish I would have glanced at their plates that may have helped in identifying them later. And please let this be a lesson to everyone out there. Trust your instincts, especially in situations that can affect your safety. This story may seem more weird than truly scary to many of you. At the time, I didn't really find it scary or terrifying myself. I didn't really get that feeling until I shared this with others and got their perspective. I'd be interested to see what, if any, comments any of you have regarding this experience. This event happened with my ex-girlfriend on Thanksgiving about six years ago. For the sake of anonymity, we will call her Kay. I met Kay in college and, at first, she was great. We shared similar interests and hobbies. We clicked instantly and for the first time I was excited to meet the parents of my significant other. I was going to meet them on Thanksgiving so that everyone could have dinner together. Kay never really mentioned her family so I was excited and intrigued when she asked me to join her for the holiday. Fast forward a week or so and Thanksgiving finally comes. I make the two hour drive to her parents house and my first thought as I approach the house is, wow. This place is huge. 
It was a gigantic brown mansion. It was very large, but also looked very old. My best comparison is if you have ever seen the movie Clue. The outside of the house looked very similar to that, a mix between mansion and castle almost. I knocked on the door and almost immediately was greeted by a strange looking guy. He was short, like five foot flat. He was bald and wearing an eye patch. I said, Hey, uh, is Kay here? I'm her boyfriend. He just proceeded to look at me and didn't answer. After a few awkward seconds, Kay walked over and happily greeted me and let me inside. As we walked away, she said in her soft voice, Oh, don't mind him, that's just Eugene. He's, like, I guess, kind of my uncle. Kind of weird way to put it, I thought, but whatever, I didn't think too much of it. As we walked through the house, I was blown away. I'd never seen anything like it. The ceilings were really high and the walls were covered with religious iconography. I wasn't raised with religion, so some of the images were foreign to me. Kay and I arrived and sat in what I assumed was the living room. There was no TV, no radio, just couches and some paintings all over the wall. The paintings seemed to cram together, trying to fit them all on the wall. An odd choice for such a nice home. After a couple of minutes, her parents walked in. Her dad was clean-shaven with wild flowing hair and glasses that were just big enough for his eyeballs, and her mom had long black hair that went all the way down to her back and reached her legs. It looked like they were in their mid-sixties if I had to guess. I was introduced and we made small talk. It really wasn't that bad, there was no awkward pauses, but her parents were not what I expected. They seemed a little strange or eccentric, I guess. While the four of us talked basically about school, Eugene came and stood in the doorway and began watching us. After a few more minutes of talking about school, her dad got up and said he had a surprise for us. He walked into the other room and brought out a lime green stereo boombox that looked like something straight out of the 90s. In his almost comical voice, he said, This one is for you two. I hope you like it. It used to be Kay's favorite. I looked at Kay and she was smiling. I can't even imagine what my face looked like. Confused, surprised, however that translates to a face. He pressed play on the stereo. Music began to play and her dad started to dance with her mom. The music, if that's what you would want to call it, was the weirdest thing I had ever heard in my entire life. It was just like banging of instruments. Very untuned instruments and other loud noises that honestly sounded like animals. Even more weird than the song that was playing were the movements of her parents. They just hopped around and were moving their bodies like they were puppets on strings or something. Thankfully, this only lasted a few minutes and we all sat down to dinner. Of course, the dining room was no different than the rest of the house. There were paintings and religious images all over the walls. We ate dinner in a combination of silence and her dad talking about politics and religion and how they were separate yet similar. I basically just stayed quiet and ate my food, which, looking back, was pretty unconventional for Thanksgiving dinner. After the meal, we went back into the living room, and that's when her father told us he had one last surprise for us. In his high-pitched voice, he shouted, It's now time for our annual Thanksgiving Day celebration. As I sat on the couch and tried to process what that could possibly mean, I noticed that more people were walking into the room. There was somebody dressed as a scarecrow, a teddy bear, a lumberjack, and one other that I think was supposed to be Jesus or some other religious figure. This is when I decided that I had had enough crazy for one night and had to get out of this place. I got up and announced to everyone that I had a family emergency and that I had to leave unexpectedly. I apologized and thanked them for everything thus far and said how happy I was to have met everyone. They all looked a little confused, especially Kay, but they shared their happiness in meeting me and their enjoyment of the night and wished me well on my drive home. As I drove away, I looked through my rearview mirror. I saw Kay and her parents waving goodbye to me from the doorway. Where to begin? This is the weirdest, strangest few hours of my life. I am obviously no longer with Kay and I honestly am not sure she even came back to school after that because I never saw her in person again. We texted for a few days after the event and she acted like everything was normal. 
I broke it off before holiday break was over, thinking it would be easier to do so before I saw her in person again. I swear part of me thinks I was on a hidden camera TV show that night or something. Does anyone from a rare religious sect know if any of this is a common tradition? Or was I just in a house with a bunch of crazy people on Thanksgiving? I just wanted to share this short but freaky experience I had with my family many years ago on Thanksgiving. This Thanksgiving, my cousins and I got together with our respective families. I was the oldest of the cousins, 11 at the time. This particular year, our families decided to go to my great aunt's house for dinner. It was a small little farmhouse pretty much in the middle of nowhere. No one liked going there, well at least us kids, because it was boring and there was nothing to do. My great aunt had recently lost her husband and obviously was very upset, which is mostly the reason our families decided to go there this year. I met my great aunt maybe once or twice in my entire life to this point, so I found this whole trip very weird and really wasn't looking forward to it. Before dinner, all of us kids decided we wanted to play hide and seek. Our parents let us because we could be out of their way and as previously mentioned, there was nothing else for us to do. My cousin and I went into the basement of the house to hide. There was so much junk and old antiques down there that we could have stayed hidden and out of sight for hours. I climbed to the top of a pile of old newspapers that was backed against a dimly lit wall. I figured if I laid flat at the top, there was no way anyone could find me. Well, after a few minutes, one of my cousins did find me, and when I tried to get down, my foot got caught on something and I slipped and fell off the side and put a small hole in the wall. At first, we were freaked out because we thought we were going to get in a lot of trouble for doing damage to the house. While we were trying to think of a story to cover it up and get ourselves out of trouble, my brother found a small box on the other side of the wall where I had recently put the hole. We pulled the box out and stared at it for a while, trying to see if we could open it. It had an entire layer of dust on it that didn't come off when we tried to blow on it. My cousin Sarah was fearless and she grabbed the box from us and opened it. At first we all felt like we won the lottery. It was filled with 20s, 50s and 100s. We were young but we knew this was a lot of money. As we looked through the money we eventually got to the bottom of the box and this is where the excitement vanished. There was a small knife that looked like it had dried blood on it and next to it was what looked like a skeletal finger or maybe even a toe. Of course we all screamed and ran upstairs crying to our parents. Our parents looked at us very confused as to what happened. We all tried to blurt out our version of the story until, as calm as can be, my great aunt giggled and said, Oh, that's just Bob's box from when he used to mess around with his army buddies. I haven't seen that since his friend Raymond passed away. Well, fast forward years later, this story came up again and we all tried to figure out what all that meant and what we actually found. After consulting with our family, the story goes that our great uncle Bob was involved in all sorts of crime in the Chicago area. He made a lot of dirty money and eventually gave it up when he had a family. Our family didn't have an answer as to the contents of the box or whose missing finger that could possibly be. Every year for Thanksgiving, my wife and I travel to her parents' house to relax for a few days, watch football, eat tons of food, and go Black Friday shopping. Two years ago, I was unable to make this trip due to an incident that happened with one of our dogs. On Tuesday night of Thanksgiving week around 11pm, I let our golden retriever out to go to the bathroom before I went upstairs to bed for the night. When I came back outside to let her in, she was barking very violently, sounding like she was going after another animal. When she made it into the garbage, it was apparent what happened. She had been sprayed in the face by a skunk. Fast forward 24 hours and we are dealing with a house and a dog that reeks like skunk. Needless to say, I offered to stay home with the two dogs while my wife made the trip to her parents. We couldn't travel with the dog and we certainly needed to do some maintenance to try and get the smell out of the house. My wife left on Wednesday, the same day I took the dog to the groomers and began cleaning and airing out the house. After this experience, I felt it necessary to go outside with the dogs every time I left them out in the backyard 
whether it was day or night, to make sure there were no further issues with a skunk. I hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary until Wednesday night, when it seemed like our shed doors had been opened slightly. Since it was that time of the year where it got dark out very early in the day, I had grown accustomed to having a flashlight with me to check the backyard before I let the dogs out. Unfortunately, we didn't have a motion light or any sort of light for the backyard, so the only source of light was the flashlight. With the dogs still in the garage, I made my way to the shed to see why or what caused the door to be ajar. When I got into the shed, I thankfully didn't see any skunk or any other animal. I did, however, see a dirty towel, which I didn't remember leaving there, but I thought perhaps it was from when I was working on the lawnmower or snowblower. The next 20-ish hours went by without incident. I was spending Thanksgiving alone with my stinky dog in my stinky house, and we were getting ready to go to bed for the night. I did my normal routine of going outside with the flashlight, making sure the coast was clear before I let the dogs out of the garage. However, this time, as I was moving my flashlight across my large backyard, I flashed it towards the side of the shed to illuminate if there was anything behind it. Absolute panic set in as I saw a hooded figure behind the shed. I instinctively started to yell at the figure asking what they were doing. By the time I went back to the garage to let our dogs out to go after the intruder, he was gone and there was no one in my backyard. Freaked out, I contacted my wife to let her know what I had seen. She advised me to call the cops, but I decided I would just monitor the backyard for a while and ignore it if nothing further happened. About an hour later, I decided to take the flashlight and go to the window in my kitchen and shine it out into the backyard rather than go outside first. When I did this, the shine of the light caught the same hooded figure going into the shed and shutting the door behind them. At this point, I didn't know what to do. Let the dogs out, call the cops, confront the person myself. I honestly was frozen in shock. Trying to think quickly, and not wanting the person to get away, I grabbed a screwdriver to jam into the openings in the handles to prevent the shed door from opening from the inside. After I did this, I immediately called the police. The person was slamming on the shed, trying anything they could to get out. When the police arrived, they took him away. Thankfully, from the conversation I had with them, he didn't have any weapons on him. I'm not sure what the intent of the person was. Were they just trying to scare me? Were they drunk from drinking all day from Thanksgiving and didn't know where they were? I still have many unanswered questions from that night, including if the person was in the shed the night before and that's why it was left ajar. Perhaps he was just a squatter. Either way, there was no further incident after this issue and thankfully my dog has also remained skunk-free since then. We now have motion lights installed in our backyard which will hopefully prevent anyone from trying to break in to our property again. I have worked in retail for many years and one of my least favorite days to work is Black Friday. Our store is packed to the brim. People are freaking out trying to get their items and it is very rare to get through the night without any incident. One particular Black Friday sticks out in my memory due to an experience that I had with a customer. I was working out on the floor assisting customers with any questions that they may have had regarding our products or our sales. I had this one customer approach me to complain about not getting a ticket towards one of our better TV offers. I apologized and tried to explain that the tickets had been given out on Thursday night and there was nothing I could do at this point. The customer smelled so bad I could barely get this information out to them without gagging. His clothes were stained and his appearance was ragged. After I explained the scenario to him one more time, a large smile came across his face and he said, I know it's not your fault, sweetie. I was beyond creeped and grossed out. I let him know that I had to go help other customers and I hope he had a good conclusion to his evening. A short time later I got a call up to register to try and assist with the long lines and wouldn't you know it, I was cashing out the same guy who had been complaining to me just 15 to 20 minutes prior. He began chatting with me, ignoring the fact that he had been irate with me minutes before. He asked my name, even though I had a name tag on, how long I had worked there, how old I was, etc. As I previously mentioned, this person smelled horrific and also began to seriously creep me out with their random questioning. 
He asked how late I had to work and I stated that all employees had to stay until midnight due to the fact that we were so busy. Looking back, I probably shouldn't have told him anything. He continued with more creepy questions and I finally got him out of my line and moved on to the next customers. Fast forward to a few hours later and I'm finally getting ready to leave after an exhausting day. I walked out to the parking lot with my coworker Matt and said goodbye to him and that I would see him on Sunday. As I made my way to my car, I thought it was unusually quiet, especially for how busy it had been throughout the day, but it was past midnight so most stores were closed. As I was approaching my car, a set of headlights began to shine in my direction. Blinded by the light, I just proceeded to unlock my car and reach for the handle to get in and leave. The next thing I know, the headlights had made their way right in front of my car and someone was putting their car in park and getting out. To my utter shock and horror, it was the same slovenly customer who had creeped me out earlier in the night. At this point, I started fearing for my safety as this person clearly wasn't all there upstairs. He had parked in front of my car and left his car running, blocking me from going anywhere. We got out of the car and I asked if I could help him and what he was doing blocking my car. He mentioned something along the lines that I needed to come with him and that we belong together. At this point I tried to make my way back to the store, but the guy pressed his body weight against me and pressed me against my own car. I couldn't move and was trapped. Fearing for my life I began to scream as he covered my mouth. His hands somehow smelled worse than his body odor. He began to try and move me towards his car, still trying to muffle my screams while dragging me with his other arm. Just when I thought I was going to be overpowered, a car horn began to honk incessantly. He let go of me and hopped in his car and sped off as quickly as he had arrived. The car that was honking then pulled up to me, and it was Matt. Thankfully on his way out, he had noticed that there was a car blocking mine in, and as he got closer, saw that there was someone grabbing me. He immediately got on the phone with the police and began honking as he came over to my side of the parking lot. Matt waited with me for the police to arrive so that we could each give a statement. The cops requested to get into the store so that we could check the camera footage in order to try to get a better view of the guy who had stalked me for the night. To my knowledge, they never caught him or at least he was never charged. I haven't heard anything from the incident but I am thankful that I had never seen that person again. And I'm very thankful to Matt for saving me that night. I've always wondered what could have happened if he hadn't been there. For a little bit of background related to this incident, I am a former athletic director of a small elementary school which also sponsors high school basketball teams. This particular event happened on Thanksgiving night three years ago. After I had a delicious meal on Thanksgiving with my family, my wife decided she wanted to go Black Friday shopping, so I decided to go to the gymnasium and start setting up for Friday morning. Every Thanksgiving weekend, our gym hosts a Thanksgiving basketball tournament for a handful of local high school teams. It was becoming a pretty well-recognized tradition in our community. Anyway, I spent about an hour or so setting up chairs, bleachers, prepping concessions, and getting the equipment in order. This was perfect because I could now sleep in a little tomorrow morning and not have to worry about rushing to the gym and set up. To try and give you a visual setup of the gym and its surroundings, it is a very small gym with one set of main doors that leads into a small elementary school. The school is very old and the hallways are lined with brick. If I'm being honest, it reminds me of an old prison. The lighting in the halls is dim, even in the daylight due to lack of windows and its construction. The school apparently used to be a home for nuns in the 1930s and I don't think it's structurally been updated very much since. In my opinion, it's a pretty creepy place. I've been in this place probably a hundred times myself and it still gives me an eerie feeling. Once I finished all my prep work for the tournament, I decided to shut the place down and go home for the night. I went into the far corner of the gym to the circuit breaker and shut off all the lights. At this point, the gym was lit by only moonlight and the glow of street lights shining in through the large gym windows. I walked into the small hallway that was basically pitch black at this point, using my cell phone flashlight to avoid running into a wall. As I walked down the long hall towards the exit, I started to hear a scratching noise. I stopped walking to try and locate the source of the noise because it was very loud and distinct. 
It sounded like it was coming from one of the classrooms up ahead. As I pointed my cell phone flashlight up the hall, I noticed that one of the classroom doors were open. This was odd because the policy was that all the doors were to be locked when the teachers left for the evening. Admittedly, I was a little spooked thinking possibly an animal had gotten into the classroom or something else. But the only way to leave was passing the door in the hall to get to the main entrance which was probably another 30 feet away. I continued down the hall, my eyes sharp to try and find the source of the noise that has now gone silent. As I passed that room, I saw something and it definitely was not an animal. It was a green figure, a tall green silhouette of a man wearing a button-up shirt, parted hair, and long pants. And I mean tall, it was probably standing about six and a half feet. It was just standing there, hovering, staring out the door, staring at me. It didn't move or make any noise. Its face was impossible to make out, like staring into the abyss. In the brief moment that I stood there frozen in fear, I felt very cold, like a window had been opened. I don't know why I didn't just run. I think my brain was trying to process if this was a human intruder or if I was witnessing something I couldn't rationalize. I snapped back to reality and began to sprint down the hall, looking back once more as I ran out the main entrance, now seeing the figure in the hallway. I drove home as fast as I possibly could, not able to get the image of the figure out of my head. Of course, as you would expect every time, I relay this story to my family or friends, people either think it's a joke or that I'm trying to scare them. For the rest of that year, I never went to the property by myself after dark. I came and went out the back entrance that was not supposed to be used in order to avoid that hallway. After the season was over, I resigned and appointed someone else to my position. I can't tell you what I saw or experienced that night, but I hope nothing like that ever happens to me again. Christmas is a time of year to be happy, merry, and joyful, at least for most people. I love spreading cheer to family and friends on Christmas. My joyful mood usually translates to my coworkers as well. I work in customer service, which many people know can be a nightmare at Christmas time, so it helps to try and stay upbeat. Well, on this specific Christmas Eve, customers were doing some final Christmas shopping before Christmas Day. Right at the end of my shift, I cashed out a pretty normal looking guy. I would say the average height range of like 5 foot 7 and maybe 150 pounds. He had parted black hair, glasses, and was probably in his mid 40s. He was buying some fairly normal stuff and not really anything Christmas related. The whole interaction was mostly friendly until the very end when I said something I now wish I didn't say. I ended our transaction by saying in my bubbly voice, Thank you, sir and have a happy holiday. He stopped and turned back to me and said, What did you just say? I responded nervously and semi-confused. Have a happy holiday? He stormed back to my register and screamed at the top of his lungs, It's Merry Christmas! I backed away in a slight panic and just said, Okay, sir, I'm sorry. He walked away mumbling to himself, but I could tell he was furious by his recent actions. For a couple of minutes, I kept staring outside and I could see him pacing in front of the store, still seemingly mumbling to himself. A few people actually came into the store and said that there was someone outside talking about Christmas and Jesus' birthday. I began to panic, thinking this guy was going to come into the store again or wait until I got out and try to follow me home or something. Well, luckily for me, my boyfriend worked at the same store, and he was driving us to my mom's house for a Christmas Eve party at the end of the night. We left shortly after six, and at first, I was relieved when I didn't see the man outside. We were almost to my boyfriend's car when we saw the man running after us from the side of the store. My boyfriend opened up the back seat door so I could hop in, and he stood there in front of the car. My boyfriend said in a stern voice, Hey, is there a problem, man? The man, still in a rage, said, That lady has no respect for Jesus or Christmas, and she should be punished. My boyfriend, confused, told the man to back away and leave us alone, and the crazy man actually tried to jump past my boyfriend to get into the car to punish me or whatever that meant. My boyfriend slammed the guy down to the ground and got in the car and we drove off. 
Like fools, we decided on the drive not to call 911 because we didn't want to bother them on Christmas Eve, so we thought, and just wanted to forget the event. On December 26th, we did alert our store manager of the situation so we could call the police if the guy ever came back into the store. I still work at the store, and almost a year later, I have never seen that man again. I can say for certainty that I will never say happy holidays again. I love Christmas. It has always been a great day to spend with my family and call me cheesy, but I really just enjoy the spirit of the day. My whole family and I had just finished a beautiful Christmas dinner and most of my family went into the living room to wait for me to exchange presents. Christmas day was when we did presents with grandparents and cousins. I was in the kitchen washing dishes with my brother Jake and cousin Teresa. While I was washing dishes, I looked out the window and thought I noticed somebody out by my shed. I didn't really let it bother me because I figured it was some kind of shadow from the tree. After a few more minutes of washing, I noticed the figure again, and this time, I was definitely sure that it was a man. I told my brother and cousin to look out the window, but don't make it obvious. They noticed it as well. We all talked quietly among ourselves, trying to figure out what we should do. Our thought was that this man was technically trespassing in my backyard, so we decided to call the police. They told us that they would send somebody out to take a look right away. Trying not to panic and hoping everything stayed how it was until the police showed up was not easy. The kids started to get restless as well as the grandparents were wondering what was the holdup. My parents knew something wasn't right, but they did a really great job of keeping everybody in the living room. After a couple of minutes, we noticed the man starting to approach my house, and he wasn't alone. There were three more men that came out from behind the shed. They started to surround my house. Confused and terrified, we tried to remain calm. What happened next was nothing shy of a Christmas miracle. The flashing lights appeared, and we heard a minor altercation outside of the house. The officers were able to catch one of the men, while the other three fled. While somehow not bringing a lot of attention to my family inside, I spoke with the cop outside and gave my statement. Well, turns out my cousin Teresa had broken up with her boyfriend several months before Christmas, and the man they detained was, in fact, her ex-boyfriend. Teresa had started seeing somebody new, and this man figured the new boyfriend would be at the house for the Christmas party. Her ex and his friends clearly planned on attacking him, or at least putting a good scare into him, so I thought, until the officer informed us that my cousin's ex was equipped with a knife and brass knuckles in his back pocket. Luckily, nobody got hurt, and I'm not actually sure what kind of trouble he got into for this. The rest of the night went smooth, and we opened presents, but I had an uneasy feeling for the rest of the night that the other men might return and try to finish the plan they started. Being the father of two small children, Christmas Eve is usually a very early night for my family because the kids wake me up around 6am for Santa's presents. At about 10pm I got into bed with my wife and started to fall asleep. Shortly after this I was jolted awake by our doorbell. I jumped out of bed and ran down the stairs. More angry than anything else that some idiot rang my doorbell on Christmas Eve after 11pm with two small children asleep. Without even thinking, I opened the door and said, What do you want? It was an old man with a dirty black beard. He was wearing a red jacket and red sweatpants. His face was filthy. He said in a slow and haunting voice, Please, let old Chris Kringle come inside and get warm. I slammed the door in his face and said through the door, If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the cops. The man was quiet for a moment, and then knocked on the door slowly. I yelled one more time, trying not to wake my kids. Do you want to be arrested? He then started to bang on my door vigorously and relentlessly. My wife then ran down the stairs, who I might add is a third degree black belt, and asked what was going on. I told her to call the police and then make sure the kids were alright. 
The man must have heard me on the phone because he stopped knocking. I could hear him muffled through the door say, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. And then he laughed as he walked away. After feeling a slight moment of relief thinking this ordeal was over, I decided to wait at the front door until the police showed up. A cop showed up several minutes later and I explained the situation to him. He stated that he had no other calls or similar reports like this tonight and that's when we heard my wife scream from the kids' room. The police officer headed up the stairs first with me right behind him. The man was trying to break into the window where my daughter slept. The cop immediately tased and arrested the man who just kept saying, Don't worry, I'm Santa Claus, over and over again. The situation was never really explained to me. Apparently he was just a homeless man who was wandering around. The cops said that he may have been possibly on something. Either way, I never sleep quite right on Christmas anymore. First, let me say I come from a somewhat unconventional family. We are all a little weird or wacky in our own way. Sometimes we get along great and sometimes not so much. On Christmas Day, my parents and I usually stay home and don't see any of our extended family. However, this past year, we decided to go to my grandmother's house. This is a little different because my grandmother and I have a very rocky relationship with one another. I have overheard my dad mentioning stories about my grandmother and my now deceased grandfather that bordered on child abuse. I remember being really young and my grandparents screaming at me for the smallest things and my parents abruptly taking me home. But anyway, I'm in my 20s now and my father decided since it was Christmas we could give spending the holiday at my grandma's a chance. The day started out pretty uneventful and, dare I say, pleasant. A lot of conversations and happy memories. My dad and aunt were reminiscing about snowball fights and such from their childhood. There was a healthy conversation about politics, which I thought for sure would change the mood, but surprisingly did not. After several hours and a nice dinner, everyone made their way to the living room for coffee and to just hang out on the couches. I left my coffee on the kitchen table and made my way to the back of the house where the only bathroom was. I washed my hands, fixed my shirt, and walked out of the bathroom. When I walked into the hallway, I was greeted by my grandma who was just standing there staring at me. I said, Hi, what's going on? And I tried to keep walking, but she wouldn't move. Now this is a narrow hallway and you're only fitting one across. Excuse me, please. I said semi-annoyed, yet still she did not budge at all. Finally, she spoke up and said, What do you think you're doing? She sounded nervous and almost a little angry. I was just going to the bathroom. I said, starting to get uneasy about the entire situation. She started to poke my chest and said, Where is he? At this point, I was beyond confused. I told her I had no clue what she was talking about. Where's who? I finally shoved past her and started to make my way down the long hallway. That's when it happened. I heard her scream like a banshee and chase me down the hall. I turned around and she lunged at me with a small kitchen knife. She was trying to stab me. She just kept screaming, Where is he? Where is he? At this point she had fallen to the ground trying to take me down with her. After a minute of this, my father finally came running in with my aunt and lifted her up. I was too scared to use any force because I didn't want to hurt her, but I also didn't want to get stabbed. I was so angry and upset, I started to grab my things and told my family I was leaving. As I made my way toward the door, she walked back into the living room and said in a calm voice, Oh, where are you going? You haven't even finished your coffee. I just left and didn't even respond. This woman, my grandmother, tried to stab me and I still have no idea why. I found out several weeks later from my cousin that after my father and I left, my grandmother cried for hours and was basically inconsolable. She didn't know why we were so angry and left so abruptly. Clearly my grandma had some sort of episode that night that she can't remember. But there are so many unanswered questions like, 
Who was she referring to? I haven't seen or spoken to her since. My dad did try to reach out and explain to her why we left and why we won't be coming back, but she doesn't believe he is telling her the truth when he transcribes the events back to her. The worst part about all of this is that this will probably be the Christmas that I always remember the most. This is a short story that happened to me approximately three to four years ago. I used to work for a charitable company that would distribute presents to families or individuals in need during the holiday time. For the most part, I loved this job. I paid decently well and was incredibly rewarding. But on this one specific Christmas Eve, it was enough for me to never want to do something like this again. I usually worked or traveled with another associate named Jose. But since it was Christmas Eve and it was our last stop, I told him I would go alone and he would go home to his wife and enjoy what was left of the holiday. It was about 5pm so it was getting pretty dark as I made my way toward the recipient's house. I arrived and went up to the door with a big tote of presents all wrapped and ready to be distributed as they pleased. A man answered the door in pajama pants and a skin tight sleeveless shirt. The guy was overweight and clearly did not take care of himself. He looked like he hadn't shaved or showered in weeks. I said to him in my still bubbly voice, Hi, I'm Jamie and I'm here to drop off the presents. He stared at me and smiled with his yellow unbrushed teeth. He looked right at me and said, Wow, you sure are pretty. Which freaked me out a little bit. I just awkwardly smiled and said, Thanks. He then said, Honey, I have a lot of trouble with my back and I can't lift these presents. Will you please bring them into my living room for me? Like a fool, I complied as this wasn't an uncommon request to bring the presents in the home for those receiving them. I walked in and the man shut the door behind me. I walked slowly in his near pitch black house. What I noticed in the few seconds of being in this house was that there were no signs of children, Christmas decorations, or anything that even looked remotely festive. I turned around to ask him where I was going, and that's when I noticed him. He was hunched over and staring at me like I was a piece of meat, basically salivating. He started to approach me and put his arms out, like he was going for an embrace or a hug. More creeped out than I've ever been in my entire life, I decided the answer was to just run away. I dropped the presents there and ran to the door, he locked it behind me. The knob was locked and so was the chain. I quickly was able to get them undone and out of the house without any further incident. I got into my car and called my supervisor and explained the situation to him. What he told me next made my eyes fill up with tears. I had mixed up two of the numbers in my GPS when I set out for the house. I was on the wrong block and clearly at the wrong house. The guy wasn't expecting presents and played along to get me into his house. I have no idea what his intentions were and am thankful nothing else happened. Running through the scenario in my head makes me wonder how I was able to undo the locks before he grabbed me or made a move towards the door. However, his pause in action or change of heart may have very well saved my life. The traumatizing events of this story happened to me several years ago. This is the first time I'm sharing my story publicly in hopes it may help others who read it. At the time, I was a mother of a four-year-old daughter. Her name is Juniper and she is my entire life. The day of these events, my husband was at work so I decided to do some Christmas shopping at the mall. On the way in, Juniper saw Santa sitting in the middle of the atrium and began jumping because I assumed she associated Santa with presents. We decided to get into line, even though it was long. We could get a picture and she could tell Santa what she wanted for Christmas. When it was finally Juniper's chance to sit on his lap, I immediately felt uncomfortable. I didn't like the way he was staring at her. His eyes were big and looked as if though he had been on something. She sat there for a moment and told the man what she wanted as I watched, filled with anxiety. After about two minutes, he got her off his lap and winked goodbye to her and said Merry Christmas. 
Happy this ordeal was over, we did the little bit of shopping we had to do and pressed on through the day. While I was browsing around one of the clothing stores, I looked up and thought I noticed the mall Santa sitting outside of the store we were in. Not taking any chances, I grabbed Juniper and walked out of the other entrance of the store. After a little while longer of shopping, we decided to get some lunch in the food court of the mall. I kept my eyes peeled because I just had mother's intuition that something wasn't right. We were finishing our food and literally as we were about to get up, the mall Santa came over to our table. He walked right up to Juniper and said in a jolly Santa-like voice, Hey there, Juniper. Remember to be good so Santa can come and bring you lots of presents. She was so excited, and so were all the people around me. It's easy to say what you would do in that situation, but I just stood still. I thought freaking out my daughter and rushing her away from Santa would be a traumatizing event, so I grabbed her hand and told her it was time to go. She said goodbye to Santa and we left. That night at home I told my husband about the entire story. He was angry but agreed with my course of action. The next day I woke up at about 8am. My husband was already gone for work for the day. I happened to look outside and saw a strange blue car that I had never noticed parked outside my house. This didn't really bother me considering it could have been anyone but it was just peculiar. At about 11 a.m., I looked out the window again and noticed the car was still in the exact same spot. I made the choice to go out to my mailbox in the front of my home and investigate the car. The car was empty, except for the passenger seat. There was a Santa hat on the seat. I tried not to jump to any conclusions, but it was just starting to make too much sense in my head. I ran inside and called my husband. He said I was grasping at straws, but decided to come home anyway to make sure I was okay. A couple of minutes later, my worst fear was realized. I looked out the window and saw the man in his car. It was the mall Santa, and he was taking a picture of my house with his cell phone. Once he saw me, he drove away, and he drove away so fast I couldn't get the license plate number. Minutes later, my husband came home and I explained what I saw. We called the authorities, but there really wasn't anything that could be done. I felt angry with myself that I looked at the car all morning and couldn't get a license plate number. My husband stayed home from work the next day just in case. At about noon, we walked around the house and noticed footprints outside of Juniper's window. Footprints in the snow that neither of us left. That night, I couldn't sleep. I felt like I was just waiting for something horrible to happen. My husband, Juniper, and I all decided to have a camp out in the living room so she could be with us all night. Shortly after midnight, my husband and I were alerted to the sound of a car pulling up. It was the mall Santa car from the day before, and he was approaching the house with a giant bag in his hand. I called the police as my husband stalked him through the windows. The lights were off, so the mall Santa couldn't see us through the windows. He made his way all the way to Juniper's window. He started to tap on the windows, almost as if though he was trying to wake her up. My husband stood on the other side of the window, trying not to scare him away until the cops came. That's when we heard it. Hey Juniper, it's Xana. Come take a ride in my sleigh and I'll show you the reindeer. Praying that the cops would show up any minute, I sat in the fetal position not knowing if this lunatic had a gun or any other weapon. He kept tapping and whispering, It's me, Santa. Finally the cops showed up and when we heard the sirens out front, my husband jumped out the window and tackled the mall Santa. My husband yelled for the cops and the cops detained the man. He didn't have any weapons on him, but his car did have duct tape and rope. It gives me nightmares to this day, thinking of that horrible situation and what could have happened. My Christmas miracle is that my family is safe and my daughter didn't have to really experience any of the intense feelings my husband and I did over those couple of days. If you as a parent have instincts about the safety of your child, please follow them. If I would have just left them all when I felt uneasy, I could have possibly avoided this entire series of events.
This happened two years ago, but I always think about it. Every Christmas Eve, we spend the evening at my grandparents' house where we have a feast and swap presents with cousins, all the people we won't be with on Christmas morning. It was a merry and festive evening and spirits were high, if not a little worn out, on our way home. Pulling into our driveway, we instantly felt something was off. In the corner of our house, decoration lights were hanging haphazardly free of the roof and something else we couldn't quite pinpoint right away. Luckily, the kids were already asleep from the soothing dark car ride, so we sat in the driveway, the motor off and ticking as it starts to cool. Did we leave that many lights on inside? My husband asked me. Because he would never. He is a stickler for turning out lights before we leave. I shook my head no. The Christmas tree was the only thing we left on. But now there was a soft glow from the windows at two ends of the house. One being the primary living room area toward the front where we were, and the other the window at the left side of the house. The hallway bar a bedroom, and it slightly lit the side yard between our house and the neighbor. We both agreed that it looked like someone was or had been in our home. Call the cops. Stay in the car with the doors locked. He recranked the car and I didn't even bother getting out. I just slid over the center console until the driver's seat just in case. He has a concealed carry permit so he drew his weapon and went to check the front door. It was still locked so he unlocked it about the time I started telling the police that our house seemed suspicious and we thought someone might be in it. They of course said that we should wait outside, but I knew that there was no use in telling my husband that as he was already starting inside and flicking on more lights. It was nerve-wracking to sit there and watch the open front door spilling light onto the lawn. I cracked my window just the tiniest bit so I could hear sooner if something started happening. Luckily nothing did and when the cops pulled up, I let them know my husband was inside and what he was wearing since he did have his gun out but all the opening and shutting of car doors alerted him and woke the kids so he'd come back to the front door with his gun back under his jacket. I went back to keep the kids busy while he talked to the cops and then the cops cleared the house. Our visitors were no longer there but they had broken in through the backyard. Many of our Christmas presents were gone, the heaviest ones it seemed as I'd bought most of them and they had left one of their own, a large pile of poop on the back porch mat. Decorations I had up inside were knocked down and scattered all over the place. The tree completely disheveled. Two pieces from my nativity scene were smashed on the floor. Our laptops were gone and my jewelry box had also been pilfered. But unbeknownst to them, although some had sentimental meaning, that was all custom or low-level stuff. Anything real was in our hidden safe they had not found. My husband made sure not to touch the light switches that had been on so that they could dust for prints and other evidence was taken and we gave a report for the theft. It seems they spent a while inside the house without much fear, brazenly turning on lights, leaving a steaming pile and, maybe as they left, hopping up and tearing the Christmas lights off the corner of the house. No out-of-the-place fingerprints came back so they must have been wearing gloves and it remains unsolved. Next year, I asked for a security system for Christmas. This happened in the summer and I believe I was about 12 at the time. I was staying in a hotel in a fairly large city with my mom and my younger brother. We were visiting our extended family but chose not to stay in their house. My brother is younger than me by a decent amount so I was usually told to keep an eye on him. On the day we arrived, my mom told me to do just that while she checked us in and received our room card. So, my brother and I sat down on the couch in the lobby and relaxed a little bit. While we were sitting, a man in about his mid-forties walked into the hotel. The couch was facing the hotel doors, so I got a good look at him. I remember that he was very average looking. Describing his features and details could generate several different images. The guy comes in and sits on the couch opposite ours. I didn't think anything of it until I realized that he didn't go up to the counter first. He just came in and sat down. It made me feel a little uncomfortable. I thought that he might have followed us in. Thankfully, my mom called us over and told us that our room was ready. We left the lobby and went to our room. Shortly after, we left the hotel to go meet family. I forgot about the man for the rest of the day. We returned at about 7 and my mom told us that we could go swimming in the hotel pool. We all went to our rooms, changed, and went to the pool. 
A few minutes after we got into the water, the same man from before walked in and sat down. He was wearing jeans and a sweater, so he definitely wasn't going swimming. Again, we didn't think much of it, until I could see that my mom was visibly worried. She pointed him out to me and said that if he didn't leave within five minutes, we needed to go back to our rooms. Five minutes passed and he was still there, so we got our things and left. By then, it was close to eight. We had brought a rented movie to watch, so we planned to watch that and go straight to bed. I noticed that my mom was a little on edge because of the man watching us, and I got a little more worried myself too. Halfway through the movie, my mom got up to get in the shower. While she was in there, someone knocked on the door and said, Housekeeping, in a high-pitched voice. I thought it was weird that the cleaning staff would come this late, but we needed another towel, so I answered the door. I wish I hadn't been so stupid. It was the creepy man. He gave me a smile and a little wave. I just stood there, kind of motionless. My mind automatically went to the worst possible situation. Kidnapping, torture, etc. I heard the water in the shower turn off. He stood there as well for a moment, and then he spoke. How was your swim? At that moment, my mom came out of the shower, saw the man at the door, pulled me back, and slammed the door. She locked it, then she called the front desk from our hotel phone to report the guy. I told her to just call the police, but she didn't listen. She then requested we switch rooms. I then heard footsteps stomping down the hallway away from our room. Thankfully, the guy had left. After that, we switched hotel rooms and didn't see the guy again during our stay. A while ago, I was staying in an upscale hotel in the safe area of a large Midwestern city. I'm a 16-year-old female and I was in a room all by myself with my parents a few doors down. In theory, this isn't unsafe by any means, but I had bad luck on this particular trip. Our first night there passed without incident, me in my room, my parents in theirs. I watched a pay-per-view movie and ate way too much from the snack bar. I didn't have any reason to feel unsafe. The next morning, we did the usual tourist stuff that one does when visiting a new city. As we ate breakfast in the hotel restaurant, I noticed a man who looked to be in his 60s staring at me for an abnormally long amount of time. I won't lie, as a young, decently attractive female, I'm used to getting the occasional inappropriate look from a guy, so I ignored it and chalked it up to him either being a perv or thinking I look like his granddaughter or something. The next night, my parents allowed me to meet up with a friend for dinner who lived in the area. He met me in the hotel lobby, and we had a nice dinner and then went back to the hotel for drinks. Yes, I know I'm underage. Coincidentally, the same man who had been eyeing me earlier was at the bar. This time, I knew I didn't remind him of his granddaughter. Even with my buff guy friend next to me, his eyes traced every curve of my body. I felt unsettled and mentioned it to my friend, Ethan, who glanced over and also seemed really weirded out by how obvious this guy was leering. We left the bar quickly, and by now it was around 12.30 a.m. Ethan walked me to the elevators of the hotel, and once I pushed the button, left. I wish I would have asked him to stay because no sooner had he walked away that my creeper came rolling around the corner and stood there waiting with me for the elevator. I felt so uncomfortable knowing that he would be seeing what floor I was going to, but it hadn't occurred to me to get off on a different floor at the time, and even if it did, he planned on following me, so... It would have been just as bad a move. When we were in the elevator together, I tried to keep my eyes averted from his, but they literally bore into my body. He kept trying to step closer, and I kept backing up, too scared to even speak. What freaked me out even more was that he hadn't pressed a separate elevator button, so he planned on getting off when I did. When I got to my floor, I almost ran to my room, and the guy just stood at the end of the hallway, waiting to see where I was going. I stayed in my room for 15 minutes until I was sure he was gone before I told my parents what had happened. They were freaked out and told the hotel staff, but there was no sign of the guy and it was really late, so I just locked my door and tried to get some sleep. I had almost drifted off when I heard a knock at my door. No, I'm not an idiot. I didn't just go and open the door at nearly 2am. Instead, I turned on the light and froze. At this point, my intuition had kicked in and I knew it was the guy. I was near tears, but the knocking kept continuing, harder and harder. 
so I finally shouted and asked who it was. The voice that replied to me was the most chilling thing I had ever heard. High-pitched but growly, almost giggly, so disturbing I can barely describe it. It's hotel staff. Please let me in. I was terrified. A look through the peephole confirmed that it was the same creepy old guy. I locked myself in the bathroom and called my dad's phone. He has a habit of always keeping his ringer on, so he answered me almost immediately, and I tried to tell him what was wrong through my tears. The guy from before I managed is at my door, and what happened next gives me nightmares. My dad naturally went into superhero mode and opened his door to find the old man in just a robe, masturbating. It's pretty obvious to piece together what he was planning, and I still dream about it and have severe PTSD from it. My dad slugged the dude in the face and made sure he didn't move an inch while my mom called hotel security. We pressed charges, and the guy is in prison now in what I think are assault with intent to force himself upon me. I have recently moved to a new town and have been job hunting. I stopped by a hotel on the shoreline and went in to see if they needed someone for desk work. Inside was vacant, dark, and smelt stale. The man behind the desk had an extremely thick accent and it was difficult for me to understand him. It seemed like he was the only person in the whole building and I got a strange vibe from the whole place, but stayed to fill out the application and turn it in as quickly as possible. I could feel him staring at me the entire time. The man muttered something under his breath and took my application. After I left, I decided most likely I would not be accepting a position there because of the strangeness of the situation and really regretted leaving my phone number, address, and other personal info on the application. Later that evening, I'm at home watching the Olympics in my living room, around 10 or so. I go into my bedroom to grab my phone off the charger, and I see I have a missed call from just a few minutes earlier. It's strange for anyone to be calling me so late, but I redialed the number to satisfy my curiosity. A woman with a thick accent answers and demands to know who is calling. I politely told her that I had missed a call from this number. She starts screaming. No, 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 Samantha! At the top of her lungs and hangs up. It freaked me out that she had used my name in her crazy talk, but figured it was some crackhead that misdialed my number. I take my phone back with me into the living room and sit down. Right then my phone starts ringing again. I answer, and it's the man from the hotel yelling my name over and over again. He is screaming at the top of his lungs and I can hear the woman yelling too. I could catch pieces of what they were saying, but in between their accents and both of them screaming it was difficult to get it all. I heard, Disturb my phone. Disturb your life. You can't see. And that's about it. I hung up really fast and proceeded to flip out. They called back 14 times within about 20 minutes. Thankfully, I don't have my voicemail set up, so they couldn't leave any. My husband came home at around midnight, and I told him what happened. He laughed it off and said they were probably on drugs and just dialed my number to mess with me. I really hated the fact that these people had a decent chunk of my personal information, but I figured they were too crazy to do anything but make creepy phone calls at night. I finally calmed down enough to go to sleep at around 3 in the morning. About half an hour later, I wake up to my dog barking, growling, and charging at the back door. I know immediately something is wrong because she never acts like this and is well trained. My husband and I both sprinted into the living room and saw a hand reaching through the doggy door, clawing at the tile. I screamed and my husband grabbed me and we went into the bedroom and locked the door. I dialed the police and thankfully they were there within 10 minutes. The man was long gone, but... I knew exactly who it was. I gave them my statement and showed them my call log from earlier. They called the number, but it was a prepaid phone, so there wasn't a lot they could do to trace it. By the time the police left, it was around 5.30 in the morning, which was okay with me since I wouldn't be able to sleep anyways. A few hours later, my husband, who was still really angry, and I decided to go to the hotel to try to get some information about the guy and inform the staff that this guy was nuts. We spoke to the manager there, and he told us that the man I described had been fired a year ago for stalking a housemaid. Oh my god, what was he doing in the lobby last week then? 
They checked the security cameras and discovered that he was constantly around the hotel and staring in the windows. I guess he had snuck in while the manager left the desk right as I walked in. The manager contacted the police and was able to file trespassing charges against him. Now at least the police are looking for him. At this point I'm in tears. I had given a crazy person all my info and he was harassing and stalking me. I'm still receiving phone calls from strange numbers during the night, but luckily he hasn't returned to the house as far as I know. I contacted my references I had used on my application to let them know what was going on. Apparently, my old boss was left a voicemail at around 2 in the morning on Monday of heavy breathing and some strange moaning noises. This past week, I haven't been able to sleep at all. I'm a nervous wreck and jump out of my skin every time my phone rings or I hear my dog barking. So I get a message on a dating site from a girl. Not my type, but I check the message out. Hey, you're super hot. Want to come over to my hotel room? I was flattered, but definitely was not interested. However, she might be a good person, so I messaged her back. Not really looking for that, but I'm down to chat. No, I really want you to come over. I'm on vacation, and I'm at the hotel near your house. Once again, I say, I'm sorry, but I'm not interested. Where are you from and why choose here to vacation to? I'm from here, but I'm at a hotel wanting you to smash. Come over. At this point, I was sketched out. Why rent a hotel room when you live here? It's a smaller city. So I did the smart thing. I blocked her. I sent a message beforehand saying goodbye and hope she finds someone that is interested. Fast forward 30 minutes. She made a second account and sent me this. I'm serious. I really want you to come over. Here's something to persuade you. And it was an Imgur link to a picture of a naked woman in a bed. So, I block her again. Not even 15 minutes went by and there was another account and message from her. At this point, I think I'm getting trolled. My friends could easily have pulled this off. I wanted to call their bluff, so I created a new kick account, gave my info, and told her to go on video. I was going to catch my friends. Well... It was her. She quickly went into doing things trying to persuade me. I deleted the kick and avoided it. Deleted my dating account. Was completely sketched out. About two months later I reactivated it one lonely night. About a day later I get a message from her saying that she saw me riding my bike downtown a few weeks ago. She described what I was wearing. I had enough. I told her I could take this to the police for harassment. I actually didn't know if I had a good case, but I wanted to scare her away. It worked. Hadn't heard a peep since. I'd never been more grateful to think with my brain instead of my other head. So my girlfriend and I got a motel for two nights. It was not the best motel, not on the best side of town, but it was cheap so it worked for us. I was 20 and she was 19 at the time. Anyways, the first night went fine. However, the second night things started to get strange. At about midnight there was a banging on her door. I looked out the peephole to see a scraggly looking shorter white man standing outside my door with jeans on and no shirt. My first thought was that this guy was probably on drugs or something It was probably banging on everyone's door for whatever reason. Whatever, I'm tired, time to go to sleep. Then, about 2 a.m., as my girlfriend and I are starting to fall asleep, I think I hear the man say something outside. You and your girl are gonna die tonight. Now, I tried to trick myself into thinking that I didn't really hear this. I mean, why would some random stranger say this? How did he even know I had a girl in the room? Had he been watching us earlier? All these thoughts are going through my mind while my girlfriend is asleep. Her name is Jane. I don't want to disturb her, but at this point, I'm feeling pretty nervous, so I nudge her awake. I say quietly, I think that guy is still outside. She is half asleep and thinks I'm being paranoid. He begins to knock on her door again. Alarmed, we get up to look through the peephole. This time he is standing in front of our door, but looking the opposite direction with his hands behind his back, almost militaristically. I begin calling the police from the motel phone. Jane thought I was overreacting, but I was too afraid not to call. I told the police about the man and they said they would send somebody out. 
I called the lobby and told them as well, but they said they couldn't do anything and that I should call the police. Sure enough, about 10 minutes later, actually a pretty decent response time, a police car rolls through the parking lot. Then they leave. What? They must not have seen the guy. Great. Now this guy starts talking more craziness outside. He says stuff along the lines of, Man, you called the cops? You're just a freaking baby. I'm going to beat you to death. But stops shortly after, and we didn't hear anything from him for another 10 to 15 minutes. Then again outside, I hear him say, You and your girl are going to die tonight. Jane heard him this time as well, and she instantly was on my level of terrifiedness. And she hadn't heard this before and insinuated I was over paranoid or hearing things. She insisted we call the police, and this time I let her talk to them. She was much more shooken up on the phone and conveyed a necessary sense of urgency I wasn't capable of. Again, a police cruiser comes through the parking lot. I see the car is about to leave again. Angry, I walked outside to the cruiser. I felt safe enough to walk outside since the police were right there. I asked why they were leaving and they said that they talked to the guy but he wasn't doing anything obviously criminal so they couldn't do anything about it. The officer said he was messing with the air conditioner to our room. I explained to the officer the comments we heard this man making about killing us, but again, he told me there was nothing he could do. Oh my God, right? So the cops leave again. They leave me and my girlfriend alone at this motel with this crazy guy for the second time. Now he's angry and must have seen me talking to the cops. Again, he's knocking on our door, calling me a little baby, saying he's going to kill me. So I call the cops for the third time. About 15 minutes later, I heard the sound of handcuffs outside my room. I had never felt so relieved. I don't know what happened and why they finally decided to arrest him. I'm just glad that they did. I could hear him saying, What did I do? I, I didn't do anything. While they were cuffing him. As soon as the police were gone, my girlfriend and I left the motel. Luckily, my friend was awake at 4 a.m. when I called him, and we crashed at his house for the night. When we were pulling out of the motel parking lot, I could see the man in the back of the police car looking at me. The deadest and most soulless eyes I had ever seen. I was 14 when this occurred and I'm 22 now, but I still remember in crisp detail and it freaks me out to this day thinking about what could have happened if things turned out differently. School was out for summer and I had convinced my mom to send me to Russia for a couple of months to visit my grandparents. We moved to North America when I was little and I hadn't been back much since. Plus I thought it would be fun being on my first trip abroad by myself. She agreed and off I went on my first solo transatlantic journey. My grandparents are great people and have always spoiled me and my mom rotten and they were ecstatic their only granddaughter wanted to visit. So they planned a little vacation of their own with me a month after I arrived to a popular beach resort city in Turkey. We were to stay at a five-star resort in Ankara for two weeks. I thought that was spectacular, getting to travel to not one, but two countries in one summer, and to a fancy exotic place like Turkey. I was dying to go. But, full disclosure, when I arrived to Russia, it wasn't really what I was expecting. My grandparents are really protective people, and I couldn't do much or go anywhere by myself, so it got boring pretty fast, and I spent most of my days playing PSP in my room. I was also accustomed to being active and wanted to do things like go jogging, which I did every day at home, so I gave my grandparents a hard time about this since they wouldn't let me go alone, and naturally they couldn't really keep up. Then after about a month, the time came to go to Turkey, and I was super excited to finally get some freedom and a change of scenery. I had been pent up at home too long. The resort they had picked was sprawled over a pretty large area, however it was all very well secured and isolated from the rest of the city and there was also a huge garden on the property which was ideally suited for jogging. This time, I had my own room separate from my grandparents, so I took this chance to go off by myself and explore the grounds. Most of the time, I would go jogging in the mornings when it was cooler with my big old iPod, so I couldn't hear anything that was going on around me, but I figured it was pretty safe since it was a nice hotel with plenty of tourists. Then I started to notice him. A pretty innocuous seeming gardener in his late 40s, early 50s in a green uniform. I remember he looked like a shriveled old date from too many years in the sun. He would always wave or say something in broken English as I passed by while he trimmed the shrubs or mowed the lawn. 
I would politely wave back, smile or nod, but I didn't really pay much attention. Fast forward about 10 days and I was really enjoying myself. It was fun to swim in the pool in the sea, the food was great, and my grandparents had let up a lot so I could do more by myself. However, they didn't know about my morning runs in the gardens, and I wasn't going to tell them because I wasn't sure they would approve. So one morning at around 7am while I'm jogging, I see the gardener again, but this time it's clear he's trying to get my attention. He waves at me and yells something, so I stop and pull out my earphones, trying to figure out what he wants. Now, I know he works for the hotel, so I don't really suspect anything. He waves at me again and motions me to come forward. I'm confused, but I figured he wants to tell me something, so I politely approach. He's standing at a trail that goes deeper into the gardens and foliage. He's smiling and gesturing, and I can see he's holding something in his hand. Rosa, he says. Beautiful Rosa. Then I notice he's holding a rose and extending it to me. At this point I'm confused and a little freaked out about what he's thinking, but I stay put. Usually the hotel staff there are chatty, but nice enough. My grandparents would always get pulled into conversations with him about things. I figured it's something like this now, and I don't want to be rude, but still want to be on my way without offending the old man. He hands the flower to me and I take it, thinking maybe he wants to show me some roses that are in bloom, but he keeps waving and gesturing, like he wants me to follow him, and stupidly I walk closer. He has another flower in his hand, and he backs away more. Then suddenly he stops and starts to lower it a little. That's when I notice he's holding his other hand behind his back too, and he's holding something. I look ahead up the trail and see a little cabin type thing where I assume they keep their gardening supplies. Something clicks in my head then, and I instantly back away. He sees me do that and tries to smile, saying, Rosa, again, and moves the hand he's holding behind his back while lurching toward me. That's when I see he's holding some kind of rag. Without hesitation, I drop the rose he handed me, turn around and run for it at full speed. I don't stop to look back and run like mad back to the hotel. It's not until the doors close behind me and I'm among other people that I look back and see if he's followed me. I don't see him anymore and my heart is beating like crazy. I go back to my hotel and wait for my grandparents to wake up. I never told them any of what happened that day and spent the rest of my vacation glued to their side. I thought that if I'd said anything, they would get even more paranoid about my safety and blame me for wandering off on my own. Also, I didn't want to ruin the remaining days for them. I saw the gardener once more on the beach. I remember him talking to a security guard. I remember growing very uncomfortable and sinking into my sun chair when I saw him. Then he looked at me and smiled. I scowled at him as he mouthed the word Rosa tauntingly and smiled again. I still remember the anger bubbling in my stomach and how much I wanted to cleave his face in, but I just froze and stared. He walked away and I went back to pretending nothing ever happened. Needless to say, I never went on any more morning jogs, and neither did I want to until long after the summer had ended and I'd returned back home. When I was about 16, I went on a trip to Cabo San Lucas with my family and my best friend. My friend and I had a hotel room to ourselves for the trip, something I was naturally excited about. One afternoon, I was getting on the elevator and a security guard got on with me. As the elevator rose, he looked at me and said, Excuse me, were you wearing a green skirt on the beach the other day? Um, yes, why? I replied. I was already reflexively creeped out at the mention of a miniskirt I had worn a few days prior. Oh, nothing. I just really liked it a lot. When I got out of the elevator, he got off on the same floor and was walking past as I took out my keycard to unlock the door to my room. At 4am that morning, I woke up with a startle, only to register that there was a man standing silently at the foot of my bed, a man in a security guard uniform, the one from the elevator. As he saw me wake up, he stammered something about my door not being locked properly and ran out of the room. I was still groggy with sleep and didn't fully register what had just happened. A moment after he ran out, I became aware I was lying on my back with covers around my ankles. I sleep nude, but never kick my covers off in my sleep as I was always cold and the AC was on full blast as well. 
I'm also a very deep sleeper, so someone standing at my bed alone would never stir me. I'm pretty sure him pulling the covers back, causing me to get cold, is what woke me. I am scared to think what could have happened had my friend not been fast asleep in the next bed. Unfortunately, as I was creeped out in the elevator and had avoided making eye contact or looking at his face, and as it was so dark I couldn't have identified him in the room, I never bothered to report it to the hotel. I still regret that, years later. I'm not much of a storyteller, so bear with me. During the 90s, I went through a very rough time in my life. After a failed marriage, I became a bit of a nomad, wandering across country on foot with no particular destination. It was a stupid idea, but I was in a very hopeless place back then, and just looking to experience something new. I had been traveling down South Dakota and hitched a ride with a truck driver into Nebraska. For those of you who have never been to that state, there are large sections of land that go on for miles with nothing but cornfields lining either side of the road. We split ways at a rest stop, and I made my way into what I now know to be the Sand Hills of Nebraska. The Sand Hills region is one of the most isolated areas in the United States, 20,000 square miles of nothing but dunes and prairies. I planned on hitchhiking my way to the nearest town and catching a bus to visit a friend I had in Omaha. Full disclosure, I had absolutely no idea what the hell I was doing. I subscribed to the I'll figure it out when I get there mentality. At the time, I didn't know a whole lot about Nebraska, but I found out the hard way that this stretch of road was not ideal for hitchhiking. I barely saw any cars going down this road, and the ones that did completely ignored me. Twelve hours had passed, and I was running low on food and water. I was utterly exhausted at this point, and I needed to find a place to rest for a while. I had about an hour left of daylight. Lucky for me, I happened to come upon an old farmhouse that was situated about a half mile away from the main road. From a distance, I thought this place may have been occupied, but when I got closer, it was clear to me that this house was abandoned. This was around the fall, so weather in Nebraska wasn't terrible. However, the nights were a bit on the cold side, so I decided to hold up in this house for the night and continue my journey the next day. I had enough supplies to last me one more night. The house was your typical rotting husk. Smelled like mold, severe water damage, creaking floors, etc. The living room seemed to be the only decent place to settle down at so I unpacked my sleeping bag and eventually dozed off. I woke up to the sound of floorboards creaking. I immediately sat up and listened. I could hear several pairs of footsteps thudding all around the house. They were coming from upstairs, downstairs, on the back porch outside, and even in the same room with me. But I didn't see a thing. I quickly got to my feet and walked over to the nearest window and peered out. What I saw was truly alarming and sent a wave of nausea through my entire body. Several cloaked figures were standing side by side. They appeared to be encircling the house. Because of the footsteps I heard, I thought there may have been people in the house with me. So in an effort to defuse things, I made another big brain decision and spoke up. Um, hello? I'm sorry if I'm trespassing. I was just looking for a place to rest for the night. I thought this place was abandoned. Again, I'm sorry. All the footsteps stopped at once. An eerie silence followed. It was so quiet that I could have heard a mouse shitting in the corner. I got this real bad feeling in my gut, so I reached into my backpack and pulled out my hunting knife. I gathered the rest of my things and slowly moved out into the hallway. Aside from the mysterious figures outside, I was also thinking of what was making those footsteps inside the house. As I said, I heard several footsteps when I woke up, so I figured it wouldn't be long before I ran into someone inside the house. But after combing the entire downstairs, I didn't see or hear anything. I could tell something was very off. 
that bad feeling I mentioned earlier intensified. Despite the fact that I knew there was a bunch of weirdos and cloaks waiting for me outside, something told me that if I didn't leave the house that very moment, something terrible was going to happen to me. The house was located in a wide open clearing. Beyond the clearing was a barrier of tall grass. When I left through the front door, I stopped directly in front of the house. No matter which direction I looked, I saw another hooded menace blocking my way. I suddenly felt this heat on my back. I quickly turned around and was shocked to see that the house I just left was now engulfed in flames. I cannot explain how this happened. Moments before, I was inside that house, walking around, and it was now on fire. I backed away. I decided that I was going to run through the figures and get the hell out of Dodge, but when I turned back around, the figures were nowhere in sight. Things were getting way too bizarre for me at that point. The only thing I knew for sure was that I had to get the fuck out of that place. When I got back out to the main road, I didn't stop walking until I finally got to a town, whose name I can't remember. The rest of my time in Nebraska went well, and I got my life together shortly after I got back home from my trip. As long as I live, I'll never forget that old farmhouse and those mysterious cloaked figures. This incident still baffles me to this day, but perhaps some things are best left unanswered. There was a time my parents went on a trip to Europe. I was taking care of their house. I was home for the summer from school anyway, so it was fine. I had been there for a few weeks and it was pretty quiet. I just went to work, came home, had some time with my friend, enjoying the house to ourselves and whatnot. But one night, I was just laying there watching TV when I heard this really weird low whistling sound coming from the window that was behind the couch. It struck me as sort of odd, and I just shrugged it off. But then it happened again. It totally sounded like it was a person standing up against the window whistling. I looked out the window and obviously there was no one there, so I figured I should go check it out. If it was something like the wind on a siding, I should probably fix it because that would get annoying. So I walked out into the backyard. The backyard in my parents' house is really, really pretty. It's sparse, but sort of forest that leads to a road on the other side. So I looked at the house and didn't see anything. But then I heard the sound again. It was coming from the woods in the back. I was pretty creeped out at this point, And of course, I couldn't see anything in the woods. So I hurried back through the door and I locked it behind me. I never really heard that sound again for the next few days. Until one night, I was asleep in my room and I could have sworn I was awakened by the whistling sound against my second floor window. I listened hard and it was dead silent. So I decided I should go ahead and look out the window. I did that whole thing where I crept super slowly towards it and just sort of peeked through it. Outside my window, there was a man just standing there. I was really sleepy, so I can't know how much of this I'm misremembering, but he was just sitting there staring at me. I was completely frozen, and slowly, the man pursed his lips, and I could hear that whistle again. It was crystal clear. It made me feel like crying. I tore myself away from the window and I hid under my covers. The next night I insisted that my friend stay with me. He did, and of course nothing happened. He figured that I was just tired and delirious and maybe I was right. It gets kind of anticlimactic here, but I didn't hear it for another week or so. And when I did, it was just one small whistle just happening randomly, coming from a wall or something like that. It just happens every week or so, and it always freaks me out tremendously. To this day, I will never stay in that house alone anymore. My name is Chris, and this happened to me in the late 1970s. I grew up in a poor neighborhood in Calgary, Alberta. 
And like most young kids, I had a number of friends from school and the neighborhood. I was 13 at the time, and this was right at the very beginning of the personal home computer revolution. You would hear about personal computers on the news all the time. However, no one actually owned a home computer, and it was almost like a story of science fiction to actually see one. One day, my friends started talking about this university professor who moved into one of our duplexes near our school. He was supposed to be a really cool guy who had all kinds of gadgets in his apartments, and he actually owned a personal computer. One afternoon, when walking home from school, I was crossing through a park near the professor's house. From the second floor balcony of the duplex, I saw some of my friends and they waved to me to come over, so I did. The teacher lived on the second floor of a two-story duplex and looked a part of a teacher with shaggy hair, beard, and glasses. At the time, I was too young and naive to see the warning signs about this guy. He lived alone in a three-bedroom duplex apartment. He said he had a girlfriend, but we never actually saw any woman ever at the apartment when me and my friends were there. He had a lot of weird-looking camera equipment and developed his own film. Most importantly, he was a computer science teacher when the field was pretty brand new and he had built a home computer from scratch. My friends and I thought he was the coolest guy we ever met. He had all kinds of games on his computer and he allowed any of the young guys in the neighborhood to pop by and play on his computer. He also had all kinds of weird gadgets and experiments. He had one of those Jacob Ladder lightning arc gadgets you'd see in those old horror movies. He always seemed to have some new gadget he was making. It wasn't long before we were going over this teacher's house to play on their computers or see his weird gadgets all the time. Sometimes he'd get very physical and grab one of us from behind and bear hug us when he was greeting us. Or he'd stand uncomfortably close to us. After a few months, we were getting suspicious about this guy and he didn't seem to have any family or friends. Sometimes, when there were a lot of kids at his apartment and he was distracted, we would snoop around and look in his cabinets and things like that. we find weird items like a pair of brass knuckles, handcuffs, and some beads that looked like they were supposed to be white, but they had dried up brown stuff on them. And the door to his bedroom was always locked. One day, when there was a lot of kids there, he put on some music. He always puts on music, but this time it wasn't top 40 music like he usually would put on. It was like folk music of some kind. My buddy and I were already suspicious at this point. And while everyone was having fun on the computer or hanging with the teacher, we listened to the lyrics of the music. It was hard to make out the lyrics over all the raised voices in the room. But it became very clear that the lyrics was about homosexuality. My buddy and I freaked out as it hit us at the same time that this guy might like kids in a way that wasn't right. We quickly made an excuse to leave and went home and told our parents of our suspicions. My father freaked out and told us never to go over that guy's place again. We also put the word out on the street and pretty quickly everyone became weary of this guy. However, one of my friends from our block, Danny, he thought we were all wrong and he kept going to see this teacher. One day, Danny stopped coming to school and the rumor was that something bad happened to him by that guy with the computers. Danny moved away, and not long after, so did the teacher. I can't tell you how lucky me and my buddies felt to have stopped going to that guy's house before something happened to us. Years later, when I was in my early 20s, I took a course at the university on computer programming. One night, my buddy and I were in a computer lab, and we were testing out a new program I wrote. When who walks into the lab? That old guy. This time, both my buddy and I stood up and yelled at that guy to get away from us. He quickly left, and other people in the lab asked what was going on. We told them what happened years ago. I don't know if someone reported him, but we never saw him at the university again after that. My name is Stan. I'm 17 years old, and this story happened about four years ago. The school I went to was in a very rural area in my village. 
My friend Peter went to the same school, but I lived further away. His mom would always drop him off near my house and we would always walk to school together. On our way to school, we would always pass some farms and one of them had this really old creepy house that was abandoned for years. One day me and Peter said we should check it out and see what's in there basically. We couldn't go after school because like I said, Peter lived further away and his mom needed to get him home. This was also during the winter so it got dark sooner. So myself and Peter, we came up with the plan that Peter would have a sleepover around my house. And when my parents were asleep, we would sneak out and explore the abandoned farmhouse. It was Friday and the past few days had been snowing. After school, Peter came to my house. We spent the evening playing video games and looking up creepy videos on the internet, anxiously waiting to sneak out. When AM rolled around and we put our coats on and snuck out my bedroom window, which is ground level. We had one flashlight between the both of us, which Peter managed to sneak out of his dad's garage. We walked through the farm fields and made it to the house. Naturally, the first thing we did was try to open the front door, but it was locked. We looked around at a few of the windows and one of them was smashed open. So we used this as our entrance. Surprisingly, the place seemed rather untouched for how long it had been rumored to be abandoned. It was just covered in dust and had a really strong smell. Not bad necessarily, but it did smell odd. I shone my flashlight to the top of the stairs. I couldn't see anything, but it seemed really eerie up there. And then I heard wood creaking. It kind of sounded like slow footsteps, but I wasn't certain. Peter then said, we should check upstairs. I told him I'm not going, there's probably some maniac up there waiting to kill us. The next thing that happened was the phone rang. One of those really old phones made myself and Peter jump out of our skin. At that time, I didn't think about it, but I thought it was weird of how someone was calling this house and it was abandoned. I picked it up and I said in a nervous voice, uh, hello? For a second there, there wasn't any response. And then a man spoke on the other end saying, I'm not a maniac. Why don't you come upstairs and see for yourself? At that point, loud, heavy footsteps ran across the upstairs room and toward the top of the stairs. Peter and I ran out the farmhouse as fast as we could. We ran out down to the farm. I glanced back to see if there was someone chasing us but there wasn't. So I told Peter to slow down so we could catch our breath for a second. After taking a better look at the house, one of the upstairs lights was on and there was a dark figure standing at the window watching us. I didn't know what to think and honestly, I was terrified. The light then turned out and the both of us made our way back to my house. We managed to sneak back inside without making my parents wake up. Peter didn't say much. I think he was too creeped out as to what just happened. And to be honest, I didn't feel like talking either. I was actually quite paranoid that, I don't know, that guy was gonna follow us to my house. Thankfully, at least to what I know of, we weren't followed. From that night on, every time me and Peter walked to school, we look at that creepy farmhouse. We can't help but feel someone's looking back at us. For a little backstory, I'm trans. I try to present as male as best as I can, but it's still pretty obvious that I'm biologically female. I have short hair and I wear guy clothes, but I have a very unmistakably female face. I also live in a very religious area, so it's not a very common or accepted thing. One of our neighbors is a priest, but he's very accepting and his house is a bit like a second home for me because I think of him like one of my grandparents and he sees me as a grandson. Anyway, I was walking home from school during the winter a few years ago and it had started snowing. Needless to say, it was pretty damn cold and I was miserable. The wind felt like it ignored my clothes and chilled me right to the bone. It was hard to hurry because the freezing wind made my muscles really stiff. 
I was only maybe a quarter of the way home when a car slowed down and pulled up next to me. It was just a little old lady. She looked nice enough, and at this point I was willing to do anything to get out of walking another three miles in the cold, so I got in when she offered to give me a ride. It felt a hell of a lot better in that car than it did to walk. She was very nice at first. She prattled on about how her grandchildren went to the same school as me, talked about how lucky we were to live in such a nice Christian community, and so on. When she started on about being a good Christian, about how much she loved Jesus, I was a bit uncomfortable, but I didn't say anything. After all, even though I'm not a Christian myself, it isn't my place to say anything about religion. Believe what you believe and all that. She'd just been nice enough to give me a ride, so I didn't want to offend her. When she started talking about Leviticus, that's when I knew I had messed up by getting into her car. She started going on and on about gay people and how they're just confused, how man should not lay with man, and so on. We were getting close to where I was going to have her drop me off. When I mentioned that she could drop me off there, she looked over at me and didn't say anything. She didn't slow down either. I was starting to get nervous. We passed the point I'd told her about. I looked over at her and said something along the lines of, you can let me out here. She gripped the steering wheel really hard and said, I can't let you out. You need me. I asked her what the hell she was talking about and she turned to me. Your short hair. I knew I needed to help you when I saw it. You're a sick girl. You need to let go of the demon inside you. I tried to cast aside the discomfort of being called a girl and stumbled out something about just liking short hair, having a boyfriend, anything that would make me seem a little bit more innocent in her eyes. But it didn't look like she believed me. I wanted to cry as I watched the drop-off point get further and further away. I begged her to let me out, promised that I would go to church, repent my sins, as long as she let me out and let me go home to my family. She screamed at me that she hated dykes and that she was going to call her son to help her, quote, fix me. At that point, I knew I needed to get out. I grabbed the handle and unlocked the door, only to feel my hopes sink as the electric lock kicked in and relocked it. She was still screeching about how I just needed to be with a man and it would fix me. That accepting God's truth would fix me. It might sound ridiculous to be afraid of an old Christian lady, but I was terrified. I was so scared of what would happen if I didn't get out. I took my chance and rolled down the window as fast as I could and made a jump for it. I landed on a pile of rocks and my breath was knocked out of me. I could hardly move. Everything in my body hurt horribly, but I knew I needed to get out of Dodge before she decided to come back. I got up and limped into my neighborhood. As soon as I came to that old priest's house, I snapped out of the stupor I was in and was hysterical. I banged wildly on the door until he let me in, and I cried uncontrollably while he called the police. I was taken to the hospital after I told the police what had happened. The jump from that car broke my femur in four places and cracked both my knees. It amazed doctors that I was able to make it to the priest's house in the condition that I was in. I've never seen that lady again or her car, but since then I never walked to or from school alone anymore. I can only hope nobody ever got into her car again. The story literally happened to me a week ago. My name is Joseph and I live in a country based in Europe. I am a student studying at university and currently live with my parents. A few days ago before this outbreak took place in my country, we had been informed through the media that we shouldn't leave our houses and to minimize contact with people for the next two weeks. The government had closed down all schools and certain businesses. This also included events within my own country. It was a Friday evening. I was trying to kill some time by playing computer games when me and my parents heard our doorbell ring. I was confused because we weren't expecting anyone. It would be really irresponsible to visit during the outbreak. I thought to myself that it could be one of my aunts or my cousins who needed help or supplies, so I immediately went to answer the front door. I was just surprised that they didn't inform us about this visit earlier. Before I could even touch the door handle, I looked through the blinds to see who it was. It wasn't any of our relatives, but two men in dirty yellow overalls which looked like hazmat suits. I couldn't even make out their faces, 
They looked so creepy. My heart started to beat faster. I thought that my father or mother had her symptoms, and they called the hospital for doctors or some medical professional. Maybe they didn't tell me so as to not make me so worried or panic about them. But when I checked the living room, neither of them seemed to be ill. They were surprised too. Something doesn't feel right. The doorbell rang once again. I hesitated, but I finally pulled the door open. The men introduced themselves as a disinfection team sent by the city council. They told us that every house in the area would be disinfected and we will need to leave for an hour. They even showed us papers that seemed legit. We had many doubts, but they convinced us. Looking back, it, it was the dumbest thing we did, but they inspired trust in us, and we were already distracted by the stress of the situation. Me and my parents looked at each other. We shrugged our shoulders and decided to take a walk. They gave us a copy of a warrant, plus we thought we were leaving our house in safe hands. After a few minutes of walking, I remembered that I forgot to turn off the oven. I said it to my parents about this and they decided to wait for me. I sprinted back to my house. As I got to the house, I heard some weird noises behind the closed door. Why did they close the door? I said to myself. Fortunately, I had an extra key and I opened the door. The view inside the house horrified me. I saw a huge mess. All of the cabinets were left open, furniture was turned over on the floor, and all of the food we gathered as supplies were thrown out. I froze from fear. Millions of thoughts were flying through my head at that moment. I immediately knew we had become victims of a robbery. How could we have been so stupid? I thought to myself. I turned around and wanted to run out of the house and call the cops, but I stumbled upon one of the robbers standing at the front door holding a big knife. I can't let you leave, boy. You seem too much, he said to me in a really evil way. Then he started to run towards me. Without hesitation, I ran to the bathroom and locked the door behind me. He was screaming and pounding on the door. If you open the door, I won't hurt you. I promise, he said. Of course, I didn't believe him and hid inside the bathtub. He started to stab the wooden door. I was so scared I couldn't even blink. My heart was pounding so hard. It felt as if I was trying to escape my chest. I started to pray because I thought that was literally the last moments of my life. Tears started to stream down my face. I cried more than I had ever cried in my entire life. Finally, the pounding on the door stopped. He was gone. I heard police sirens and I opened the door. My parents ran up to me and hugged me. I felt like the luckiest person alive. I was so happy. They told me that after a while of waiting, they eventually decided to walk back to the house. Then my father saw a robber in the door with a knife. He hid behind the trees and called the police. The police told us that they were searching for these men for two weeks. They had already robbed 10 houses in the nearby cities and used the situation as a way to gain trust in people and to access their properties. The papers they found on them were also fake. I hope they will rot in prison now. Let this be a warning. I hope you guys won't fall for this kind of scam. I have never been a huge believer in the supernatural, but I'm not closed-minded either. It's just I have never had an experience of my own, that is until one night in early December of 2016. I was 16 at the time and was doing what I love best, that is, hunting with my father and grandfather. I have been an avid hunter since my dad brought me my first hunting license when I was just a mere age of seven. Throughout my life I have hunted all kinds of game, from pheasants and turkeys, bears and foxes, to deer and elk. So it's safe to say, I am very familiar with the wildlife all over the United States. This particular encounter took place on my grandparents' property in southern Maine. They own 55 acres of land with a small river that runs through the southwest corner of the property. However, that time of year, that river is nothing but a mud pit. For a little more detail, the topography of the land is very hilly with steep inclines and deep valleys. The plan for the evening hunt was supposed to be a short one and was only supposed to take two to three hours. My dad and grandpa were supposed to come from opposite sides of the valley, and I would come down the hill, 
and we would all meet at the halfway point in the valley and walk out together. The valley was very easy to find and it was an old logging road and was well marked. The idea was to push deer to each other. We had a late start so there were only two and a half hours or so of daylight left by the time I started my solo trek down into the valley. Before I started my hunt, I pulled out my phone and looked at the map of the property. I know, I should be able to walk down the hill without navigation, but I have a huge fear that I'll take a wrong turn and get horribly lost. What scares me most is pissing off my grandfather for making him wait for me at the rendezvous point, so to be safe I looked at the map. The first part of the hunt started off without a hitch. It was making good time while stopping every once in a while trying to look for a deer sign. So far there was nothing worth mentioning, but I was happy to be in the woods regardless. Things, however, became really bad, really quickly. As I mentioned, there wasn't much daylight left to begin with, so we took that into account. What we didn't take into account was that the storm came in like a bat out of hell with no warning. In an instant, the sky became dark as night and the snow came down to the point where seeing more than five feet in front of you was damn near impossible. I had enough and began to haul my butt to the meeting point at the bottom of the hill. Once I finally reached the level ground, a wave of relief finally fell over me. I was cold, wet, and wanted a hot shower. Then my heart sank. I was not at the old logging road. In fact, I had no idea where I was. Crap. Everything I know about making out of situations like this tells me to stay calm. Forget about that, I am everything but calm. I knew I was down the hill, so I had the hope that my grandfather and dad were somewhere close by. Not even thinking about scaring any deer, I yell out, Dad! Grandpa! I took a momentary pause to listen for a response. All that I heard was the wind blowing through the valley and the sound of snowfall. Then I heard something I truly cannot explain. I heard, Dad! Grandpa! Echoed back to me. What the heck? Over here! I yelled back, only to have, Over here! Yell back to me. This time it was really close. Whatever was echoing me was moving fast. To heck with this! I pulled out my phone to try to call my dad or at least figure out where I am, but of course it was dead. The only thing I was sure of was the fact that I did not want to be in these woods any longer. I figured that if I walk in one direction long enough, I would eventually end up at a house or a road. I must have been walking for close to a half hour with no sign of, well, anything but more woods. The whole way I had an uneasy feeling. It was like something was there but it wasn't like it was watching me. It felt like it was stalking me. Every time I paused to get my bearings, I could hear the sound of the snow crunching under my footsteps. When I had enough, I called out, Who's there? Nothing but the sounds of steps circling me. Then I remember them stopping. I was able to pinpoint where the steps stopped. It was dead ahead of me. I looked out into the woods, and behind a large hemlock, I noticed something ducked behind a tree. It was quick, so I couldn't make out any details, but whatever it was, it was tall and skinny, and was thin enough to hide behind a tree without being seen. By this point, I wasn't sure what my next move would be. I was too afraid to move forward to the hemlock. I had no interest in finding out whatever this creature was. I raised my rifle and pulled back the firing pin. I put a round into the tree, and almost instantly I heard the thing take off at warp speed. Thinking I got rid of this thing, I continued walking in the same direction. I thought if I could just get to a road, my dad and grandpa would be looking for me. So I carried on and so did the storm. After another hour or so with no other issues, I finally stumbled onto a paved street. Now I had to figure out how to contact my dad so they could come pick me up. That is when I heard it again. Dad! Grandpa! Over here! The thing had still been stalking me. I fired off another round into the air, but it had no effect. The creature just kept yelling back to me, and it was getting closer. Once it sounded like it was almost on top of me, it went dead silent. 
I looked around and heard a welcome sound. It was my dad's truck coming down the road. Thank God. I piled in and began to tell my dad and grandpa everything. When my dad started to drive off, I looked behind me, and through the red glow of the tail light, I saw a tall figure duck behind another tree. I, to this day, never figured out what was stalking me in those woods. If anyone has any ideas as to what I encountered, I'm all ears. For this story, my name will be Charlie. Years ago, my first year of college, I lived in a dorm. But if only I knew what was going to happen. I earned a scholarship to college for baseball and all the players lived in one dorm. Being that I was a freshman, they roomed me with a senior so he could show me what right looks like. He was a pretty tough guy who no one would mess with, so I felt like I was in good hands. It was the winter and by that time of the school year, I was pretty set in my ways and comfortable. I was invited to a house party that one of the sororities were throwing, so I went with a few friends. When we got there, it was like any other party. People were outside, and some were inside having fun. While inside, there was music playing along with people playing video games in one room, and it looked like a board game going on in the other. That was upstairs. After a while, I went upstairs to see why anyone would be playing a board game at a party. When I got to the room, I noticed that it was the most quiet room in the house, which was odd to me. When I walked in the room, there were four girls and a guy sitting at a table. I asked what was going on, and they said they were using the Ouija board. I thought it sounded interesting, so I joined. But I never really believed in that type of stuff. While we were messing with the board, they said that there was a girl in the room. But I think that one of the other people that were playing moved it, so I left. That's when unexplainable stuff would happen to me in my dorm. I'd hear laughing in our hallways at odd times of the night, knocks on the window, and I started to have bad dreams. I told my roommate, but he told me it was stress from our upcoming midterms. That went on for about two weeks. Then one night, everything changed for both of us. I remember it being a Thursday night when this happened. I was sleeping in the middle of the night, and all I heard was, Charlie, Charlie. Wake up. I remember making noises and being half asleep, but I acknowledged him. Then he said something that woke me up immediately. Charlie, what the fuck is that in the corner? I looked in the corner of the room and I swear there was a silhouette of a girl. I was so afraid that I jumped off the top bunk and I told my roommate to get up and run, but he was so petrified. He was under his covers quivering. Then she spoke. So scared. All I wanted to do was play with you. I told him I'm out and we both ran out of our room. He was yelling that she's talking. After that, we were both so shaken that we never went back to that room. We called the police, but when they came, they never found any girl. I don't know if it was because of the house party, Ouija board game, or coincidence, but that was a moment that I'll never forget. To this day, I still hear odd noises throughout the night wherever I go. So, I've been watching a YouTube series about deep web exploration. I won't name this series or the channel it belongs to, I mean, I'm not getting paid for advertisements. Anyway, I looked up a video on how to access said deep web. I did it fast and dirty, not much research on what not to do. Big mistake. Let me tell you right now, using Windows on the deep web is a bad idea, that much I did know. Easy to get hacked that way since it's the most prominent OS. I know you can boot up a live USB on a Linux clone OS, I mean, a simple Google search can tell you how to do that. It's not as difficult as it sounds. But I figured if my laptop gets hacked, I'm screwed. I can't exactly afford to just buy a new one right now. So I thought I'd be smart and use my Android tablet. What a genius, right? Yeah, I know. I'm an idiot. So a few VPN apps later and I'm surfing the deep web. 
looking around like a little kid in an adult store. I have no clue what any of it means, but I'm interested in it all. I'm aware you can find a lot of snuff in pedo rings, so I treaded carefully. Unfortunately, I stumbled upon one of the two. I'm not going to say which, but it made me sick to my stomach and I nearly quit then and there. In fact, I did, for a few minutes. I chalked it up to bad luck and resolved to be more careful. I'm not into that shit, not by a long shot. I'm not some deviant with fetishes for snuff or kids. Jeez, man. That image will probably be burned into my brain for the rest of my miserable life. Anyway, I'm browsing for a few hours and it's after 3am. I've heard it's better to use the deep web at night. Less traffic that way. I found a few interesting sites. There's tons of religious stuff on there. You'd be surprised how often you find Satanists. Or at least people who claim to be Satanists. Most of the time, it's likely to be some edgy teenagers rebelling against their religious families. I won't get into my religious views, don't worry. It even has several of its own social networks and email services. No, thank you. You're begging to be stalked by some creep if you use one of those. Or better yet, get scammed by a catfish or honeypot. There are loads of conspiracy blogs as well. Both interesting and hilarious. Everything from Justin Bieber is secretly a reptilian member of the Illuminati to leaked files on human experimentation. There was even a guy who claimed to have stumbled across interdimensional travel via falling into an actual rabbit hole. As in, a literal physical hole in the ground made by a rabbit. I'd say you can't make this stuff up, but clearly you can. I was serious about the human experimentation, by the way. You're going to want to avoid that kind of stuff. If you had any faith in humanity, you'd lose it in a heartbeat. My god, I, I mean, I hope that stuff wasn't legit. Gun shops, drug shops, celebrity nudes, pirated movies, hackers for hire, hitmen, virus programmers, script kitties, stolen credit cards, you name it. There was one site that sold stolen US currency that was supposed to be marked for shredding due to age or poor condition. Seems like they got a lot of business too. No wonder the economy is in the toilet. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of legitimate stuff on there too. I visited the site of a really smart dude who was creating his own custom operating system. Even had games and stuff on it. There was funny things too. A mock cult made for people named Dan was among my favorites. The people that weren't maniacs seemed to be open-minded, if a little paranoid. Then I came across a site that supposedly gives you access to the webcams of people's personal laptops. I was curious. I shouldn't have been, I know. I'm not expecting to see some cam girls here. Just some slack-jawed people staring blankly at their screens while watching Let's Plays or some shit. And that's exactly what I saw. Neckbeards, teenagers, old men looking confused, the works. Here's me laughing at unsuspecting people. Then I, I saw myself. Ha ha, very funny, I thought sarcastically. It's tapping into my camera and trying to give me a good scare. It almost did, at first. Even so, I logged off. I kinda realized how bad what I was doing was. Not to mention how illegal it was. I went back to the clear web and watched some Netflix. Soon enough, I had all but forgotten about my deep web exploits. Then my Skype starts ringing. Another Skype number is calling me. I think maybe it's one of my friends trying it out. After all, I have been pestering one of them for a while to get on Skype so we can chat while playing games on Steam. So I pick it up. At first there was silence. Then I heard a voice. A man's voice. He sounded like he was an older guy, 50 plus. Looking good, he said. Without a second's hesitation, I hung up, deleted every deep web related app on my tablet, shut down and restarted my router. I have no fucking clue how that guy got my Skype number. And to be quite honest, I don't want to know. All I know is, if you're going to use the deep web, I beg of you, for your own safety, do more research than I did. Talk to someone who has experience in setting up a proper VPN or some other kind of anonymity. 
you're sure as hell not going to find it on fucking Google Play. If you went to school any time from the 90s onwards, the chances are that you've at least experienced a lockdown drill, maybe even an actual lockdown. Obviously, not all of them end in tragedy. Some schools go into lockdown because of a crime committed nearby, or because some parent forgot to wear their visitor's badge. There's lots of different reasons. Most of them have nothing to do with an actual legitimate threat to students. But better safe than sorry, right? I went to school in a post-Columbine world. Lockdowns were always taken very seriously, despite the fact that we lived in a fairly isolated area where most people knew each other. There were regular petitions to allow teachers to carry guns in school. Who knew how long it might take the police to arrive if something were to ever happen? But obviously, I'm not here to debate gun control, so I'll get to the point. Most lockdowns are drills, but I'm going to tell you about one that wasn't. I've always been a pretty nervous and paranoid person. For example, throughout middle and high school, I despised being in the cafeteria because I always seemed to get stuck sitting in some corner nowhere near an exit. It made me anxious, realizing just how much distance I would have to cross just to get out, even if something as innocent as a food fight were to occur. In upstairs classrooms, I would occasionally glance out the windows and ponder where or not the drop might kill me, or if I can make it out with just a broken arm or leg. In downstairs rooms, I would tend to sit near the windows unless I was forced to sit somewhere else. Admittedly, this was also because I just like to look outside and daydream. But like most routines, after enough repetition, you get used to almost anything. If you work in a school, you probably know this like the back of your hand. In the event of a lockdown, teachers are supposed to lock the doors, turn out the lights, and herd students into a part of the room that can't be seen from the window panel on the door. This always seemed a bit ridiculous to me. I once had an English class in a room where the only spot that you couldn't see people from the door was, ironically, right next to the door. The idea of us just lining up there while someone jiggled the knob outside sounded horrifying. However, I did have one major concern. What would happen if I were caught in one of these drills outside the classroom? Was I supposed to run and bang on the nearest door, hide in a closet, run outside? I always figured if it came down to it, if I was near an exit and it seemed like the real deal, I would take my chances running outside. Teachers never really told us during drills whether or not they were real, but someone always knew. There was always that one kid whose mom worked at the school and would tell everyone else that they weren't real and that there would be a fire drill the next day or something. They have a special code for when it's real. A girl named Kelly once informed our entire algebra class, if they say lockdown three times, it's only a drill. Four times, it's for real. We all snickered, but what she said lingered in the back of my mind every time the principal went on the loudspeaker, a voice crackling throughout the building, and I always counted, awaiting for that fourth time. 11th grade swung around. Now officially an upperclassman, I let a certain confidence seep into my step. I was 16. Next year, I would graduate and would be going to college. I practically owned this dump. I would see everyone that I hated working at McDonald's. You know, the usual 16-year-old spiel. I no longer felt the need to rush into first period. Instead, I lingered in the hallway with other relaxed juniors and seniors and made fun of confused freshmen and actually made eye contact with my teachers. This newfound skip of my step was what led me to cutting the first period bell very close as I wiped out my shirt with a wet paper towel in the bathroom. Someone had tripped on the bus and had gotten what I prayed was iced coffee on me. The stain did not look like it was coming out and I hadn't brought a jacket that day. I groaned, balled up the paper towel and chucked it at the garbage. I missed. Through the thick bathroom walls, I heard the distant crackle of the loudspeaker. Were they starting the morning announcements earlier this year? Maybe someone had parked in a teacher spot again. Lockdown, 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 lockdown. I was more caught off guard by the fact that it sounded like the secretary was making the announcement than anything else. Only after a moment or two did it sink in. This wasn't a drill. I stood there, completely motionless, wondering what the hell I was supposed to do. Finally, I lunged towards the door and yanked it open, peering out into the hall. Every door was shut. I was on the second floor. I thought I heard distant yelling from below. My panic then settled into a cold fear 
that pulled in the pit of my stomach. I darted back into the bathroom, trying to rationalize things. Maybe I had misheard it and it was just a drill. I tried to remember how the person on the loudspeaker had sounded. Were they frightened? Forced calm? I don't know, and not knowing was the worst part. The police had to be on their way if this was real, I assured myself. So as long as I stayed put, everything would be fine. What potential school shooter was going to check the bathroom? That said, I ran to the last stall, the one for people with wheelchairs, and scrambled up on the toilet. Should I lock the stall door? No. There was no point. If they did come in, it would be obvious that someone was in there. What if somehow they saw me through the small space in the door? Could I somehow wiggle on the ground from one stall to the next in an effort to evade them? By this point, I was slightly hysterical, but I knew, in the back of my mind, like you always know in these situations, if they did come in here, I would probably die. Ridiculously enough, I began preparing my last lines. What would I say? Should I try to plead with them? What if it was someone I knew? Maybe I could talk them down. But I couldn't even convince myself, never mind someone already homicidal. Should I try to be the hero and go for the gun? Right, and get shot in the face. Perhaps I could stall them. Stall. Them. I started to laugh. I didn't know why. Crouched on a grimy public high school toilet seat, my chuckles faded into harsh breathing, and I told myself not to look up, no matter what. I heard a loud noise from down the hall and flinched, although I had no idea what it was. I tried to still my breathing, and only succeeded in feeling faint, and then I heard it. Footsteps. I was sure of it. Maybe it was a cop, I told myself. The footsteps drew closer. I hadn't been raised to be religious, but right then and there, I started to make bargains. I didn't care if I got shot, as long as it didn't kill me, or paralyze me. Actually, that might be worse. I just wanted to go home. If whoever was in charge of this shit just made sure I got home, I would do whatever the hell they said for the rest of my life. Maybe they didn't have a gun. Maybe it was a knife. Maybe I could get out of this with a few nasty scars and a story. The bathroom door opened, and I went blank. I'm not sure how to describe it. I felt completely removed. I was there in the stall, but also, I wasn't. Like maybe it didn't really matter much either way, like I was beyond all of it. For a fleeting second, I wondered if I would collapse and die of fright. I knew they were there. I heard them. The first stall door swung open with a groan, as did the second. I tried to close my eyes, but I couldn't. My eyelids refused to cooperate. The third stall door opened. I was convinced I could hear them breathing. I wondered what they were thinking. Were they excited? Could they hear my breathing? God, I thought. Don't let it be someone I know. The next stall opened, and the one after that was mine. Suddenly the loudspeakers crackled on. Lockdown is now complete. Students and staff, thank you for your cooperation. The person in the bathroom paused. They then turned and left, doors swinging quietly behind them. I didn't leave that stall for another five minutes. My first period teacher was very annoyed, but I didn't really care. I informed him about what happened and he called the vice principal down, and I relayed my story to her. She seemed skeptical about my claim, and told me that the lockdown this morning was only a drill. The staff at the school was questioned, but no one had gone into the bathroom during the lockdown to check for students. I never really heard any more about it, but I am certain that there had been someone in there with me, and they came very close to finding me. My name is Corey, and I've spent a lot, and I mean a lot, of time camping, hiking, and hunting. I've seen all kinds of predators, and I've been in some sticky situations. Everything from a tornado heading my way to being tailed by some bears, so I don't exactly frighten easily. 
This past July, I was out camping near my family's farm in western Iowa, along with my girlfriend Alexa, my best friend Jason, and his new girlfriend, Samantha. Samantha actually had never been camping before, let alone more than a mile off the trail in the middle of a forest. She was understandably nervous, but we were watching out for her. We do have to watch out for prairie rattlers, poison ivy, and even mountain lions in this part of the state. We made camp in a clearing on top of a small hill with a few trees, but we were deep in the woods to be sure. We arrived to make camp, eat, drink, and went to bed by midnight. Nobody had any injury besides a few mosquito bites. Everything was going according to plan until, suddenly, I woke up to the sound of Samantha screaming at the top of her lungs. I just couldn't believe how loud she was screaming, it, it was actually insane. I woke up, I, I guess at the same time as Alexa, grabbed my light and my Glock and ran out. I told her to stay in our tent just in case. Jason was already trying to comfort Samantha and she was talking, almost babbling about something huge walking through camp and scratching at the tent and making a terrible sound. I told her it could have been a coyote or even a mountain lion. What little food and trash we did have was outside of the camp area so that wasn't an issue. But I assured her that I would stay up and light the fire again that I would take turns with Jason watching the fire because our movement and the fire should scare anything away. This seemed to comfort her and she actually went to sleep in with Alexa. Jason and I both stayed awake talking quietly, watching the fire and checking around camp for tracks and signs. We couldn't see anything obviously wrong or suspicious. It certainly could have been a mountain lion and this did have me on edge with the girls there. About 30 minutes had passed and Jason walked just out of the firelight to take a leak. He was off to my left, my tent across the fire in front of me and Jason's tent behind me. There, off to my empty right, I saw something and heard a large crunch. Jason heard it also and was practically still pulling up his pants running towards the fire. What the hell was that? That is big, he said. I, I know, it could be a big cat. Better get your 44 out of your bag too and get that bright tack light, I told him. He returned with those items and we waited to illuminate whichever area we heard more movement from next. Then we heard a crunch and a snap. More movement almost directly behind us. We stood up simultaneously and spun around, turning the brightest light on. For just a second, we saw what almost looked like a gorilla-sized and shaped figure disappear back into the trees. At this point, I'm trying to keep it together and Jason is just frozen. I tell him to snap out of it and that we need to get the fire to grow. Once the fire is larger, we both need to take a position, one in front and one in the back of the tent to protect the girls. We heard this awful grumbling and growling sound for the rest of the night. I have never heard anything like it and large crunching and snapping sounds continued to emanate from the woods behind us. Periodically, we would see something move either to our left or right in the clearing just outside the trees. I kept the fire going. I actually had the fire pretty enormous by the end of the night. As soon as the sun started coming up, we packed up. On our way out, we saw large prints in the mud down by a small stream at the base of the hill we were camped on top of. I can't really say anything other than the fact that they basically looked like a huge man's prints. The thing we saw was definitely not a man. I, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was going to hurt us. I, I don't know if it was Bigfoot. Frankly, I don't want to know. The way I see it, it's really not relevant because I was thinking it was a mountain lion initially. Those are also dangerous. I won't let this stop me from camping. Sometimes I guess you just hear scary things at night in the woods. Because scary things do live in the woods. I guess that's just part of the adventure. This happened to me about seven years ago. I worked at KFC through high school and college. I went to college really close to where I grew up, so staying at the same work location was very easy for me. One day I went to work at 4.30 and had to work to drive through half of my shift due to someone calling off. It seemed like a regular day until we were getting ready to close. 
At around 10.50 p.m., this guy walked in and stood by the front register. He looked weird as if he just came from a costume party. I let him know that when he's ready to order, just tell me, as I'm cleaning due to us closing in 10 minutes. He told me that he wasn't ordering and wanted to know what time he closed. I told him 11 p.m. and he left. I noticed that he got inside a van that has been sitting in the parking lot for hours. I thought it was weird but continued to clean up. There were a few of us still on shift. Again, everything seemed regular that night. I grabbed the trash and went outside toward the dumpster. As I approached the dumpster, I noticed someone trying to hide in the shadows behind the dumpster. I stopped immediately, and I tried to squint in order to get a better look. Then whoever that was behind the dumpster moved back so I wouldn't be able to see their shoes anymore. But they didn't know I already saw them. I turned around immediately and went back inside. I told my manager he went to the door with one of my co-workers to get a better look. They couldn't see anyone, so they went outside to check it out and left me inside by myself. I felt safe while they were outside. I went to the cash register at the drive-thru to cash out for the night. Then on my left, I swear I saw the man from earlier in the window. He had a blank look on his face, then he started hitting the window with a dead raccoon trying to get in while yelling my name. I ran to the front door as my manager and co-worker were walking back in. I frantically told them what happened, and my manager ran back outside to the window while my co-worker stayed with me and called the police. The guy left before my manager was able to get him. The cameras outside got the license plate, but it didn't match the description of the van, and the plates were registered to a woman. This guy was never found, and I am forever worried that he will come back for me. I've been working at McDonald's now for over five years, and this is still my creepiest experience there. This happened two years ago when I was 18, and I had been working my first overnight shift on front counter. I usually work in the kitchen on overnights, so I had no interactions with any of the customers until then. I was working from 10pm until 6am, which is a usual overnight shift for us. Around 3am I was making some fries when I noticed a man standing there and trying to take pictures with his cell phone of me and my other female coworker, Rebecca. I pointed it out to her and she just rolled her eyes in annoyance and went to take an order and drive through telling me it happened a lot. I was instantly uncomfortable. I wanted to tell the manager but he was in the office doing his manager stuff and I didn't want to bother him. I went over with what I felt was a nervous smile and quickly did my usual greeting. Hello, what can I get for you? He just kind of looked at me and stayed quiet. He was about 5'8", white, early 20s, medium build with dark hair and brown eyes. An average man, I would say, but something about his piercing glare made me feel super uncomfortable. Then he smiled, a smile that sent shivers down my spine. I'll just have a coffee, black, sweetie, he said, and I could instantly smell alcohol on his breath. I nodded and told him the price before he pulled out a $5 bill and went to hand it to me, making sure our hands touched. I avoided his gaze and went to hand back his change when he winked at me and went to go wait for his coffee. I went to go make it as fast as I could, but, just my luck, we were out of coffee on both the front counter and the drive through as we don't sell much through the night. I turned around and kept as little eye contact as I possibly could. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to brew you a fresh pot. Should only take about three minutes. Don't worry, I don't mind. I have quite the view while I wait, he replied, shooting me a wink. I just smiled awkwardly and looked away. I had to make sure I didn't fall behind on my shift, so I began to set up the muffins on the display so we had them all ready for breakfast, which starts at 4am in Canada. So, Susan, I heard behind me, realizing it was the guy. 
I instantly tensed, wondering how he knew my name before I noticed I had my name tag on and quietly cursed to myself. I turned around and looked at him, and he said, What time are you stuck here until tonight, beautiful? I instantly panicked as I didn't do well in these situations. I, uh, seven, I said nervously, which then the guy gave me a huge grin. Oh, so you still have time before you're off, eh? I nodded and noticed the coffee was done pouring, so I went over and made his coffee as he watched me with an intense stare. I handed it to him before saying, have a nice night, earning me another wink. He then waved and said as he turned around, I'll see you later, Susan. I watched as he walked out the door and tried to calm myself down. He doesn't actually know when I'm off, so I'm okay. I thought to myself, 6 a.m. rolled around, and it was finally time to go. I still felt a little paranoid about the guy, but I knew it was now in the past. My coworker Chris was going to drop me off at home as we carpooled, so we got our stuff together and left. As we were heading to his car, I noticed a parked car with someone in it, and of course, it was the guy. I panicked and quickly told Chris, that was the guy, as I had told him what happened not long ago. He instantly brought me into his coat and did his best to keep me hidden as we walked quickly to his car. He made sure no one followed the car, dropped me off, and watched as I went inside, telling me to stay safe. I thanked him before going into my house and going to bed. The next day, I went into work and got asked by my manager how I got home. I told them Chris gave me a ride. My manager looked confused and said something that made my blood run cold. Oh, that's strange, because some guy was here looking for you just before seven, He said he was here to pick you up. I thought before that the man's intentions weren't good. Just the way he looked at me and spoke to me, like I was prey. And this pretty much confirmed it. Since then, I have refused to work front counter overnight shift. And we no longer wear our name tags overnight. At the time of this story, I was about 12 years old. We lived in Wichita, Kansas. We had just moved there from Garden City, Kansas. My family also lived in a duplex in a rough neighborhood. Less than a block away from the house was my brother's school. And on the weekends and holidays, we would go to his school to play and do kid stuff. Well, one Thanksgiving break, my brother and I went to the basketball courts just to get some shots up. So we had been there for about an hour when I got a strange feeling. Now I've had this feeling before and I remember knowing it meant something bad. So I looked around for anything that may catch my attention, but there was nothing. So we kept playing, but I could not shake the feeling. So after about 30 minutes, we were preparing to leave, which all we had to do was go across the playground and jump the back fence. And we would just be across the street from our own house. So I go to get the basketball from the court and my brother follows. I get to the ball and decided to shoot a half-court shot. In mid-shot, there's this feeling again. So again, I stop and I look around. That's when I notice a man standing there on the other side of the fence on the sidewalk. He's looking at us, but he's not moving, just standing there. But I really pay him no mind and shoot the shot. Of course, I missed it, but the ball hits the rim and it bounces near the fence. I race over to get it, trying to beat my brother to it. And I reach down to get it, and there's that feeling again. So I look over my shoulder. The guy is still there, just watching us. Now he's walking along the fence, running his hand along the fence, just staring at us. Not once did his eyes come off of us. Did not notice. He's heading to the fence entrance. Now I knew that being next to the busy street, people could see us as they passed. But that feeling was so strong, and this guy, he looked so creepy. And he keeps staring at us. Something in me yelled, run. 
and my feet started moving and my brother was right behind me. We got to the corner of the school and stopped. We turned and looked and he was entering the fence and he was still watching but now he's coming our way. I grabbed my brother and we sprinted around the back side of the school in the block and a half to our house. We bust open the door and ran to our mother and we told her what happened with tears coming on our face. She held us and told us everything would be okay and we're safe. She called the police but nothing ever came of it. I don't know, ever since then, my brother and I were too afraid to go to the park by ourselves. When I was 21, I transferred to a college in San Francisco. I checked out a room for rent on Craigslist. It was in a really nice two-bedroom apartment. It was cheap rent and close to campus, so it was the ideal spot. The girl who lived there was 29 and her name was Beth. She was tall and white, and she had jet black hair and wore pale makeup. She seemed nice, although a little quiet, but she seemed to like me and agreed to let me move in. So far, so good. My first night there, we went out for pizza, and that's when I could tell that something was a little bit off with her. Throughout dinner, she kept telling me how much I looked like Shia LaBeouf. I didn't know what to say, so I just shrugged it off with a, thanks? I mean, I looked nothing like Shia LaBeouf, so it just didn't make any sense to me. When we got back home, she asked if I had seen her room yet. I said no, and she took me to see it. Her walls were covered in posters of Shia LaBeouf. She had even printed out photos of him all over her mirror. She owned all of his movies. I, I mean, I didn't know what to make of it. It was creepy. The whole night she had been saying I look like him, and now it's obvious to me that she's obsessed with the guy. A few weeks passed, and I never really saw her that much. We didn't spend any time together, really. She would come home from work and practically run to her room. She would spend the whole night in there. She had this really creepy high-pitched giggle, and I would hear her giggling through the walls at night. I wondered what the hell she could possibly be doing. Occasionally, she would come out and talk for like two minutes, and then she would always be slurring her words, so I suspected she was drinking a lot. Sometimes she wouldn't say anything, and she would just stand in the hallway and watch me in the living room. I would turn and see her and be surprised and say something like, Hello, Beth. And then there would be this long, awkward pause, and she would just give out her creepy, high-pitched giggle. It was uncomfortable being around her. She gave me the chills. One night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. because I heard what sounded like the front door being unlocked. I came out of my bedroom, and all the lights were off. But I could still see Beth standing at the front door. She had her face against it and she was turning the lock back and forth over and over again. And every time she turned the bolt, she mumbled my name. Max. 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 Seeing her standing in the dark and mumbling my name really freaked me out. And it doesn't help that she kind of looks like a bigger version of the girl from The Ring. I just quietly went back to my room and tried to sleep. One night, I was watching Gladiator and she stumbled out of her room and turned on the living room light, forcing me to pause the movie, which was annoying. She then asked me if I wanted to hear about her ex-boyfriend. It was an uneasy segue into the topic, but I just said sure and then awkwardly sat back to listen to her. Ten minutes into her story and she was extremely riled up. She was screaming at the top of her lungs about their breakup. I was worried that the neighbors were going to call the cops and she wasn't listening to me when I was asking her to lower the volume. Amidst all of her screaming, one thing she said really freaked me out. She was in such a fit and she yelled that she'll slit his fucking throat. That was a big game changer. Suddenly I had no idea what this girl was capable of. I mean, she was practically a stranger and everything I had seen was becoming alarmingly disturbing. After a few more minutes, she told me thanks for listening and started doing her giggle. I got out of there pretty fast and went to my room to go to sleep. I had a pretty unsettling feeling about being in the house with her. And what's worse is that there was no lock on my bedroom door. I pushed the edge of my dresser in front of it to act as like a little barricade. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my dresser scraping against the floor. Beth was pushing the door open. I turned on my light, shouting at her to stop. I could see her through the opening of the door. 
She was so drunk and had this insane look in her eyes. I pushed the door closed and yelled at her to go to bed. I could hear her walk back to her room, but I couldn't fall back asleep. The next morning when I went out into the hallway, my heart dropped. I saw that one of her steak knives was on the floor by my door. I got goosebumps all over my arms. All I could think about was her saying she would slit that guy's throat. I confronted her about it and she said she didn't remember trying to push my door open. She said she didn't even remember telling me about her ex. I had enough. My lease was month to month, so I found a new spot and moved out. About a month after I moved out, she contacted me. I was at the movies and my phone was off. When I got out, I turned my phone on. And to my shock, I received 40 plus text messages that she had sent me over the past two hours. They were all just insane texts that ranged from everything between, Hi, how are you? to, I fucking hate you. It was insane. I didn't respond and I never heard from her again. I always wonder, if I hadn't set my dresser in front of my door, would she have quietly crept into my room and slit my throat? It freaks me out. A couple of years ago, one of my closest friends relocated cross-country with his long-term girlfriend to work a job he couldn't refuse. The only issue he had was that he didn't want to fly his dogs out with him when they made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit reticent to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his furry babies and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we are Chicago folks so the trip would be a long one, however, with the three of us to foot the near 30 hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves and, if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were in a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an 8 hour stay at a Denver La Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, barring getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving two miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point we made it through Utah, Arizona, and Nevada without much problem until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town or something along those lines which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient too as it wasn't located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally we'd let the dogs out at every rest stop but having stopped not long before then and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled up on the opposite side of a beat up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoopties at the pumps, all unoccupied and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees so nothing seemed out of the ordinary, until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt which I chalked up to a misread. I swiped again, and the pump read, Please see attendant. I was annoyed, but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was going to do and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marble Reds, I walked up to the store to make a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kind of quiet, especially for one right off the interstate, but it's no matter. As I walked in, though, more weirdness. First thing I noticed is that there were some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed immediately that there was no one milling about in this place. With the six cars besides my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers or workers. And then it dawned on me, what happened to that gentleman who was at the pump adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. 
This is where I began to feel this gnawing sensation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could always trust my instincts, and those instincts were screaming at me to just get the hell out. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of the gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple of minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something, anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in the movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, something comes and strikes them down. I'm about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. And the best way I could describe it was like Nick Cage's smile from face off before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I got the fuck back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95-pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently, my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the fucking door, to which he only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when I opened the door. I reached my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and see Nick Cage had stopped about a pump away from where we were, still with that same look on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with a story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a hundred dollar charge at a mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what the hell was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what the hell was that smiling man's story. <laughs>